the illness of Wally Mayer, the part of Mike Shane will be played tonight by Edmund McDonald in The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. <laughs> The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It's a bright and sunny San Francisco afternoon. The sort of day you want to close up your office, say to heck with work, and go over the hill. Right now, Mike Shane and Phyllis Knight have closed their office and gone over the bay. But they can't say to heck with work. In fact, work is calling them to the Oakland Railroad Terminal. As they enter the depot, Phyllis looks at her wristwatch. Twenty past three. Mike, do you realize that train is five whole hours late? Uh, I ought to. This makes our third trip across the bay to meet it. Yeah, well, watch out for these swinging doors. Yeah. Oh, it's in, all right. Here comes the red cast with the bags. Hey, I'd still like to know why we had to come clear over here to the train to welcome Mr. Frank Hewitt Newton back to his own town. I wouldn't know what a minute, Angel. Fifteen-word telegram can't say much more than meet me at the depot, Pioneer Limited. Plus that little business about a package he's sending you, Air Express. Uh-huh. Something's wrong, and I guess he wants fast action on it. Yeah. Uh, hey, there he is. Where? Where? Right ahead of us. Those two men and that red-headed gal. Yeah. Oh, uh, glad to see you, Mr. Newton. Oh, uh, uh, Mr. Newton. Hey, uh, Mr. Newton. Oh, it's me, Mike Shane. But, well, uh, just look right through us. Well, maybe he didn't hear us. Come on, we'll catch him at the taxi stand. Okay. Excuse me. Forty thousand people in our way. Oh, 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 excuse me, sir. Uh, uh, this way, Phil. Hurry, come on. Yeah. They're outside already, Mike. There, there he is. Get into that sedan with the others. Well, run for it, Mike. Run. Oh, Mr. Newton. Mr. Newton. Mr. Newton. Oh, save your lungs. Save your lungs, Mike. He's gone. Oh, for the love of... You know, he's got a real cute sense of humor, hasn't he? Three trips across the bay to glad hand a guy and he gives you the glassy stare. Yeah. Maybe it ain't from humor. Let's head back to the office. I want to do some phoning. <laughs> Hello. This is Mike Shane calling. Mr. Newton in? No, no. He got back a half an hour ago. He wired me to meet him at the Oakland Depot, but something went wrong. Oh, you're Mrs. Newton? Yeah, that's right. Mike Shane, the detective. Well, I don't know. I, I got his telegram from Reno telling me to meet him at the train. Yeah, yeah. It was sent from Reno. Well, if I knew, I'd tell you, Mrs. Newton. Y- you'll have him for me. Oh, well, well, thanks a lot. Goodbye. Oh, so friend-husband didn't tell the missus he was arriving home today. Mm, guess not. She thought he was still in Chicago. Awfully curious why he was hiring Mike Shane, the detective. That makes three of us. Mm. Where's that telegram? I want to read it again. Oh, oh here, on the desk. Thanks. Uh-huh. Reno, 11.10 p.m., sending package, Air Express, hold for me, stop. Meet me, Oakland Depot, tomorrow, Pioneer Limited, Frank Hewitt Newton. Yeah. Well, he must have gotten off the train to send the mysterious package. But why? To make little girls ask big questions. Smart. So far, the score is double zero. No package, no client. I'll get it. Mike Shane speaking. Mr. Newton. Say, what went wrong? We went over to the depot. We, we saw you hollered at you, chased after you. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, well, all right, but, but it seemed funny. Well, no, it hasn't. Where? Fairfax Hotel. Well, sure, if it comes before we close the office. Uh, room 911. Yeah, okay. But would you not mind telling me what it's all about? Uh, hello? Hello, Mr. Newton. Hello? Hello? Oh, he hung up on me. Well, did he tell you why he gave us the fast oh, run he around? Oh, says he'll explain later. Wants me to bring the express package to him at the Fairfax Hotel when it comes. Well, it sounds to me like he's dodging the sheriff or bill collectors. Well, it sounds pretty worried to me. He's dodging something or... But what? Or who? Uh, you're Mr. 
Mr. Shane? That's right. Something we can do for you? I'm Mrs. Frank Newton. Oh, we talked on the phone. Won't you have a chair, Mrs. Newton? I've come here, Mr. Shane, to find out exactly why my husband hired you. I'm afraid you know as much about it as I do, Mrs. Newton. In other words, you won't tell. It's about me. Mr. Shane isn't in the habit of lying, Mrs. Newton. We do not know. We think it has something to do with a package which your husband sent to us. A package? Yes, an air express from Reno. Uh, he phoned a few minutes ago from the Fairfax Hotel. I'm to deliver it to him there. <laughs> That's all I know. Fairfax Hotel? <laughs> Well, I'll see about that right now. Well, that lady better watch her blood pressure. Uh, this is a divorce case. I'm getting out of it. Yet somehow it doesn't smell like one. Hey. Hey, Mike. Now, where are you going? Fairfax Hotel. I'm going to find out what this hoopla is all about. I'll see you later. Oh, fine. Fine. Now, all I got to do is sit here and just go crazy. I write letters, which is worse. Oh, uh, yeah. Hi there, Phyllis. Phyllis. If you want to see Mike, Inspector, you missed him by 15 seconds. Huh. You must have gone down the other hole. You mind if I sit down? Just make yourself comfortable. Thanks. You're just in time to see me go nuts. Huh? Batty. Telegrams, trains late, phone calls, people tearing in and out. Oh, there you see. See what I tell you, see? Air Express for Mr. Michael Shane. Air... This is it. It's come. Let me see uh, it. Uh, take it easy, lady. I just want you to sign. Yeah, sure, sure. The receipt. I'll sign it. Here. Here. Like that? Uh, thanks. You're welcome, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Phil, what's gotten into you? Where's the package? What's the package? What is it's it all about? It's no bigger than a small book. It doesn't even weigh as much. But this is the dear little darling that's got a skaga. Will you let me have that again? Faraday, we got a telegram. Sending you package air express. Hold for me. You walked right past us at the train. Wants it delivered to the hotel. Wife says it's hers. And Faraday, have you got an aspirin? Oh. Relax me, gal. I'll get it. Mike Shane's office. Huh? Oh, No. Where? Market and Geary. Right away. Faraday, what's the matter? What's wrong? Phil. What? What is it? Mike's been hurt. Bad. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane and his assistant Phyllis in their adventures. Regular lubrication for your car is, of course, most important. But proper lubrication is even more so. If your car is carelessly or hurriedly greased, important fittings may be missed or left dry. That is why Union Oil Stop Wear Lubrication means extra insurance against mechanical wear and depreciation. Stop Wear Lubrication jobs are a matter of pride with the Union Oil Minutemen. Only the finest high-quality greases are used. Each fitting is carefully and thoroughly lubricated according to the manufacturer's specifications. While your car is on the hoist, the Minutemen inspect out-of-sight points and check them for danger signs. Stop wear lubrication is so accurate and scientific that you receive a written guarantee with each job, which is definite proof of reliable service. Your car will roll smoother, handle easier, stand up better with stop wear lubrication. So, ladies and gentlemen, for guaranteed, reliable lubrication, ask your Union Oil Minuteman for Stop Wear. Stop Wear is an exclusive process, available only at Union Oil Minuteman stations. Phyllis and Inspector Faraday have reached the intersection of Market and Geary Streets, where Mike was reported badly hurt. I'm scared. I'm scared, Faraday. I'm just scared sick. If Mike is hurt so bad... I know what you mean, but where is he? There's no crowd, no ambulance. Well, maybe they've taken him to the hospital. Perhaps. Let's ask that traffic officer over there. He's just got to be all right. He's the best boss, the best guy who ever lived. Officer. Officer. Yes, sir? Did the ambulance take the man who was injured here a few minutes ago? What man? Mike Shane, my boss, the best guy who... He was run over. Not on my corner. Ain't been even a dented fender around here all day. But they said Market and Geary. They said he... They said... Oh. Yeah. A phony call. Somebody wanted you out of your office. Oh, I have been a dope. They wanted that package. We've got to get back, Faraday. Too late now. I've lost it. Mike was to deliver it to the Fairfax Hotel. What'll he do to me? <laughs> I'm curious. Let's pick him up at the hotel and find out. <laughs> Uh, 
Phil, Faraday, what are you two doing here? Looking for Mike Shane, Lothario of the hotel lobby. Oh, golly, Mike, it's good to see you alive and whole. <laughs> huh? Mike, the Air Express came, and then we got a phone call saying you were hurt and to come quick, and we ran out, and, and uh, I forgot the package. It's it's stolen. Holy, uh, we're the oldest trick in a book. Now what'll I tell Newton? Nothing, just hand him the package. Here it is. Faraday? In your pocket? Yes, yeah, sure. I grabbed it when we tore around. You knew it was a fake call, and you let me go on worrying. <laughs> oh. I'd like to know who made that call. It was a woman's voice. Mrs. Newton. She tried to get the package before. Maybe. I talked to Mr. Tootin on the lobby phone here. He said he'd be down in a minute. Did he tell you what this hide-and-seek is all about? No. He was holding a conference in his room. One of the men we saw him with him at the depot got out of the elevator. Then you're waiting for Newton now. Yeah, if he ever goes down. Well, let's go up to his room and talk to him. Yeah, I'd like to know what's on the fire myself. I suppose that... Okay, it's room 911. Well, come on, Mike. The elevators are this way. Yes, and so is Mrs. Newton. She just stepped out of one. Yeah. Uh-oh, let's not tangle with her again. Amen. Yeah, she's going through that arcade. All right, kids. Let's make an end run for it. Here it is, Mike. Number 911. Huh? Yeah. The key is on the outside of the door. I will be so glad when we get rid of this package. It's hexed. Mm. Uh, no answer. Suppose we might stick our heads inside? Go ahead. I've got the authority. Uh, Mr. Newton. Uh, Mr. Newton, it's uh, Mike Shane. Well, he must have gone downstairs. Hey, what's that noise? Come on, let's find out. I don't see anybody. Uh-oh, <gasps> on the sofa. Yeah. Mike, is that... Is he... Useless question, don't you think? Pillow over his face. Oh, it used to be a pillow. It's blown inside out. Stuck the gun into the pillow and use it as a silencer. Is that your man, Newton? Must be. Yeah. Yeah, I can still recognize him. Yeah, but this man's dead and we heard sounds. Here he is. Where? Tied up with bed sheets and gags. Slugged a couple of times, too. Here, give me a hand, Mike. Hey, you bet. Hey. Hey, I know him. This is one of the guys who came out of the depot with Newton. Yeah, he's not tied very tight. Let's get that gag out of his mouth. Oh, oh thank heavens. I was choking. Can you stand up? I, I think so. Oof. Dizzy. You hit me so hard. Who are you? Carl Stanton, Frank's business partner. You uh, were, Mr. Stanton. You mean... And he... He, he did it? Very thoroughly. You know who did it? The, there were two of them. man and a woman. She called him George. That's it, Mike. The other two who were with Newton at the depot. Yes. Frank wired me to meet him there. They were with him. Had guns and said they'd kill us if we called for help. That explains why Newton gave us the brush off at the station. Well, we didn't dare make a sign. They forced Frank to come to the hotel and get this room. They made him phone a detective. I guess it was you, sir. They bring the necklace here. You mean they're... There's jewelry inside his package? A diamond necklace. Cost Frank $42,000. Ooh. And he sent it to me because he knew these two were after it. Oh, confound it. They've cut the phone wires. I have to go downstairs to call headquarters. Just a minute, Faraday. Let's get a description of the two so you can broadcast an alarm. Don't worry. I intend to. Now, look. Give us the whole story while you're about it, Mr. Stanton. Well, Frank bought the necklace in Chicago for his wife. These people got on the train there, he said. They became so friendly, got suspicious. He sneaked off the train at Reno and shipped the necklace to Mr. Shane. Well, somehow they must have figured out the trick. Well, they found the Air Express receipt in Frank's wallet. So they made him come to the hotel and then phone the detective. The red-headed girl said she was going downstairs to the drugstore. But she didn't come back, and the other one got awfully excited. He said she was double-crossing him. Well, she made that phony call. She went to our building, watched for the express truck, and then tricked us, huh? Probably. Go on, Mr. Stanton. Well, this fellow lost his head. Said he'd blow our brains out if we didn't give him money. We were to call a messenger here to the room with all our company cash. I tried to sneak the gun away from him, and... Well, that's the last I knew. Uh-huh. He slugged you, tied you up, then killed Newton. He really went haywire. I'll get it. I'll answer it. Is Mrs. Newton in? Well, uh, Come I... on in. Well, I... I didn't expect to find so many... Good Lord, Frank. Yeah. 
Murdered. A couple of jewel thieves. What did you want? Why, uh, I, uh, I was to meet Mrs. Newton here. What for? I, uh, I'm her attorney, Warren Wilson. We're going to discuss Edna's divorce and property settlement with, uh, with him. Looking out for her interests very carefully, aren't you, Wilson? Somebody has to. The way you're milking the company. That's a lie. If anybody was milking it, it was Frank. $42,000 for a string of diamonds. You mean the company bought the necklace? It did. Frank phoned me from Chicago for the money. I told him it would take all our cash we had in the bank. Just a minute. Mr. Wilson, is this the first time you've been to this room? Certainly. Hmm. We found the key on the outside of the door. Why, anybody could unlock it and come in. Right. What about Mrs. Newton? We saw her come out of the elevator. Yeah, but Mike, Mr. Stanton didn't mention her. Of course, he was unconscious. Wouldn't know. Phil, you looked up Newton's house phone. You remember the street number? Yeah, yeah. Let's get going. I want to swap one diamond necklace for one piece of information. Send a cop up to the room, will you, Mike? I'm going down to headquarters and broadcast a pickup for the Chicago paper. Okay, but don't talk the newspapers yet or you'll be sorry. <laughs> What do you wish to see me about, Mr. Shane? The Air Express package just came, Mrs. Newton. We understand it's for you. May I have it, please? Certainly. Here you are. Thank you. Your, uh, your eyes are red, Mrs. Newton. Is there something wrong? Why, uh, no, I, I'm just upset. I'm getting a divorce. Warren Wilson is your attorney, I believe. Oh, I suppose Frank has set you on his trail. Gentleman seems very interested in protecting your financial interests. I don't believe that concerns you. Excuse me. Uh, by the way, I saw you in the lobby of the Fairfax Hotel a while ago. Did you uh, talk over the divorce with your husband? I... yes. How did he take it? Mr. Shane, if you came here to pry into my private affairs... I came I... here, Mrs. Newton, to tell you that your husband is dead. He's dead? Who did it? I didn't say he was murdered. Oh, oh no. Uh, no, of course not. I, I just assumed from the way you spoke... As a matter of fact, he was shot to death. Yes, they're looking for the killers right now. Two jewel thieves followed Mr. Newton from Chicago. Oh, well, then it was for this. This is my anniversary present. That's a pretty costly one for a man who was going to leave you. Well, if I'd only known. We were in Chicago, and I, I told Frank I wanted some diamonds for our 15th anniversary. And he said no, and... We quarreled, and, and I came home without him. This attorney, Warren Wilson, he wanted you to get a divorce, didn't he? Well, he said it was my only protection, that Frank and Carl Stanton were robbing the company, and Warren was worried about my property. Which, of course, he would be glad to protect uh, if he married you. Oh, never. I told him so. I respect him as an attorney, but as a man, a husband, no. He's probably heard that women change their minds. That would pay off even as executor of your husband's estate. You mean Warren might have... Oh, no, he couldn't be smart enough to use a pillow. Mike. No, I guess he wouldn't, Mrs. Newton. In fact, it's pretty ingenious for a woman. Uh, I didn't do it. I, I swear I didn't. I, I, I opened the door and Frank was on the couch and I just turned and ran. and I, I didn't know what to do. I, I was afraid to tell anybody... What would the police say? Oh, that's easy to find out, Mrs. Newton. Put on your hat and coat and we'll go down to headquarters. Case 26, 28, height 5 feet 3. Wait, 105, red hair. Powderfield, turn it up, will you? Repeating, pick up man and woman, George Highland, alias Slip Doyle, age 36, height 5 feet 9, weight 155, blonde hair, woman Gwen Evans, alias Clara Bloomberg, age 26, 28, height 5 feet 3, weight 105, red hair. Warning, they are killers. They are killers. Well... Faraday got a real description of the two. Stanton must have identified them from police uh, photographs. Well, then what's the sense of dragging me in? They're the ones. They, they killed Frank. Now, did they, Mrs. Newton? I wouldn't be known. Mike, that coupe behind us. Yeah? I saw it park across the street when we rang Mrs. Newton's doorbell. You sure of it? I'm positive. Okay, I'll turn up this corner and see what happens. Oh. 
Yeah, it's still behind us, Mike. It went so dark, I could see who's driving. Wait a minute, the street lamp. That... Yeah. yeah. I caught it in the rear vision. His pal, Georgie, able to slip joy. Oh, the killer! He's alone. He's alone in the car. Oh, oh, he's after my necklace. He's after me. He's after all three of us. Mike, head for a police station. Save our necks and lose? Uh-uh. We're heading for the office of Shane Detective Agency. Mike, you're plain crazy. Maybe. We'll decide that after the trap is set. Oh, fine. If we're still alive to decide anything. <laughs> We'll return to Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, the entire weight of your automobile rides directly on the wheel bearings. Now, wheel bearings are round, must revolve rapidly, and yet support the heavy weight of the car. Because of this concentrated pressure, and because they are also liable to damage from brake dust, grit, and water, the front wheel bearings need the best possible lubrication. Failure to keep these bearings properly lubricated may result in expensive repairs requiring parts now hard to get. Your neighborhood Union Oil Minuteman knows this. That's why he takes such pains to do a thorough job of lubricating the front wheel bearings. First, he washes out all the old grease and dirt with solvents. Then the bearings and races are individually cleaned until they are dry and shiny. Finally, the clean, polished bearings are replaced in the races and greased with special equipment to make certain that every surface is snugly sealed in a thick coating of Union Oil wheel-bearing grease. Then your front wheels are all set for months of well-lubricated, easy rolling. The cost for the entire service of your front wheel-bearing assembly is nominal. So for safer, easier driving, just stop in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and take advantage of Union Oil's front wheel-bearing service. Thank you. Mike thinks he has a plan to capture the murderer who is trailing him. With Phyllis and Mrs. Newton, he is just entering his office. Turn on the lights, Phil. Yeah. Mike, this room, it's been ransacked. Sure. So Doyle's red headed girlfriend, that fake phone call you got, remember? Well, he'll be here any second, Mr. Shane, by the next elevator. Phil, you get into your office. Do exactly as I told you. Okay, all right, but this better work good. And lock your door from the other side. Oh, Mr. Shane, the man's desperate. He'll kill us, I know. I don't think so. If he sees I'm on my arm, I'm So is my husband. Good evening. Do you always enter with your hat on and a gun in your hand? I saw three of you get out of the car. Where's the girl? Phil? Oh, uh, she went down the hall a little... Uh, she went down the hall. Maybe. Or maybe she's in the next room. Locked. You. Oh, uh, what? Hand over the necklace. Well, I haven't got it. Really, I haven't. Uh, uh, Mr. Shane, he... Oh, uh... he's got it. All right, Shane. <laughs> Sorry. I'm fresh out of diamonds, too. Wasting your time, pal. No diamonds in that desk. Your red-headed valentine gave this place the frisk hours ago. Oh, the dirty little double-crosser. You've got the necklace here somewhere. I saw you go into that house with the package and come out again with it. Grandma, what big eyes you got. I'll give you ten seconds. I'd hate to spoil your nice carpet with a lot of blood. Oh, don't, don't. Well, I can have the carpet clean. And uh, I'll have to unless you hand me your gun right now. What are you giving me? You've got a good pair of eyes, chum, but you don't raise them high enough. Next time you test a locked door, look up at the transom. Huh? It's open. And that gun's sticking right through at it. And it's aimed right at your heart, mister. <laughs> Kids, I just talked with ballistics. What do they say? Slip Doyle's gun hasn't been fired for some time. What did I tell you? I didn't do it. Well, maybe he used the girl's gun. We'll have to wait on that. They just picked her up over in Oakland. He might have used another gun. We know he threatened to kill Newton. Well, I, I was just bluffing. He and that other guy knew it. He said I'd be scared of the noise. 
I told him there wouldn't be any. I'd stuff a pillow in his face and shove the gun into it, but I didn't kill him. No, you just got bored with the whole thing. You walked out leaving two guys to turn in the alarm. Oh, I locked them in. That's the catch. The key was in the outside of the door. Anybody could walk in and do the job. Okay, then I'd pick Newton's wife. She's in the next room with Stanton and that attorney, isn't she? Yeah, let's have a talk with him. And you're coming too, Slip. Well, all cleared up. Can we go now? Not yet. We're not dead sure this is the killer. What? But you all said he was. You might have that honor, Mrs. Newton. You tried to cover up the fact that you were in that hotel room. But I explained that. Maybe. But you sure had blood in your eye when you left our office this afternoon. Preposterous. It's this jewel thief, undoubtedly. Well, perhaps an attorney who tried to get Mrs. Newton away from her husband. I was protecting her from Frank and Carl. They were stripping the business. How very noble of you, Mr. Wilson. However, I agree, it must have been this thief. Oh, you're all trying to frame him. Now, me. wait a minute. Nobody's trying to frame you. You said you threatened to kill Newton. Now he's dead. You said you were going to fire your gun through that pillar. That's how we found it, the exact way. Say that again, Faraday. Huh? Never mind. Have we been slow? Remember when you and Phil found me in the lobby? I said I saw the Chicago guy going out of the lobby? Yes, yeah, sure. That was before I talked to Frank Newton on the desk phone. Well, then... Then Newton was still alive when Slip Doyle left the hotel. I told you so. Slip Doyle made the threats. He told exactly how he'd kill Newton, but he didn't follow through. There was one other person, the only other one in the room, to hear the threat and to carry it out in detail. Carl Stanton. Right. Looked like a cinch. The jewel thief was a perfect floor guy. Oh, no, you're wrong. I told you Carl was stealing from the company. With Newton out of the way, he could lay all the blame on his partner. Right. So the two crooks had a falling out. That's why Stanton was tied up so sloppy, he did it himself. Okay, I'll send a man to the hotel to find his gun. That'll cinch you. It's cinched right now. We've got the motive. We've got Doyle's testimony. We've got our own. You'll never convict me. I'll kill myself. First. I don't think you will, Mr. Stanton. They tell me the suicide rate in the county jail is very low. <laughs> You don't have to see me to my door, Mike. I'm not afraid of the dark anymore. Please, Angel, allow me one little touch of Irish gallantry. Oh, <laughs> all right. Here we are. Now, if I can just find my keys. Phil. Hmm? Faraday told me how busted up you were when you thought I was injured. The best boss, the best guy who ever lived. Oh, well, uh, Faraday is an old gossip. You know better than to believe his stories. Oh, jeepers, these keys are here somewhere. If, if I had been injured, dear, what would you have done? Oh, I, I'd come down to the hospital and kiss you, make you well. You would, huh? Kiss me, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, here, here are my keys. Well, um, good night, Mike. Oh! What? What's the matter? What's wrong? Oh, I'm hurt. I just bit my lip. Mm. <sighs> Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Ed McDonald substituted for Wally Mayer, whose appearance was prevented by illness. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Holiday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... 
The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. As a loyal native of San Francisco, Mike Shane would like to solve all his cases right inside the city limits. However, this is not one of those times. Right now, Mike and his assistant, Phyllis Knight, are a two-hour's drive east of the city by the Golden Gate. Also right now, Mike is on the long-distance phone talking to, you guessed it, Inspector Faraday. No, no, Faraday. Moccasin Hill. It's a little town on the highway east of Stockton. Oh, I remember it now. That's where a rich old man Kilgallen died last month. Right, right. They said his house was haunted and somebody frightened him to death. Yeah, that's what his daughter said. She tried to get us to investigate. Listen, Mike, you're not getting roped into that, are you? <laughs> Inspector, right now I'm sitting in the chair where they found the corpse. Oh, Mike, you're not dizzy enough to think a ghost killed him. It was heart failure. Uh, maybe. I've uh, just been talking to the daughter. It looks like somebody's been trying to give her the business, too, like dropping a flower pot on her head. So you call long distance to tell me that? No, no, Inspector. Look, I want you to find out if a Mr. John Himes of Boston, Mass., was in San Francisco four weeks ago. One of your boys can check the hotels, trains, and airlines. John Himes, Boston. Well, it's a waste of time, but for you, Mike, okay. And look, phone me back at Moccasin Hill, 193. Got it. Oh, Mike. Yeah? Don't look now, but I... I think there's a ghost behind you. What? <laughs> oh, that guy. Mike, the inspector giving you the Bronx cheer, Mike? Yeah, darling. Oh, uh, Miss Kilgallen, one thing more about uh, your cousin, John Himes. Did you two ever quarrel about your father's estate? Why, no, Mr. Shane. There's no reason for you to suspect John. He's the only other heir, but he'd never kill father or try to remove me, I'm sure of it. Besides, Mike, he lives in Boston, 3,000 miles away. But he makes frequent visits to the coast. Miss Kilgallen just finished telling us that. I'm sorry. Well, what do you say we have a look around the house now, huh? I want to know where the ghost hangs out. Well, as I said, Mr. Shane, they found my father here in the living room, in the chair you were just using. Mm -hmm. What's this next room? Father's hobby room. Oh, he kept his photographs and guns and hunting trophies in here. Oh, mm -hmm. jeepers. He had plenty of them. Deer heads, mountain lions, fox. And they're terribly old. Father wasn't strong enough to hunt in his last years. He had to content himself with his guns. Mm-hmm. Well, the collection covers a whole wall. You know, it's funny, but this room seems much more worn and older than the living room. It is. Granddad built the house back in the 1860s. Hmm? The other rooms were added on around it. Wow. Father tried to keep the old part as it was. Mike, look. Hmm? Look, here's a souvenir of early California. Yes. A poster giving the schedules of the Wells Fargo stages. Really? Yes, oh, Moccasin Hill was right on the old stage route. Oh, that long pistol you see above the fireplace, that was used by Black Miguel to hold up the stages. Oh? Hey. Hmm? What in heaven's name is that? <laughs> Sounds like a lost soul, doesn't it? Oh. Scared me the first time I heard it. It's just an owl in the chimney up in the attic. <laughs> atmosphere, Angel. Oh. Atmosphere. Every well-run haunted house has an owl in the attic. Now, Miss Kogala and I was just noticing the odd shape of this room. Half of the ceiling is so much lower than... That's because fa Father tore down the partition. On the other side, it was a secret room. We had several secret rooms, just like a movie set. Last year, Father tore out all the sliding panels and made them into perfectly honest rooms. Well, your granddad must have been a queer old duck. Somehow I can't picture a girl like you living in this curiosity. I don't intend to. Especially not after Father's... Well, anyway, it's too far from college. Uh, Miss Kilgallen, you said you were away at school when your father died, huh? Yes. I'll sell the place as soon as I get a fair bid. I don't know. Maybe Cousin John will take it. He wrote me that he'd like to if I'd sell for $20,000. Twenty. dollars 20... Twenty. Oh, well, that's ridiculous. It's worth much more than that. Which is why I suspect Cousin John. Well, now, come on. Let's go outside again. I want to take another look at that busted flower pot. All right. We can go through the terrace door here. Look. Look, Mike. Who's hmm? the old character in the straw hat? What? Hey, wait a minute. He's sweeping up the flower pot. Hold on. Hold on, partner. Oh, here's the gardener old dick. What's he? You talking to me, young Yes, fellas? sir. Yes, sir. Just leave the pieces of the flower pot right there, huh? We want them for sentimental reasons. Well, Miss Kilgallen always told me to keep things spruce. It's all right this time, Dick. You weren't here yesterday, and you don't understand. By the way, sir, uh, how long have you been gardening here? Oh, three, four months, I reckon. You want a handyman? No, no, I was just wondering. Do you uh, know anything strange about this house? I mean, like being haunted? Of course it's haunted. You don't know who by, but I vomit ain't no place I'd hanker to live. I told Mr. Kilgallen... Did he think it was haunted? Of course he did. 
The hands got him, too. <laughs> they'll get everybody. You just listen to spell. You'll hear footsteps without no feet and moanings and things. That's true um, enough, but they're not from the spiritual world. Ah, uh, let me see. The flower pot fell from this balcony directly overhead. Yes. It, it couldn't have just happened. The pot was too big and heavy to jiggle off the railing. Yeah, but you saw no one push it. I wasn't looking up. It was warm yesterday afternoon, and I was watering the geraniums here. Just as I stooped over, it came down crash. Two seconds earlier, it would have crushed your skull. I think I'll climb these stairs and give the balcony a once-over. Hey, hey, you be careful, Mike. Don't push another pot down on us, huh? You're giving me ideas, my darling. Mike, look out! I tell you, what did I tell you? Mike! Oh, Mike, are you hurt? Oh. Baby, that was Here. a close call. If I hadn't grabbed the railing... Well, Mike, the steps just gave way under you. They're rotten. No. No, Angel. No, sir. They were meant to give way. Look at the underside of this next step. Huh? Mike. Why, that saw it halfway through. Yes. Evidently, the ghost of Moccasin Hill wants company. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane and Phyllis Knight in their adventures. As your car gets older, its bearings wear down. The bushings enlarge and the joints and fittings loosen up and rattle. This means that lubrication becomes increasingly important in relieving friction and protecting worn parts against extra shock and strain. And since even the latest cars are now almost four years old... No one can afford to take a chance on a careless grease job. That is why the Union Oil Minutemen take such pride in stop wear lubrication. Each job of stop wear lubrication is performed so carefully and accurately, it is guaranteed in writing. When your car receives stop wear lubrication, you can be sure that only the finest high quality greases are used throughout. And you can also be sure that each fitting and bearing will be thoroughly lubricated according to the manufacturer's specifications. While your car is on the hoist, the Minutemen will inspect out-of-sight points and check them for danger signs. So, ladies and gentlemen, for smoother, safer driving, ask your Union Oil Minuteman for Stop Wear Guaranteed Lubrication. Stop Wear is an exclusive process available only at Union Oil Minuteman stations. Remember, stop wear lubrication is guaranteed. Mike and Phyllis are still searching through the ancient house on Moccasin Hill, stalking the ghost who throws flower pots and designs collapsing staircases. Right now, they are interrupted by a new arrival. Why, Mr. Patton, won't you come in? Thank you, Miss Kilgallen. I happened to see your car in the driveway, and I thought I'd stop in a moment. I'm glad you did. Oh, I want you to meet some friends. This is Mr. Shane and Miss Knight from San Francisco. Oh, how do you do? Oh, how do you do, sir? Patton? Mr. Patton was my father's attorney. He's handling the estate. Yes, mm -hmm. it's in that regard, Miss Kilgallen, that I'd like to talk to you. Could we uh, go into the living room? Certainly. You too, Mr. Shane and Miss Knight. All oh, right. I thought it might be better if we talked alone. Oh, I have no secrets, Mr. Patton. And I think Mr. Shane may want to ask you some questions about father. Uh, strictly in the line of duty. Duty, Mr. Patton. I've been retained to uh, investigate Mr. Kilgallen's death. Well, my dear girl, you're wasting your money. Your father died of heart disease. Perhaps, but what was it you wished to see me about? Oh, yes, oh, yes. Miss Kilgallen, I've thought it over, and I'm now prepared to offer you $22,500. I think that's a generous sum indeed for this property. I'm sorry, Mr. Patton. You know that father put over twice that much money into the place. And it has the historic value. Uh, may I ask why you want to buy it? Why, that's obvious, sir, to live in. It won't be easy to dispose of with her father's death and certain rumors about the property. I think I'm doing her a kindness. I'll answer it. These uh, rumors, Mr. Patton, did this girl's father tell you anything that would bear them out? Well, Mr. Kilgallen was an ill man, sir. He had a rather morbid turn of mind, of course. It's for you, Mr. Shane, San Francisco. Oh, oh that's Faraday. Excuse me, please. Hello, Inspector. You did. Well, well, a pat on the old back, my boy. Uh-huh. Right now? Okay, hold him there. Or, or better still, bring him out here. Oh, I see. Then I guess he's out of reach by now. No. No, no, nothing much, Inspector, except that you uh, almost lost your best pinochle partner. <laughs> well, the ghost pulled the staircase out from under me. Don't worry, I'm watching out. But uh, thanks for trying, Faraday. 
No hits, no runs, no ball game, huh? Mr. John Himes was registered at the Palace Hotel at or about the time the old man died. He also registered there just two days ago. Mike, you were right. And checked out this morning. Destination unknown. Oh. Even so, I'm sure you're wrong, Mr. Shane. Well, Mr. Mm-hmm. Gilgallan, I take it you're rejecting my offer? I'm afraid I must. Well, very well. It's been a pleasure to meet you, sir. Thank uh, you. And Miss Knight. Thank you. Oh, I almost forgot. I found you a new gardener. His name is uh, Fred Norman. I brought him along with me. He's right outside. But I can't fire poor old Dick. You won't have to for a day or two. Uh, I'll need both men to help me on a little job. Oh, very well. You'll find Fred waiting at the back door. Uh, good day. Good day, sir. Mike, Cindy. Mike, what are you up to? What job? Are we staying here? Not so loud, honey. I haven't any job for him, but I think Mr. Patton has. Oh, you mean this new gardener is a spy, huh? I mean. Well, we'll give him something to prick up his ears about. Okay. Miss Kilgallen... I want a tape measure, the longest you can find, please. What on earth for? Something tells me your ghost haunts a very secret room. We're going to find that room by yard, feet, and inches. I dropped it again. Well, hold on to it, honey. It's a tape measure, not a snake. Oh, quiet. I'm tired, Mike. We've spent over two hours measuring this house, every room, every hall, every closet. We haven't found a thing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, the hall is 50 feet three, uh, 53 feet long. Now, Miss Kilgallen, what did we find in the living room? Let's see. It's on this other paper. It says here 30 feet. 30 feet. And the gun room next to it? 14 feet each way. That totals 44 feet plus one foot for the wall. That's it. Yeah, sir, there's eight feet missing. Fine, fine. How do we get into this secret room? By pickaxe? Come on, come on, into the gun room. But, Mr. Shane, uh, Father knew all our secret rooms. He had them all open. Well, he didn't know about this one, or maybe he just lost count. Okay, now, honey, you take the far end of the wall and I'll start at this end. There's got to be a hidden spring or something. Now, pound every inch of the woodwork. All right. It doesn't sound hollow. Well, that's why nobody suspected it. Come on, use some muscle, honey. You're just playing patty cake. Listen, Mike, Shane, I haven't got calluses on my knuckles. Oh, Mike. Huh? Mike, this panel, it moved. What? This is it, kids. It, it, it only moved an inch or so. I'll pull it open. There. <gasps> there you are. It's dark as a coal bin inside. I'll strike a match. Good. Now we shall see what we shall see. Look. Isn't that an old table and, and a chair? Well, what's more important, a candle. We can get some real light. Yeah, that's better. Uh, ooh, oh, honey. It's dusty in here. Well, sneeze the other way. You almost blew these off the table. Blew what off? These papers here. Newspaper clippings. Oh, they're so old, they're brown. Well, what on earth are they doing in here? I don't know. They're printed in old-fashioned type. Must be 60 or 70 years old. Hold on here. Hold on. Miss Gilgallan, what did you say the name uh, was of that stage robber? You mean Black Miguel? Yeah. Here, read this. Maybe this will mean something to you. Driver Billy Pringle reported to the sheriff that on Wednesday night his stage broke down at Moccasin Hill. Pringle took the express box to the Kilgallen house. Hey, that's your grandfather. I remember hearing some sort of story. Go on, read it. During the night, Black Miguel assaulted the driver. As he attempted to flee with a small fortune, Mr. Pringle shot and killed him. The express box, however, was not recovered. The authorities are not searching. You know, this sounds like something out of Treasure Island. <laughs> you can say that again, honey. Here, here's a diagram with everything on it except dig at the foot of the crooked pine tree. Yeah. Hey, Mike, hmm? that paper's almost new. Well, it would have to be. The handwriting is my father's. Well, then he did know about this room. Yes, and he must have spent plenty of time in here. Candle drippings all over the table. You know, there's something funny about them. You notice how heavy the dust and grit is on the table? Yet when I rub my finger over the wax spots... There's nothing... no dust on them. They're fresh. Yeah. It's Shane. Shh, shh, It's the living room wall. Somebody else wants in. Blow out the candle. We're leaving. I don't see anybody. Wait till I push this panel back. Mike. Mike, you're not going to use your gun. Come on, follow me into the living room quietly. Hands in the air, mister. Huh? What? Well, Fred Norman, the gardener. Get that gun away. You ain't got no call of... We heard you pounding that wall. What if it was? Thought I could knock the ashes out of his pipe, can he? Yeah, but you're a gardener. What are you doing in here? I was looking for Miss Kilgallen. I wanted to know about the rose bushes. 
But I guess I don't want to work here at all. What was that? The hmm? front door. Hey, don't you answer the door in this house? That's Faraday. Inspector Faraday. Well, since when is Moccasin Hill your bailiwick? Oh, I guess I'm just an old maid. Got to worrying about your neck. Not that I wouldn't like to bust it myself sometimes. Well, I'll save it for you just for you, Daddy. Hmm. Here, here. No, all kidding aside, Faraday, there's something going on here which ain't done with mirrors. I'll say not. We found a secret room, papers telling of a stagecoach robbery 70 years ago, a map of where the treasure's buried. Plus and... rapping noises, hot and cold running spooks, anything you want, we got it. Uh-huh, yes. Has your cigarette tasted different lately? No, we mean it, Inspector. Somebody's putting on a spook act to frighten people away from here, even if it means killing people. Somebody wants the old express box, and he's willing to kill people to get it. Yeah, right out of this morning's comic strip. Ghost turns out to be an expert with a peg leg. All right, we'll take our word for it. Come on, we'll show you the secret room. Now watch. I'll press this wall panel here, and... Well, I'll be... See, Inspector? Stoop as you go in, or you'll bump your noggin. Any light switch in here? No, there's a candle on the table. I'll light it. Well, you weren't kidding. No, not this trip. Now, here are the papers I was talking about. Mike. Hey, wait a minute. The papers. Mike, they're gone. All right, come on now. We mean business, Fred. Come on, hand over those papers. We know you got them. I don't know nothing about any papers, and I don't know nothing about any secret room. You're lying. Patton brought you here. He hired you to steal them for him. What's more, you ain't no gardener. Old Dick can tell you that. Don't know a shovel from a hole. I'm leaving right now. I wouldn't work here for no kind of money. You're staying right here. You're not to leave this property, you understand? Maybe I won't, and maybe I will. Well, don't trust that feller. If it's all right with you folks, I'll kind of follow him around. Keep my eye on him. Good idea. But let him do anything he wants. He'll tip his hand yet. But I don't see why you didn't search him for the missing papers. It's useless, honey. He's smart. He's already hidden them somewhere. It seems to be, Mr. Shane. This is all beside the point. I wanted you to find out if my father was murdered. Right, that's impossible for any detective, miss. No one saw him die. He's been dead for days when he was found. Karn only made a rough guess when it happened. I think we can establish the time, Faraday. We were looking at the old gentleman's diary. It's here on the desk. Father was very religious in keeping up his diary. He wrote down everything he did. The final entry was made on the 17th of last month. Here it is. Quote, rained all day. Afternoon spent cleaning and oiling all my guns. Had to fix the pin on the derringer. Ah, uh, that's a pistol, isn't it, Mike? Mm-hmm, it's a short barrel, heavy caliber, darling. Just a minute. The derringer. Oh, what about it? Well, Father always kept it on top of the bookcase. It's gone. Probably forgot to put it back after he fixed it. Yes, but getting back to the diary, these are his last sentences. Heard the noises again. It laughed and moaned. Next time it happens, I'll... And there he stopped. Right in the middle of a sentence. Oh, that front door. You'd think this was a house for me. As I see it, Faraday, the old fellow heard something again. He stopped writing, got up, went into the living room to check up. Whatever he saw or heard stopped his heart. Mm. He was found in the chair by the telephone. I thought you were acting for me. Uh, hey, what goes on? Well, I'm just as surprised as you are. This is John Hines, my cousin. The fellow from Boston. Well, sir, I'm very happy to meet you. My name is uh, Mike Shane. Oh, yes. Mr. Patton says you were investigating, looking me up. I understand you were in California last month about the time Mr. Kilgallen died. Yes, I was. And you're here now. Why? On business. I came up to see Patton about buying this property. I wrote to my cousin and to him as her attorney and made an offer. Now I find Patton is trying to buy the place himself. And, uh, in case you didn't succeed, Mr. Patton, you hired Fred Norman, the fake gardener, to steal those papers from the secret room. I don't know what you're talking about. Mr. Himes, what is your interest in this property? We understand you live in Boston. Well, my firm is transferring me to San Francisco. I'd like to have a country home. Uh, just what is your business? <laughs> I can see you're suspicious. Perhaps you'd rather look at one of my cards. Well, it wouldn't hurt. Here you are. Thank you. Hmm. Investment banking. Uh, Michael... Hmm? Inspector, could yeah. I see you alone a moment? Can't it wait, honey? No, it'll just take a minute. Oh, all right. Excuse us, please. Uh, come on. Let's go into the living room, huh? You look as wise as the Sphinx, Phil. To solve the case? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Now, this is it. I was standing right next to Himes, Mike, when he took out his wallet to give you that card. And? Well, there was an envelope tucked into a pocket of the wallet. Airline tickets. But the name written on the envelope said Gene Powers. Gene Powers? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't add up, honey. The girl introduced him as her cousin. She said John Himes. She said, do we have to believe her? I'm going to phone headquarters. Gene Powers may have a record. No, no. What's that? No. Oh, oh, good up. heavens. It's outside. Come on, quick. The front door's open. Yeah. Mike. 
Spike, look. Spike in the driveway. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, cross off one suspect. Ooh. Attorney at law, Stephen Patton. And add another. I just saw somebody on the balcony. Hmm? Who? Who did you see? Alan Kilgallen. <laughs> We'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. If you ever had a jack slip when you were changing a tire, you get a pretty forceful demonstration of how much a car weighs. Now, all that weight rests directly on the wheel bearings. And as you travel, those wheel bearings must revolve rapidly and still support the heavy weight of the car. Because of this concentrated pressure, and because they're also liable to damage from brake dust, grit, and water, front wheel bearings need the best possible lubrication. Failure to keep these bearings properly lubricated, they result in expensive repairs, requiring parts now hard to get. Your neighborhood Union Oil Minute Man knows this. That's why he takes such pains to do a thorough job of lubricating front wheel bearings. First, he washes out all the old grease and dirt with solvent. Then the bearings and races are individually cleaned until they are dry and shiny. Finally, the clean, polished bearings are replaced in the races. Then, with special equipment, every surface is snugly packed in a thick coating of Union Oil wheel bearing grease. Then your front wheels are all set for months of well-lubricated, easy rolling. The cost for the entire service of your front wheel bearing assembly is nominal. So for safer, easier driving... Just stop in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil's front wheel bearing service. Thank you. A second man has died at the strange old house in Moccasin Hill. While Phyllis telephones for the local police, Mike and Inspector Faraday are in the gun room questioning four uneasy people. Now we know what we're talking about. One of you here in this room killed Steve Patton because he knew too much or because he was double-crossing you. Miss Kilgallen, we'll start with you. What were you doing upstairs in that balcony? Why, I... I heard the shot and I ran out to see what happened. Oh, that's no answer. When we left this room, you and your cousin were with Patton. Now, why did you go upstairs? To get Father's old watch for John. Father left it to him in his will. Does that satisfy you? Maybe. And you, Mr. Hines, where were you when the shot was fired? Why, I was following Ellen upstairs to get the watch. Is there anything wrong with that? No, no, I guess her cousin is entitled to the heirloom. But not a guy named Gene Powers. Well... <laughs> oh, so that's it. <laughs> Sharp eyes, Mr. Shane. The credit goes to Miss Knight. Well, it's quite innocent, really. Gene Powers is a friend of mine, and he had a plane ticket for New York tonight. He couldn't get away, so I'm using his priority. We'll check on that. You, Fred Norman. I was in the kitchen eating. Can't send a man to jail for swiping a chicken wing. You were watching him, Dick? Yes, sir. He wasn't even in the room. Oh, I was watching you through the hall door, okay. just waiting for you to do something. Okay, okay, okay. Now we're going to ask all of you to empty your pockets. Each one put his stuff in the pile on this table. What for? We're asking the questions. Start digging. I know what you're up to. Thing. Looking That's for the gun that killed him. No, the murderer saved us that trouble. <laughs> he put it right back where he got it. The Derringer there in the bookcase. Why, yes, it's back. All right, Mr. Hines, now let's see what you've dished out. Handkerchief, ten knife, bill fold, notebook, small change. And you, Dick? Oh, ain't got much. Old oil rag, a knife, a busted pack of seeds, and four bits. Fred? Handkerchief, knife, pencil, and some money. Yes, yeah, too much money for a gardener. Fifty dollars? Well, that's Patton's money. He bribed him. Obviously. Uh, any pockets in your dress, Miss Kilgallen? No. If you tell us what you want, I'm sure... All that... right, now... After the three of us ran out and found Patton, we did a quick circle around the outside of the house. We tried to come back in through this terrace door. It was locked and the key gone. That's odd. We used the door a little earlier. Yes, so did the murderer a little later. Fired a shot from the terrace, ducked back in, locked the door, and went to another part of the house. I'm sorry to spoil the game, kiddies. What? What's... But is this what you want? Mm-hmm. The key. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I found it by the door. Well, what do you know? It had slipped under the carpet, Mike. All right, folks, you can put your stuff back in your pockets. Oh, too bad, Mike, it almost worked. Ah, but it did work. What? In a way we hadn't counted on. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Mike. You know the killer? Positively, darling. The confession is right on top of that table in the secret room. <laughs> Uh, 
I don't get it, Mike. There's nothing on this table. Just a candle, dust and grit and splotches of wax. That's all, Angel, but it's enough to convict a murderer. Oh, folly, daughter. Nobody ain't ever hanged a ghost. Take more than a smart big city detective. Well, I can't believe the motive. I don't think there's any buried treasure. It's quite possible, but Patton and his killer thought otherwise. They wanted no one on this property while they were hunting. So, the haunted house routine. But how could Mr. Patton be so cold-blooded? Father's friend and attorney deliberately scaring him to death. Well, he probably didn't intend to go that far, Miss Kilgallen. Hey, come on, Mike. Who gave Patton the tit for tat, huh? All right, all right. Now, as you notice from these candle drippings, somebody spent plenty of time at this table going over the papers about uh, Black Miguel in the express box. Father, we found that diagram in his handwriting. And somebody else in just the last day or so. Somebody who emptied his pockets onto this table, perhaps searching for a pencil and notepaper. Mike, there's a limit to crystal gazing. You can't... Can't do... I? Brush your hand over the tabletop. That's it. Now, what have you got in your palm? Dust and grit. All right, now pick out some of that grit and eat it. Go on, go on, it's not dirt. Mm. Seems to me. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure I've tasted this before. Yes, in restaurants, on rolls. It's poppy seed. Oh, oh this is right. the end. And uh, in whose pockets did we find a broken package of poppy seed? Hey, Dix, the gardener. You're all right. Maybe I was in there. I used to play in this house when I was a kid. It was all busted down. I knew every inch of it. That don't spell nothing. Oh, it does. You were very careful not to tell us about this room, not even Mr. Patton. You're right, mister. Patton hired me to watch Dick and you folks. You figured Dick was cheating. That ain't saying I killed him. Nobody can say that. A dead man's diary can, Dick. The day Mr. Kilgallen died, he wrote that he cleaned all his guns, including the old Derringer. You mean there are only two sets of fingerprints on the gun? Yes. Kilgallen's? And the man who fired it. Yes, Dick. That's exactly what I mean. You know something? That was very sweet of you, Faraday, coming clear out to Moxon Hill just to be Mike's bodyguard. Yes, sir. And driving us back home in yeah. a police car should sure beats that bus trip. <laughs> was doggone nice of you, Faraday. I got the sentiment. Maybe I just want to sell a couple of extra tickets to the policeman's ball. Oh, <laughs> we need those. As a policeman, Mr. Inspector, and as a detective, Mr. Shane, hmm? there's one thing you did in this case which I don't understand. Only one? Miss Knight, you are improving. Smarty. <laughs> You and Mike knew you could catch old Dick by his fingerprints on the Derringer. So why'd you bother to look for a missing door key and Mike act so big and brainy about the poppy seeds? Oh, honey, never put all your money on one horse. We were both afraid Dick had already wiped his fingerprints off the gun. But we didn't tell him that. Oh. Time was a-wasting and it was a good shortcut. Uh-huh. Just as I thought. The big city boys had to crack it fast before the local hayseeds took over the case. And uh, your glory. Why, Phyllis, how can you say such a thing? again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis with Joe Forte. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... Oh.
The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Most private detectives, when they're called into a case by a wealthy patron, are ushered into the library or the gun room or the master's private den. Not so private detective Michael Shane and his attractive assistant Phyllis Knight. Oh, no. They find themselves at San Francisco's Cliff House to keep a date with, well, let Phyllis tell it, which she is doing without any of the poetry she knows so well. Now, there's no use arguing, Mike Shane. If she oh. weren't a blonde and good-looking, you'd have turned the case down. For the thousandth time, honey, I tell you, I haven't seen the girl. Oh, really? She isn't blonde, and I don't know whether or not she's good-looking. I'll bet, I'll I bet. I only know, honey, that she's frightened. Mm-hmm. She said she was a brunette, five foot two, and wearing a Kelly green raincoat. Well, then, there she is, hmm? staring out the window. Right, Angel. Well, leave us ankle over. You know, she does look scared. Oh, she saw us. Hey, does she know you? No, but I told her I was bringing you along and there aren't any other couples around. Mr. Shane and Miss Knight? Correct. And you're Miss Jones? Well, no. Well, that is, I used that name over the phone, but my real name is Wright. Not Patricia Wright? Yes. Hmm? Oh, then it was your brother. I mean, I read the article in the papers. Say, what is all this? My brother was killed Monday. The police said it was an accident. He fell over the cliff, they said, but... But you think he was killed <clears throat> deliberately? Yes. Uh, murdered, in fact. Yes. Why? Well, I just know he was pushed over that cliff. And now, whom do you suspect? Oh, I don't know. My father's manager, Mr. Haberman, for one, and, mm-hmm. and a Mr. Armstrong, a businessman dealing with my father, and... And... And your father? Well, yes. Well, not that I think my father killed my brother, no, but... Well, I am suspicious of some of my father's business dealings and very suspicious of some of his associates. Uh, Miss Wright, your brother was in the business with your father? Yes, and, well, he didn't approve of some of their deals. Did he complain to you or to your father, or both? Both. Oh, they've had bitter quarrels over some of their transactions. And how about you, Miss Wright? Are you afraid for your own life? Yes, terribly oh. afraid. Okay. Okay, that settles it so far as I'm concerned. We'll take the case. Now, uh, how about going out to your place and looking over the ground? Hmm? But we can't. That's why I use the assumed name, and that's why I met you here instead of at the house. Listen, Patricia, your best safeguard is to let the murderer know that you have a detective on the job. The very fact that you've engaged me will make them wonder how much you know. We'll watch out for you, Miss Wright. Nothing's going to happen to you while Mike's on the job. Well, all right, I'll do it. Fine. Good. Now get in your car, then, and we'll follow you out, and even if he turns out to be your father, we'll get the killer. <laughs> It's over here, just by that white post. That's where he he fell. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, boy. Did they, uh... Did they take your brother's body away from the bottom of the cliff or, uh, bring it up here on ropes? They took it away from the bottom, in a boat. I see. Was there much of a crowd here at the top? No. Why? Well, there are a lot of footprints here. The ground is pretty well tramped down. But there weren't any people here at all. This is private property. The murderer tramped the ground to confuse... Hey, wait a minute. What? What is it, Mike? Honey, you see those marks? Yeah. Those marks were made by a dead man's heels as his body was dragged to the edge of the cliff and thrown over. And the killer hid behind the tree. Yes, and probably hit his victim with a rock. Yeah. Uh, Patricia, did your brother have a date with anyone the night he was killed? Yes, with Mr. Haberman, Daddy's partner. Mr. Haberman came out to the house at 8 o'clock and mm-hmm. said that he'd made an appointment to meet my brother. But about 10 o'clock, he decided to go home. Just as he was leaving, the chauffeur came to the door and said that they'd found the body down on the rocks below the cliff. Was the chauffeur looking for your brother? No, he didn't know anything was wrong then. The chauffeur was out fishing and was just coming into the little cove when he saw a hat on the water. He turned the boat along the rocks and found my brother's body. The chauffeur is up at the house now? No, he left. He left? He left? What do you mean? Well, he's been doing a lot of drinking, and my brother fired him about a week ago. Oh, fine. We seem to be turning up suspects wherever we move. Yeah, right, Angel. Well, Miss Patricia, will you get your father's manager and Mr. Armstrong up to the house right away? Use any excuse at all. I'll get Inspector Faraday to find the chauffeur, and we'll have a little quiz contest with Mike Shane as quiz master. <laughs> Hi, 
I don't know what on earth you could be thinking of, Patricia, to do such a thing. But, Daddy... Not another word. You tell this Shane fellow to get about his business. When any private detectives are hired to come to this house, I'll do the hiring. Daddy, I'm more convinced than ever that my brother was murdered. Murdered? Stuff and nonsense. My dear, you're upset. I don't blame you for that. You were very fond of your brother. But thinking for one moment that any of my business associates could be guilty of such a thing... The idea of dragging Mr. Haberman and Mr. Armstrong out here to be cross-questioned by a, a private detective. Why, it isn't as if there was any suspicion about your brother's death. The police were satisfied it was an accident. I'm not satisfied, however, Mr. Wright. Who are you, sir? Michael Shane, private detective, and this is my assistant, Miss Knight. Hello, I'm very happy to meet you, Mr. Wright. I'm sorry I can't say the same. Hmm? I hate to appear impolite, but I must ask you to leave my house immediately. Well, let's go, Mike. We don't have to take this sort of thing from anybody. Uh, just a minute, Angel. Oh, really? Mr. Wright, I suppose you realize that by your attitude, you're casting a lot of unnecessary suspicion on yourself. Why, you impudent young whelp. If I were a younger man, I'd thrash you within an inch of your life, you... you... Will you leave quietly, or will I have to have you thrown out? Evidently, there's company at the door, and I'd much prefer not to have to introduce you. Pardon me, sir, but to Mr. Faraday. Faraday? Detective Inspector Faraday, sir. With the chauffeur, sir. Hello, mm. Mike. Fellas. Hello, Inspector. Mr. Wright here was just about to order us thrown out. Huh. He won't have a private detective around the place. I see. Well, maybe he'll let you stay as my assistant. What on earth are you talking about? I'm talking about the fact that we're here to investigate the death of your son. I'd just as soon get on with the questioning if you haven't any objections. Will you have everybody come in here? Uh, Inspector, they're all out in the front hall. I Maybe don't know what this is all about. I'm only the chauffeur. I haven't done anything. I'll sue you for arresting me. That's, That's what right. Do. Be sure and do that. All right, into the front hall. Well, which one of you is Haberman? I'm Mr. Haberman. Why? And Armstrong, that's you, I suppose. Mm-hmm, correct. Now, I don't know much about this except what Mike told me over the phone, but I understand that you, Mr. Haberman... Had an appointment with Mr. Wright, Jr., the deceased, the evening he was killed. Yes, that is true. Uh, what was that meeting about? Well, I don't see that it's any of your business. You mm -hmm. can answer that question here and now or at headquarters later. Take your choice. Well, uh, it was a business matter. Don't answer him. But, right, if I don't, he'll take me in and... And oh. he'll have to answer in the long run. It was uh, business, and young Mr. Wright was going to tell you that he wouldn't play along with the kind of deal you and his father were cooking up, correct? Well, that's putting it rather strongly. Hmm. He was a young fellow with too many idealistic ideas for the business world. I was quite certain I could straighten him out when we sat down and talked it over. And when he wouldn't listen, you threatened his life? Of course not. You didn't see him that night at all? No, I didn't. And you weren't anywhere near the top of the cliff between 8 and 10.30? I most certainly was not. Can you prove that? I can. I sat and talked with Mr. Haberman all evening. And Mr. Armstrong, I suppose you have an alibi, too? Well, I don't know. I think I was at a picture show that night, but I wasn't keeping track of my movements. Uh, I wasn't anywhere near this house, though. Mm-hmm. Oh, Inspector. Yes, Mike. Come in. I think we ought to do some checking on the murdered man's papers. We might find something that would give us a lead. You're probably right, Mike. Okay. You can all go now. But don't leave the place. We may want to do a few more answers before we leave. Uh, Miss Patricia. Yes, Inspector. Will you take us to your brother's room? We'll see what that leads us to. Find anything, honey? Uh-uh. Nothing important, Mike. How about you, Inspector? Nothing. I hope we're not on a wild goose chase. Oh, I know we're not. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here's something. What, what is it, Mike? Find, Mike? It's a memo pad. And here's an entry. It says, must talk to father about Haberman's inability to do things honestly. If he can be so dishonest with the people we are doing business with, there will come a day when he will be as dishonest with us. Mm. Hey, hey, look at that later entry, Mike. The one made the day he was killed. Here. Oh, yes. We'll have showdown with Haberman tonight. Either he goes or I get out of the business. I've called him and made appointment for 7 o'clock. Wait a minute. 7 o'clock? Haberman said he made the appointment for 8 o'clock. Yeah, that's he right. Did. Come on. Come on, we'd better hurry up looking through this stuff and then a little more questioning Shane, for Mr. Shane, Haberman. What's the matter? What's the matter? Quick, What's the matter? What's the matter? Mr. Shane, Inspector, yeah. it's it's unbelievable. It's horrible. What is it? What is it? Haberman. I I went to the stables a few minutes ago. Go on, go on. Haberman was lying there, dead. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane and his assistant Phyllis in their adventures. All of us know that some restaurants always seem to serve better food than others, even though their menus may read the same. 
The reason, of course, is simple. Better ingredients plus extra attention on the part of skilled help. The same principles apply to car lubrication. For example, Union Oil Stopwear Lubrication is more than just a grease job. Stopwear Lubrication is a highly specialized servicing process. Only trained attendants using the latest and most modern equipment are allowed to service your car. Each fitting and bearing is thoroughly lubricated with the finest, high-quality greases in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications. While your car is on the hoist, the Minutemen inspect out-of-sight points and check them for danger signs. As final evidence of the care and exactness with which stopwear lubrication is performed, you receive a thousand-mile written guarantee with each job. Definite proof of reliable service. So, ladies and gentlemen, since careful, thorough lubrication is so vital to the life of your car, why not buy stopwear? Stopwear guaranteed lubrication is available only at Union Oil Minuteman stations, and it costs no more than ordinary lubrication. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. It is a few minutes later. Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday have reached the stables and stand looking down at Haberman's body. Now, how did it happen? Well, he just got too close to Prince, and Prince lashed out and kicked him. I found him lying here when I came by. Was anybody else around the stables? Yes, uh, Armstrong was here, and the groom and the gardener. Isn't it a bit odd that everyone should gather at the stables? No, I don't think so. Everybody's interested in the horses, especially Prince. Why Prince? Well, I've warned them all to keep away from him. He's a killer. Why have you kept him, then? Because I can handle him. So can the stable hands, and he's a very valuable horse. He just lashes out at strangers or people who don't talk to him as they approach him. Hmm. Surely you don't think this is murder, too? Hmm? Why, it's ridiculous. Nobody in their right mind can have any doubt as to how Haberman was killed. The mark of the horseshoe is as plain, too plain. Well, you can see the curve of the shoe across his forehead. Perhaps I'm not in my right mind, Mr. Wright, but when two men engaged in the same business die within a few days of each other, I'm suspicious. You and me both, Mike. Mr. Wright... You just walked out from the house and found Haberman lying dead. Well, uh, more or less. I came out from the back of the house. Hmm? Saw that the upper half of the door to Prince's stall was unlatched. I came over to latch it and found Haberman. I couldn't see him lying on the ground from where I was because, as you can see, he was hidden by the water trough. Yes. Yes, I see. So, Inspector, depending on how you look at it, everybody has alibis or nobody has an alibi. You're right, Mike. They all have alibis if they're telling the truth. Well, I most certainly have. I was talking on the telephone from the time I left you until I came out here. The servant saw me in the hall when I was on the phone. Oh, yes, and the chauffeur and the stable boy, Joe, saw me at the back of the stables. I didn't even come around front until Wright called out. That's true. I'm his alibi and he's mine. <laughs> so I'm afraid, Mr. Shane, you'll have to pin the guilt on the horse after all. Yeah, it looks that way, doesn't it? Oh, Mike. Yes, Inspector? How about running down to headquarters with me? Okay, but you're going to leave someone here. Well, I hardly think we need... Inspector. Inspector, for 24 hours, I'd like someone posted at the stables and at the west side of the house looking out toward the cliff. Yeah, but Mike... If only to guarantee the safety of Miss Wright. Okay, Mike. I'll leave the sergeant and one man. Will that satisfy you? Excellent, Inspector. Excellent. And now I'm quite ready to accompany you to headquarters. <laughs> Inspector, report on a threatening telegram. A threatening wire addressed to Haberman was handed in at San Francisco's main office. No one remembers what the man looked like. They paid no attention. Okay. Follow through on the chauffeur, will you? Yes, sir. Well, it's not much help. Oh, why don't you give up, Mike? After all, we're just following nothing but a hunch from that girl, Patricia. Well, that's right, Mike. I admit it's a bit gruesome having two deaths in the same household, but it's happened before. Oh, there's something wrong about the whole thing. What do you mean, Mike? Well, as I see it, the father, Mr. Wright, isn't above entering into shady deals. No, that seems apparent. So one can legitimately assume that his manager, Haberman, wasn't uh, averse to entering into the same sort of deal. We don't have to assume that. We know it from the son's memo pad. Yeah, hmm? that's right. The son actually accused him of being crooked. And we have Armstrong, a business associate. We can assume in his case, too, that he's not above turning a sort of twisted penny. To all of which the son is opposed. 
to such an extent that he actually puts in writing that he's going to talk to his father and that either the crooked manager goes or he does. Right. And if we assume, too, that the father would rather have his son in the business than the crooked manager, we have motive for murder. For some men, at least. And we have Haberman making a date to see the son. Which Haberman says was for 8 o'clock, but which we know for a fact was at 7 o'clock. You're building quite a case, Mike, but it all hinges on supposition. Suppose, Mike, that you're right. Yeah? And if you are right, and Haberman did kill the son, justice already overtaken him. Yeah, but there's something wrong with the whole thing, Inspector. You say I'm building the whole case uh, uh, of a supposition. Well, plus a hunch of the girls, Mike. And a funny little quirk that keeps running through my own mind. What? Well, when I was a kid, I used to hold horses at the old Fairfax Hunt Club. Yes? Sometimes for a whole day's work, I made two bits. One day, well, I hadn't made my two bits. I guess I was a little on the anxious side. I stepped up too quickly to a horse. He lashed out at me, and I, I jumped back. But that hoof, with its iron shoe, seemed to be following me. It was a huge, as huge as a, as a barn door. A great big black iron shoe that would mash my face in from chin to forehead. A great big letter U coming at... Go on, go on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, a big U. That's it, that's what's wrong with the picture. Oh, what a blockhead I've been. Say, what goes? What is it, Mike? Oh, come on, can't you picture Haberman lying there on the ground by the stable? Well, sure I can, Don't but... you remember what Wright said? The mark of the horseshoe is as plain, too plain... You can see the curve of the shoe across his forehead. I remember him saying that, but what on... Mike, you're right. Well, I don't get it. Huh? I uh... Yes, I do. Haberman would have had to be standing on his head for the horseshoe to have left a mark like that. Had a girl, honey. The mark was upside down. Come on, come on. Back to the right stables as fast as that squad car of yours will take us, Faraday. <laughs> Go right back to the stables, Inspector. We can park there. Right, Mike. I'm going to follow my hunch as long as I'm in the mood. What do you mean, hunch? If I were a killer and had killed a man at the stables... Yes? ...and I was so certain that everybody would think it was an accident... ...and so nobody would even think of looking for a weapon... Yeah, yeah. ...where would I go to hide the weapon? The, the hayloft. Hay right. So, come on, up these steps. Here, honey. I'll help you there. Well, I'm not very good at this. Way. I know that, but come on. There we are. Now you take the far end, honey. And I'll right. climb up onto the rat. Okay, and I'll take the scent. Oh. It's not behind the speed box. It's not here either. Where's it? Where's Phyllis? Here. Here, under this load of hay. Okay. Anything up there, Inspector? No, everything up here is covered with dust, so I think this is all in the clear. Okay, come down then before you break your neck. Ooh. What? What is it, honey? Oh, it's something heavy. And wet. Huh? And sort of sticky. It, it's blood, Mike. Let me have it. I'll use my handkerchief. There may be fingerprints. What is it? Just a second. Oh, ye gods. Look, Inspector. A heavy piece of timber. Oh, but with a horseshoe nailed to the flat side. Upside down. Okay. Okay, let's keep our find a secret and continue our quizzing. We'll rejoin Mike Shane, Phyllis Knight, and Inspector Faraday in their search for the killer in just a moment. We'd like you to listen for a moment to one of the most sickening sounds of modern life. Lately, you've been hearing that sound more frequently. Traffic accidents in the United States are increasing to an alarming extent as our automobiles grow older. To reduce human casualties and conserve transportation, the International Association of Chiefs of Police has developed a program to emphasize the need for good brakes for all cars. For the next six weeks, law enforcement officers throughout the nation will conduct a brake-checking campaign. They are seeking to protect your life and property. This program on brake emphasis for traffic safety is supported by over 100 automobile clubs and traffic organizations, including the Office of Defense Transportation. 
Your cooperation is earnestly requested. You can help by checking your own brakes. If you can depress your brake pedal within an inch of the floorboard before the brakes take hold, they are inadequate and demand immediate attention. Remember, serious accidents can occur at speeds as low as 20 miles per hour if your brakes are in poor condition. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you have the slightest doubt about the condition of your automobile brakes, don't take chances. Have them inspected without delay. Mike, Phyllis, Inspector Faraday, and Patricia Wright are in the library waiting for the members of the household to put in an appearance. Are you sure you don't want me to get Daddy and the others in here? No, no, not yet. We let them wander in one at a time and take them by surprise. I I have a reason. Hey, what about the chauffeur, Mike? For my money, he's out. Mm. Why, Mike? Well, as a suspect for the killing of the son who fired him, he was a possibility, but I see no connection between him and Haberman's death. No, perhaps not. But don't forget one thing. He's the alibi for Armstrong, just as Armstrong is his alibi. The way I'm thinking right now, honey, no one has an alibi. What do you mean? When all the suspects have alibis for their actions, and yet you have two bodies to account for, there's only one act. One and that is? Someone or all of them are lying. And the alibis mean nothing, so just ignore them. Mike, somebody's coming. Hmm? That's right. Oh, there you are, Pat. What? Oh, I, I thought you'd all gone back to the city. We did, sir, but we have a few more questions we'd like answered. <laughs> if you don't mind my saying so, I... I think you're not quite bright. Hmm? Meaning what, Mr. Wright? Meaning that you're all following a completely senseless theory, trying to find clues to a murder when no murder has been committed. To everyone but you, it's obvious that Mr. Haberman had been kicked by Prince. Suppose we just skip that for a moment, huh? Uh, Mr. Wright, just exactly what is the relationship between your firm and Mr. Armstrong? I don't see that it's any of your business. Oh, now let's not go through that routine again. If you'd let me finish, I still think it's none of your business, but I'm perfectly willing to tell you. Mr. Armstrong is an agent for some eastern industrial properties which we're considering purchasing. I see. And was Mr. Haberman in complete agreement with you about this purchase? He was up until a few nights ago. Uh, what or who changed his mind? Well, uh, my son wasn't too happy about the deal, and I think he changed Haberman's mind. When did your son tell you that you either fired Haberman or he would leave the company? What? Why? No, you... no, no, no. Don't I... get all ins- insulted and abusive. We know your son did tell you that. Patricia, if you... Your did... daughter had nothing to do with our knowing that, Mr. Wright. Ah, uh, let's not argue about it. It is true, isn't it? Yes. And what did you decide? Well, go on. Answer. Well, I... I hadn't made up my mind. I... I sort of hoped that things would work themselves out. And they have, sir. First, by the death of your son, and next, Haberman. Both troublesome elements removed within a... Surely you don't... You can't think that I'd connive in the death of my own son. Patricia, you... Yes, Father. You don't believe that I had anything to do with... No, Dad. And I don't either. Nor do Miss Knight and Inspector Faraday. Well, I... I'm glad of that, I... I'm glad, too, that you're coming to your senses and realizing that my boy's death was an accident. No, Mr. Wright, your son's death was not an accident, any more than Haberman's was. Well, who could you possibly suspect? Who stands to gain by both deaths? Why, no one. What about Armstrong? Armstrong? But Armstrong... You mean that Armstrong was afraid that my son's objection to our deal and later Haberman's objection might cause the deal to fall through? Exactly, Mr. Wright, and it's very easy to prove, that is. It Mm. will be easy. If you will cooperate. Oh, oh, certainly. I'll cooperate in any way I can. But... <laughs> you haven't been very cooperative so far, Mr. Wright. I... Yes, well, I'll, I'll do whatever you ask me to. Now we're getting somewhere. Now here's what we'll do. Phyllis, the inspector, and I will hide. Phyllis behind the curtains leading to the terrace. The inspector in that closet. Got it. And I'll get behind the door. Yes. Patricia will go to her own room. You, you, Mr. Wright, will call Armstrong in and tell him you're not going through with the deal. Mm. I'm quite certain his reaction will be enough to convince you. Well, I, I don't think I'll find that difficult. I, I practically made up my mind to that anyway. All this I think is Armstrong to... is coming in the front door hall. Oh, oh, no. All right, all right, now, quick, everybody, quick, get set. You run upstairs, Patricia, go on. Okay, right, call him in. Uh, oh, uh, <clears throat> that you, Armstrong? Yes. Did you want me? Uh, yes, yes. I I think in spite of all the tragedy around here that we ought to arrive at some definite conclusion about this transaction. Well, I suppose you're right. I didn't want to hurry you or seem aggressive with all the things that have happened. Yes, yes, I understand. But it is an excellent opportunity. And I know you'll make a mint out of it. I'm not going through with it, however. I... What? I'm not going through with it, Armstrong. Oh, you're not, huh? 
Well, that's what you think. What was that you said? I said that if you think you've got to back out now, you've got another thing coming. Oh, wait a minute. You're not leaving me holding the sack. I've obligated myself for those properties, and you're going to buy them. I'm most certainly not going to buy them if I don't want to. And maybe this will persuade you. Put that gun down, you fool. Drop it, Armstrong. The next time, be faster. What is this? Is this a trap? In a way, it is, yes, and apparently quite a justifiable one. I must apologize for the gunplay, and I must apologize for being quite slow and somewhat blind. Blind, Mike? Yes. Yes, I should have noticed long before this that Mr. Armstrong was left-handed. I didn't, however, until he whipped out that gun of his with his left hand. Left-handed? Yes, I... Phil, left-handed. What? What does that matter? I... I've been left-handed all my life. Yes, Armstrong, left-handed. I think you can produce the evidence now, Inspector. Right, Mike. Did you ever see that weapon before, Armstrong? Where did you find it? In the hayloft. That's where you hit it, isn't it, Armstrong? Okay, Inspector, I don't think we'll get any more argument out of him. You ready, Armstrong? Uh, yes. You want some more coffee, Inspector? No, thanks, Phyllis. Mmm, that was an excellent dinner. Oh, <laughs> Say that again. Angel's a good cook. Flatterer. As well as being good at uh, poetry reviews. Oh. <laughs> Say that left-handed business. I've been turning it over and over in my mind. I don't see what on earth Armstrong's being left-handed had to do with the case at all. Hmm? Well, I thought perhaps his being left-handed was, well, responsible for him nailing the horseshoe on the club the wrong way. Oh, no, Angel. No. That was just the inevitable slip that a murderer makes. Well, then what was the left-handed clue? When I remarked on Armstrong's being left-handed, you repeated it after me, remember? Yeah, sure. I... I caught the look in Mike's eye and repeated it after you. Well, yes, I remember that, too. It impressed me, but I didn't catch on. Ah, then it impressed Armstrong, too, and he didn't catch on. He didn't know why or what we had in mind, and the inspector and I didn't give him time to find out. We played cat and mouse with him. Armstrong thought that his being left-handed was a clue. He couldn't figure out what it was. But our tone of voice convinced him that we had him dead to rights. And, well, he broke down. Smarty. Hmm? <laughs> it was nothing but playing up a guilty conscience. <laughs> right, Angel. One of the best weapons a private detective has. So let it be a lesson to you there, darling. And don't try holding out anything on your old man, Mike Shane. Or your good old conscience will get you. See? <laughs> again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, and Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written and produced by David Taylor and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... 
The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. When Mike Shane isn't burning the midnight oil over some unsolved crime, he's generally doing the next most interesting thing, talking about one. Right now, he's leaning back in his easy chair, doing a powerful lot of talking to his old friend, Inspector Faraday. It's a stag session for Mike's assistant, Phyllis Knight, has gone home early this evening. Of course, Faraday, I don't know much about the case except what I've read in the papers, but it seems to me that you're going after the wrong guy. Mike, this Joe has got a prison record as long as a kangaroo's tail. Why should he sidestep a little thing like murder? Just because he has got a prison record as long as a kangaroo's tail. Look... I remember a case back in New York that's almost a carbon copy of this. I, I've got some newspaper clippings on it in the files here. I'll read them to you in just a second. You don't get the point, Mike. This killing is gruesome, horrible. It would take a hardened criminal to carry it through. Doggone it, they're here in the files somewhere. Now, Phil could turn right to it. Yeah, she went home kind of early this evening, didn't she? Yeah, she's got a girlfriend staying up at the apartment with her. <laughs> went home to help her pack up. Friend from out of town? Uh-huh. Girl had a fight with her fiancé and wants to play hermit for a few days. I know. The old feminine trick. Goodbye forever. Till next Saturday night. Right. I'll get it, Mike. Hello? Mike. Oh, thank heavens you're still there. This is Faraday, Phyllis. Mike's ransacking his files. I'll get him for wait you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You better hear this too, Inspector. Maybe it's your business. What's wrong, girl? You sound scared blue. I am. I know something's happened. I don't dare look. All right, but what is it, Phil? Yeah, wait, wait a minute. Let me talk to her. Here. She sounds like she's going to cry. Hello, Angel. Oh, Mike. Mike, get over here quick. Now, wait a minute. Calm down, honey. Now, tell me what's wrong. Well, you, you know Lois was leaving my apartment tonight, and I came home to help her pack. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, Mike, she's not here. At hmm? least I don't think so. Now, please, Angel, wait a minute. I can't tell what you're talking about. Well, I found her trunk already packed and locked. And, yeah? And I think... Yep. I yep. Th- what? What, honey? What? I think her body's inside. Well, at last, I thought you'd never get here. Honey, we came as fast as we could. Yeah. Where's the trunk? In the bedroom. Hmm. All right, now tell me what happened. Well, I found the hall door off the lock, so I expected she'd be right back. I kept waiting, and then I started to worry. She had that row with Nelson. He threatened her. (laughs) You see what I mean, Faraday? A woman's intuition. (laughs) Well, the the baggage man came. He started to take the trunk, but then... Then I heard it. Heard what? Something slumped inside. And the trunk seemed so heavy, I... I told the man to leave it. We weren't going to send it after all. Oh, great. I looked at it real close, and and when I saw the padlock... Oh, that's when I phoned you, Mike. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I see it. It's mere blood on the lock. But that's not unusual, honey. Maybe she cut her hand when she closed the trunk. Oh, for heaven's sakes, I'm no child. Look here in this closet. There. There are all Lois's dresses, still on the hangers. They weren't packed in the trunk. It just means that she hasn't finished packing. I thought of that, too, Mike. I started to push the trunk back against the wall, but it wouldn't budge. There's something inside of it, and it isn't clothing. Well, let's see. Loaded with something. There. There, you hear that? Something slumped inside. Just as you tip the trunk, Faraday. Okay, I guess the only way we can satisfy you is to open it, if we can find the key. Oh, here, I've got it. It's, it's here in her purse. That's another thing that scared me, Mike. Lois's handbag. Just laying here on the dressing table. Let's have it, Phil. Honey. Wasn't that the hall door? Of course. There's your girl now. Oh. Oh, it's about time that she. No. No, it's Nelson. Hmm? Let's see. Yeah. You looking for somebody, partner? Huh? Oh, uh, I, I didn't think there was anybody you here. You always walk right in when there's nobody home? Well, I meant, uh, I, I thought Lois was here alone. I'll, I'll come back again. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, we'd like you to stay. She uh, she may be in any minute. Well, I, I really... Uh, come in a minute. Come on in. We'd like to talk to you ourselves. Come on, come on, come on. I, I, I don't understand. You're friends of Lois? Yes. This is Mike Shane and Inspector Faraday. I don't understand. You don't have to. Okay, Phil, let's have that key. Here. Thanks. Hey, here, what are you doing? That's Lois's trunk. You haven't any right to Maybe not, uh, but we like to open surprise packages. 
Oh, oh, I hope I'm wrong. I hope it's a mistake. All right, Mike. Let's swing her open. Honey. Yeah? What? What's inside? No, no, don't look. I'm afraid you were right. Coroner's on his way. Oh, it, it doesn't seem real. Just a few hours ago, I was talking to her, and now... I know, honey, I know. It's hard to take. You, young fellow, what's your name? Huh? Uh, Nelson Carter. Supposed to be the girl's fiancé, huh? You don't seem to be particularly upset. Uh, I'm stunned. What, uh, what brought you here? I came to see Lois. I, I was here this afternoon and we had another fight. I came back to apologize. That's something new. First time you ever apologized for anything. You drove the poor girl half crazy. Well, it was her fault. She wouldn't listen to me. I was right from the very start. Oh, Sure. So right you never let her have a thought of her own. You hounded her with your rightness. That's why she moved in with me, to get away from you and your pestering phone calls and your fights. That's a lie. You came between us. Lois told me this afternoon you said she should forget me. I told her so at breakfast. But she couldn't. She was still in love with you. Huh? She was going back to her apartment tomorrow morning. There's something I don't get. If Lois was using Phil's apartment as a sort of hideout, how did this fellow know she was here? That's my business. It's also ours, son. What time did you come here this afternoon? Why, about 4.30. Hmm. The girl's been dead three or four hours. Say, look here. If you're trying to pin this on me, you're crazy. Maybe. Lois told me about your insane temper. You threatened to kill her. I did not. Oh, you're a pack of fools. But I think I do know who did it. Yeah? Who? Wait a minute. Hmm? Who can that be? Oh, it's too soon for the coroner. I'll answer it. Good evening. Good evening. Well, sorry to bother you at this hour, but we had some trouble about a pickup at this address. Oh, what kind of a pickup? Why, a, a trunk. I'm the traffic investigator for the transfer company. We gave one of our drivers a pickup order at this apartment, but he didn't bring it in. In fact, he's disappeared. Oh, wait a minute. I can explain part of it. I told your driver I'd changed my mind. I didn't want the trunk sent. Oh, oh, I see. You... Oh, you were Miss Phyllis Knight. That's right. Haven't I, uh... Haven't I met you somewhere before? Your voice sounds familiar. In order, Mr. Shane. You used to hear it every day. Hmm? Going up, sir? Floors, please? An elevator operator. In the Rust Building. Well, I'm... I'm sorry I disturbed you, but we're just trying to locate our driver. Good night. Yeah. Mm, uh, good night. That's funny. Why should a baggage company driver disappear? Right after he came for this trunk... I wonder... All right, kids, let's get back to business. Now, Mr. Carter, you start to say you knew the killer. Yeah, Lois's old boss, Joseph Spiegel. He's uh, head of the Spiegel Chemical Laboratories. She told me this afternoon he was coming to see her. Yeah, but he doesn't know she was here. Lois quit her job with him last week. As soon he did know. Why should our next boss want to kill the girl? Because he's a crook. I used to work in Spiegel's <laughs> laboratory, and I discovered he was stealing formulas from other companies. So I quit. Yeah, but not Lois. Oh, no. Now, she was his private secretary, and her boss was just a soul of honor. That's what started our fighting. Yes, but when she learned you were right, she did quit. Three days ago. All right. But it sounds like a pretty flimsy reason to kill a girl. Not if Lois had the goods on him. He wanted to stop her tongue. You weren't fighting about that this afternoon? No. No, she told me she was going to go to work for another chemical company. I told her when I married, I didn't want my wife working. Well, we both got pretty mad. She said she'd never marry me. I can imagine how you took that with your conceit. I, how about it, Mike? I don't know. I'm a little worried, Faraday. This is Phil's apartment. She's been living here alone up till the past few days. Yeah? Lois and Phyllis are about the same height, same color hair. Yeah. Maybe... Maybe somebody thought he was killing Phyllis. Huh? Who'd want to? I haven't an enemy in the world. Oh, you've got hundreds, angels, as many as I've got. Oh. Mike Shane and Phyllis Knight have sent plenty of lugs up the river. Yeah, but Lois and I don't really look alike, Mike. A, a killer would be awfully certain before he did it. Why should he, honey? Yours is the only name on the mailbox. If some crook hired a gunman to come to this address and knock off the girl living in apartment 616... Listen, Mike, that stuff doesn't happen in San Francisco. Those are the old Al Capone days. 
Well, maybe I'm a nervous Nelly. I just don't want Phil running any danger. Mike. Yes? Come here a minute. Look here. Hmm? Here. This ashtray. Uh Well, I see what you mean. Mr. Carter, do you Uh, smoke? What? Uh, yes, a pipe. Oh. There's a cigar butt in this ashtray. Spiegel. He smokes them all the time. I told you he was coming here. Maybe we should check that right now. You know where he lives? Yeah, he's got an apartment at his plant. It's next to the laboratory. That's on uh, Bay Street. Okay, suppose Phil and I mosey over there right now and swap formulas with Dr. Speaker. Good, and if the coroner gets through here in time, I'll join you. Oh, Mr. Shane. Hmm? Have you got a gun? You think I'll need it? You might. Spiegel's a huge man with a cunning, fiendish mind. (laughs) Well, thanks for the warning. I'll be ready with a few shenanigans of my own. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Quality of workmanship and materials has always been the hallmark of successful business. That is why Union Oil Company has copyrighted the name Stopware. You see, Stopware lubrication is more than just a grease job. It is a system that has been worked out from years of experience to give your automobile the best possible care. With stopwear lubrication, you can be sure that nothing on your automobile has been overlooked or hurriedly serviced. Each fitting is carefully and thoroughly lubricated according to the manufacturer's specifications. Only the finest, high-quality greases are used. And while your car is on the hoist, the Minutemen inspect out-of-sight points and check them for danger signs. As a proof of stopwear's superior lubrication, you receive a written guarantee with each job. Stopwear lubrication jobs are a matter of pride with Union Oil Minutemen. And you'll know why when you take the wheel after a stopwear servicing. You'll find your car rolls smoother, handles easier, stands up better with regular stopwear lubrication. So, ladies and gentlemen, with correct car servicing so important these days, why take a chance on inferior work? Stopwear, the best attention you can buy, costs no more than ordinary lubrication. Remember, Stopware is an exclusive, guaranteed process. Available only at Union Oil Minuteman stations. It is a dark and foggy street in San Francisco's commercial district. Light streams out into the night through an open door. The entrance to the Spiegel Chemical Laboratories. In the doorway is the huge silhouette of a man. Shane? Michael Shane? Yes, sir. I do not know you, sir. I'm aware of that, Dr. Spiegel, but Miss Knight and I would like to talk to you. It's very important. Impossible. Tonight I'm working in my laboratory. It's about Lois Lavers, Doctor. Lois? Oh. Come in. Close the door, please. We will talk in the laboratory. I must get back to my experiment. This way, please. Thank you. Jeepers, he is a giant, Mike. Mm Mm-hmm. And those thick glasses make him look like a movie horror man. You, sir. Mr. Shane, you are a detective. How did you know that? Well, I rather expected Lois might talk to someone. She's a very neurotic girl. She imagines things. I'm afraid she's past that, Dr. Spiegel. She's dead. Dead. Murdered. It's a pity. She had a fine brain. But, uh, too much imagination? My laboratory... I caution you both not to handle the tubes or retorts. They are very fragile. Oh. Golly, it's a, it's an elaborate place. What are you experimenting on? That, madam, is my business. Doctor, I believe you knew Nelson Carter, Lois' fiancé. Hmm, he used to work here. Capable, but a wild temper. And very jealous. Of you, perhaps? Yes. I used to take Lois to dinner so I could continue my work without interruption. Nelson misunderstood. Yes. I should not be surprised if he killed her. Perhaps. Uh, you saw Lois this afternoon, Doctor. About what time? A very good detective. <laughs> About five o'clock, I would say. How did you know she was staying in my apartment? One moment. There is trouble with this retort. Better. Better. How did I know? It is very simple. Lois telephoned me. Her last paycheck was incorrect. I brought her a new one. Is that all you went to see her about? No. Also, I asked her to come back. 
She was an excellent secretary. Mr. Shane, what are you doing? Just admiring your laundry in the sink. Laundry? Does your experiment include bleaching of blood-soaked handkerchiefs, Doctor? Good heavens. Yes, they, they are my handkerchiefs, yes. But the blood is not from Lois's veins. Ooh. She was strangled, then stabbed to death by a sharp instrument, Doctor. Like this surgical knife here. <laughs> Perhaps I, I show you how I use that knife. In this cage... Ooh, rats. Hundreds of them. One hundred, madam. Disease, very sick rats. When my experiments are concluded, they go in here. Into this bin. Oh, no. Ooh. Very dramatic, doctor. But it doesn't fool us. Sure, sure, you wanted Lois to come back to work, but she told you she was going to another chemical company. That scared you, doctor. If she told about your stolen formulas and your other cookery... Oh, so she did talk. I thought this was a trick. Don't you reach for your gun, Mr. Shane. My hand is already in my pocket. You killed her. You lie. She's not dead. It's a trick to get something on me. Get out. Get out of here, both of you. Now you will forget you ever came here. You will drop this investigation. I don't take orders from you, Dr. Spiegel. This time you will. Your young lady has sense if you have not. Good night. Oh, I thought he was going to keep us in there and experiment on us. Yes. <laughs> he's a cold-blooded baby. Yeah. Right. Hmm? Hey, hey, the inspector. There, he's parked in that police car. Oh, with Nelson. Yeah. He's got here in time to see the bums rush. What are the odds? I don't know, Inspector. He's devilish enough to commit murder. Should I take him in for questioning? No, no, not yet, not yet. He'll be here. He doesn't scare out. Mike found handkerchiefs soaking with blood. He, he said he was experimenting with rats. Hmm. I think he was sincere, though. He figured we were on the trail of those stolen formulas. He killed her, I tell you. If the police don't get him, I will. Oh, stop acting. You're too dead anxious to pin it on Spiegel. Yes, yes, and the good doctor threw the honor right back at Nelson. I'm on the fence. Spiegel had the motive, Nelson had the jealousy and the temper to do it. Each saw the girl about the time she died. Mike, if you ask me, you're passing up a bet. Hmm? The killer stuffed Lois into the trunk so her body could be smuggled out of the building. Find where the trunk was going and perhaps we'll have the address of the murderer. But she ordered the trunk picked up herself, Phil. Maybe she didn't. Anyway, it's worth a try. Hop in, Angel. We're heading for that transfer company. Appreciate it, sir. You're coming down and opening the office at this time of the night. Well, lucky my wife saw you were a policeman, or she'd never have let me out of the house. <laughs> uh, this is our dispatch office. Oh, uh, by the way, have you located your missing driver? Missing driver? I, I don't understand. Why, your traffic investigator came to the apartment. The driver that was to pick up the trunk had disappeared. He, he was checking up. Well, that's impossible. All of our men checked into that. And we don't have a, what did you call him, a traffic investigator? Mike. He was a fake. Mm hmm. It's not so good. Probably never ran an elevator in the Rust Building either. This thing is getting screwier by the minute. Oh, here we are. Here's the pickup order on the trunk. It's under the name, uh, oh, yes, Phyllis Knight. Not under Lois Lavers. Well, let's see. It was a phone order received 5.25 p.m. Yeah. Trunk to be sent to 9053 Jennifer Street. Mm hmm. Seems to me I've heard that address before. 9053 Jennifer. 9053 Jennifer. Yeah, there's something about it. I should hope so. It's the address of Michael Shane. I was right, Inspector. I was right. Lois was killed by mistake. It was intended to be filled. Well, if that's the case, then Carter and Spiegel cancel out. Correct, honey. The murderer had planned to kill Phyllis, send her body in that trunk to my apartment, and leave me to explain it to the police. All right, maybe so. Say the motive is revenge. You got a hundred enemies, Mike. One of them poses as a transfer company investigator, but who is he? He didn't leave a single fingerprint in Phil's apartment. Where do we start looking? Oh, if I could only remember the guy. I, I know his voice. 
But where have I heard it? When did I? I must know him. Well, he didn't know me very well, or he'd never have killed the wrong girl. Lois and I were the same height, same color of hair, Mike, but that's all. Maybe... Maybe he figured you changed a lot, honey, if, if he hadn't seen you in a long time, if he'd been away, if he'd ha- been... Faraday! Yeah, if he'd been away in prison. Kids, we're going to make a phone call right now. Hello, give me San Quentin. Phil. Phil, honey, close that door to the other room. I yeah. can't hear a thing. Hello, Inspector Faraday, San Francisco calling. Yes, I want to speak to him personally. Might get on that extension phone. Hmm? Yeah, okay. Hello, Faraday. What's on your mind? Plenty, sir. We need a list of all prisoners you've released from your little sanatorium in the past two weeks. Past two weeks, huh? Yeah. I'm afraid it'll hardly make a list, Faraday. Only one man. What's his name? Now, let me see. That was Ford. Harold Ford. That mean anything to you, Mike? Hmm. Well, never heard of him. Oh, who's that on the phone, Mike Shane? Well, you got sharp ears, sir. We, uh, we figured maybe you had released a prisoner who had a grudge against me. Some old enemy of Mike's who might try his hand at revenge. Oh, that's the only release we've had lately. In fact, Mike, you can subtract one enemy from your book. Hmm? Died here last week. Al Smock. Al S- Holy jumping. Now I remember. It's Al Smock's brother, Jack Smock. That's right. He had a brother. Came up here and claimed the body. Does that mean anything to you? Ha-ha! Does it? Set an extra plate in your dining room, Chief. We're sending you a new border. Goodbye, sir, and thanks a million for your help. Jack Smock. Jack Smock. He must have dyed his hair and put on glasses. Phil, Phil, you remember the case, the two brothers, uh, about four years ago? Yeah, yeah, vaguely. It was, uh, it was manslaughter. You helped send the one called Al Smock up for 20 years. Right, honey, right. Jack was supposed to be brother's Al, alibi. Yeah. But our testimony tied him up in bow knots. Yeah, that's so right. So Al died in prison. Now, brother Jack is out for revenge. Oh, fine. But where is brother Jack right now, and how do we catch him? Got it, honey. Jack claimed the body, so he must have buried him. Now we gotta find that body. <laughs> We'll return to Mike Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Due to their position, the front wheel bearings of your automobile are subject to damage from dirt, water, grit, and brake dust. Because of their more exposed position, and because they are so important to safe, easy driving, front wheel bearings need the best possible lubrication. Failure to keep these bearings well greased can mean wheel shimmy, hard steering, and weakening of the whole front assembly. For these reasons, your neighborhood Union Oil Minuteman uses extra care when he lubricates your front wheel bearings. First, he washes out all the old grease and dirt with solvents. Then the bearings and races are individually cleaned until they are dry and shiny. Finally, the clean, polished bearings are carefully assembled in the races and greased with special equipment. With each bearing snugly sealed in a smooth, sturdy coating of Union Oil ball roll grease, your front wheels are all set for months of well-lubricated, easy rolling. The cost for the entire service is nominal, so for safer, easier driving, just stop in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil front wheel bearing service. Thank you. At police headquarters, Mike and Inspector Faraday each holds a telephone in his hands. They have checked every cemetery in the book. Well, here's the last one. Shadow Mountain Cemetery. Yes, sir. Here it is. Albert Smock, interred last Friday. The plot was bought by a Mr. Jack Smock. Swell, swell. Uh, what's his address? Our records show it as 1960 Waterfront. This is it, kids. Looks like a busted-down rooming house. And somebody's head sticking out of every window. Yeah, there. There's a sergeant at the entrance. Good work, Sergeant. Anybody try to leave the building? No, sir. I got two boys at the back door, two in the alley, and two by the fire escape. Okay, let's go in, Mike. I'm coming, too. You are not. You want a hole in your head? I might get one just standing here, Smarty. Hmm? Smock may be in that crowd across the street. Something to that, Mike. Sergeant, your job will be to take care of Miss Knight. We're all going in. Right. Come on. Oh, jeepers, it's dark again. Why don't 
They like these stairs. Quiet, honey, quiet. All right. He's on this next floor. If he's in his room. The landlord said room 305. Now, let me see. That'd be here to the left. Keep close to the wall. There it is. That door there. There's no light shining under it. Maybe he's playing possum. Sergeant, you and Phil stay here. Latin out against the wall. Yes, sir. Now, you ready, Fanny? Ready. Mm, he's playing coy. Open up, Smock. You're completely surrounded. Okay, so you won't open up. All right, Fanny? Yeah. <laughs> so that's his answer. Okay, Mike, let's go. Wait a minute, I'll get the light. Oh, hurry up, hurry up. Here Something it is. Happened. Mike. Oh, he's flat on the floor. Mike, are you all right? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Okay, Inspector, okay. Climb out from under that table. We, I know somebody got hit, but who? He shot the gun right out of my hand. Yeah, I know. I didn't know where to aim in the dark till he fired and I saw his flash. Thanks to you, Mike, I'm still breathing. Yeah, well, this man on the floor won't be unless we get an ambulance quick. You... Found out. I didn't think. No, you're right, buddy. You didn't think, period. Revenge doesn't take much in the way of brains. Just an awful lot of lives. (laughs) Don't be silly, Phyllis. Mrs. Faraday will be glad to put you up for a couple of nights. Here, drink this down. Right. He's right, honey. Stay out of your apartment for a few days till you sort of forget what's happened. No. Oh. All right. I was just thinking. Hmm? You know, this was a freak case. Everything stacked up so strongly against Nelson Carter and Dr. Spiegel. Mm-hmm. And yet at the last minute, it turned out to be almost a complete stranger. Because we were looking for the wrong motive. Yeah, yeah I'm worried about that guy Spiegel. He looks to me like a guy who'd commit plenty of murders. And will before he gets through with his career. No, you can spike that, Faraday. Lock him up for stealing chemical formulas. That'll keep him quiet. Hey, not a bad idea. Keep him so busy making little ones out of big ones that he can't make dead ones out of live ones. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I hope, honey, that this little episode won't scare you out of the detecting business. Nearly getting bumped off by your boss's enemies. He's got plenty more enemies besides Jack Smock. Oh, I don't know. I'd stick anyway. My boss forgets the attractions of the job. What? (laughs) What? Why, honey. Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, and Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Holliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis.
anything can happen in San Francisco, well, almost anything, and when it happens, you usually find Michael Shane, private detective, somewhere around. That's why Mike and Phyllis Knight, his observant and easy-on-the-eye assistant, are locking the office at 9 a.m. and heading for the nearest corner to join Inspector Faraday on what the inspector describes as a wild goose chase, or as Phyllis more aptly puts it, a junket on office time. It it seems there are pirates in San Francisco Bay. Oh, it's spring, Angel, wonderful day, and... I've always wanted to go aboard a yacht. Yacht, my eye. It's probably phony, too. Hmm? What about our clients? You haven't cleaned up on that insurance case Oh, let them wait, let them wait. Haven't... Sixteen men on a dead bench, just your hole and a bottle of rum. Oh. Here's the elevator, darling. Oh, this is going to too many pirate pictures. Pirates in San Francisco Bay. Do you suppose they're related to the Indians at Stanford? What are you muttering about? I always mutter when some publicity-seeking chorus girl lets herself be found drugged in her pajamas, wrapped in a blanket in the bottom of a canoe. She's no chorus girl, honey. She's the wife of a college professor. But when she says pirates boarded a yacht, killed her husband, and kidnapped her, well, now, really, Yeah, yes, my I know, I know. You just... don't believe it. Well, I'm the open-minded type, darling. You certainly are. Here's where we get off. Oh, smell that air. As I said before, honey, it's spring. Mm-hmm. And in the spring, the sap rises. Oh. Over here, folks. Oh, hi, Inspector. Hello, Inspector. Well, I'm in. Here, darling. Thank you. Sausalito, first stop. Oh, what a day for a motorboat ride. Why, well, Inspector, you're actually glowering. What's happened? Plenty. I think I got my finger on the guy at the bottom of this deal. A movie press agent by the name of Jim Fonda. And never that guy pulling his Hollywood shenanigans in my town. Why, Inspector? No pirates. Oh, plenty of them, Phil. Too many of them. A whole brig full. There's 200 of them. What? You've already got 200 pirates in jail? Holy smoke. A brigantine is a pirate vessel, Mike. Huh? <laughs> right, Inspector? Right, Phil. Uh-huh. They might as well be in jail. For that anchor doesn't budge until I give the word. Lafitte's men, I suppose, from around the hall. No, no, nothing so romantic, my dear. They're Captain Kidd's men from Central Casting in Hollywood. There's a movie company aboard the ship, and they're getting ready to sail down the coast on location when I clam down. Oh, aren't you a bit rough on them, Inspector? After all, press agents have to have their fun. Or do you know something I don't know? No, not a thing, Mike. I guess I lost my sense of humor. Hollywood had its laugh this morning. Now I'm going to have mine. Huh? <laughs> You know, they have to pay those pirates every day, you know. Oh, yeah, I get it. Investigations, questions, delays. <laughs> well, where do we go first? The pirate ship or the yacht? The yacht. Maybe Professor Porter will be there himself, if he isn't still playing dead. Um, where's the wife? She'll be there, too. And so will Jim Fonda. Or I'll fire every detective on my staff. Well, that might not be a bad idea. Save the sarcasm, Mike. <laughs> That's only for you. Well, there's the yacht. Oh, that. Wow. There's nothing pony about this baby. She's big enough to go to sea. Yeah, but she hasn't been away from that dock site since the professor bought it. Hey, this doesn't look like a college professor's layout. A nice, tidy little investment there. Yeah, teaching's a sideline with Professor Porter. They tell me he's got oil wells working for him. If that's Annabelle, his wife, coming out to welcome us, they better be gushers. She looks very expensive. Inspector Faraday? Yes. Oh, and uh, this is Michael Shane and Phyllis Knight, Mrs. Porter. How do you do? Good morning. How do you do? Uh, uh, Please come into the lounge. Thank you. I'm a courteous man, Mrs. Porter, but I haven't time for courtesy this morning. I can't understand why an apparently sane woman would expect us to believe such a story. Do you mind if we stroll around, Mrs. Porter? I've never been on a yacht before. Well, yes, certainly. And now, Inspector, will you please explain why you got my Big-hearted story? Mike. He just can't bear to hear a beautiful redhead bald out, so he takes the powder. Oh, look, Angel, this doesn't add up. You don't plot publicity gags in a playhouse like this one. Huh? You've seen something, Mike. Or maybe it was just one look at the redhead. Hmm. I guess this is the master's stateroom. Two beds. What are you doing? The one bed layouts in the guest cabin. Mike, what did you see? Huh? Oh, just Mrs. Porter. She uh, used to be Annabelle Armstrong in the movies. Well, so what? Hey, now it's my turn. Hmm? I spy something beginning with the letter P. Give you one guess. Phil's in a blue bottle by the bed. Oh, <laughs> think I'll have a look. Mike, this entire bottle wouldn't put a child to sleep. Let me see, honey. Oh, it doesn't spell anything backwards. <laughs> It spells something for me. These pills prove Annabelle went canoe riding with her eyes open. Mm -hmm. Ow! What did you expect to find in the closet, pirates? Oh, that bag that hit my foot felt like it was packed. Hey, it is. And so is this one. Mm -hmm. Everything for a nice long trip. You know, I could take a honeymoon with this bag. (laughs) Say, the professor's a snappy dresser. Just look at this sport coat. Come on, Mike. Let 
Let's quit playing house. I want to watch Annabelle act. Okay. I might have known how it would turn out when I brought you along, Mike. Why, what's up, Inspector? It's murder, my boy. While we're playing houseboat. So her story stood up. I'm buying it up to here. Well, I haven't heard it, but I think I'll shop around. Well, fond is the guy, all right. I just telephoned a general alarm. Ought to pick him up any minute. You telephone? Yeah, there's a phone. The yacht's permanently tied up to the pier. I also sent for Porter's secretary. He may have some information. Inspector, do you mind bringing us up to date? We've been sightseeing. Well, Mike, here's the story. Jim Fonda is Porter's nephew. Yeah? Sort of a family black sheep. He's been causing trouble. Everything from forgery to some sort of blackmail. Uh Uh-huh. Well, it seems Fonda headed for the professor's home as soon as he hit town. The professor's secretary sent him to the yacht. That'd be yesterday afternoon. There was a row. Porter threatened to send Fonda to jail and shoved him off the boat. Yeah? Fonda yelled he'd be back and told Porter he'd better have it ready. Mrs. Porter thinks he meant a sum of money. Maybe the secretary Taylor can clear that point. Uh Uh-huh, but uh, where do the pirates come in? Well, I'm coming to that. I'll tell you, Mike. After Fonda left, Mrs. Porter developed a headache. That night she couldn't sleep. The professor went into the lounge to read, and uh, Mrs. Porter took two sleeping pills. Uh, Three, my dear. Mrs. Porter took three sleeping pills. Uh, Later, she was aroused by loud voices, and then... And then a big, burly pirate with a red beard leaned over the bunk. I believe his beard was black, Miss Knight. Oh, yes. The light was on. No, the cabin was dark. This man, dressed like a pirate, seized me, threw a blanket over me, and carried me to the canoe. It was one we kept tied to the yacht. There was a body wrapped in a blanket on the bottom. He paddled for several minutes and then put the body overside. Maybe you'd better ask the questions, Mike. Well, you're doing fine, Angel. Thanks. Uh, Mrs. Porter, the uh, cabin was dark. There was no moon. How did you know the man was dressed like a pirate? He struck several matches. Oh? Yes, he was smoking the pipe. I see. And uh, why are you so sure that this man dressed as a pirate was Jim Fonda? I knew Jim. He was publicity man on one of my pictures. Oh, maybe I should explain. Uh, I'm Annabelle Armstrong. Oh, not at all. I recognized Annabelle Armstrong the moment I came aboard. Thank you. Well, Jim Fonda had two peculiarities. His eyebrows were highly arched, and his left eye twitched. Hmm? I re- recognized him despite his disguise the first time he lighted a match. Did uh, he know you had recognized him? I'm not sure. He might have worn the pirate costume as a prank. Jim had an odd sense of humor. I believe he intended taking me with him. He tried to arouse me when he landed the canoe. I was too heavy to carry far. Those sleeping tablets must have been pretty powerful. Mr. Shane, those tablets are a mild, harmless sort. I was wide awake. Then from fright at first, and then I acted. Don't forget, I used to be an actress. Why did you stay in the canoe after he left you? Well, I yelled my head off and nobody came. It was dark and... Well, I, I was afraid I'd fall into the water. I, I can't swim. Well, that's sensible. Do you uh, think you could locate the spot where your husband's body was dropped into the water? I pointed out the spot when the police brought me to the yacht this morning. That's right, Mike. We've had men grappling for the body all morning. There's no current and the water is quiet, so we ought to bring it up. Well, that's the police launch. That ties it up. Bring it in, boy. Well, you satisfied now, Angel? No, I am not, and neither are you. Mm Mm-hmm. Say... I guess that'd be Mr. Taylor with the briefcase over there coming down the pier. Huh? Oh, yes, the secretary. Dark and handsome. Huh? And not too tall. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane and Phyllis Knight in their adventures. Probably no other possession you may have requires the attention and constant care that your automobile does. The hundreds of bearings and precision gears in a car need continual protection against rust, friction, heat, and abrasion. That is why regular stopware lubrication is so vital to the condition of your car. You see, stopware lubrication is more than just a grease job. It's a system that's been worked out from years of experience to give your automobile the best possible care. When you leave your car at a Union Oil Minuteman station for stopware lubrication, you can be sure that nothing on your automobile will be overlooked or hurriedly serviced. Each fitting is carefully and thoroughly lubricated according to the manufacturer's specifications. While your car is on the hoist, the Minutemen inspect out-of-sight points and check them for danger signs. 
Finally, as complete proof of Stopware's reliable lubrication, you receive a thousand-mile written guarantee with each job. You'll find your car rolls smoother, handles easier, stands up better with regular Stopware lubrication. Stopware guaranteed lubrication is available only at Union Oil Minuteman stations. Professor Porter's body has been recovered from the bay, and Inspector Faraday is hurrying to meet the launch at the end of the pier. Mike and Phyllis are following, but Phyllis is reluctant to leave Mrs. Porter and the professor's secretary, Bill Taylor, together in the lounge of the yacht. Come on, hurry, honey. They'll be here in a minute. You're getting awfully careless, Mike. I know what I'm doing. I wonder. Oh, cut it out, Angel, please. Oh, Mike, get tough. Be yourself. Why, what do you mean? Well, don't let a good-looking redhead blind you. So far, she's got all the answers, Angel. Good answers. All of them. All right, take it easy now. Yeah, okay. Bring it over here. Hey, give me a hand. This is heavy. Okay. Okay, Sergeant, cut the ropes. Right. Hey, what are all those lumps? Some sort of weights. Made a sack out of the blanket. Open it up, man. Okay, here we are. Right, Holy jumping catfish. Well, I'll be... I knew they were heavy reading, but I never thought of them as weights. Well, the professor went down wrapped in culture, the Encyclopedia Britannica. Yeah. One, two, three, four, twelve volumes. Mm-hmm. From A to J. Mike, look over by the inspector. Mrs. Porter and Bill Taylor. Of course, darling, they've got to identify the body. Oh. Look out, she's fading. Take her back to the yacht, men. Yes, I've got to see Annabelle in a swoon. You better go with her, Angel. Now hurry. Okay. Doc says, can you have the body now? Okay, take her to the morgue. What about all them books? You know what to do with evidence. The blank and everything go to headquarters. All right. Inspector. Yeah, see any marks on the body? Not a scratch. Hey, where's Porter's secretary? Right here, Inspector. Bill Taylor. Does Jim Fonda strike you as the sort of fellow who'd pull a job like this? Well, I wouldn't like to accuse anyone of a thing like this. How long have you known him? It's about a year. Ever since I've been with Professor Porter. Oh. Uh, shall we return to the yacht? I'm afraid Mrs. Porter's ill. We can talk here. Miss Knight will look after her. Oh, uh, this is my friend, Mr. Shane. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Shane? Fine. Well, looks like Fonda put his trademark on this one. I don't know. I only wish I'd never sent him to the yacht. Hmm? Uh, when was this? Sunday. Uh, yesterday afternoon. Well, uh, why did you send him? Well, I never dreamed it. Well, he was insistent. Did uh, Porter tell you to keep Fonda away from him? Well, this is embarrassing, Mr. Shane. <laughs> Murder usually is, Mr. Taylor. Come on, let's have the story. Well, uh, Professor Porter disliked seeing his nephew. Why? Was he afraid of him? No, oh, no, not exactly afraid. It was just that... Uh... Well, look, Inspector, can this be kept confidential? Well, how can I tell you until I know what it is? Well, a good many years ago, Professor Porter was involved in a rather nasty divorce case. Well, nothing like that stand up. His past is clean. Maybe he took on a new identity, Inspector. It's been done, you know. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Professor Porter did take a new name and arranged an entirely different past. You see, Professor Porter was William Steele. Mm. Hey, wait a minute. I remember that case back on Long Island. Mm, I don't know a great deal about it, however. But uh, Fonda did, huh? And made the most of it. Well, I'm not sure, Mr. Shane. But you see, I took care of Professor Porter's bank account, and uh, he gave his nephew large sums of money. Hmm. How much does Mrs. Porter know about this? I don't believe she knows anything about the divorce. But she knew Fonda had something on her husband? I suspect she did. She knew about the money because she spoke to me about it. Mm-hmm. How often has Fonda been tapping the professor? Oh, almost every month. This was his second trip this month. Uh, speaking of trips, where were you going on your vacation? My vacation? Oh. Oh, you found my bag. What's this about a bag, Mike? I found two bags fully packed in a closet. One belonged to you, Mr. Taylor, I believe. And the other one? To Mrs. Porter. Oh, well, uh, that's uh, that's easy to explain. You see, the professor sold the yacht, and I was moving my personal possessions. Uh, I presume that Mrs. Porter had the same thing in mind. What about Professor Porter? Well, he always put things off until the last moment. Meaning? Well, the moving van isn't due until tonight. All right, Mike, that explains the bags. Now, let's get back to my office. I want Fonda. And uh, I'd like to see how Mrs. Porter's feeling. All right, go ahead. The coroner's inquest hasn't been set, but I want to see you and Mrs. Porter tomorrow morning. Okay, we'll be at Mrs. Porter's home. Mike. Huh? Mike. Yes, Angel? Now, I've seen everything. Hmm? How is Mrs. Porter? Oh, she's beautiful, but bereaved. She's repairing her makeup. Come on, I want to get to my office. Mike, Mike, did you ask Mr. Taylor about the bags? Yes, Angel, yes. But he knows the answer. Any 
messages? Hollywood's been calling every 20 minutes, Inspector. What do they want? Tell her at Apex Studios. Wants his pirates. Tell him we got a murder case to settle first. Well, says you're going to have a lawsuit, too. Claims this is costing them thousands. Why don't you turn him loose, Inspector? The guy says you better do it pronto. That boat's stuck till I get my hands on Fonda. Come on, Mike and Phyllis. Okay. Now, let's get down to business. Yeah, let's go to work. Well, it's about time. What do you mean, Phyllis? Fonda left a trail a yard wide. Too wide, Inspector. You uh, want to do me a favor, Inspector? You too? What is it? Check on that story about the sale of Porter's yacht. Yes, Mike, I had that in mind. Yes, Inspector? Is Bolton back from that pirate ship? He's waiting out, sir. Send him in. Pick up any leads, Bolton? Not a line. The guy just vanished. Oh, he can't do that. What did they tell you about Fonda? Everybody had a good word for him. He came to town ahead of the picture crowd last Friday. Oh? When was he on the boat? Yesterday. They said he seemed worried about his uncle. Hadn't been able to see him. Did uh, he tell uh, anybody why he wanted to see his uncle? No. Nope. Seems that he didn't do much talking. Does uh, Fonda smoke a pipe? Hmm? So you haven't found him, have you, Mike? No. Why? Well, the pipe's a part of the description they gave me. Mm-hmm. The left eye twitches, too. You must know the guy. No. No, just the woman he kidnapped. Well, he can't get out of town. He must be holed up somewhere. You searched the boat? Yeah. Even turned up some girl pirates. Any pirate costumes missing? Wardrobe man says they're all there. Well, how about the odd parts? Wigs, scarves? I uh... thought of that. Could be. But it'd take a week to check. Okay, take a week, but check it. Okay. Hello? That Hollywood guy's on the wire. Crying. Tell him I got a murder in my hands. The boat stays here. Father's not on that boat, Inspector. His friends are. Get back to that boat. Yeah, if I stay out there any longer, I'll turn pirate myself. Got any ideas, Mike? Well, I'd like to know about, uh... About that Porter Yard, Inspector. Yes? Professor sold it all right. That satisfy you, Mike? Well, that cooks one idea, anyhow. I've got an idea, Inspector. Let's have it, Phil. Remember when lovely Annabelle was giving us Act Two? Oh, let's don't be catty, Angel. You be quiet. I know when you're getting ready to spring something. <laughs> I wish I knew as much. All right, all right, Smarty. Well, Mrs. Porter spoke of Jim Fonda in the past tense. A natural reaction. Probably glad to have him out of her life. Oh, you don't. Just heard from the coroner's office, Inspector. When's the inquest? Tomorrow. Funny thing... What's that? Doc says Porter's been in the water two or three days. Did you hear that, Mike? Well, that knocks the whole case into a cocked hat. But Mrs. Porter said it happened last night. Well, maybe she'll know the answer to this one. Maybe I know the answers. What? Remember when we went through the staterooms on the yacht? Yeah, yeah, you admired the bed. Uh-huh. There were two in the stateroom and one in the guest cabin. Yeah, they'd all been slept in. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no, but... But there was something missing. Hey, hey, I remember. The blankets. Now you're cooking. Look, this is no time for guessing games, Mike. Let him alone, let him alone. I thought he never would wake up. One blanket to wrap the professor in, one for his wife for a canoe ride. Yeah. That makes two blankets. Where's the third one? Maybe it was for Fonda. You're wrong, Mike. And about encyclopedias? Twenty volumes to the set, covering everything from A to Z. Right, Angel, right. Where's the other eight volumes? Porter was dumped overboard with A to J. And you think K to Z are with Fonda? Say, anybody on the yacht with that dame? Oh, Taylor's with a shield key. Well, Fonda didn't keep very well. Well, maybe I left her uncovered so she'd lead us to Fonda. I've got a different slant, Inspector. The only place Annabella leads you is astray. I guess we'd better get back to the yacht. If you're still looking for Fonda, we'd better go. Well, I doubt if there's anyone else there. All right, let's go. Fonda's the lad I'm still looking for. Uh, uh, then you better take along the boys with the long-handled rakes, Inspector. We'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures in just a moment. The front wheel bearings on your automobile are made of finely machined, high carbon steel. With proper lubrication, these bearings will last the lifetime of the car with no other attention. But notice, ladies and gentlemen, that we say, with proper lubrication. For front wheel bearings do require extra protection. They're exposed to damage from brake dust, grit, and water. In addition, they must support the heavy weight of your automobile. For these reasons, and because they're expensive and difficult to replace nowadays, front wheel bearings should be carefully and thoroughly lubricated. Your neighborhood Union Oil Minuteman knows this. That's why he takes such pains to do a thorough job of lubricating front wheel bearings. First, he washes out all the old grease and dirt with solvent. 
Then the bearings and races are individually cleaned until they're dry and shiny. Finally, the clean, polished bearings are replaced in the races. Then, with special equipment, every surface is snugly packed in a thick coating of Union Ball Roll grease, and your front wheels are all set for months of well-lubricated, easy rolling. The cost for the entire service of your front wheel bearing assembly is nominal. So for safer, easier driving, just stop in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil's front wheel bearing service. Thank you. Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday are back at the yacht. A crew with grappling hooks is just arriving. It would be old home week if Mrs. Porter and Bill Taylor were there, but they've flown the coop. The inspector mutters to himself. I hope this phone's still working. Hello? Hello? Hello, Sarge? Yes, Inspector? Get Cassidy on the short wave. Tell him to bring Mrs. Porter and Taylor back to the yacht. So, you did have them tailed. How do you think I keep my job, Mike? Mike? Hmm? Mike, you were right about the blankets, and the bags are gone, too. Sure they're gone. Taylor told us they were moving into town. And here's where the encyclopedia set came from. Where is it? An empty shelf, and I never even noticed. Say, let's go out on deck and see if they fished up anything, huh? All right. All right, here. Oh. Hey, fellas, have you found anything? Two tire cases and a couple of pairs of old shoes. Well, keep on raking. Try it forward. Okay. It's beginning to add up, all right. Yeah, sure, sure it adds up. Fonda gets into town, goes to see Uncle Porter. And tries to pick up five grand. No, 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 I'm not buying the blackmail scenario. Why am I? Too well planted like the rest of the deal. Anyhow, a crook working a blackmail racket doesn't have to work as a press agent. Okay, so Fonda goes to see Porter. And Porter isn't in sight. Annabelle and Taylor give Fonda a cock and bull story. He gets suspicious and starts checking. Yeah, but where? Around the neighborhood, at the university. And then? Annabelle and Taylor get ideas. Maybe Fonda is the answer to a little job they've already done. You mean Porter's murder? You're on the beam, Inspector. My guess is Fonda stood to get a slice of the professor's estate, a big slice. I'm beginning to like your story. Well, wait a minute. Let me finish it, hmm? They decide to knock off Fonda, hang the Porter murder on him, and live happily ever after. Take the whole part, huh? Right, right. So Taylor lets Fonda know that his professor uncle is on the yacht. And when Fonda shows up Sunday night, Taylor drills him. Hey, Aren't you boys guessing a bit too far ahead? Huh? You've got no proof that Taylor shot Fonda. In fact, you've got no proof that Fonda's even dead. No. But do you see what I see on that ledge? You mean the lamp? Yes, darling, a lamp. Where it couldn't do anybody any good. No, it's not very ornamental. Okay, okay, quit being clever. Move it. All right. A bullet hole. Yes, honey, a bullet hole. Not very old, either. And since no bullets were used to put the professor out of the way, and Taylor and the professor's wife are still alive... What is it, Sarge? Another bundle, Inspector. Well, well, Inspector, blanket number three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the same kind of bulges as the other bundle. Yes, Angel. Encyclopedia Britannica, volumes K to Z. Looks like a police car. Cassidy, you hope. With our two murdering lovebirds. Yeah. Yeah, it's Cassidy, all right. Here they are, Inspector. Did you send for us, Inspector? Yes, I wanted to finish our chat. Why, what happened, Inspector? Nothing much. We just found Fonda's body. Get out of the car, Taylor. You too, Annabelle. Duck, guys, he's got a gun! Get him, Faraday! Get him! My gun's jammed! The car's caught fire. Yeah, come on, run for it. Hurry. They're both unconscious. Yeah, pull them out, pull them out. Get her first. Easier Taylor. that way. Taylor's all in one piece anyway. It's the same with the dean. Just bump your head. Well, that's too bad. Mike, where are you going? To get the robe out of the car before it's burned. Have you gone crazy? No, no. Now, here. Here, let's throw this robe over Annabelle. Oh, Put it up over her face. Hey, Taylor's stirring. He's coming out of it. Good, good. But I can't have Annabelle awake. Maybe I'd better conquer her. Let huh? me. Wake him up, Inspector. Come on, you get up. Wake oh. him up. Come on. Where am I? You're at the end of the road, Fallon. Oh. oh, where's Annabelle? Mrs. Porter. Mrs. Porter is dead. Huh? Oh, no. No, she couldn't be. Huh? Hold the blanket back, honey. Was she dead? 
I mean, I mean... I know exactly what you mean, boy. No. No, she talked. Talked plenty before she went. You've been out cold for ten minutes, fella. Come on, you'd better talk fast. I had nothing to do with it. Oh, I helped dispose of the bodies, yes, but she made me. She threatened my life. She acted like a mad woman. I didn't do it. I didn't. Then who did? Annabelle. She poisoned the professor and she shot Fonda. He's lying. Don't believe him. Oh, so you came too, huh? But but you said she was dead. You, you tricked me. Which is nothing compared to what we're going to do to you, both of you. Yes, we tricked you. And you accused her of murder. Now it's her turn. Where did he hide the gun? At my apartment. Oh, you fool. If you kept your mouth if shut. If you both kept your mouth shut, we'd still have caught you. Every clue that you planted, every clue that you thought would point to Fonda was a signpost leading us right to you. I don't want to talk to them anymore, Inspector. How about you? Not me. I've had all I want. Take him away, Cassidy. <laughs> This is my apartment, remember? Huh? Oh. Oh, yes, Angel. Yeah. Uh-huh. What are you thinking of, Mike? The redhead? Redhead? Oh, her no. Oh, no, no. She did sort of go for it. In a mild sort of way. <laughs> Not me, honey. I knew she was a phony. Ah, don't give me that. No, look, Angel, look. What do you think I am, a fool? Yes, where blondes and redheads are concerned, yes. Oh, Angel, from the word go, I had her tagged. She tried to identify Fonda as the guy who kidnapped her. Well, I know it. Well, could you picture Fonda picking her up, wrapping her in a blanket, carrying her to a canoe, and all the time striking matches to light a pipe he was smoking? Tough cut, Angel. Well, then why didn't you say so before? (laughs) Just because you look so cute when you're jealous. Jealous? What? Ah, Angel, please, Angel, not here. The neighbors are watching. Again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Tom Petty and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is Ed Stevens substituting for John Lang, saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. Ladies and gentlemen, despite all our efforts to know that living costs are rising, and certainly the high taxes of war are cutting deeply into our incomes, so why not help yourself and your country by starting a victory garden now? Growing your own vegetables will not only make a big saving on your grocery bill, but will provide a healthy, interesting hobby. Those who have no yards of their own may be able to find space in nearby vacant lots. So wherever you live, whatever you do... Serve yourself and the nation with a victory garden in 45. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Excitement and danger are the salt and pepper in Mike Shane's recipe for life. But at this particular moment, Mike seems fresh out of spice and seasoning. Life is very dull for our detective friend. So dull, in fact, he almost yawns right in the very pretty face of his secretary, Phyllis Knight. 
Ten minutes to four. You've had that poetry book propped under your nose since lunch. Well, certainly. If I'm going to write poetry reviews, I've got to read them. Exactly. Three people have walked through that door today. One bill collector and two guys asking where they could... Mike. Where they could comb their hair. Three plus one equals four. You, sir, are Monsieur Michael Shane, the private detective? If it's all right with you, ma'am. I am Madame Jolene Toulot. Uh, once again? Madame Jolene Toulot. But, of course, I shouldn't expect a detective to know and the... Jolene Toulot, the opera star, of course. Won't you have a chair, please? Uh, the other one, Phil, it's strong, uh, more comfortable. Young man, I weigh 230 pounds. If this chair won't hold me, I'll let you know. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Uh, a big voice means a big body. Did you ever hear a voice from one of those little musical comedy with it? Uh, no? No more voice than a sick grasshopper. Madame Tello, you wish to see Mr. Shane about some problem, a case? Of course. What did I come here for? It's in my purse. Here, read this letter. Thank you. Madam, this is your last morning. If the book is published, you will not be here to enjoy the pain it causes. Hmm, that's all. It's unsigned. This is the second one I have received in the past two weeks. Well, what on earth does it mean, uh, the, the book? My memoirs. Oh. Everybody knows I am writing them. A lot of famous people will lose sleep when they read what I, Madame Jolene Torlo, has told about them. But I want to live to uh, enjoy it. You you wish me to investigate who's sending you these notes? I do. I'm sorry, madam. I'm not a press agent. Writers have tried this publicity stunt before. Why, you young cochon. Very well. I'll go to a good detective. I wish you luck, madam. I like you, young man. You talk back to me and don't apologize. Only uh, in months spelt with an R. <laughs> I admit I like publicity, Mr. Shane. I love to see my name in print, but not in the obituary. If you will take the case, I'll give you the names of the people that might have written these notes. Go ahead, Mike. We wouldn't want anything to really happen to Madame Tello. Thank you, my dear. What is your name? Phyllis. Phyllis Knight. I remember hearing you sing Carmen when I was a little girl. Mm, you're older than I thought. Uh, you like <laughs> opera? Oh, I love it, yes. I've got record albums at home of Aida and Carmen, Rigoletto, Cavaliero Rusticana. Wait a minute. Didn't I see in the papers that you were singing that tonight? The, uh, the, uh, Benefit series. Yes. My fifth farewell appearance. Uh, coming back to business, madam, you were going to give me some names. Yes. The first one is Roderick Mackenzie of the Newport Mackenzies, an old suitor of mine. Would, uh, he threaten to kill you? He's come clear out to the coast just to keep his name out of my memoirs. He wants to buy his letters back from me. Oh? My dear Julien, he says, I was wild, a wild and foolish boy, but that was long ago. There is my family, you, my uh, circle. You're writing this down, honey? Uh-huh, yes, yes. Uh, then there's my ex-husband, Edwin Buck. He's got political ambitions which my book might sour. And uh, Leonora Baril, Madame Baril. Do you think I have to sing tonight with that Hungarian foot owl? Uh, oh, and one other, Savadal, our maestro. They're all in your memoirs? Uh, any others? Uh, yes. Savadal, our maestro, he hates the air I breathe because I won't let Helen marry him. Helen? My secretary, Helen Smith. Oh. The girl thinks she's in love with him. She's too young, too good for him. Uh, you might add the secretary to the list, honey. Mm-hmm. Helen? Impossible. She couldn't. She's... No, never. Well, we've got four names here. Now, where do I find these people? Come to the opera tonight, the Figaro Theater. I will have them all there for you. Figaro Theater, Okay. Uh, it's a double bill, Pagliacci, then Cavalleria. I sing in the second half. Oh, oh let, uh, let us meet in my dressing room during the intermission. Uh, one thing more, madam. Do we have to listen to the opera itself? Of course. Someday you can tell your children you heard Madame Jeline Torlot. You will never forget tonight. Uh-huh. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> I wanted to hear the end of Pagliacci. Yeah, so do I. It can't end quick enough. Oh, you're just being childish. You like music and singing. Yeah, sure, darling, but when guys get up on the stage and insult each other, I want to enjoy it in English. Oh, my. Yes? Oh, oh, we thought this was Madame Turlow's dressing room. I'm sorry. It is. 
Madam is a no come here yet. Oh, well, we were to meet her here in her dressing room. Can we come in and wait? I am a waiting to see her. Okay, we'll make it a threesome. Uh, the names are Miss Knight and Mike Shane. So? I am Savadel. The maestro? But I thought you were conducting the... Cavalleria only, madame. Oh. Diavolo, she is late, late. Uh, uh, excuse me. Hello? Hello? Madame, the time I wait and wait and wait. So? See, they are here. You, Mr. Shane. She wants to talk. Oh, thank you. Hello? Mr. Shane, I am going to be late. A certain person has been here at the house trying to tear up my memoirs. What? Who? I'll tell you when I get to the theater. Come back to the dressing room after the performance. Au revoir. Goodbye. I want to talk to her. I'm sorry, Maestro. She hung up. Oh, that woman, that big girl, will not stand to this. I warn her. No, we do it. I do what? Hey, hey, just a second there. That, my dear, is what we artists call temperament fortissimo. Yeah, well, I've got a plainer name for it. <laughs> Come on, darling. Let's go back to our seats and join the other sufferers. <laughs> That man conducting the orchestra, he doesn't look like Savadell. Yeah, you're right. It's the same bald head who umpired the first opera. Yeah, but Savadell said he would. I wonder what it means. Don't ask me, darling. The only thing I know about grand opera is the price of our tickets. It's awfully funny. Yeah. Well, this is the last part of the prelude, and right now the tenor is supposed to be singing off stage. The curtain's huh? going up. There's nobody on the stage. Somebody's coming out, of the, out from the wings now. It's Sabadell. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Quiet. Please. I am regret to announce there will be tonight no Cavalleria Rustican. I have to announce there is a tragedy. Our soprano, Madame Turlow, is a dead. <laughs> We'll return to Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Many motorists blame poor mileage, sluggish pickup, and inferior engine performance on wartime gasoline. Now, it's true that all civilian gasoline must be restricted in quantity and quality due to government regulations. But if you've been having trouble with a rough motor, or your gas coupons don't seem to go quite as far as they used to... Ask yourself this question. How long has it been since my spark plugs were checked? You see, spark plugs have a lot to do with engine performance. If they're old or burned or dirty, they won't fire properly and they waste gasoline. In fact, engineering tests show that defective plugs can waste one tank full of gasoline out of ten. Now, there's no reason why anyone should put up with this condition when it's so easy to have your Union Oil Minuteman check your spark plugs. Union Oil Spark Plug Inspection is scientifically performed. The condition of each plug is carefully measured on a special machine, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minuteman will clean and adjust them. The cost of this service is only a few cents per plug, and you'll soon save that in extra mileage. You'll find Union Oil Minuteman ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. The sudden death of Madame Turlot has been announced from the opera stage. It's a few minutes later. Mike and Phyllis are at the home of the dead singer. As they hurry through the entrance hall, Inspector Faraday is explaining. Well, for once, Mike, I beat you to the scene. The old lady started to phone the police, but never completed the call. One of our operators heard gunshots over the phone. So you hightailed it right over. Yeah, when somebody at the opera phoned for her, I gave him the news. Well, this is the living room. The bodies, well, you can see for yourself. But, but, Inspector, there are two of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As bloody as Grand Opera itself. Oh. And when she came to our office, I thought it was a publicity stunt. Mike Shane, you're a hero. Oh, Mike, you couldn't possibly know. I haven't had time to identify the other body. It's a woman of, I'd say, 25 or 26. That's probably Helen Smith, the mm-hmm. secretary. 
only we knew who was here with Madame Tillot when she telephoned you at the theater. Yeah, the somebody who had just tried to destroy her manuscript. So that's what it was, a manuscript. One of my boys found a pile of paper over there in the fireplace. Huh? A lot of it was burned up. Uh-huh. Looks like some old photographs and letters, too. Oh, well, maybe that's the coroner. Be right back, kids. Okay. Look at these, Mike. Here, these pages didn't burn. Chapter 5, My Husband. There never was a more dashing, gallant figure of a man than Edwin Buck. Hmm, there's something screwy here. She's giving him a gold-plated Oscar, unless it's supposed to be sarcasm. Her desk looks as if she'd been working on a manuscript, Mike. A lot of typewriter paper and carbon sheets. Only used a couple of times. Oh, good, good. You know what to do with them. Mike, what are you staring at? Blood stains on the carpet. They trail from the phone over here to the piano where she died. Oh. Well, she must have clutched at the music rack as she fell. There's music all over the floor. Uh-huh. She's got a couple of sheets crumpled in her hand. Looks like they were torn out of something. I see. That's part of an opera score. An aria from Rigoletto. Court I G on I Z. Mike. Corsiani hmm? Virazzi. It's a baritone aria. I thought she was a soprano. Oh. Helen, Mama Mia, Helen. No, Sabadell, no, don't touch her. I don't know who these men are, but they all insist they're special friends of Madame Turwell. What's your name, sir? Edwin Buck. I was once her husband. And you? Roderick McKenzie. I've known Jelaine for, uh, well, a long time. I was supposed to meet all three of you gentlemen this evening about certain threatening letters sent to Madame Turner. Mm-hmm. So no, I understand. Have that. you got those letters, Mike? Uh, I have one, Inspector, here in my purse. Maestro Savadell, uh, when we were in the dressing room with you, you blew your top about Madame. You said you uh, had warned her, and now you would do it. Uh, do what, Maestro? I was... I was a meaning for Helen. Madame, she said, we cannot marry. I'm say, Madame Turlo have no right to stop us. Tonight, I'm going to decide. No more talk. We do it. And uh, where did you go when you slammed out? First, I go for a walk. Get over my temper. Then I phone Madame. She's a very late. They say she's a dead. Mr. Buck, you came here for some reason, but you're very quiet. Yes, I... Oh, it's so horrible. And... How long ago were you divorced from Madame Turlo? About... 18 years. I understand you have political ambitions, is that right? I hope to run for Congress. And what your ex-wife wrote about you might do your opponents more good than you. Hmm? Why, no. From all Jelaine told me, she wrote rather well of me. From all she told us, that wasn't her idea. Can you tell us, Mr. Buck, where you were during the past hour? Why, certainly. At the opera to hear Jelaine. Mm-hmm. Mr. McKenzie, I believe you made a special trip here from New York to keep your name out of these memoirs. There's no crime in that. You tried to buy your letters back from Madam. I did. I have my family to think of, my social standing. Some of my letters were, well, full of youthful enthusiasm. I was afraid Jelaine would distort them. Mr. McKenzie, where were you during the past hour? I was at the opera. No, no, that is one a lie. He was here. I'm see him. All right, McKenzie. Drop the innocent act. What were you doing here? Well, if you must know, I I came to talk to Jelaine's secretary. And? I was going to bribe her to steal my letters for me. But nobody answered the door. I never got in. You can't prove anything on me. Except that you're a poor liar, sir. That goes for all of you. Any one of you three could have sneaked up here from the opera and killed these women. Inspector? Yes, Mike? Madam has some uh, some of the musical score in her right hand. I want to borrow it for an hour or so. But, Mike, that's evidence. Nothing's going to happen to it, Inspector. And, honey, if you'll give me the keys to your apartment, please. Uh, what? I- I'll go with you. No, no, no. I want you here to sort of observe the uh, proceedings. Mr. Shannon, please. I want to talk with you. It must be private. Inspector Faraday will be glad to hear anything you have to say, Maestro. I'll uh, be seeing your children. Oh, Angel. Uh, you dropped your handkerchief. Hmm? Oh, thanks. All right, Mr. Sabado. What was it you wanted to tell Mike? Oh, it's a, like I say, it's a private. Okay, I suppose it's private why you came here earlier and saw Mackenzie. I'm all ready to tell. I come to see Helen. And say to Madame that we get them married. But nobody's opened the front door. They're already dead. Inspector. Now what? This isn't my handkerchief. It's got the initials L.B. Mm-hmm. Of course. Leonor Beryl, the singer. Her name was on our list, too. Then she must have been here. Whew. We're knee-deep in suspects. Well, maybe this one is the fish we're really after. See you later, Inspector. Hey, Phil, where are you going? Where do you suppose? Right, Inspector? <laughs> I, I hope you will excuse my appearance, but I'm 
Well, I, I am so strong from this shop. Yes, yes, I understand, Miss Barilla. She, Lily, and I, we, we were such good friends. She was like a mother to me. Yes, you know. yes. Did you see her today? Today? Oh, no. No, I... Oh, my eyes. The mascara was... Oh, here, here, use this, Frankie. Oh, oh, thank you. You buy very expensive handkerchiefs, Miss Barilla. What? That handkerchief. It's yours. You dropped it in the living room. Jelaine Turlow's living room. Oh. You did see her today, didn't you? In fact, this evening. How did you know? <laughs> I didn't. There's a shot in the dark. I see you use a typewriter. What, what are you doing? Just checking something. Will not be... Yep, it's the same. It is the same what? The letter E on your typewriter, exactly like the E in the note threatening the life of Jelaine Turlow. They're all right. I was trying to scare her. She had me in her memoirs. I am trying to get my husband back. But if Savadell reads the malicious way she twisted things... Savadell? He's your husband? And our divorce became final last month. But I am going to get him back. Ah. He was going to elope with Helen. So you got rid of the girl. Then you had to kill the other woman. I kill... Get out of here. Get out of here. Gladly, gladly. I think you've told me all we need to know. with women. They tell it too much. Oh, Zephardel. How did you get here? The inspector, he's a turn to lose everybody but Mr. McKenzie. Now, I talk to you. No, you don't. You stay. Stop it. They want to talk. You let go of me. Get over the she back. Stop it. Stop it. She's getting away. Sister, I am away. <laughs> of the time because Wait everything that please, she said... Please, Angel, please give it to me slow. I oh. can't get it all at once. Well, listen, all right. Faraday has turned everybody loose except Mackenzie. He's holding the wrong man. Well, it could be, but Inspector Faraday must have his reasons. But the handkerchief. Leonor Barrell admitted she was with Madame Tullow tonight, and she was married to Savadell. Yeah, so you said. But doesn't all this mean anything to you? Savadell tried to keep me in that apartment. Mm-hmm. Men try that occasionally. Oh. By the way, did you check Madam's uh, carbon paper? I did not. I found more important things to do. Phyllis, I told you... Mike, that... stop fiddling with that phonograph and listen to me. Leonor Barrill sent those threatening letters. She wanted Savadell back, but he was going to elope with Helen. Don't you think Leonor would be mad enough to kill her and Jelaine Tullow? If you think that, why were you so scared of Savadell? Because... Because they're in it together. Mm-hmm. Oh. oh, by the way, honey, have you got some extra phonograph needles? This one's getting scratchy. Oh, Mike... What's my something wrong? Yes, you. Huh? I beat my brains out trying to help you on this case. You just stand there gawking at sheet music and phonograph records. Excuse, please, but the doorbell. That's the apartment phone, stupid. Down by the mailboxes. Oh, I'll get it. It's probably Inspector Faraday. Hello? Please. Mr. Phyllis and Knight. Well, who is it and what do you want? Senor Sabatel. I must see her at once. Look, mister, look, this is Mike Shane. If you come around here to Pester Phyllis, I'll put no, you... No, no, please. I want to talk to both of you. It's a secret. I have an idea. Uh, hello? Oh. Hello? Hello? Oh. Hello? Mr. Shane. Yeah? The aria. The aria. Oh. Sabatel. Sabatel, what's wrong? Sabatel! <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures. A few minutes ago, we mentioned some of the reasons why clean spark plugs are important to the efficient performance of an automobile engine. Now, while you're having your spark plugs checked, it's a good idea to ask the Minuteman to look at your ignition cables, too. These cables are the small, fine wires which deliver electricity to the spark plugs. If any of them are broken or frayed or the insulation damaged, even brand new plugs won't help your driving. You see, old or damaged ignition cables leak electricity so that by the time the charge gets to the spark plug, there isn't enough juice left for the rich spark needed for instant firing. So to get full power out of old engines, ask the Union Oil Minute Man to check both spark plugs and ignition cables. Then you'll be sure of more power and better mileage. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 
and ask for Union Oil Ignition Service. Thank you. For the second time tonight, a phone call has been ended suddenly by a revolver shot. It is minutes later. Mike and Phyllis are standing on the sidewalk outside Phil's apartment house. Two men in white are lifting a limp body onto an ambulance stretcher. Mike, do you think he'll live? Well, the doctor says he will if they get him to the hospital quick enough. Mm. Even so, we won't be able to question him for days, and that may be too late. Not a soul in this crowd saw who did it. Somebody decided Savadell shouldn't talk to us. Yeah. Oh, if I had only listened to him when he tried to tell me something at Madame Turlow's. Or you at Leonor Burrill's. Well, if we just knew what he wanted to tell I us. I think I have a sneaking hunch on me. You have? Yep. Well, come on, Bright Eyes. We're going to phone Inspector Faraday and send out the invitations. Invitations? Mm Mm-hmm. To a midnight reunion at Madame Turlow's. The guest list will be very select and slightly dangerous. Uh, Good evening, Inspector. Hello, Inspector. You round up everybody? I did. They're in the living room. Come on in. Okay. That package under your arm, Mike, what is it? <laughs> patience, me lad, patience. Everything in due time. Mm, Mike, you tell me on the phone that Mackenzie was innocent and to release him. Well, I haven't. You mean you've got proof on him? Mackenzie came clear across the continent just to stop Madame Tolo from publishing that book. He admits he was going to bribe her secretary to steal the stuff for him. And Savadell placed him here at the house at or about the time of the killing. That's enough for me. Oh, uh, there's just one hitch, Inspector. What? Well, how about the killer trying to remove Savadell, too, at the very time you had uh, Mackenzie at headquarters? Say, that's right. Yeah. Uh, unless Savadell's ex-wife did it in a fit of anger. Mm. Oh, uh, Miss oh, Burrell, yeah. this is Mr. Shane. So, I understand I have you to thank for dragging me out at this unearthly hour. Yes, Miss Burrell. Oh. Uh, Mr. Buck, how are you? As well as could be expected. Phyllis, uh, will you look up those carbon papers now? Yeah, yeah, right away. I believe Inspector Faraday has told you of the shooting of uh, Maestro Savadell, so the first thing we want to know from both of you is, uh, where were you during the past hour? Well, I was at home, reading the newspaper story about tonight. Oh, an incomplete story, I'm afraid. And you, Miss Perrin? Also at home. When uh, Miss Knight left you and Savadell, or should I say, escaped from you, what happened? Nothing. You and Savadell had a fight. He accused you of killing Helen so he couldn't marry her. I told him I didn't, and he said truth. All right, all right, all right. Now, honey, how about the carbons? All checked. Madame Tillot was still working on the chapter, My Husband. And? We were right the first time. She's anything but flattering to Mr. Buck. Rubbish. She was very kind to me. Well, here's the carbon sheets. We found them on Madame's desk, and they were used only twice. I just held them up in front of my vanity mirror and read what she'd typed, and it was not flattering. Well, how was I to know that? I thought it was all favorable to me. Well, that's a minor issue now, anyway. The real key is Helen Smith, the secretary. How do you mean, Mike? Madame Turlow was against a marriage between Helen and Savadell. She told us it would never happen. Mm -hmm. Now, doesn't that strike any of of you as a little strange? Employers usually don't have such control over the lives of their secretaries. Okay, Mike, but get to the point. Ah, that is the point, Inspector. And now you wanted to know what I have in this package. Yeah, yeah. First, the music score we found in Madame Turlow's hand. A baritone aria from Rigoletto. The Cortigiane Virazzi. Pronunciation by courtesy of Miss Phyllis Knight. Thank Thank you, you, darling. And uh, next we have Phil's record album of the same opera. Angel, will you warm up the madam's phonograph for me? If you ask me, this is all very cheap and, and dramatic. Operatic is the word, Miss Borrell. You see, when Madame Turlow was shot, she made a dying effort to tell us who killed her and Helen, especially Helen. She tore a very special aria from the score of Rigoletto and a desperate gamble somebody would understand it. Mr. Shane, I don't believe you are the man to give us a course on opera appreciation. Well, we shall see, Miss Barrio. Photographs ready, Mike. Okay, darling. Now, uh, do you people know the plot of Rigoletto and what this aria means? Well, of course. I have sung Rigoletto. I'm afraid I have only a hazy idea. All right. This is the setup. A gang of the Duke's courtiers have just kidnapped a girl. Now this guy, Rigoletto, is cursing them. Now he's begging them to give her up, and they won't. Now he tells them the secret. The girl is his own daughter. Well, does that mean anything to you, Mr. Rill? Not a thing. You, Mr. Buck? I can't say that it does. Okay, then I'll put on the other record. Now, this is the end of the opera, the payoff. Miss Burrell, 
As an opera star, tell us what's happening on the stage right now. Why, Rigoletto had planned to kill his enemy, the Duke. Right. He has the body in a sack, and then he makes a discovery. Now, listen carefully, Mr. Buck. Rigoletto opens the sack and sees a girl's body. He cries, speak, oh, speak to me, my darling daughter. Oh, awful fate. By my hand, she hath fallen. Oh, what? What's that? What? My, my, my child. Helen was my child. Helen was Jelaine's daughter. Then, then Buck is her father? I, I didn't know. I didn't know. Yes, her father. And her murderer. <laughs> Are you feeling better? Ah, uh, Mr. Shan, to you, bigger congratulations. <laughs> Your work, bravo. She's the most brilliant. Well, thank you, Maestro. I thought I was pretty good myself. Good? Well, Buck could hardly add anything to his confession. He hadn't seen his daughter, Helen, since she was six years old. Buck says he just wanted to scare her. Madam, out of publishing her book. Helen tried to grab the gun. It went off. Then he had to shoot again. Mr. Savadell, you uh, had something you wanted to tell me privately. Now, can you talk now? Yes. Yes, I can. Tonight... I see Aria from Rigoletto in a madam's hand. Mm -hmm. The ideas have come to me. Maybe Helen is not often the way she's a think. Maybe she is the daughter of madame and Mr. Buck. The same idea Mr. Shane have, but I must tell in a private. Well, why under the sun would Jelaine Tello keep such a secret from her husband and her own daughter? We in the opera are strange people. Mm -hmm. Madame Tello live and breathe opera. She's a very dramatic. She's in a joy secret. Just like a storybook. Uh, speaking of operas, Angel, I noticed you've got another record album up at your apartment. Maybe if I studied it, I might get the answer to another problem. Mike, not another crime. Well, they're a different sort. It's uh, The Marriage of Figaro. Catch on, Miss Knight? Then, uh, Mr. <laughs> Shane, you must translate better than your Rigoletto. Huh? But just a minute ago, you were complimenting me See, about... See, only your thinking. But the audio, oh, no... I have never heard such a bad translation. Oh, my. <laughs> Dear, I was so proud of your learning and your culture. Well, what about you? You didn't correct me. You're supposed to be the highbrow in this partnership. Oh, I am. Opera, music, books, poetry, reviews. Climb down off that pedestal, you fake. Why, Michael <laughs> Shane, I... Phil, there's only one book a man wants a woman to review. I know, I know. A cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Even the busiest detectives can't always be detecting. And on this late Saturday afternoon, we find Mike Shane and his pretty assistant, Phyllis Knight, driving through the timber country high up near the Nevada border. They're on their way to keep an important date, a date with a wedding. 
but no, not theirs. It's the wedding of Betty Harrison, daughter of the timber tycoon, and Mike has been unwillingly dragged along to help Phil carry out her social obligations. You know, I ought to have my head examined coming way out here to see two people I don't know get married. Oh, Mike. Betty was my closest friend at finishing school. Yeah, but I only finished uh, high school. Now, where do I fit into this high society stuff? Michael, it's a quiet wedding. We're the only guests. And I'm supposed to hold the bridegroom's fevered head? Mike, where is your romance? Romance, I've got, Angel. But when it comes to rice and orange blossoms, I'm strictly allergic. Mm -hmm. You're hopeless. Hey, look. Look, there's the Harrison place. Place, you say? That, my love, is quite a shack. And there's Betty. There's Betty waiting for us. Yeah, say, honey, that, that guy with her looks familiar. Huh? Mike, that's Inspector Faraday. In the flesh, and that spells trouble. Betty? Betty? Phyllis. Phyllis, I'm so glad you've come. Oh, you look wonderful. Me too. Betty, this is Mike Shane. Hello. I'm pleased to meet you. Well, I'll be. Mike and Phyllis. Say, Inspector, aren't you early with your vacation? No, I'm here on business, Mike. Mr. Harrison phoned me. Said he was leaving on the second section of 98. That he transferred to his own private trainer for me to meet him here. Father wasn't planning to come up for the wedding. Then all of a sudden, I get a wire that he is. Well, that must be Harrison's train now. Yes, it runs up to a little station behind the house. Well, then why don't we walk over and meet it, huh? Let's. Father will be surprised. Betty, hey, where's the bridegroom? Don should have been here by now. Oh, bridegrooms are always late. Those last three hours. You be hey. quiet. Betty! Oh, there's Don coming now. Hey, he's a bit of all right. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I'm late. I had a flat tire. Oh, Don, dearest, this is Phyllis Knight, Hello. Mr. Shane, Mr. Faraday, Don Manchester, my fiancé. How do you do? Hello, there. How are you? Well, there she is, a coming around the mountain. You know, this is something yeah, to see, an engine train. pulling one coach. <laughs> they <laughs> dropped the lumber cars off at Camp Junction. Oh. Hey, look. There, there's somebody getting off. Oh, that's Mr. Oliver, father's business associate. Oh, that's Mr. Miller getting off the back platform. I still don't see Mr. Harrison. No. Oh, Mr. Oliver. Oh, hello, Betty. Where's father? Oh, as usual, in his private compartment. Hasn't even stepped out since we left Northwood City. He's probably napping again. Oh, he certainly was fine company. Well, I'm going up to the house. Yeah, that's one happy character. Let's climb aboard and get farther. Sort of like a welcoming committee, mm -hmm. huh? Okay. Uh, Inspector, watch mm -hmm. your lumbago on these steps. Never mind my lumbago, Mike. <laughs> watch out for those fallen arches of yours. Oh, oh get oh, him. Oh, man. <laughs> Here's father's compartment. I'll sneak in and shout boo. Father! Something's wrong. What is it? What is it? Father! It's Harrison stretched out on the floor. Oh, Betty's fainting. Here, put her on that couch, Don. Wait a minute. Rub her wrist. Wait a minute. I'll get some water. Well, Inspector, how's Mr. Harrison? He's dead, Mike. Looks like a heart attack. Uh-huh. Maybe so, Inspector, but this heart attack has had a little help. What are you talking about? About murder, Inspector. Froth on the lips and dilated eyes don't spell a heart attack. Somebody slipped Mr. Harrison a nice big slug of poison. <laughs> Mike, get Betty up to the house all right? Yes, Inspector. Phil and Don are taking care of her. You still think Mr. Harrison was poisoned? I know so, Inspector. Look at his neck, stiff, and his jaws locked, eyes wide open and staring. Mm -hmm. I've got a little plan, Inspector. Would you like to try it? You know me, Mike. Well, look, no one knows we suspect murder, and whoever pulled this job figured on a local doc calling it a heart attack. So? Now, you take Harrison's body into Northwood City, along with that thermos of coffee we found by him. While you're checking for poison, Uncle Shane here will keep his big o ears open here. All right, honey, how's Betty? Oh, she's a little better, Mike. She's sleeping now. Oh, the poor kid. Say, uh, what was that Betty said about her father not coming up for her wedding? Well, originally, he didn't like the idea of her marrying. But she was going to go through with it anyway? Yes. Then Mr. Harrison changed his mind, that's all. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Mike, when you start double-talking, I get worried. Angel, look, there were three men on that private train making a 50-mile trip. Now, come to the end of the line, what happens? Well, I'm listening, Mike. Miller gets off the back platform and scoots. Oliver hops off the front and goes away mad. And we go aboard and find Mr. Harrison dead. Uh-huh, that's it. This Mr. Harrison is the big boss, honey. You'd think those other two would wait for him, sociable-like. Oh, it's probably just a coincidence, Mike. Uh, and is it a coincidence that Faraday is here? 
On business. All right, all right, mastermind. So what do you make of it? Uh Uh-uh, Angel. A good detective works from facts, so let's go get some. Facts? Where? Where, Mike? Mr. Miller's room is at the end of this hallway. Let's stop in and say hello, huh? Oh, I hope you know what you're doing. Yeah, Hebby, too. Here's his room. I'll knock. There's no answer, Mike. So, being friendly people, we'll go in and wait. Well, you can't just barge into somebody... Why not? The door's not locked. Come on, come on. Mike, I don't like this. Well, now, don't you worry your pretty head. Wow, the remains of a fire in the fireplace. I always love to poke around ashes. Now, let's see. Those look like letters. Mm -hmm. Letters they were. Letters to Betty. Well, she's asleep in her room. While someone conveniently burns her mail. Mike, let's get out of here. What's the matter, Angel? There's just us two. That's where you're wrong. Mike. Huh? Well, well, Mr. Miller... And with a nice shiny gun. We don't like snoopers around here. Get going. Uh, just a mistake, Miller. Just a mistake. That kind of mistake isn't healthy. Get out while you're still lucky. Sure. By coincidence, we were just leaving. Come on, Angel. Right away. The gentleman doesn't like our type. And I'm afraid the feeling is very mutual. <laughs> These couple of scraps I took from Miller's fireplace don't help much, honey. Well, I can't understand why anyone would burn Betty's letters from her father. Mm. Oh, well. Yeah, plenty of books around. Michael, after all, this room is the library. Encyclopedia? Modern timber methods? Look, honey, here's a book, Famous Scotland Yard Murder Cases. Well, that ought to help you, Mike. And here's a bookmark. In the section on poisons. Mike, here comes Don. Mr. Oliver's with him. Huh? Mr. Shane. Well, what's up, Don? I told Mr. Oliver you're a detective. He wants to talk to you. <laughs> yes, uh, something quite confidential. Miss Knight is my assistant. Oh, never I... mind. Never mind. I'll go look up a sandwich. Okay, dear. All right, Oliver. Now, what's the trouble? Mr. Shane, I want protection. Protection from what? Miller. He threatened my life on the train. Oh, what happened? Well, shortly after Miller came aboard Mr. Harrison's private train at Northwood City, I discovered him going through some of Mr. Harrison's private papers. Then what? We had an argument, and he drew a gun on me. What is Miller's position in the company? Frankly, I don't know. He's on Harrison's personal payroll. And Betty's been rather worried. She felt that Mr. Miller had some sort of a hold on her father. Yes, that's it exactly. It was a very suspicious relationship. And uh, you want me to do what? Watch Miller every minute. He's dangerous. Mike? Yes, honey? Mike? Yes? A telephone call for you here in the den. Oh, okay. Expect okay. Faraday. All right. Okay, Phil, close the door. All right. Hello, Faraday. Well, what's the dope? Yeah? Well, that might help. Oh, sure, sure, they're all here. Don't worry, I'll be careful. Okay, Inspector, hurry back. So long. What did he say, Mike? I was right, honey, 100% right. Harrison was loaded with strychnine. Well, then it, it was murder. And that's not all. I heard the click of an extension phone... There are extensions all over the house, Mike. Someone listened. We're keeping company with the murderer, honey. And the trouble is, we don't know who he is. But he knows we're looking for him. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Dirty or burned-out spark plugs can cost you a lot of gasoline. In fact, as much as one tank full out of ten. Now, that's a serious loss in mileage, particularly so when it's unnecessary. Your neighborhood Union Oil Minuteman is equipped to give you complete spark plug service. The performance of each plug is accurately measured on a special tester, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minuteman will clean and re-gap them to the proper setting. If they're burned or worn out, he can furnish you with correct replacements. Then you'll not only save gasoline, but your engine will run smoother. Union Oil Spark Plug service takes but a few minutes and costs but a few cents, a cost you'll soon save in extra mileage. So, friends, if it's been 3,000 miles or more since your spark plugs were checked, or if your engines seem to be rough and listless, drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. And ask for Union Oil Spark Plug Service. It will make driving easier. Gas coupons go farther.
It is a few minutes later. Mike and Phil have learned that what started out as a happy wedding has turned into a grim case of murder by poison. We find them walking rapidly towards the station behind the Harrison's house. The murdered man's private coach is still there on its siding, made almost invisible by the tall trees which turn the weak moonlight into gloomy shadows. Come on, honey. I'm hurrying as fast as I can. I want to see if that briefcase is still in the car. Inspector Faraday remembered that Harrison mentioned some important papers he was bringing up with him. Well, then whoever was listening on the extension, they know about it, too. Right, and I want first crack at that briefcase. Hey, maybe you do, Mike, but so does someone else. Yeah, flashlight. In Harrison's private car. Maybe it's the murderer. Hang on, honey, we'll find out. Mike, there he is at the end of the car. Hey, honey, look out! Mike, Mike, did he hit you? No, no, a clean miss. Oh, he got away out the front. Could you see who it was? No, a flashlight in my eyes. Well, we'll catch up with him sooner or later. Oh. Let's go look over the compartment. Here it is, the briefcase. Oh, what a break for us. We frightened him away without the case. Uh, uh, sorry, honey, bad guess. The lock on the briefcase has been forced open. Oh, and whoever was here opened it and got what he wanted. Correct. Now, here's some papers. Business letters, checkbook, some kind of a report. Honey! What's the matter? This report. It's from the Atlas outfit. Atlas? Uh-huh. The, the detective agency in Los Angeles? Sure, sure. Listen to this. On the basis of our completed investigation, you have sufficient grounds to instigate criminal action against Z. Z? Evidently, Harrison didn't want the name mentioned. Well, Mr. Harrison was certainly checking up on somebody. And getting ready for the kill. I'll bet that's why Inspector Faraday's here. Mike, this is the motive for the murder. All we have to do is find out if Miller or Oliver is the Z in that report, and we've got the murderer. Partly right, Angel, partly. But I'd say it was better this way. Find out which one of them is Z, and the other guy is the killer. Huh? I don't get it, Mike. Look, Angel, look. The murderer listened in on my my telephone conversation with Faraday. He heard the inspector tell me about this briefcase, and he knew it held evidence that could hang him. Well, of course. That's why he dashed down here. Right, Angel. He beat us to the briefcase, and yet this report is here for us to find. Oh, oh. You see? Mm -hmm. He wanted us to find this report, and that means the killer isn't Mr. Z. As soon as we get back to the house, I'll send a telegram to the Atlas people. Okay, but these high heels don't go very well with forests. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. Yeah, I heard. There's someone on that other path. Freeze behind this tree. All right. Whoever it is, he's walking fast. He's going past. No, he isn't. Hey, you hold it. Hey, what the... Mike. Yeah. Mike, it's Miller. Yeah. I say... Now, what's the big idea of roughing me? I just want to ask you a few friendly questions, Oh, Tom. now, look here. First, about a gun that took a couple of shots at us. Oh, you're off the beam. I'm not carrying a gun. No? Well, don't mind me. I'll just search. Oh, go ahead. Well? Well, Mike? No, no gun. But you could have ditched it easy enough. Oh, Miss Knight, Mr. Shane. It's done. Well, what's the hurry, Don? Uh, I was out for a walk. Is something wrong? Plenty. I'm glad you're here. Oh, I don't understand. Yeah, Shane. How about you doing some explaining? Okay. Mr. Harrison was murdered. What? Murdered? But why? Who? That's what we're finding out. Miller, you're on the spot and it's plenty hot. Are you saying I killed Harrison? He was poisoned on that coach and you and Oliver were the only ones aboard. Oh, that doesn't prove a thing. It proves there's a 50-50 chance that you're it. Listen, smart guy. Your mathematics aren't so good. There were three of us on that train. Sure, sure. But only you and Oliver walked off. I don't mean Harrison. Somebody else got on that coach. Oh, now we have the ever-present uh, mysterious third party. Oh, not so mysterious. He's standing right next to you. All right, Don. That means you. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Shane, I did get on Mr. Harrison's train at Mill Junction. Well, Shane, guess I can be running along while you turn the heat on him. Uh, not so fast. I still think you know some of the answers. You know, maybe I do. And maybe I might just do a little talking to the right party. And when it will do me the most good. You're sticking your chin out a mile. This is murder. Well, I'll be around, resting in my room. No, I don't trust him at all. Yeah? But you're still right in the middle of this, Don. 
You were on that death train. Oh, but I only stayed a minute. You see, Mr. Harrison was asleep, and I didn't want to disturb him. Which still doesn't explain why you drove out of your way from Northwood City to meet the train at the junction. Oh, it's a very personal matter. Look, Don, look, a man has been murdered. Wait, why should I want to kill my future father-in-law? Harrison wasn't too happy about you marrying his daughter. But he changed his mind. That's why he sent me a telegram this afternoon, asking me to meet his train. Oh, and what kind of a telegram might that be? Well, I have it right here. Read it for yourself. Here, honey. Huh? I'll hold the flashlight. All right, honey. Wait a minute. Um, Don, have changed my mind. Happy to have you as son-in-law. Meet my train at Camp Junction. We'll ride in together. Much to talk over. Harrison. Sounds all right. Let me see you, Angel. Here. Yeah, from Northwood City at 3.20 today. Yeah, I wish I could help in some way. Yeah, sure, but... Hey, what was that? It's a window. Someone lowered it. That's Mr. Oliver's room. Mike, he must have heard everything. Yeah, something tells me we'll be hearing his little story very soon. That's right. The telegram is to the Atlas Detective Agency, Los Angeles. Uh, this is it. Please advise immediately. Name of Z. Yes, Z, the last letter in the alphabet. Name of Z in report to Harrison. Right. Sign that Michael Shane. That's right. Send it right out, please. And phone the reply here to me at Harrison's place. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, the answer to that telegram should mean a lot, Mike. Well, it'll help, darling. But there's some angles I don't get. Miller is a mysterious employee of Harriet Harrison's, all very hush-hush. Oliver's scared stiff of Miller... And Don goes walking around in the moonlight right after somebody takes a shot at us. Oh, you can't blame him for that, Mike. Here the night before his wedding and his future father-in-law is poisoned. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. But there's one thing we do know. There's a killer here. Well, there's a car outside. That must be Inspector Faraday and in a big hurry. It's too bad you haven't the murderer all signed, sealed, and ready to deliver. Now, Angel, now sarcasm doesn't become you. Well, well Mike, Phil... How goes the home front? Oh, quite a few interesting details for you, Inspector. Whatever you're figuring, Mike, forget it. Uh Oh, that means the Inspector knows something. Plenty. While you two were taking it easy, I cracked this case wide open. Yeah? Well, give. Who's the murderer? Miller. Miller? Sure. I thought his face had a familiar profile, so I checked on him with headquarters. And found what? He's got a record a mile long. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I'll be willing to wager it's for blackmail. That's right. But how did you know? Inspector, are you forgetting? Mike is smart. All right. I hope Miller's still around. He said he'd be in his room. Good, let's go pick him up. Okay, let's go. Well, Mr. Shane, it looks like Faraday beat us to it this time. Oh, he's just a good man, honey. (laughs) Tell me, what's the line on Miller? All the usual stuff. Hires out as a private investigator and then turns the information he picks up into blackmail. Wow, cute boy. That racket should put him in clover. Yeah, but this time, Mike, it'll put him right in the middle of the lethal chamber at San Quentin. Ooh. Here's Miller's room. Yeah, no need to knock, Mike. Just open it up. Okay, here goes. Miller, we want you... Say, what? Well, there's your man, Inspector. You can take him in. But unfortunately, he's very dead. We'll return to Mike Shane and his adventures in just a moment. It's true that clean spark plugs make a difference in engine performance and gasoline mileage. But it's also true that even the finest spark plugs cannot fire properly if the ignition cables are defective. These cables are the small, fine wires which carry the electricity from the distributor to the spark plugs. They should be carefully inspected whenever your spark plugs are checked because old or damaged ignition cables leak electricity which means that only a thin, weak spark reaches the plugs. So to get new performance out of old engines, ask the Union Oil Minuteman to check both spark plugs and ignition cables. Then you'll be sure of more power and better mileage. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Ignition Service. Thank you. Phyllis, Mike, and Inspector Faraday have just burst into Miller's room, only to find him dead, shot through the heart. 
This new development has put quite a crimp in the inspector's plans, and Mike is pointing this fact out to him. Looks like you were wrong about Miller, Inspector. At least wrong about his being the murderer. Miller could still have been the one who bumped off Harris and then somebody took care of him. Well, that would leave us with two killers. Well, could be, but it doesn't stack up that way. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to take Oliver in and charge him with murder. Okay, so you're charging with murder. But how are you going to make it a stick, Inspector? How about motive? What, what evidence do you have? Oh, two and two make four, Mike. Harrison must have been poisoned on that private train. So it had to be Oliver. There's Miller lying there, absolutely eliminated. All fine and good, but it leads us to one other little item. Don was on that train, too. Don? Betty's fiancé? Mike, you saw the telegram Mr. Harrison sent him. Don couldn't have been the murderer. In this business, honey, we've got to figure every suspect guilty until we know they're innocent. Yeah, Mike's right. Oh, Phil, would you step into the other room and phone the coroner down at Northwood City? Yeah, yeah, sure, Inspector. I'll give him your compliment. You know, this business is beginning to make sense. The one who poisoned Harrison had to get rid of Miller because he knew too much. Miller said he might do some talking when the right time came. Well, Mike, for my money, Oliver fits into the picture. He's our man, and I'll get some evidence out of him. Oh, I'm sure he knows Inspector. plenty, but... Yeah. Inspector, I tried to call the coroner, but the telephones are dead. Uh-oh, the wires have been cut. Well, that don't make much difference. Oh, yes, it will, Inspector. You see, I'm expecting a reply to a telegram I just sent, a very important telegram. About this case? Yes, sir, in connection with the detective agency's report to Mr. Harrison. The answer to that why might be just what we need. Oh, now that the phones are dead, what are we going to do? Do? Simple, darling. The inspector will sit tight here while you and I go for a nice moonlight ride back to Northwood City. There it is. There's the telegraph office just on the other side of the tracks. Okay, I'll park the bus here. Now, watch it. Easy crossing these tracks, honey. Oh, thanks for the tip, old boy. But you could have carried me. Huh? (laughs) More trains. Yeah, this is the main line from San Francisco. Isn't this the place where Harrison transferred to his private train? Correct. Well, here's the telegraph office. Folks, can I help you? Uh, Yes, I'm Mike Shane. I'm expecting a wire from Los Angeles. Mm, Shane, let me see... Yeah, your telegram's coming in now. I'll have it for you in just a minute. Okay. Look, Mike. Hmm? There's another. The train just pulled in. Now, that's 820, miss. Only stops for a few minutes. 820? Well, it's late. It's 835 now. Nope. Train's on time. That there's the second section of the 820. Oh. So many people traveling, huh? Yep. Too many. That's why they run two sections. Like this afternoon, the second section of 98 came in at 340 with a whole parcel of folks. Is that right? You know, honey, that's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, of course it is. Isn't it? What are you staring at me that way for? Well, here's the telegram, mister. Oh, swell, swell. Oh, come on, come on. Who was Mr. Z in that report? Well, this does it, honey. This does it. That Z is nobody else but Oliver. Oliver? Then Faraday's right. No, Angel. Faraday isn't right. Oliver wasn't Harrison's murderer. But uh, come on back to Harrison's place for a little meeting of the minds with Inspector Faraday. <laughs> All right, is uh, everybody coming? Yeah, they're coming, Mike. I told Betty and Don, Oliver. Good girl, good girl. Now, uh, now to open these French windows. There. Okay, Faraday, now out on the porch with you. Right, Mike. Phil, drape that beautiful body in that chair. Oh, thank you. Yes, hello, Lord Master. Well, here comes Betty and Don. Oh, hello. I'm sorry it was necessary to bother you. Don and I understand. I'm glad to help in any way, Mr. Shane. Thanks, Don. Come over here. Stand by me out of range. <laughs> Certainly, but... Uh, out of range. I don't understand. Now, what is all this rigmarole about in the middle of the night? There's nothing to get excited about, Oliver. I asked Miss Knight to call you downstairs for a conference. A conference? About what? About mysterious happenings around here, but particularly about why Harrison had you investigated by a detective agency. Hmm? Mr. Shane, what do you mean? I mean you've been cheating the Harrison Timber Company out of thousands of dollars. Oh, that's ridiculous. Why, Mr. Harrison trusted me implicitly. He did, until he finally caught up with you. That's why he was going to turn you over to Inspector Faraday today. I won't listen to this. There's no proof. There's plenty of proof, all written down in black and white. What's more, you knew Harrison had you dead to rights. That's why you poisoned him. You're mad. I never killed anyone. It's no use, Oliver. You're hooked like a fish. I didn't murder him. You can't frame me. he's running. He's running towards that window. Oh, stop him. No, Don, no. Drop that gun. That's better. 
You knocked the gun out of my hand. You let Oliver get away. Oh, no, no. Here comes the inspector. And he's got our friend Oliver by the well-known collar. Oh, Here no. he is, Mike. Squirm in, but safe and sound. I didn't do it. I'm innocent. Take him in, Faraday. You've got enough on him to make it stick and stick hard. Yes, he's a dead duck. Oh, Mr. Shane, I can't believe Mr. Oliver would kill my father. But, uh... He didn't, Betty. What? Well, you just told the inspector to take him in. Sure, Don. I'm taking Oliver in for theft. But for Mr. Harris's murder, we'll take you. Me? Oh, wh- what are you saying? Sorry, Betty. Don wanted to marry you in the worst way. He married a couple of other girls with wealthy parents. Oh, Betty, don't listen to when him. When your father suddenly wired he was coming up, Don knew it was the showdown. That's ridiculous. Oh, no, no, no. You had a hunch Harrison engaged Miller to investigate It's him. a lie. You saw the telegram Mr. Harrison sent me just this afternoon. Sure, Don, sure. You got a telegram. A telegram you sent to yourself. All you did was slip over to the Northwood City, wait until the train pulled in, and then send that telegram to your own address and sign Harrison's name. Oh, nothing but lies. No, lies. no, 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 son. It's a fact, a fact that we can prove. Because you made a mistake, a bad mistake, Don. You saw the train pull into Northwood City and thought that Harrison was on it. But you didn't know that there were two sections of that train today and that Harrison was on the second section. You sent that telegram 20 minutes before Harrison got there. <laughs> Hmm? You know, it's wonderful to be getting back home, here by the Golden Gate. Oh, I like it. You know, honey, one of these days they're going to put up a statue for me, right on Market Street. Oh, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it at all. You're such a genius. <laughs> well, maybe not a genius, but quick with the answers, mm. huh? Speaking of answers, there's hmm? a couple you still owe me. Oh, please, honey, no more Now, questions. remember, remember, Mike, that statue to a genius? Okay, okay, shoot me the question. When did you know for sure that Don was the murderer? When we found Miller shot, of course. Why then? Don't you remember, honey, when we caught uh, up with Miller sneaking back to the house from Harrison's private train, he said he would talk to the right person when it would do him the most good? Yeah, yeah, I thought he meant Faraday. Oh, no, no, no. Our blackmailing friend was talking right through us to the only other party there, which meant Don. He was throwing out a hint for a payoff. Well, of course I know, but how about... That's all, honey, please. That's all. Positively all. And hold on to your hat because I'm turning. Just a minute. This isn't the way to the office. You're turning into Golden Gate Park. Ha-ha! Is that bad? Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. If some of you have wondered where Mike Shane has been during regular office hours the past few days, you'll find the answer on the front page of this evening's San Francisco papers. That's right, the murder trial of Jack Holmes. At this moment, which is along about 6.30, Phyllis Knight has one of those newspapers spread out on the desk before her. As she glares at the headlines, Mike is talking on the phone to Inspector Faraday. 
Yeah, Faraday, yeah, I just got back from court. Didn't take the jury long to decide. Less than two hours, Mark. That boy is no more guilty than I am. Sure, somebody killed the watchman, but not Jack Holmes. Now, don't take it so hard, Mike, just because his sweetheart hired you to investigate. All right, all right. Maybe I'm sentimental about those two kids, but I say Jack Holmes isn't the killer type. And with a nice girl like Janet Miley... Oh, Faraday, Faraday, I let him down, and Janet was so certain I could take help him. Take it easy, Mike. You did your best, but the evidence was against you. Yeah, sure, you're sure it was. Is that unusual? Why, I've cleared dozens of guys when it looked like... Janet, like... what's wrong? Hello. Hello, Mike. I'll talk to you later, Faraday. The girl's just walked in. Janet, are you sick? You're white as a sheet. Here, get her some water, honey, quick. Yeah. Mr. Shane. Yes? Jackie. Yeah? Jackie. Oh, here, here, sit down, honey. Let me help you. Oh, the poor kid. She's all unstrung about the verdict. No, it's more than that. Her hands are like ice. He didn't do it. I just discovered what? the grocery. What? Janet, what are you trying to say, honey? My room. Somebody went through. Huh? Oh, oh, Janet. Here, here, Janet. Drink this water. Janet. 12, 15. I, I just discovered I went and told him the thought he would... Oh. Mike. Mike, she's fainted. I'm going to call a doctor. Phyllis. Yeah? Call Inspector Faraday. She's dead. Okay, Mike, I fixed it. We can go to Jack's cell now. All right, all right. Now, remember, honey, not a word about Janet's death. Jack will go all to pieces and we'll learn nothing. I know, I know, but it seems so hard-hearted. This way, kids. Ah, oh, boy. Sad business, I guess the girl figured after that jury's verdict she didn't have anything left to live for. Suicide? Uh-uh. No, no. If Janet found something she thought would clear Jack, she certainly wouldn't take poison. Unless she took the poison before she got the information that would clear Jack. Hmm? No, then she would have called the doctor. If we can believe her dying words, she went first to some man, told him her discovery, then came to us. She didn't even know she was poisoned. All right, but who did it? We only knew what she was trying to tell us. Better pipe down. That's Jack's cell with a jailer standing outside. Oh, yes, sir. Now let me do most of the talking. All right, Morrissey. Open it up. Yes, Inspector. Hello, Jack. Hello. How do you feel, Jack? Oh, top of the world. It's so cheering to be condemned to death for a crime you didn't commit. You had a fair trial, my boy. The jury could decide only on the evidence presented. I told them I left the warehouse that night way before it happened. At 12.15, I was at home. But no, they take the word of that cab driver. He did pick you up at the warehouse door, and he said the clock in the drugstore read a quarter past twelve. I checked the clock myself the next day. It was an electric, right on time. So did I, Jack. Unless the cab driver was lying, and he seemed like an honest guy. I see. Even my loyal detective, Mr. Shane, says I'm guilty. Oh, no. No, Jack, you don't understand. Go ahead. Say I killed the watchman. Say I stole the diamonds. You never were working for Janet and me. Yes, we were, Jack, and we still are. That's why we're here. It's about Janet. She's not so good. What? What are you trying to say? She came to the office a little while ago and tried to tell us something, some new evidence she had found, but, well, she got sick. What's wrong? Is she all right? Where is she? Now, easy, son, easy. She's still at the office. She said a lot of mixed-up things, Jack. Her room had been ransacked, something about a grocery that you weren't guilty, and she had discovered proof and told him so. Him? Who's him? Oh, that's what we don't know. Did, uh, uh, does Janet have any close men friends she might go to? Not that I know of. We've been engaged for almost a year now. She never mentioned any. Our boss, Mr. Phillips, is a good friend of both of us. Yes, yeah, he's paying the fee on the case. She might have gone to him. Or maybe to his partner. Mr. Russell? Oh, no. Not that old crap. Well, why come to me? Janet's the one to tell you. Well, as we said, Jack, she's all busted up over this thing and... She isn't well. Well, she can talk, can't she? she? Can she? Jack. I can see it in your faces. Something's happened to her. What is it? Tell me. She... She's dead, isn't she? We're awfully sorry, son. <laughs> Why, 
I, I see you went out to my home, Mr. Shane. That's right, Mr. Phillips, and your wife told us you were working at the office this evening. Yes, Russell and I spent so many days in court on the trial. We had to work evenings to keep up with business. Now, oh. I wouldn't imagine there'd be such a turnover in the wholesale jewelry line. You'd be surprised. Our firm cuts and mounts gems for at least half the better jewelry stores in the city. And the robbery and loss of the diamonds didn't hurt your trade. It would have, Inspector, except for the capture and trial of Jack Holmes. Of course, we're covered by insurance. If you'll step into the office. Oh, Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Yes, Bauer? May I see you a moment, sir? Uh, yes, excuse me, please. Uh, go right into the office. Okay, sure. Thank you. Well, good evening, Mr. Russell. Miss Russell? Good evening. I uh, believe you and your sister know Inspector Faraday. Of course. Yes. How are you, Inspector? Fair enough, thanks. So the lady executives work nights around this company, too. If she's the treasurer, she does. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. And now, Mr. Shane, I suppose you'd like your fee, now that nothing more can be done for poor Jack. Well, I'd hardly bring Inspector Faraday along just to collect the check, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> well, I assume... The case is cracked wide open again. Janet Miley has just died. What? Janet? She was poisoned. She staggered into our office about an hour ago, gasped out a few words, and she died. I was afraid of this. Remember, Ann, I said to you, if the jury brought in a guilty verdict... It wasn't there was no... suicide, Mr. Russell. I said she was poisoned. Poisoned? Her dying words were that she'd found new evidence, and that she had gone to him, some man, and told him. Well, of course, she came to me, but she didn't say anything about evidence. What time was this, Mr. Phillips? About six o'clock. He was crying and hysterical. Begged me to help Jack to get a retrial or an appeal. I tried to comfort her. Excuse me, Mr. Phillips, but I thought you'd like these invoices. I'm very busy, Mr. Bauer. Oh, yes, sir. I'll leave them here on the desk. If Jim had found any new evidence, it'd hardly be likely to clear Jack Holmes. I'm pretty well convinced that young man is a born criminal. Mr. Russell, that's unfair. Is it? Look at the court testimony. Phillips and I found shorties in Jack's account books. We called him back to the office that night to explain he couldn't. Said he wanted to spend the night checking back through his records. Phillips and I left. Next thing we know, 1,300 carats worth of diamonds are missing. Night watchman's found dead. You never found the diamonds? Of course not. He hid them. I'm afraid it's true. The watchman's clock was smashed. It stopped at 12.10. The cab driver picked up Jack at 12.15. Uh, Mr. Bauer, would you mind leaving the room? Oh, oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. He's new here. Bauer is the nosiest secretary I've ever hired. I oh, know. now I remember. Remember what? Well, I was in the outer office this evening. When Janet came out of this room, Bauer stopped her. I heard him say something about going out to a bar and having a little chat. I'm going to call him back. A bar, eh? Do you suppose the poison was slipped into a drink? Mr. Bauer. Oh, Mr. Bauer, hold on. Stop. Hey, Inspector, what? what's wrong? He's running for the front door. He's running. <laughs> We'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Week in and week out, a lot of motorists go along wondering why their engines lack power without realizing that much of their trouble may be due to dirty or worn-out spark plugs. Yes, that's right. Defective or worn spark plugs are to blame for a great deal of poor engine performance. For example, engineering tests show that faulty spark plugs can waste one tankful of gasoline out of every ten, which not only cuts down your mileage, but causes your engine to lose power. So, friends, if it's been 3,000 miles or more since your spark plugs were checked, or if your engine has been losing power, it's a pretty safe bet that the Union Oil Minuteman Spark Plug Service can do you some good. Union Oil Spark Plug Inspection is scientifically performed. The condition of each plug is carefully measured on a special machine, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minute Man will clean and adjust them. Or if new plugs are indicated, he can quickly install them. The cost of this service is only a few cents per plug, and you'll soon save that in extra mileage. You'll find Union Oil Minute Man ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. <laughs> While Inspector Faraday hurries off in pursuit of the fleeing Secretary Bauer, Mike and Phyllis have set off on an errand of their own. And now in the hallway of a certain apartment house. Oh, here we are. 
Oh, that's telling it here. My cat secretary, Bauer, he's tied into this somehow. Mm-hmm. Snooping around to hear what we said and then running from the inspector. Well, I'll leave that problem to Faraday, will you? Well, the place looks all in order. Hey, wait a minute, honey, it's for bed. It's not made up, it's cut to pieces. Yeah, the stuffing pulled out of the mattress. What on earth were they looking for? Let's go here, let me see. Oh, the bathroom. Mike, look at the medicine cabinet. And the floor. Uh Uh-huh. Bottles and jars scattered all over the place. Every one of them with its top or Look at this cold cream jar. Here, the cream's been scooped out and dropped all over the basin. Huh? Oh, that's an old trick, honey. Hiding gems in a woman's makeup. Mike, you don't think Jet... That she had the diamond. Huh? Somebody thought so. Maybe she did. No. No, that guess that. That's too dizzy. Well, come on, let's check the other room again. Here. Yeah, there's something worth looking into. A desk. Yeah. Somebody else found it, too. Drawers yanked out. Everything's a mess. I doubt if there's anything left for us, but I'll double check. Still searching. No. No, just the usual stuff. Say, how about that wastebasket, honey? How about it? Here. Put huh? in my thumb and pulled out a plum. What a big girl am I? Yeah. Our checks one in half. Mm-hmm. Pay to the order of Janet Miley. Two thousand dollars. And signed by Well, I'll be a Anne Elizabeth Russell. I think this note went with it, Mike. It's the same handwriting. Janet, take this and do as I say. And that's all. Take this and do as I say. Which apparently Janet did not. $2,000 is a rather expensive no thanks. Well, stuff this in your purse, Angel. We're about to go places and ask questions. You know, if you ask me, Shh, Miss honey, Russell... Quiet. What? Hmm? Please, the door quick. Snap out the lights. Yeah. Or flatten against the wall. I'll jump him when he comes in. No, the All right, buddy. Come on, up with your hands. What? Let go of me, you dope. What? Faraday. You? Yeah, me. Oh, I thought you were chasing Bauer. I got away. I phoned Phillips for Bauer's home address. Turned out to be a gas station. Oh, a phony, eh? Well, we've got a lead that may be better. Come on, let's go. Give the doorbell another push, Mike. You know, I wish these people would stay put. First we go to their homes, but they're working at the office. Now they're not at the office, they're home. Somebody's coming now. Yes? Oh, it's you again. Don't strain your enthusiasm, Mr. Russell. May we come in? Uh, yes. Mr. Russell, we would like to talk to your sister. And? Oh, well, she's upstairs. Will you ask her to come down, please? Yes, if you'll go into the living room. And? Oh, Anne, will you come downstairs? May I ask what you people want? Oh, you'll hear it. Oh, by the way, sir, I believe your sister is treasurer of your company? She is. For how long? Six or seven years. How long was Janet Miley with your firm? Mm, Several years. She worked in the same department with Jack Holmes. Look here, I insist on knowing what this is about. Alfred? In here, Anne. Oh, so you're all back. Yes, these people say they want to talk to you, Anne. Phyllis, uh, give me that check and note. Ready and waiting. Miss Russell, would you look at this note and check, please? So Janet gave them to you. What did she tell you? Right now, I'm more interested in what you told her. What was Janet to do for your $2,000? Two thousand. And what's the meaning of this? I was merely trying to save you from yourself, brother dear. Save me? I've watched you for a long time, Alfred. What is... I saw the way you were mooning around Janet. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, don't you? I know you proposed marriage to the girl... And now with Jack out of the way, you thought she'd say yes. But I'm not going to have another woman in this organization. I have trouble enough as it is. That doesn't explain the $2,000, Miss Russell. Of course it does. I offered her the money to get out of town and not come back. And what right had you? You're not running my life. Well, this puts a new slant on everything. Could be that Russell wanted Jack out of the way so he could have a clear track with Janet. Uh The diamond robbery might have been conveniently arranged. That's a lie. If Miss Russell didn't want her brother to marry Janet and the girl wouldn't buy off, then perhaps Big Sister thought of another way out. You mean the poison route, Phil? (laughs) 
I'll tell you. You, you little... Uh, 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 you mustn't. I know some naughty names, too. Oh, surely, Mr. Shane, you've got some brains. You don't believe such insane twaddle. Are you referring to my colleagues, Miss Russell, or to your story? No. It could be possible oh. you and your brother Alfred have been uh, putting on a little act for us. I'll answer that remark, Mr. Shane, but right now you're wanted on the phone. What? Oh, thanks. Hello? Mr. Shane, this is Power. Yeah? I've got to see you at once. What? Where are you? Listen, I have the real dope on the murder. Meet me at the old Dutch windmill in Golden Gate Park. What time? Let's see, it's just about 10 o'clock. Make it 10.30. And come alone. Don't tell anybody. Okay, Bauer. So it's Bauer. Where is he, Mike? Shh, quiet, Inspector. Well, Mr. Russell, I, I think we'll be running along. If we have any more questions, we'll be back. I'm sure you will. No, no, please. Don't bother to see us to the door. Mike, where are we going? Golden Gate Park. Bauer wants to talk to us secretly. A great secret with somebody listening on the line. What? Who's listening? Miss Ann Russell on the extension phone right in the hall here. Is it Mike? 10.28. Now keep back in the shadows with Faraday. Oh, this guy Bauer certainly picked a romantic spot to meet the old Dutch windmill in the loneliest corner of the park. Not to mention spooky. Look at those four huge veins above us, like the arms of a giant hovering over our heads. Oh, Angel, your poetry picks the doggone times to bust loose. Well, I can't help it. I'm nervous. What time is it now? 10.29. I don't know. This may be a trap. Bauer may be after you, Mike. I don't like anything about that bird. I don't like anything about tonight, period. Psst. I see a light through the bushes. Car's coming around the turn. Got your gun, Mike? I'm all set. Now keep back in the shadows. This sounds like he's driving fast. What was that? Sounded like a gun. Why, Grandma Faraday, your nerves. Here he comes. Mike, he's passing you. Mike? Hey, Bauer! Bauer! He's skidding. Is he hurt? Is he can't, hurt badly? Can't tell yet. Open his shirt, Mike. That's oh, a waste of time, Inspector. Look at the back of his head. Oh, guess I was right. We did hear a shot. But who would do it? Who knew he was coming here to talk? Oh, that phone call. Yeah, Ann Russell. Well, I guess there's no mystery about this killing. Hey, Faraday, here's his wallet. Maybe it will answer a few things for us. Let's see. Hmm. Well, what is it? What is it? I'm old enough to be told. Mr. Bauer wasn't any ordinary secretary. He was an insurance detective. Planted in that office to find the missing diamonds. Well, then maybe he ransacked Janet's apartment. Yes, he did. It says so here in his pocket notebook. Search girl's room, no evidence, no jewels. Janet went in to see Phillips. Something's up. Took her to bar. Told me to check on mistake 1215. 1215. Mike. Remember? Huh? Janet tried to tell us something about that. 1215. That was when Jack was picked up by the taxi driver. Yes, according to the clock in the drugstore window. Inspector, let's telephone the coroner and then... Then what? Go take a good look at that clock. This is a waste of time, Mike. I checked that clock the day after the robbery. So did we, Inspector, before the trial began. It's an electric. It keeps perfect time. It couldn't be wrong. Save your breath, pal. Mike's in another stubborn spell. Oh, the drugstore's closed for the night. Yeah, but there's the clock. You can read it a hundred feet away. Neon hands, neon numerals. Uh, it says 11.10. What time have you got, Faraday? 11.10. Now are you satisfied? Jack came out of the jewelry place two doors north of the drugstore. The taxi picked him up. The driver saw the clock in the window... The window. What are you staring at, Mike? The grocery store over there. Inspector, call a cab and get the driver who picked up Jack Holmes. In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. A few minutes ago, we mentioned some of the advantages of Union Oil's spark plug service. As a featured part of this service, the Minutemen also inspect your ignition cables. 
These cables are the small, fine wires which deliver electricity to the spark plugs. Normally, they give little trouble. But if anything happens to them, if they get broken or frayed, or if the insulation is damaged, even brand new spark plugs won't help your driving. In other words, a faulty ignition cable will leak electricity. And by the time the charge gets to the spark plug, there isn't enough juice left for the rich, full spark needed for complete combustion. So for a careful check and double check on your car's firepower, have a Union Oil Minuteman service your spark plugs and ignition cables. You'll get honest, accurate work, and you'll notice the increased power and snap from your engine as soon as you drive away. You'll find Union Oil Minuteman ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. It's a few minutes past midnight. At a lonely street corner in the commercial district, Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday are talking to a scared little taxi driver. Look, fellas, it's just like I said in court. I'm cruising along here and I see this guy. The inspector and I know that, Smitty. Now, we just want you to show us. Now, do exactly as you did that night. Yeah, cruise down the street and pretend you're picking up Jack Holmes. And we'll get in the back seat and ride along. Okay, okay, climb in. Okay, darling, come in. Thank you. <clears throat> I turns this corner here, see? Yeah. And I'm moseying along when I spot him crossing the street. He waves at me, so I slows down. I stops right about here. And Jack was standing in the middle of the street. You opened the door. Which one? The right one. He climbs in and gives me the address. Well, go ahead. Open the door, Smitty. See, ain't you got no imagination? Now, Smitty, when did you see the clock? Right now, when I leans over to close the door. There it is in the window, see? All lit up with neons. Okay, look at it. What time does the clock say? Uh, gee, it's just like that night. 12.15. Mike, you were right. He made the same mistake all over again. Look at it again, Smitty. Look hard now. Come on, look hard. What do you mean, look hard? The clock says, hey, there's something screwy. The numbers, they're backwards. Right, Smitty, right. You're not looking at the clock. You're looking at the reflection in the grocery store window. The real clock is across the street in the drugstore. The drugstore clock reads a quarter to twelve, but the reflection looks like a quarter after twelve. Thirty minutes difference, Smitty. Gee, I got a sworn. Say, I did swear. You ain't gonna pinch me, are you? No, Smitty. Now, are you willing to do something for us? Me? Yeah, sure. Anything, fellas. All right. We're gonna pick up three passengers, and one of them is the murderer. Here's the office. Right. Mr. Shane, I doubt we'll find anything in here that the police haven't already gone over. Well, they had the wrong slant, Mr. Phillips. You see, someone planned to steal those diamonds, but they needed a fall guy, Jack Holmes. So they faked the shortage in his account books. Then they called him that night, very indignant at discovering his dishonesty. Just a minute. I was the one who found him out. Shut up, Ann. Jack said he wanted to check back through his records. He didn't leave till a quarter to twelve. About midnight, the thief came here and stole the diamonds. The night watchman surprised the thief and was killed. Then the cab driver blundered about the drugstore clock, and Jack was really on the spot. For the killer, it was a beautiful out. Janet discovered the mistake this afternoon. She told it to Bauer. He checked her story. When he discovered Janet was dead, he tried to tell me what Janet told him. That's why he was killed. Oh, that's rubbish. Bauer ran away from the inspector. Why? He must have had a reason. He had. He wasn't ready to talk yet. You see, there's one detail we didn't tell you people. Bauer was a detective himself. He was what? Oh, yes, yes. Hired by the insurance company to find those diamonds. You mean that he was... A... Do you think he found the diamonds? I'm sure he didn't. If we can step inside the office, Mr. Phillips, I'll show you why. Now, Bauer had a suspect, but it was the wrong one. He did know, however, that Jack was innocent. And uh, when he telephoned me, the same call you listened in on, Miss Russell... The killer knew he was trapped, unless... I don't believe it. I didn't hear anything on that phone. Oh, yes, you did, Miss Russell. You ought to have recognized it. Now, perhaps you will now. Mr. Shane, stop this cat and mouse business. Shh, please, please. That clock on the bookcase there, in five seconds, is going to strike the hour. Now, listen. One, two, three... This is fantastic. Four... Well, distinctive chimes, aren't they? 
This is the same clock I heard strike while I was talking to Bauer on the phone. He called from this very room. There was only one man who knew where I was who could tell Bauer where to phone me. Mr. Phillips. Me? You're insane. Am I? Bauer told you Jack was innocent. You sat there in your chair and heard him say to meet me at the old Dutch windmill at 10.30. So you killed him. He trusted the wrong person, just as Janet did. She came to you, told you about the drugstore clock. You had to stop her tongue. You poured her a drink from this water jug in your desk with poison in the glass. You anything to say to that, Mr. Phillips? No. No, nothing. I thought not. All right, Inspector. Oh, come on in the house, kid. Huh? Mrs. Faraday will be glad to fix us some eggs and coffee. Oh, no, no, no. It's pretty late, Faraday. I think we all better get to bed. Look at Phil here. She's almost asleep. I am not. I was just thinking. How did you know, Mike, that the clock you heard over the phone was in Philip's office? Oh, I heard it the first time we went there, dear. It just took me a little while to get it placed in my memory. Oh. Clocks ran all through this case, didn't they? The watchman's clock stopped at 12.10. The drugstore clock that convicted poor Jack. The office clock that caught the murder. Yeah, sometimes a clock can tell more than the time of day. Oh, oh, Mike, that's corny. But hmm? I knew you'd say it. I was just waiting for it. Well, <laughs> I guess Michael's entitled to a little corn off the cob tonight. <laughs> that was neat thinking, my boy. A clock reflected in the window and the hands reversed by 30 minutes. Doubt if I'd have thought of it myself. Oh, Faraday, please, Mike's ego. Huh? Besides, I think I know why he's so leery of clocks lately. Mm -hmm. Oh, now, listen here, honey, if you mean yes, Go on, please. Phil, let's have it. Well, no, Mike no. had a date with me for 6 o'clock, and he was an hour late. No, no, Angel, please, and no, no. And guess what his alibi was? What? He thought he saw a clock that said 5 p.m. It was a grocery scale with 5 pounds of potatoes in it. <laughs> <laughs> This is Mike Shane again. On June 4th, we come on the air one half hour earlier. Remember now, that's not next Monday night, but the Monday for following, June 4th. Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Many an exciting case crosses the desk of our detective friend, Mike Shane. Right now, there's something special on that desk. Bending over it are Mike, his assistant Phyllis Knight, and Inspector Faraday. Shh, watch. Mike frowns grimly. Then slowly, carefully, he turns the next page of Lear magazine. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Mike, where did they get that picture of you? Oh, no. A day from the life of Mike Shane, San Francisco's sophisticated sleuth. Oh, anything for a story. If they were going to write about me, why didn't they interview me? What are you kicking about? It's publicity. That super sleuth, that maestro of the clue, well, that glamour boy of detectives. Yeah. Hey, hey, here's a picture of both of us. Hmm. 
handsome detective inspects scene of society murder. Oh. The willowy damsel on his left is Mike's current heart in... Hey, current. I like that. Oh, sure. It seems Mike is a wizard with the ladies. But read all about it on page seven. I'm packing my bags and heading for the mountains. (laughs) Spare the suitcase. This may be a client. Hello? Yes, this is his secretary. I'm sorry, he's busy right now. Who is this? Oh? Oh, yes, Mm. yes. When? Who is it? Shh. Tonight. 7.30. 7.30. Well, I'm sure he'd be delighted to come. Honey, honey, yes. I'd be delighted to what? What? Shh. Certainly. Certainly I'll tell him. Thank you very much, Miss Melton. Goodbye. Now what have you got me into? Your magazine story is paying dividends already, Mr. Shane. You and I are going to attend one of the exclusive parties of Miss Sherry Melton. Oh, no, not that sob, sister. But, of course, she gives such different parties. And her newspaper column, why, she might write you up, too. Yeah, well, I can skip that. (laughs) Kids, I don't like this setup. I don't like it at all. You can say that again. No, Mike, you don't understand. I'm invited to the same party. You? Yeah, she called me up. I told her I liked parties, but being inspector of homicide, I never know about my evenings. Then she said I had to come because she was going to recreate a murder. Oh, one of those things. Mike, I'm leery of this sort of stuff. Something always goes wrong. What do you mean? It seems someone always gets hurt. Well, but why is she doing it? What's her reason? What goes? Not what, darling. Who goes? And the answer? We do. This is a real party, and it's oh. such an attractive house. Don't you think so, huh? Mike? <laughs> My collar's too tight. I, I told you I can't wear a tuxedo. I feel like a pallbearer. Ah, like Mr. Shay. Oh. Why, you're much handsomer than in that magazine. <laughs> you should wear a tuxedo on every case. <laughs> uh, Miss Melton, this is my... Uh... Well, this is Miss Phyllis Knight. How do you do, Miss Phyllis? Oh, yes, yes. Well, come on into the lounge. I want you to meet everybody. <laughs> you know, uh, the party tonight is just a mad inspiration. The other day, I was having lunch with Freddie. Oh, you know Freddie, the senator from Kansas or uh, Florida or someplace. And, and I said, darling, I'm going to give a party. And, oh, wait, here, here's a man I want you to meet. Uh, Sherwood. Yes, my little butterball. Uh, Miss Knight, this is Sherwood Armstrong. Oh, the mystery story writer. How do you do? <laughs> Rather bored up to this moment, but now I see possibility. <laughs> uh, 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 Sherwood, before you ask her out onto the balcony to talk over her story ideas, you better check with Mr. Shane here. <laughs> I'm glad to know you, Mr. Armstrong. Wish I could say the same, sir. I've always admired your ability, and now you're... Good taste. Oh, uh... go away with you, you wretch. (laughs) I want these people to meet somebody really important. Well, I'll be back. Oh, uh, there's our man, the one with the big glasses and bushy hair. Hmm? Uh, Dr. Kaler. Yes? Dr. Kaler, Michael Shane and Miss Phyllis Knight. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Shane? Uh, Dr. Kaler studied psychology in Vienna, and he writes all those fascinating books on dreams and why people commit murder. Oh, Miss Melton, please. Of course, we've all heard of you, Doctor. One of our best criminologists. Mike, you must read some of his books. Mm, Yes, I must. Uh, Sherry... Oh, Sherry, uh, may I see you a moment, please? Oh, Ray, I almost forgot you. Uh, Ray and I used to work on the same newspaper in Chicago. Uh, look, darling, I want you to meet a publisher. Dr. Kaler, I'd love to read some of your books. You must tell me which one to start on first. You are very kind, madam, but I'm afraid you would find them very technical and perhaps dull. Oh, no, no. And if I can't understand what you mean, I'll ask Mike to explain it to me. He's a wonderful student, you know. You should see his library. You oh, really should, Doctor. Huh? He's got a complete file of Esquire. Faraday. Well, I was wondering where you were. Oh, oh get you. Tuxedo and patent leather shoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, Doctor, how are you coming with that next book? Very well indeed, thank you. Well, then you two know each oh, other. Oh, sure. Huh? Dr. Kaler's helped me out with several cases. Not jealous, are you? Oh, of course <laughs> Hey, wait a minute. Miss Melton's trying to say something. We're now going to have a buffet supper. <laughs> After that, I have a surprise for you. I won't tell you what it is, but I'll give you a hint. It's murder. <laughs> Quiet, everybody. Quiet, please. I brought all of you upstairs to this bedroom because we're going to play a game. Oh, I don't care what Faraday says, Mike. This is going to be fun, huh? Now, I want four of my guests to pay particular attention. 
Inspector Faraday. Yes. Mr. Shane. Yes. Dr. Kaler. I'm ready. And Sherwood Armstrong. Yeah. Uh, Sherwood, will you look around this room and tell us what you see? <laughs> Besides people. Well, let's see. A uh, double bed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nightstand. Mm-hmm. Telephone. Mm-hmm. Two chairs and a bureau. <laughs> yes. Well. Does uh, Does anything about it look familiar to you? No. How about you, Dr. Kaler? It's a complete mystery. Inspector Faraday? Well, the arrangement and spacing of furniture does look familiar to me. Reminds me of the bedroom of a man who was recently murdered. You're right, Inspector. The bedroom of John Hines. Oh, yes, oh, yes. I've arranged everything to duplicate his bedroom. And tonight, we're going to reenact the murder. Mike, that killing's never been solved. As you all know... I like to give unique parties. So I've invited four famous crime experts here tonight to give us their own solutions of this unsolved mystery. Mr. Shane, do you know the details of the case? Well, fairly well. It uh, it happened about two months ago. John Himes was a rich old miser. He was found shot to death in his bedroom with the doors and windows locked from the inside. The only suspect was his secretary and... Uh, He had a watertight alibi. Is that right, Inspector? It is. All right. Now, you, Dr. Taylor, will be John Hines. Uh, Lie down on the bed, please. (laughs) Oh, now, hurry up, hurry up. Don't be so shy, Doctor. All right. (laughs) And and you, Sherwood, you will be the killer. Stand outside the door till we call you. (laughs) This is very exciting. Yes. Now, as Inspector Faraday tells us what happened that night, Dr. Taylor and Sherwood will will act it out for us. Now, if you please, Inspector. Well, it's about midnight. John Hines is in bed, probably asleep. Doors and windows are locked. Somebody comes to his hall door. All right, Sherwood. Hines thinks it's his secretary. He gets out of bed, goes to the door. He unlocks and opens it. The killer enters. At first, there's no struggle, no outcry. Oh, careful, Dr. Kaler. Hmm? Put on your glasses. You can't see where you're going. Of course not, madam. Neither could Mr. Himes. If he had worn his glasses, he would have seen it was not his secretary. Correct, Doctor. The killer advances into the room, demands the old man hand over the cash he has hidden in the house. The old fellow refuses. The killer insists. He raises his gun and then... (laughs) What the... Mike! We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane and Phyllis Knight in just a moment. Simply because your automobile engine is rated at a certain horsepower doesn't mean it's delivering that rate. Worn or burned out spark plugs, for example, can actually cut down the horsepower of your engine even at full throttle. You see, high compression engines demand complete instant firing. If any of your spark plugs are worn or improperly adjusted you get a weak, sputtering fire which fails to ignite all the gasoline. So serious is this loss that engineering tests prove faulty spark plugs can waste one tank full of gasoline out of every ten. So, friends, if you are not absolutely certain your spark plugs are firing properly, why not play safe and have your Union Oil Minute Man check them? The performance of each separate plug is accurately measured on a scientific tester, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minute Man will clean and adjust them to the proper setting. If they're burned or worn out, he can furnish you with a new set. Union Oil Spark Plug Service takes but a few minutes and costs but a few cents, a cost you'll soon save in extra mileage. You'll find Union Oil Minute Man ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. And remember, next Monday night, Michael Shane comes to you one half hour earlier, 8 o'clock instead of 8.30. An unsolved murder is being reenacted at Sherry Melton's society party. Suddenly, at the very climax of the scene... Mike! Mike! Everybody stay where you are! Who fired that shot? Armstrong did. He had the gun. I saw him. Don't be ridiculous, Ray. I was just faking a gun with my pipe. Please, is anyone hurt? Oh, no, no, only your dignities. Four famous crime experts, and they don't know a fake gunshot from the real thing. What? You mean it was a phony? Of course. I slapped this yardstick here on the bed pillow. Oh, oh for heaven's sake. Very say. amusing. A perfect example of mass psychology and suggestion. Now let's get on with the crime. You've been shot, Dr. Kaler. 
So stretch out on the floor. Yes, perhaps like this beside the bed. Oh, that's perfect. You make a very convincing corpse, Doctor. <laughs> and now, Inspector, if you'll just go on. Well, there's nothing more to tell. The killer didn't find the money he was after, so he slipped out of the house again. A perfect crime, eh? Well, if the police couldn't solve it, I can. You are? Right? Yeah. Oh, at least I will in my next book. Oh. Oh. That's where a writer has it all over. The oh, we'll solve it, Mr. Armstrong. In fact, just this evening, I got a fresh angle on the case, which I can't tell anyone yet. Wow. That means a neat headline. Sherry Melton's party gives police answer to a puzzling murder. Oh, always the news, Hawk Ray. But meanwhile, let's play my game. Hmm? You four masterminds have 30 minutes to solve the mystery. You're each to go to a different room so you can't compare notes. In 30 minutes, we'll vote who has the most exciting solution. And the prize, champagne, of course. <laughs> Up, Mike, we've got just ten minutes to oh, go. Oh, honey, of all the dimwit stunts, this is it. Come on, come We on. can spend all night dreaming up solutions, but none of them will be right. Crimes aren't solved by slapstick. It's just a game. Oh. Think up something really dramatic. I want you to be brilliant tonight, Mike. We've got a famous criminologist and a mystery story writer. Show them what we can do. Oh, uh, we? <laughs> what was that? Mike, huh? what was that? Sounded like outside. Come on, come yeah. on. Mike, it's an accident or something outdoors. Let's go. I'm coming, too. Well, it can't be an auto smash-up. There's nothing on the street. Oh, it sounded closer to the house. Anyway, maybe here on the ground. Can I help, gentlemen? I don't know, Doctor. we got to search the garden. i got a flashlight in my car. So have I, Inspector. I'll get it. Okay, let's spread out. Search both sides of the house. Right, I'll take the left wing here. No, no, Angel, not you. Look. But, Mike, I want to. No, no, you're not going to prowl around through bushes in the dark. Now, go on, go on, be oh, it. all right, you old worrywart. Who's that? Answer me. Who is it? An elk looking for his lodge. Oh, Faraday. Well, did you find anything on your side? Nah, too dark. Ray was supposed to bring me his flashlight. I got tired of waiting. Well, come on, let's go get our own flashlights. Coming, coming. Maybe we're just chasing our own tails. Is this another one of that woman's party gags? It isn't. It isn't, Faraday. Huh? What I just found doesn't belong at any party. Found what? On the running board of Faraday's car. A dead body. Stand back, everybody. We can't see what we're doing. Oh. Looks like he was knocked out first and then strangled with his own tie. Oh, but who would want to kill Ray and why? And what was he doing on my running board? He said he was going to get the flashlight from his car. Well, that's fairly simple, Inspector. Miss Melton says that's his sedan right behind yours. Looks like a riddle. But it's the same make, model, and year. Well, sure, he thought he was getting into his own car. Did, uh, did any of you people see uh, anybody come near this car? Not me. Only this night. We were all looking for the cause of that crash. Oh, oh, I forgot. I found the cause. Huh? H here's what's left of it. Mm. Looks like a table lamp. An expensive one, too. It was at the end of the hall upstairs. Somebody must have thrown it out the window. The cook found it in a flower box. That's it. Smashed on purpose to get us outdoors. But, but why? I'm the only person Ray knew in town. I invited him here to the party so he, well, so he wouldn't be lonely. I invited him to, to his death. No one saw the killer. No one has a motive. Where do we go from here? First off to the telephone. I got to call headquarters. Uh, just a minute, uh, Inspector. Phil, stay here and see that nobody touches the body. All right, Mike. Now, Faraday, what is it you know about the murder of John Himes? What is it the killer's afraid of? Huh? I don't get you, Mike. Did you take a good look at Ray Rogers' body just now? Of course. No, no, you didn't. Not a good look. Ray Rogers was just about your height. He had the same stooped shoulders, same gray hair. Holy jumpy. And he was getting into my car. Exactly. Somebody made a mistake, Inspector. Somebody wants to kill you. This is the window right here, Mr. Shane. 
You can see it's still raised. Mm -hmm. The lamp fell into the flower box on the ground floor. Yeah, but it's so smashed up. And you've handled it. I guess fingerprints are out. But we know that the killer was here on the second floor. Miss Melton, can you place everybody at the moment you heard the crash? Well, I, no. I, I was in my bedroom fixing my hair. And where is your bedroom? Uh, through this door here. Oh, but Sherwood, you were in the room across the hall. Take it easy, Sherry. You put me in there because of the contest. I was cooking up a solution for the murder. Uh, I mean, of John Himes. Well, how about you, Dr. Kaler? You were in the next bedroom down the hall. I cannot oblige, madam. I also was deep in thought. Well, I, I guess no one saw the man then. The inspector and Mr. Shane were downstairs, so were all the other guests. As a writer of murder thrillers, I'd say the man came here with no idea of killing. Hmm? Ray was strangled with his own tie, so the man was without a gun. You assume the unknown, Mr. Armstrong. The victim was strangled, which is a masculine technique in murder. Therefore, a clever woman with a strong arm might choose that very method. Yes, mm. yes, a red herring. That's very clever, Dr. King. Uh, Miss Melton, I know you're famous for unusual parties, but why did you decide to reenact a murder tonight? Why, why it was just an inspiration of mine. Th then Sherwood suggested we do the case of John Himes. Mm -hmm. uh, I interviewed the old man once, and yes, I even, even covered his inquest for my paper. I see. Sherwood Armstrong suggested it. When we entered your, your contest... You asked all of us if the room and furniture looked familiar. You, Mr. Armstrong, said not at all. Well, that... That was just an act. Sherry and I knew you'd made sketches of the actual scene, and we wanted to trip you up if we could and, and get a laugh. But why did you pick the particular murderer of John Hines? I knew him. He was a fan of mine. Read all my books. So you and Miss Melton both knew him. That is hardly a crime, Inspector. I, too, knew Mr. Himes. We were members of the same club. However, it is disturbing that they should choose that particular unsolved crime. As a psychologist, I know the subconscious desire of every killer to confess his murder. Some return to the scene, some even talk about it to strangers. The criminal subconscious feels cheated of the drama, the notoriety which comes with his confession or capture. Look here, I don't like the drift of this talk. Well, I apologize, my friend. I'm always going off into a lecture. I'm sure neither of you is guilty. None of us is. We have no motives. Ah, here come my boys. Well, it's about time. You ready, Mike? All set. Honey, get your coat. Are we leaving? Yes, we are. The answer to Ray Rogers' death isn't here. It's in a house that's been padlocked for two months. Dusty. Did you expect John Himes' ghost to meet us with a vacuum cleaner? If I remember right, this is the bedroom. Yeah, it is. We left everything in place. Nothing's been changed. Uh, the old guy was a miser, all right. Not enough furniture for a dollhouse. Inspector, you told us tonight you had a new idea about this case. What was it? Uh... That's the blood stain over there, Mike, in front of the telephone stand. Inspector, what was it? Maybe it's our solution. Don't bother him, honey. Hey, there's the print of a shoe here on the edge of the blood. Yeah. The killer made it. Wore tennis shoes. We tried to trace it. How about fingerprints? All identified. Well, except for one. Probably an old print. Maybe some visitors. Couldn't match it up with our files anyway. You said his secretary lived with Himes. You sure of his alibi? Positive, Phil. Nice young fella. He got a phone call in the afternoon that his uncle was dying down at Carmel. He got to Carmel in the evening, and it turned out to be a fake call. The murderer just wanted him out of the way. Well, he could have sneaked back that night and... No, no, he had witnesses. In fact, he telephoned long distance about midnight to tell Himes he'd be back in the morning. Yeah, I remember it now. The operator said somebody answered the phone but didn't say a word. Just hung up. Yeah. We figured the murderer picked up the receiver to hear who was calling. He cleaned the receiver afterwards and put it back. That's when he stepped in the blood. Uh, it doesn't add up, though, Inspector. There's only one shoe print. Now, he couldn't possibly stand here and reach over to the phone on that table. It's too far. Well, does it matter? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me try something. If I put one foot on the blood stain here and then my knee on this chair, I can... Yeah. Now I can reach it. Say, come to think of it, that's where we found the stray fingerprints. Right where you got your hands right now. On the back of that chair. Okay, now we're clipping coupons. That fingerprint belongs to the killer of John Himes and Ray Rogers. All right, but whose print is it? The inspector doesn't know. Well, we'd better know, and in a hurry. The murderer tried to get Faraday once tonight. He'll try again, and the next time, who knows? <laughs>
In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. A few minutes ago, we mentioned some of the advantages of Union Oil's spark plug service. Now, as a featured part of this service, the Minutemen will also inspect your ignition cables. These are the small, thin wires which deliver electricity to the spark plugs. Naturally, if any of them are defective, even brand new spark plugs won't receive enough juice for proper firing. In other words, a faulty ignition cable will leak electricity. So for a complete, accurate check on your car's firepower, have the Minutemen service your spark plugs and ignition cables. You'll notice the increased power and snap in your engine as soon as you drive away. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. It is midnight. Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday are at headquarters. Mike and Phyllis are bent over a desk studying a police file. No luck, kids. Huh? Boys, recheck those fingerprints. None on record. But we've got to have it, Faraday. Your life may depend on it. All right, there are. 130 million people in the United States. Shall I ask every one of them to mail me their prints? Oh, easy, Inspector, easy. Well, we're stymied. That's all there is to it. Well, we'll keep on trying. Phil and I have been going through the coroner's report here. So far, nothing new. The bullet entered skull immediately below right ear. Death was almost instantaneous. Deceased fell to floor in position shown in photographs. The eyeglasses held in his left hand were crushed and embedded in his palm. In the hmm? opinion of the doctors... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold it, hold it. What was Himes doing with the eyeglasses in his hand? He was nearsighted. Oh, we covered that at the party tonight, Mike. He probably never put his glasses on. That's why he mistook the killer for his own secretary. Why do we have to assume that? Why not the opposite? Opposite? What do you mean? Well, perhaps Himes was taking his glasses off. So what? Does it make any difference? Does it make any difference? Look, Faraday, look. All we need to get this killer are three things. A pair of tennis shoes, a set of fingerprints, and an address. Mm, that's all. Just sit down and write ourselves a letter to Santa Claus. No, no. We'll get the fingerprints from the police files. But we just looked. Not everywhere, Inspector. We'll get the address from the phone book and the tennis shoes at that address. Well, the party doesn't sound quite as lively as it did a few hours ago. Mike... That paper sack, everybody will know their shoes. Carry it like a bottle of champagne. Shh, quiet, quiet. Here comes our hostess. Well, at last. We thought you'd never get back. My guests want to go home. Oh, they can shortly. Where are they? In the bar, most of them. Sheer escapism, gentlemen. Personally, I prefer this book of poetry. Shakespeare's sonnets. How nice. What's wrong with a copy of Sherwood Armstrong? Any luck, boys? Well, I think so. How about it, Inspector? Dr. Kaler, you're an expert on fingerprints. I have in these cards two sets of fingerprints. Will you examine them and tell us if they're identical? Uh, certainly. Hmm. This world here and the lines. Yeah, they're identical. Do you recognize them? No. Mr. Armstrong, do you recognize them? But I... No, I don't. And Miss Melton? Why, no. But I'm not an expert. May I ask where you got these prints? From the back of a chair in the bedroom of John Himes. Oh. The second card is from the file of honorary members of the police force. Oh, I mean, isn't that strange? You were about to say, Miss Melton, that you, too, have been an honorary policeman for the past three years? I, uh, yes. Oh, but surely you don't think that I... I never did like the idea of your parlor entertainment, Miss Melton. When I came here tonight, I expected that something might go wrong. Or at least that the murder of John Himes might be present. Now, just a minute, Inspector. I think I you're going... I told to... you people I had a new angle on the murder. Actually, I didn't know a thing. It's an old trick making the murderer think you have the answer. He'll stampede and give himself away. Which is exactly what happened. The killer tried to remove the inspector, but he made a mistake out there in the dark. He got the wrong man. Wrong man. Now, I have here in this paper bag a pair of tennis shoes worn by the murderer. May I, uh, may I ask you, gentlemen, what size shoes you wear? A number nine. Also a nine. I see. But uh, the night you killed John Himes, you wore an eight and a half, Dr. Kaler. The night I... Oh. Sir, this is a joke. Is anyone laughing? The sole of this left shoe shows traces of blood. The blood of John Himes. The blood you stepped in when you answered the phone in that bedroom. But no, they are not my shoes. I do not play tennis. You bought them because they were noiseless, Doctor. We found them in the closet in your room at your club. And the fingerprints are from your honorary police card. 
You convicted yourself, Doctor, when you reenacted the crime. You pointed out to us that Himes mistook the visitor for his own secretary because he hadn't put on his glasses. The crime was so vivid in your memory that you unconsciously repeated it to the last detail. Your own subconscious was what trapped you, Doctor. <laughs> Golly, Mike, I wish that magazine had waited a few days. Well, they really have something to write about. Hmm? Mike Shane, Outwit's famed criminologist. Well, I'd say the honors go equally to our friend and companion, Inspector Fowler. Oh, oh, I don't do. know. But all I did was to smoke him up with a big wise act. No, it gets me, kids, is why Kaler did it. He hardly knew John Himes. He had no motive. He told us the motive, honey. His own vanity. The great criminologist commits the perfect crime. He, uh, he, 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 it's like a case out of the, the last book he published. Mike Shane, you didn't tell me you'd read any of his books. Oh, every one of them, honey. And I can show you a book at my apartment he wrote back in 1937, and on one of the pages I scribbled, Someday this man's going to commit a murder. Oh, and I thought I was the only one who suspected him. What? Oh, now look, Angel. Why, you were draped on Kayla's arm all evening. What, Dr. Kayla, how clever of you. Shakespeare's sonnets. How <laughs> utterly wonderful. Oh, I was just playing up to him, I knew. Oh, oh, oh you did? <laughs> How? Mike Shane, I suspect any man who parts his hair in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> This is Mike Shane again. And this is Phyllis. Both reminding you that next Monday evening we'll be on the air one half hour earlier. Same night, same station. Remember, won't you? Mike and Phyllis at 8 o'clock next Monday. Good, Good night, night, all. all. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective. Starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. The official slogan of San Francisco goes like this, the city that knows how. The slogan of San Francisco's favorite detective might well be, the man who knows who done it. This evening, Mike Shane and his assistant Phyllis Knight have put work behind them. They're about to leave their office in the Rust Building to meet their old friends, Inspector and Mrs. Faraday, for an evening at the movies. Hey, hurry it up, Phil, honey, will you? Stop primping and fussing. They'll be waiting for us. Just a second. Golly, you know, it'll be fun to see Mrs. Faraday again. It's weeks <laughs> since I've heard any of her Irish stories. Yeah, gosh, it's been weeks, months since Faraday, Faraday and I managed the same evening off. I must be taking a holiday in our town. Yeah. All set, Mike. How does my hat look? Screwy as ever. And the face below it? Beautiful as ever. 
Oh, Mike. Oh, pretend we didn't hear it. Come on, Mike. Don't worry. It's not a client. It's after hours. Hello? Mike, it's off. I can't go. Oh, now, Faraday. That's how I feel, too. But this is something special. Federal Judge Stanton has just been murdered. Holy jumping. Come down to headquarters, Mike. I'm afraid this is more than straight murder. What do you mean? I'm not sure myself. Just get down here. Sarge. Evening, Mr. Shane. Miss Knight. Hello. Hello, Quinn. The inspector in his office? Yes, yeah, sir, but I think he's busy. <laughs> so he said. Inspector. Hey. Mike. Phyllis, come in. Come in. Well, you look all frazzled, Inspector. I am, Phil. I'm worried. Plenty worried. Well, come on, come on. Give with the details. When was Judge Stanton murdered? Less than an hour ago, near as we can tell. I just got back from his house. But first, Mike, take a look at these fingerprint cards on my desk. Mm-hmm. Fingerprints found at robbery, Jackson Street, night of the 17th. And this one. Housebreaking, Venice Avenue, night of the 21st. And two more. But they're burglaries, Inspector. What's the tie-up with Judge Stanton? The judge was shot, Phil, but his house was robbed, too. I got an ugly feeling that the fingerprints we found at his place are... Oh, that's it now. Yes? We checked the fingerprints, Inspector. They belong to Victor Rackner. You're sure of it? Yes, sir. Positive. Okay, that's all. I was afraid of that. Huh? These fingerprints you just looked at, Mike, they belong to Victor Ratner, too. Well, what's the matter with that? Don't they identify the killer? Yeah, they do. But these burglaries took place last month. Ratner was released from the penitentiary only two days ago. What? It's impossible. That's what we said. Two years ago, Victor Ratner was sent to the pen for embezzlement. A 15-year rap. The proof was his fingerprints found in a safe. Then the last couple of weeks came four robberies. Victor Ratner's fingerprints at every one of them. While he's still in the state penitentiary? Yeah, he was pardoned, Phil. Wrongful conviction. Now this murder and his fingerprints again. Well, I thought no two people in the world had the same prints. That's the point. If two men can have the same fingerprints, our whole criminal procedure sails right out of this window right now. Well, Inspector, if Flattner was released two days ago and the judge was murdered tonight, he's still bound to be your suspect. Haul him in and make him prove his whereabouts at the time of the killing. I've already ordered him to be picked up. Meanwhile, i got to go back to the judges and finish the examination. You kids like to come along? Oh, of course. Where the bloodhounds go, we follow. This is the judge's study. On the flare over there by the desk is the... Uh-huh. Covered over with a sheet. Yeah. Hey, the desk drawers are all pulled out, Mike. The killer must have been looking for something. Yeah, the judge's wife said he didn't keep any valuables in here, and yet... Where did you find Ratner's fingerprints? On the broken glass from the terrace door. Here it is on my desk, Mike. Exhibit number eight. Hey, this door must have been locked at the time. He broke a pane of the glass, reached inside, and turned the key, huh? Yeah, but he was careful to wipe off the key afterwards. If he hadn't touched the glass, we wouldn't have a clue. Well, this doesn't look like the work of a professional housebreaker to me, Inspector. All he had to do was use a little pressure and the door would have come open anyway. Yeah, he used the same system at each house. Smash the window or door, then in. Say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I remember reading something in the paper about Ratner's conviction. Wasn't he an attorney? Yeah, a lawyer for a loan company. He got a hold of the combination of their safe somehow and made off with almost a hundred thousand bucks. Did they get the money back? Not a nickel. Then this doesn't make sense at all. He's got the dough stashed away somewhere. He wouldn't go in for penny ante robberies now. Could all those burglaries be just a red herring, Mike? You know, a build-up, so we'd think tonight was just another theft with a killing on the side. Uh, you're forgetting the main point, Angel. Ratner was safely put away in mothballs until the day before yesterday. How did his fingerprints turn up at robberies three weeks before he was released? Yeah, that's a mystery good enough to bind in three-quarter Morocco. Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. We just got a call from headquarters. The boys can't find Ratner anywhere. Not at his house, huh? No. Better get a hold of his attorney. Yeah, they've done that, sir. He says he hasn't seen Ratner since the day he got the pardon for him. Hmm. What do you say to that, Mike? Well, he's probably hiding out. We'd better get on his trail fast while it's still warm. Fine, if we only knew where to start. We do. Huh? At the old homestead of Mr. Victor Ratner. <laughs> Find anything in 
anything in the bedroom, Mike? Oh, a couple of suitcases. I can't tell whether Ratner was packing or unpacking them. No food in the kitchen. Guess he didn't plan to tarry long. I searched his desk. All his papers date back two years or more. Looks like we're out of luck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Say, honey, do you mind turning off the kitchen light? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll get it. Mike, maybe we'll have to play a waiting game. If Ratner tries to skip town, we can add him at the depot or airport. Oh, pretty slim chance, Inspector. He'll probably hit the highway. Mike! Inspector, yeah? come here! Coming! Something? Yeah. Yeah, this door here. Just now I noticed dirt trailing away from it. And look, look. Hey, a stairway. Must be a basement. Where's the light switch? Oh. Now, watch your step, Angel. Those high heels. Yeah, I will. Mm, it's a big basement. Brick floor, cupboards and shelves around the walls. And half an inch of dust and dirt on everything. Except the seat of this chair. Yeah, and look. It's placed right below these cupboards. Ratner climbed up to get something out. Well, let's have a look. Uh-huh. Well, a couple of cameras, a tripod, glass plates, film packs, projector. <laughs> the guy's a real shutterbug. Uh, oh, oh, doggone. What happened, Phil? Oh, I turned my ankle on a loose brick. Just a minute. There's more than one brick loose. Mike. Coming. Look, there's no mortar between these bricks. Yeah, an area of about three square feet. I think we know what this means. Below these bricks, Mr. Ratner banked his hundred thousand bucks and came back to dig it up. Shh, shh. Listen, upstairs. Ratner, he's come back. Sounds like he's heading for the kitchen. What What if he comes down here? Quick, turn off the light. Where? I, I, I don't see a switch. Oh, great. It turns off from the head of the stairs. Shh. Okay, then duck under the steps fast. Yeah. Now, not a sound. Oh, good heavens, my purse. I left it hanging on that chair. It's too late now. Mike, it's a woman's footstep. Hello? Who? Who's down there? Who? Oh. She sees Phil's purse. Hey, stop, stop. Come on, Faraday, after it. Harry, Mike, I think, I think we're locked in. You think we're locked in? You know darn well we're locked in. In just a moment, we'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane. Ladies and gentlemen, June probably seems like an odd month to talk to you about winter driving. But many motorists are driving around right now with engines still filled with sludge from last winter. You see, cold weather means heavier moisture condensation inside your car's engine. And that means water gets into the crankcase where, with some oils, it forms thick, black, ropey sludge. Now, just draining the oil doesn't get rid of this sludge because sludge is sticky and adheres to pistons, valves, crankshafts, and other parts. But your Union Oil Minuteman has a quick solution to this problem. He has a special solvent action flushing oil, known as cleanse oil, which is guaranteed to cut sludge. After draining the old, dirty oil, the Minuteman pours in a generous amount of cleanse oil. When the engine is started, the cleanse oil is pumped automatically to every working part. Cleanse oil is harmless to your engine but its special solvent action cuts sludge instantly. Then, when the cleanse oil is drained, the sludge flushes out with it, leaving your engine clean as a whistle. And with a fresh supply of Triton motor oil, the low-carbon paraffin base oil, you can be sure it will remain clean for a long time. So for smoother, more economical summer driving, just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. And ask for Union Oil Engine Flushing Service. Thank you. Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday find themselves locked in the basement of a strange house, thanks to an equally strange woman. Oh, this is no ordinary door. There's no gift to it. Well, maybe if both of you hear it. There's an easier way. We'll shoot the lock off. Stand back, Phil. Gladly. Ah, that did it. You've got to find that woman. Save your legs, Inspector. Just listen. Yeah. But who in the blazes was that woman? Some gal who has a key to his house. And I don't mean the cleaning woman. Say, what's the matter with me? 
My brain's a smoke dried and kippered. Huh? His ex wife. Swell, if we can't find Mr. Ratner, his ex wife will do. Where does she live, Inspector? Headquarters can tell us that. Vera. What's her name? Vera. Vera Miller. That was her maiden name. She may be using it again. Okay, Inspector. So let's find Vanishing Vera and see what she can tell us. <laughs> Yes? Who is it? This is the resident of Vera Miller. It is. May we talk to her, please? <laughs> I don't know. Who are you? I'm Inspector Faraday, Police Department. Oh. Well, come on in. Oh, uh, please excuse my manner. I thought it might be about something else. Uh, my name's William Miller. Oh? A relative of Vera's? Her brother. She's in the parlor here with a caller. Vera? Yes? These oh. people want to see you. Inspector Faraday and... Uh... Mike Shane and Phyllis Knight. And this is Mr. Johnson. Curran Anvil Johnson. I'm right glad to know y'all. Don't get up, please. Miss Miller, I believe you were once married to Mr. Victor Ratman. Look, is there something wrong? We'd like very much to talk to him if we can locate him. Do you know where he is? Well, no, I'm afraid I don't. Mm-hmm. May we ask why you locked us in his basement a few minutes ago? His basement? Well, there's some mistake. Mr. Johnson and I just got back from the movie. We just... Honey. Just skip it, skip it. The lady says she went to a movie, so she went to a movie. Mm. Sir, I don't like your attitude toward my... toward Miss Miller. What do you people want, Ratner? Wasn't he pardoned and released? The Corey approach, I see. We want to talk to him about Judge Stanton. Judge... the one who was killed? Marvelous. The news flashes you can get at the movies nowadays. We heard it on the radio. Victor wouldn't do such a thing. I know he's innocent. They let him out of prison because they were wrong about his fingerprints. They're wrong again. Well, I never trusted him. I wrote him while he was in prison that if he ever came near Vera again, I'd... Stop it! I can't stand it! Vera, honey, now, wait a minute. I want to talk to you. Honey. On my way. Mr. Miller, you seem pretty burned up about Ratner. Perhaps you had a business deal with him once, eh? I wish they'd left him in prison for the rest of his natural life. Vera was a fool to marry him. And now she's heading for more trouble with this Texan. Oh, what's wrong with him? Why, she's known him only two months. His soft talk, a ranch in Texas. Mike. Yeah? Mike, I, I overheard Mr. Johnson ask her what she meant about going to the movies. He just got here ahead of us. She said she'd explain later. And then he asked what she wanted down in Ratner's basement. Y'all don't she... mind. I'll tell the story myself. I just wanted to know if Vera had seen Mr. Ratner since he was sprung from prison. I think a fiancé is entitled to know these things. Not to mention her brother. Inspector. Yeah, Mike. If you've asked all your questions, I think we can leave this family love fest. Yeah, I agree with you, Mike. It's uh, been a pleasure to meet all of you. One final word, Mr. Miller. Miss Miller. It's a prison offense to shield a criminal or aid in his escape. You might think that over. Good night. You know, kids, I don't believe a thing we heard here. All oh, right, it's the hammiest performance I've seen since Uncle Tom's Cabin. Still, there's a grain of truth in every lie. Bill Miller is awful anxious about Ratner and Sister Vera. And what was she doing in that basement? Well, what was she? That's what we're going to find out, Angel. Remember those loose bricks in the basement? Well, I'm afraid we're going to find more than money. <laughs> How are we coming, Mike? Just a few more bricks. Then we can pull up these planks. Why are there planks underneath the bricks? For support, Phil. Otherwise, the floor would cave into the hole. There. Okay, Faraday. Up with the boards now. Pull it! Oh. Oh. Ah. See anything yet? Uh. Mm-hmm. Something. Maybe I can reach down and pull it up. Mike! A man's leg. Ooh. Here, let me grab hold. That's it. Oh. Lay him down here. Well, this is the end of the trail, Mike. It's Ratner. Two, three, four bullet holes. Ah, a thorough job. But, but Judge Stanton was murdered only an hour and a half ago. Rentner couldn't have killed him. Not unless he committed suicide and buried himself under the bricks. I wonder how long he's been dead. There's a newspaper here in his coat pocket. Maybe that'll tell us something. Oh, the bullet went right through it. Evening paper, and the date is night before last. He wouldn't carry an old newspaper in his pocket, Mike. That means he was killed the day he got out of prison. And Ratner wasn't murdered for nothing. There must be some tie-up with Judge Stanton. There is, Ratner's fingerprints. It wasn't any ghost that left that calling card on the judge's glass door tonight. We know that, Mike, but that's all we do know. Faraday, you said those fingerprints were found at four different burglaries. Yes. Okay, we've got to recheck every one of them. Now, uh, where's the nearest? Let's see, we're on 27th Avenue. 
There's one up. Uh oh. Huh? A.J. Bremner. Where's he? Oh, you'll razz the whiskers off me, Mike. He's on 26th Avenue, right behind us. In fact, the two backyards join. Inspector Faraday, will you please open that clam-like face of yours and tell us these things? I know, Mike, but I got so wound up on Judge Stanton, I clean forgot the robberies. Backdoor neighbors, eh? Ah, but he won't tell you anything, Mike. He's as sore as a goat of the department. Keeps ringing up every day to ask if we found the stuff he had stolen. Sounds like he's keeping tabs for a reason. All right, Inspector. Call headquarters and have a man bring out all your exhibits. We'll meet him at A.J. Bremner's. <laughs> Please, Mr. Bremner. I've paid taxes in this city for 25 years, and what do I get for it? My house is robbed, and the police do nothing. Nothing. Isn't that right, Margaret? Uh, Yes, dear. Now, look, Mr. Bremner, I'm not a policeman. I'm a private detective. If I can help you get your stuff back, I've had enough talk. I want results. Don't we, Margaret? Yes, dear. We just want to look at that smashed window, Mr. Bremner, to see the glass. I've replaced it. We weren't going to freeze, were we, Margaret? Yes, dear. Uh, No, dear. What did you do with the old glass? I don't know. I think I threw it in the trash can in the backyard. Then let's go to the backyard. Well, I suppose I'll have to show you. Back door is this way. Come on, Sergeant. Yes, sir. This way you put the glass, Margaret? Yes, dear. All right. Now if we can pick out the glass... Oh, wait a minute. I'll hold the flashlight. All right. By the way, uh, how many years was that fellow Ratner sentenced to? Fifteen years. Hmm. And I think he'd be willing to sell that house of his. You interested in buying? Well, it's a good rental property. Here you are, Inspector. All the glass I could find. All All right. right. Now, now the pieces you brought with you, Sergeant. Now, let's put them all together on the pavement here. Beats me what you people are up to. There's something wrong, Mike. They won't all fit. Well, that's no great surprise. Here, Inspector. Here, feel these two pieces of glass. Hmm. What about them? Oh, one of them is your exhibit piece with Ratner's fingerprints, Inspector. But this other glass is at least an eighth of an inch thicker than the glass with the fingerprints. I'm beginning to smell a rat. Yes. These fingerprints were faked and planted here and at all the other houses. And the man who did it killed Judge Stanton. Which is still a king-size mystery. Mr. Bremner, can we get to Ratner's house through your backyard? Yes, yes. There's a gate behind the garage. Say, if uh, if you fellas don't mind, I'd like to go along and watch you work this out. Wouldn't you, Margaret? Yes, sir. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Not at this stage. We'll give you an invitation a little later on, I promise you. Mike, that sounds ominous. Now, don't twist my words, Angel. The killer has made his first mistake. Now we'll trick him into his last one. <laughs> We'll return to Mike and Phil in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, did you know that your selection of motor oil determines the amount of carbon formed in your engine? Yes, that's right. You see, nearly all carbon is caused by the lubricating oil and not the gasoline, as so many people think. But some oils stand up better than others, resist oxidation better, and hence form less carbon. And by means of laboratory tests, motor oils may be measured as to the amount of carbon they will form. Now, you'll be interested to know, therefore, that Triton Motor Oil, in a competitive test with the seven leading motor oils sold here in the West, contained 38% fewer carbon-forming elements than the next best oil, 86% less than the average In other words, ladies and gentlemen, in addition to being a 100% pure paraffin-based lubricant, Triton motor oil very definitely gives you maximum protection against carbon. That means better mileage, fewer repair bills for your car. That's because Triton motor oil is made by an exclusive propane solvent refining process, a process so valuable that it's been patented by Union Oil Company. Remember, when you buy Triton motor oil for your car, you are buying less carbon. You can buy Triton motor oil at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are once more in the basement tomb of Victor Ratner, spread out on a tool bench of the dead man's cameras and photographic accessories. 
As you can see, Inspector, he's got two candle cameras here, as modern as he could buy two years ago. Yeah, darn expensive. Now, all his equipment fits these cameras except one item. This stack of old-style glass film plates. That's right, Mike. They're way too big. Ah, but maybe Ratner kept them for a purpose. Honey, take this plate and blow some dust across it. Okay. Now, here, Inspector. Yeah? You take another and do the same. Okay. That's it. Now, what do you see? Fingerprints. A whole set of them. As neat and clean as the files at headquarters. Yes, Inspector, yes. This is where Ratner's fingerprints have been coming from. Neatly stacked, stacked away down here, then planted in the smashed glass at every one of those robberies. Well, I'll be a... I'll bet you this is what Ratner had in mind. He was arrested because his fingerprints were found on a safe. So, he built himself an alibi. He knew the state would probably release him if the same fingerprints turned up while he was in prison. Well, then he must have had help, Mike. Somebody to rob houses and scatter this glass for him. Aha, check. And the same person killed Judge Stanton tonight. He planted these fingerprints so we'd go looking for Ratner. And never find him because he was already dead and buried. Mike, what are you staring at? The body. Nobody knows Ratner is dead except us and the killer. Now, this, uh, this may be a little ghoulish, but... Uh, here. See this ring of Ratner's? Yeah. It's big and flashy and an odd design. Oh, don't put it on your finger. Oh, my. Now, we'll gather our suspects together. We'll meet at Judge Stanton's house. We'll have an innocent little talk. Doesn't matter what we say, so long as we keep the secret of Ratner's death. I get it. The killer will see you wearing his ring. Right. And what do you think will pass through his mind, knowing he left Ratner buried under a layer of bricks and two-inch planks? <laughs> Sorry we had to call all you people together at this hour of the night, but it seemed necessary. Well, why bring us to Judge Stanton's house? If Ratner killed him, that's not our concern. It uh, happened to suit our convenience, Mr. Miller. Excuse me for asking, sir, but what am I doing here? Mr. and Mrs. Bremner and I just seem to be what you might call excess baggage. Well, I don't mind. It's all very interesting, especially if I get my stolen property back. Isn't that right, Margaret? Yes, dear. Miss Miller, would you tell us when you last went up to the penitentiary to see your ex-husband? Oh, then you know. Just answer the question, please. Your brother would learn about it anyway. Well, it must have been two months ago. Uh -huh. Did he give you anything or ask you to do something for him? Uh, no. And you, Mr. Miller, when did you last visit him in prison? Are you trying to be funny? I'd never go near him. Then it ought to please you to know that Ratner never should have been pardoned. He did embezzle that money. I don't believe it. They made a mistake. No, Miss Miller. Victor Ratner's fingerprints were fakes. They were planted at those house robberies. You're just trying to trick us. Please, please, honey. You mustn't rile yourself There'll up. There'll be no further cause for it, Mr. Johnson. Oh. We've told her she refuses to cooperate. That's all we can do. Yep, that's all for tonight. You folks can go home now. You mean uh, all this for nothing? Uh, yeah, the no, officer at the door will let you out. Okay, Faraday, fill us out the back way. We've got to race the murderer to that basement. <laughs> Well, I hope this is the last time we have to climb down into this basement. I can feel the moss sprouting on my north side. Well, we'd better hide behind the staircase. Phil, turn off your flashlight. Okay. I hope this worked, Mike. Nobody said a word about that ring you were wearing. Uh, they wouldn't, but I flashed it enough. <laughs> you scratched your nose like you had the seven-year itch. He's got to come back. He's got to see if that body has been disturbed. You taking any bets on who shows up? I'll put my money on Vera and her brother. She looked at Lockers in this basement, remember? And Brother Bill, there's something awful fishy about him. Well, I'll risk a dollar on Mr. Bremner and... Yes, dear. He's too curious for me. I think you'll both lose your bets if I... Shh! The front door. Jeepers, if they turn on the lights... There they go now. Mike, your gun. I'm ready. Put up your hands. Huh? Oh, you... Mike, look out! Oh. My hand! The next time it may not be your hand, Mr. Johnson. I don't know what this means. Don't you? You're the only one who knew Ratner was dead and where he was buried. Well, uh, this is all wrong. No, Mr. Johnson, no. You are all wrong. And there's just one way to put it right. And you know what it is. <laughs> Uh, 
Say, I thought you kids had gone home. Oh, no, not until we hear Johnson's confession. He just dictated it. He admits he was Ratner's cellmate up at the penitentiary, released two months ago. Ratner got him to do the robberies and worked the fingerprint deal with him. Well, what about Judge Stanton? It was revenge, Mike. Stanton was the judge who sent him up. Johnson had big plans for this fingerprint racket, so he double-crossed Ratner. I'll say. He even tried to marry his ex-wife. Oh, I doubt it, honey. Probably just playing around with Vera to learn where that money was hidden. That's just what he said, Mike, but the girl was innocent. So, Mike, the inspector and I bet on everybody but Johnson. You said we'd lose. How'd you know? Well, well, I got to thinking over that first talk we had with him. Our cattleman from Texas wouldn't use a jailbird's word for getting out of prison. He didn't say Ratner was pardoned. He said he was sprung. Of course, that wasn't proof, but it made me suspicious. I see. Well, I guess that winds up the case. Yeah, thanks a million for helping me out, kid. Sorry it ruined the evening. Oh, that's all right, Inspector. There's always another night for fun. Well, what's the matter with this one, Angel? Hmm? <laughs> you know, I knew I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the seventh war loan will soon be over. We believe that you know the urgent reasons for buying extra war bonds, for making that extra effort to show how well we know here in the West that the war is still going on. This message is not an effort to sell you on buying extra war bonds. We don't believe there's an American alive who needs selling on the subject of war bonds. But we do want to remind you that the time to do your part in this renewed offensive is growing short. So if you've not already subscribed to the intensified war on Japan by buying bonds for the seventh war loan drive, please do so soon. Thank you. Tune in again next week at 8 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. As San Francisco's busiest private detective, Mike Shane can be found at almost any hour at almost any spot in the city, except one, perhaps, his apartment. Yet right now, that is just where we find him. Of course, he's there only long enough to pick up his overcoat and two theater tickets. Waiting impatiently in the hall doorway is his attractive assistant, Phyllis Knight. Mike, what's keeping you? I can't find the ticket. Oh, fine. Fine, the master detective. Oh, I know, I know. I left them in my other suit. Say, Mike. Mm? Somebody's coming up your stairs. A strange woman. Yeah? I don't know any strange women. You better not. Your date's with me tonight. Good evening. Is this the apartment of Michael Shane? Yes, it is. And you're Mrs. Shane? <laughs> well, no, no. I'm his assistant, Phyllis Knight. 
Oh, I, I'd like to see Mr. Shane. It's very, very important. Well, we were just going I'm out. I'm sorry you... to impose, but I'm afraid it's a matter of life and death. Would you tell him that, please? That's all right. I, uh, I heard it. Oh, Mr. Shane. You are Mr. Shane? Yes, yes. Come in, come in. My name is Mary Noble. I, I arranged to be in your neighborhood tonight, Mr. Shane. I, I had to talk to you. Yes? Oh, won't you sit down? Oh, thank you. I brought my friends to visit some people across the street at the El Tavar Apartments. Then I slipped away so I could see you without them suspecting. I don't understand. Without who suspecting? Mr. and Mrs. Pringle and Chico. Chico? Uh, that's Mr. Savadell. Oh. I told them that I'd stay in the car, that I needed fresh air. You see, Uncle Briggs lets me go out only with his friends. Hmm? People who will spy on me and, and tell him what I do. Chico says he loves me, but I, I know that I'm not pretty. He wants my money. Now, just a second. You said Uncle Briggs. Would that be Briggs Noble? Yes, the rich, the upright Mr. Briggs Noble. I'm his niece, and he's trying to poison me. Oh, now, really. You don't mean that, I'm sure. Oh, but I do. For the past two weeks, I've had strange sick spells. I I'm sure it's the poison. What does your doctor say? I I haven't had a doctor. Hmm? I I've never told anyone, but, but I can't stand it any longer. Uncle Briggs wants me out of the way. I'm a burden. I can't imagine you being a burden to a millionaire. That's what's so strange. He's rich, yet he wants more and more money. Next month I'll be 21, and, and then I inherit my father's money. It's in trust for me. Uncle Briggs wants my money. That's the only way I can explain it. And uh, just what do you want me to do? Talk to my uncle. Warn him that you know everything. You'll protect me. Be my bodyguard. Oh, now, Miss Noble, I'm not that kind of a detective. You don't believe me, do you? Well, I, I can't say. I'm not sure. I might talk to your uncle, but I, I'm certain you've uh, imagined things. I see. I thought you really helped people. Hmm? But I was wrong. No one will help me. No one. Miss no Noble, now, if you'll tell me... Wait a minute. Miss Noble. Well, that gal certainly got off the merry-go-round backwards. Mm -hmm. She seemed perfectly reasonable when she first walked in. But that talk of being a burden on a rich uncle, spied on by his friends, and, and poison. I don't know. She walked the fence between sanity and, well, the opposite. She was scared, Blue, anyway. She almost got me going. People do talk strangely when they're in terror. She said those friends were across the street. Mm-hmm. The Altavar. Yeah, that's right. I'll tell you what. Let's go after her. There. There she is, Mike, hmm? crossing the street. Yeah. Miss Noble. Mary Noble. Mary. Mary, stop! Mike, that taxi! Mike! <laughs> Honest, mister. She fell right in front of my cab. I didn't run over her. Listen, she's dead, isn't she? Oh. I'm telling you, I saw her fall. You mean she tripped? No, no. She slumped in a heap right in front of me. I didn't hit her. Maybe he's right, Mike. Mm -hmm. Look at her dress here. There's no dirt from the wheels. She wasn't dragged. Sure, I stopped in time. My bumper hardly touched her. Yes. My... Yes, huh? it's Mary. Oh, oh, heavens. Is... Yes. What happened? Yes. She... She's dead. She's dead. Oh, William, I told you we shouldn't have left her in the car. Well, she said she wanted some fresh oh, air. How no. could we know this would happen? I uh, I think if you are Mr. and Mrs. Pringle... Why, uh, yes. Uh, do we know you, sir? No, I'm Mike Shane, a private detective. Oh. This girl just left my apartment. Oh, so that's where she went. Huh? She got out of the car and said she wanted to take a walk. You her chauffeur? Uh, yeah, that's right. I, I don't understand, sir. Why did Mary go to you? She thought somebody was trying to kill her, that her life was in danger. Ah, rubbish, Tommy Rock. The girl imagined things. Maybe not, Mr. Pringle. You're a good friend of my boss, but I don't oh, mind shut saying... shut up, Dan, for heaven's sake. Please, gentlemen, gentlemen. Poor oh, Mary, she lies dead. What must we do? We must go call an ambulance. We'll call more than an ambulance, honey. We'll call the inspector. <laughs>
Don't misunderstand me, Mike. It's a sad case, but you admit yourself she was neurotic. This poison business was all in her mind. Possibly, Inspector. Possibly, but the only way you can be sure of it is to investigate. And you ask for an autopsy, Mike. All right, I've ordered it against my own judgment. That's as far as I can go. You know, we really don't have any proof, Mike. Maybe she just had a heart spell and fell in front of the taxi. Police certainly can't investigate Briggs Noble on such weak evidence. He comes from one of the oldest families in San Francisco. He's rich, society. Murder isn't his line, Mike. All right, Inspector, all right. But will you do one thing more for me? What is it? Go out with us to see Briggs Noble. Oh, Mike, you're the most stubborn. We've got to know what we're talking about first. I'll do the talking if you want. I'll take the blame. But I want you there in case. Wait a second. Yes? Autopsy report, sir. Mary Noble. Examination of stomach shows heavy dose of poison. Mike, you were right. Sergeant, what was the poison? Arsenic? Well, I can't tell, sir. Autopsy surgeon says the victim's hands are clenched tight and toes turned under. He says that the same symptoms of a rare native poison from South America. I see. Mike, is there anything you want to ask him? No. No, just tell him if they find anything else to call you at the home of Briggs Noble. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane. Ladies and gentlemen, sludge in an engine is terrible stuff. It sticks to the pistons, valves, and other working parts, and it slows down and interferes with smooth engine performance. The sludge formed by some oils is so sticky that it doesn't ordinarily drain out when the oil is changed, but continues to accumulate. The only way to get rid of it is to have your engine flushed out occasionally. Your Union Oil Minute Man can perform this service for you quickly and cheaply. He has a special solvent action flushing oil known as cleanse oil. Now, cleanse oil is harmless to your engine, but it cuts the sludge in a hurry. So when the cleanse oil is drained out, the sludge flushes right out with it, leaving the engine nice and clean. Then, with a fresh supply of pure paraffin-based Triton motor oil, you're all set for hundreds of miles of clean, safe engine operation. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Engine Flushing Service. Thank you. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have just entered the ornate library of Briggs Noble. Noble stands in front of the fireplace. This is the first time I've had the pleasure of meeting you, Mr. Shane. I'm told you already know my friends here. Yes, yes, but the inspector doesn't. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Pringle, Mr. Savadell, and of course my chauffeur, Dan Casey. How do you do? How do you do? do? I imagine, Mr. Shane, that you've come here to tell me my niece appealed to you for protection. Yes, she did, Mr. Noble. I told your friends that. Yes. Poor girl. I never understood her. She was so moody. Hmm? I tried to make her happy. Gave her everything she asked for, except the one thing she really wanted. Her pretty face. So she chose the final remedy. You mean she committed suicide? What else? She threw herself under a taxi cab? It's not that simple, Mr. Noble. The autopsy shows she was not killed by the taxi. Really? No, she was poisoned. What? Poisoned? Oh. Why? Quite bent on death, wasn't she? Perhaps not, sir. You see... We think she was murdered. Oh, no. No. Did she have any enemies, Mr. Noble? None. Nor many friends. I suppose that was the trouble. Do any of you know if she was sick during the past couple of weeks? Why, yes. I remember one day I Hmm? was driving her and Mr. Savadell. She almost fainted. You remember it, sir? I, uh... Oh, I remember. Did she tell you, Mr. Savadell, that she planned to see a detective tonight? No, I... I come in, Mr. and Mrs. Pringle are with her. I... I give Marie a box of candy. We make small talk. Mm -hmm. She keeps saying we must all go visit some friend. But uh, that is all. It's difficult to remember. Mm. Mr. Noble, your niece said she was to come into an inheritance on her 21st birthday. Where will that money go now? Well, I'm the last member of the family. It'll come to me. Oh, I see. Mm. I know. Our family has had a tragic history. All violent deaths. Mm. My brother Edward died in a shipwreck off China. My nephew, Grant Noble, disappeared in his plane over Brazil. Dodd Noble, Mary's father, was crushed in a train wreck. Aren't the women alive? No. Edward and Dodd married, but their wives are gone, too. It's been very, very depressing. Mr. Noble, it's uh, time to be frank with you. Your niece came to me for protection from you. She said you were trying to poison her. Why, that's fantastic, Miss... Hmm, She thought that about me. Poor girl. 
I told you she had strange moods. It's a very weak explanation, sir. You admit she had no enemies and that you would inherit her estate. Why should I want her money? I have more now than I want. You gentlemen don't realize the penalties of wealth. That's neither here nor there, sir. Mary Noble was poisoned. She named you. It's my duty to determine the facts. I see, Inspector, that you're determined to make me out a murderer. All I can say is this. I'm not guilty. But, Mr. Noble... Furthermore, if you insist upon bringing charges against me, I'm a man of wealth and power. I can employ the best legal counsel. I think you'd look very embarrassing in court. It would not benefit your reputation. I see. Thank you for the warning, sir. And good night. Well, I don't mean to tell you boys your own business, but why didn't you search the house for poison? Well, for one thing, the killer would be smart enough to remove it. Second, I don't think Noble is our man. He has no motive. Now, don't tell me the brave inspector is scared out No, by no. Him. Look at it this way, Mike. Uh, Poison is one of the subtlest types of murder. Mm -hmm. The killer figures that because nobody sees him actually give the victim poison, no jury will convict him on circumstantial evidence. Noble has a perfect alibi. She committed suicide. He ought to know. He's our uncle. If it were suicide, the girl would hardly run to Mike to protect her life and then take poison. Unless she hated her uncle enough to try to frame him with her murder. Well, let's get rid of this suicide alibi right now. Inspector, if she took poison, it must have been in some container. Uh -huh. Now, we didn't find anything suspicious in her purse, but she would have to leave the bottle someplace. Now, where was she just before she died? In your apartment. But she didn't swallow anything there. And before that, she was in her car. So how about giving that a quick once-over, huh? Okay by me. Suppose it's the car over there by the driveway? Well, we'll find out. Uh-huh. It's a limousine with a chauffeur's compartment. Here, here's the light switch. See anything, Mike? Mm, mm, magazines, lap robe, newspapers and stuff. Ah. Now, there's nothing under this cushion. No, no bottle. Well, then she didn't have any poison with her in the car. That still doesn't rule out suicide. Hey, wait a minute, Inspector. What? We've been a couple of dopes. Mary accused her uncle. We accepted that and forgot everyone else. Got anybody in mind? Yes, the autopsy report said Mary's hands and toes were curled up tight, the symptoms of a South American poison. Who in that house there is, uh, is a Latin? Savadell. Of course. That's enough for me, kids. We're making a round trip right now. But of course, gentlemen, I am from South America. My my father was a trader in the Amazon River. Then maybe it's more than coincidence that Mary was killed by a rare native poison from South America. What? Why, well, you didn't tell us that. A poison from... Oh, Santa Maria... Gentlemen, this is bad. You're oh. telling us. Oh, no, you do not understand. You have not been in this room before. Look on the walls. Hmm? Mr. Noble has poison spear, poison arrow, poison darts. Yeah. All from South America. So, what about this, Mr. Noble? It's true. Oh, fine. Pringle brought them to me from Ecuador. They were poisoned, but not now. I had the stuff all soaked off when I mounted them. Mr. Pringle, is it possible to use that poison after it's been removed? Uh, well, I don't know. The uh, natives in South America use a number of poisons. They act in different ways. I can assure you that Mary did not die of poison from this collection. Ah, where she procured it is a question for you detectives. You still insist it was suicide? I do. Mike. Hmm? Maybe there's another way we can settle that. Yeah, what is it? Well, Mary seems to have been a very lonely girl. It's very common for lonely girls to keep diaries. Hmm? Well, if Mary kept one, perhaps it would tell us what she intended to do. Yes, yes, yes. I gave her a diary for Christmas. She always kept it on the top of the desk up in her room. Swell. Then up to the bedroom we go. <laughs> That's her desk over there by the window. Mm -hmm. And we'll find it on top, huh? That's right. It's a big green and gold book. Well, I, I don't see it, Mike. Maybe it's in the drawer. No. No, just the usual stuff. 
Well, it's not here, Mr. Noble. Oh, that's very strange. Could she have hidden it? Well, I don't know if it's important enough to make a search right now. We'll go on with the question. Uh, Noble, do you mind... You're uh, you're going? Well, yes. uh, My wife and I would like to get home. If there's nothing we can do for you, we'll say goodnight. Well, the inspector may not have done with you. Uh, Oh, I think so. If we need you, Mr. Noble can give us your address and phone number. Uh, uh, Yes, of course. Well, uh, good night, then. Uh, Mrs. Pringle. One moment, please. Pardon? Uh, Your purse... Hasn't it taken on weight very suddenly? Uh, what? May I look inside, please? Why, well, this? Well, Mrs. Pringle? A diary. Oh, Why, well, I, I didn't know. Mr. Noble motioned to me to rope in my purse, and he slipped something in. I didn't know it was a diary. You see, it's, it's a different color. I'll admit it. I misled you all. I slipped the diary into her purse while you were searching the desk. It certainly doesn't help your case, Mr. Noble. I didn't know what peculiar ideas Mary might have written down. I wanted to protect her memory. And yes, my reputation. Mike, Mm. did you read anything in it? Mm, Nothing very unusual so far. No mention of suicide. Mr. Savadell, I gather that you proposed to Mary. Oh, many times. We never followed up our questions with you either, sir. I know what you have in mind, but you were wrong. Mm. I killed the girl I love? No. Uh, uh, Mr. Inspector, excuse yeah. me. I realize this diary episode with my wife looked suspicious. Uh, but since Mr. Noble has admitted the fault, I think we're cleared. Uh, would you let us go home now? Tonight's been a great strain on my wife. Well, we'd all like to go well, home. Well, I, I wouldn't ask it, sir, but my wife is not in good health. I see. What do you say, Mike? Yeah, certainly, by all means. All right, Mr. Pringle. Thank you very much. Good night, good everybody. Night. Good, yeah, night. Yeah, good night. Good night. And now, Mike? Wait. Okay. Now, Mr. Noble, if you please, the address of Mr. and Mrs. Pringle. I suppose you boys know this may be a wild goose chase. Oh, I don't think so, Angel. The Pringles were a little too anxious to get home. And I'm still not satisfied about that diary in the purse. They put on quite an innocent act, the way Noble came to their rescue. Yeah. There, there's the house, number 1511. Yeah, but it's all dark. That's funny. We drove slowly so we'd get here ahead of them. We wanted to catch them with whatever they're up to. Wait, Inspector. There's a light in the garage. Yeah. Okay, stop your engine, Mike. Close that door gently, Mike. Okay. Leave us walk on the grass so they won't hear us. And keep in the shadows. Look. Look. They're both in the garage. Let's cross the driveway. What in blazes are they doing? They got a bucket of... Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. Pringles got some of those javelins. Poison javelins. Soaking them in the bucket. All right. Let's make an entrance. This water isn't hot enough. It, it's got to be boiling. Well, I'll go heat a kettle. Then. Don't bother, Mrs. Oh. Pringle. You're in enough hot water right now. Oh, William. Shane, I... Inspector, what's the meaning of this? So you cook the spear points in hot water to extract the poison. I I don't know. I was just trying to find out to see if it still had power. Yes. Mike, there's a car coming up the driveway. Yeah. Who is it? Why is he blowing the horn? Oh, I don't... Hey, cut it out. Get off that horn! There's something wrong. Come on. There's a man slumped over the steering wheel. I'll pull him off the horn. Okay, mister. Raise up. Holy jump. It's Savadell. Yes. Unconscious. But how? Who? Here's the answer. Remember the symptoms of that South American poison? Tight, clenched hands? Look. We'll return to Mike and Phil in just a moment. Friends, it's pretty safe to say that carbon is the number one enemy of your automobile engine. Carbon burns valves, gums up piston rings, and may lead to expensive repair bills. Therefore, anything that reduces carbon formation is of interest to careful drivers. And that's just what Triton Motor Oil does. Yes, that's right. Triton Motor Oil cuts down carbon. Why? 
Well, nearly all carbon comes from the lubricating oil and not from the gasoline, as so many people think. But all lubricating oils are not the same in their carbon-forming tendencies. In fact, in a recent comparative test made with the seven leading motor oils sold here in the West, Triton contained 38% fewer carbon-forming elements than the next best oil, 86% less than the average. The secret of Triton's superiority lies in the Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent refining process, a process so valuable that it's been patented by Union Oil Company. So, friends with mechanics as scarce as they are today, why not take advantage of the extra protection the 100% pure paraffin-based Triton motor oil will give you against carbon? You can buy Triton motor oil at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. An ambulance has carried the unconscious Sabadell to the hospital. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have returned to the Pringle garage with Mr. and Mrs. Pringle. I, uh, I know it looks bad, gentlemen, but you didn't give us a chance to explain. Well, you've got your chance now, Mr. Pringle. Make the most of it. You were out here in your garage trying to get poison off two South American hunting spears. What for? Uh, well, because they're the same type spears I brought Noble from Ecuador. I wanted to collect the poison and send it to the police. So you people could compare it with the poison found in Mary's stomach. Yeah. Oh, you're suddenly very helpful, Mrs. Pringle, after you try to smuggle Mary's diary away from the police. But I didn't mean to. That's what made William and I think Mr. Noble might be guilty after all. Looks to me like all three of you are in the same boat. At least we don't have to consider Savadell any longer. Yes. As I see it, Savadell was really in love with Mary. He tore over here to the Pringles for the same reason we did. Because he figured they were in cahoots with Noble. Then collapsed in his car from the same poison. Okay, but which of these three did it? And is the poison from these three spears? Wait a minute. I got a new angle, Inspector. Mary was killed by the poison. Savadell got enough of it to send him to the hospital, but... But nobody else has keeled over tonight. That's right. Then what did Mary and Savadell eat or drink that nobody else touched? Did all of you people eat dinner together? Uh, yes, we did. Well, then it's not the food. Did either of you see Mary or Savadell drink anything which you didn't? Not that I remember. Well, they must have a food or drink or something that... Wait a minute. What? Wait a minute. How about candy? Savadell said he brought Mary a box tonight. Oh, he always did. Mary was a candy fiend. Ate chocolates all day long. Did you eat any tonight? Oh, no. They're much too sweet for me. And you, Mrs. Pringle? I never touched chocolates. Then they did eat something which you didn't. If Mary always ate chocolates, that would be an ideal way to give her the poison. The sugar in the stuff might slow down the effect. We may be wrong, but we've got to find that box of chocolates. Well, the last I saw of it, Mary and Mr. Savadell had it with them in the car. But we searched the car, Mike. Yes, honey, yes, but we were looking for a bottle of poison. We weren't thinking of candy. There was an awful lot of stuff in that car. We've got to look again, and it better be fast. I put the car in the garage here just a minute ago. Uh, if I'd known you fellows wanted to look at that's it... That's all right, Dan. That's all right. Thanks for letting us in. Sure. Uh, anything else I can do for you? No, thanks, Dan. Okay, if you want me, I'll be in my room. It's right overhead. All right. Okay, Dan. Thanks. We better look good this time, Mike. Yeah. You need more light in there? No, no. Did you find anything, Inspector? Uh-uh. No. Ah, no, right. Just the same stuff I found before. Uh, it's it's hopeless, Mike. No killer would poison the girl, then leave a box, box of chocolates high and dry for the police. He wouldn't be that dumb. It isn't a question of dumbness, Inspector. It's a question of time. But he'd still get rid of the chocolates. We don't know where to look for them. Now, let me think. He wouldn't throw the chocolates out of the car. Somebody might pick them up and eat them. That means he must have brought them back here. Think, Inspector, think. Would he destroy the chocolates or hide them? He'd destroy them. That means the box, too. He'd have to burn it. I saw an incinerator on this side of the garage. Lead us to it, Angel. Mike, you, you got a hold of something. Well, pull it. Come on, pull it out. There. Here you are. The box of chocolates. Open it up. Mm, they're mashed up a bit, but we can analyze them, and if the fingerprints aren't too must over... Well, they probably are. Wait a minute, honey. Yeah? Back at my apartment, didn't Mary say she had told no one ex no one else but you and me that her uncle was trying to poison her? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yet, yet one other person tonight seemed to know something about it. When we were looking at Mary's body, he made a crack about Noble. It was Dan Casey. Mm -hmm. 
Yes? Oh, Mr. Shane. Yeah, do you mind if we come in for a minute, Dan? Why, glad to have you. Dan... Dan, tonight when we found Mary Noble's body, I heard you start to tell Mr. Pringle that your boss could uh, stand some investigating. Well, I guess I was right, wasn't I? Mm, perhaps, but uh, before Mary came to me, she hadn't told her fears to a living soul. Yet you were able to name Briggs Noble. Well, you know, that's just one of those things. Mind if we take a little look around your room, Dan? Now, hold on. What is it you want? Well, here's uh, one thing we want on your dresser. This dish of chocolates here. What of it? Miss Mary gave them to me. You mind eating a piece? No, of course not. Hmm, that's it. Oh, by the way, I got a few more chocolates here in my pocket. It's the same kind. Huh? They had a few ashes on them, but I cleaned them off. Good as new. The ashes? Yes, yes, from the incinerator. But I'll just add them to your dish here and mix them all around like that. Now, would you eat another? Yeah. I... Go on. Eat a piece. Eat two or three. No. No, I won't. No. I didn't think you would. Okay, Inspector, I think this is where you take over. <laughs> I insist you must have a drink. A cup of peace between the Inspector and myself. Well, I guess I would drink to then. I can understand your suspicions of me, gentlemen, when I kept telling you it was suicide. But what gets me, Mr. Noble, is uh, how you could employ, uh, employ a chauffeur for months and not recognize him as your own nephew. You forget I hadn't seen him for over ten years. When he disappeared in his plane over Brazil, he was hardly more than a boy. Mm. When he was dead, the whole family thought he was dead. But, uh, Mr. Noble, he was Mary's cousin. Could he still inherit her money? Certainly. The inheritance was so arranged that it would go either to him or if dead to me. So he planned to disappear after tonight and come back in a few months as the long-lost heir. Quite a scheme. Chocolate-coated murder. Say, speaking of that, do you think there's a candy store open at this hour? I'd like to buy Phil a box of chocolates. Uh, uh, no, thanks, no. After tonight, I've lost my sweet tooth. Oh, but maybe when you see him, honey, nice, big, luscious bonbon. Mike Shane, you haven't given me a box of chocolates in years. If you do it now, I'll know what to expect. Oh, no, you won't, Angel. <laughs> oh, no, you won't. <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Once, Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite detective, is in his office high up in the Rust Building attending to business. Phyllis Knight, his easy-on-the-eyes assistant, is taking notes as their latest clients, inventor William Belsey and Miss Hess, try to explain the unexplainable. Now, let me get this straight, Miss Hess. You have been visiting your aunt in New York? Yes, for six months. I wired Daddy that I would arrive Wednesday, but I managed to get an earlier train and arrive Monday. And the house was all in order when you came home Monday at ten in the morning? Yes, that's right. I expected Daddy for dinner, but 
Well, he didn't come home. You didn't call his office and tell him you had arrived earlier than expected? Oh, no. Daddy hated people in the family calling him at the office. And you weren't particularly worried when he didn't come home at all that night? Not particularly. Daddy often stayed at the club. But uh, you didn't call the club, hmm? No. So Monday night he didn't come home, all day Tuesday he didn't come home? Nor Tuesday night, nor all day Wednesday. So it was only because Mr. Belsey called you Wednesday night and said your father had an appointment with him and that your father hadn't showed up. It was for that reason only that you started to worry. No, I wouldn't say that. I worried more and more as the time passed, but you must remember Daddy didn't expect me till Wednesday night. And his appointment wasn't with me exactly. I was going to be there naturally, but the appointment was with Mr. Hackert and Mr. Carter. As uh, I understand it, you, uh, you had an invention which Mr. Hess was going to finance? Actually, he did finance it. He advanced me the money I asked for. But I saw that my estimate was wrong, so I laid the cards on the table and gave Mr. Hess the chance to withdraw. And instead of withdrawing from the venture, he invited Carter and Hackett in on it. Hmm? That's right. And I wanted them to think it over before they accepted the deal. It's pretty much of a gamble, you know. And uh, although Miss Hess maintains that her father hasn't been home since Monday, you saw him at lunchtime on Wednesday. Oh, just for a second. We just happened to be lunching at the same cafe. Uh, you reminded him of the evening's appointment? He reminded me. So today you both decided to ask me to investigate. Well, the idea was Mr. Bess Belsey's. He insisted that we do something, so I called the police, but Mr. Belsey said that that wasn't enough, and so we came to you. When did you notify the police? About 11 this morning. I'll get it. Mike Shane, private detective. Hello, fellas. Oh, hello, Inspector. Is Miss Hess still in your office? Why, yes, but how... Let me I... talk to her, Phil. Sure, Inspector. Uh, it's for you, Miss Hess. For me? Yes, Inspector. Here, you talk to him. Hello? Miss Hess? Can you come over to Oakland right away? Why, yes, I suppose so. It's important, Miss Hess. It's about your father. You... You mean you found him? Yes, I'm afraid so. Afraid? Then... Then something's happened to him? Yes. Oh, serious? Very serious, Miss Hess. Your father is dead. Dead? You say Daddy's dead? Yes, Miss Hess, your father was murdered. Hello, well, Inspector. Hello. Thanks for bringing the young lady along. We won't keep you alone, Miss Hess. Just a matter of identification. Of course, from the cards and his wallet and other bits of information, we're certain. I understand. All right, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Is that your father, Miss Hess? Yes, Inspector. That's Daddy. Have you any idea as to who murdered him? No, not so far. We'll want to question you later, of course, to find out, well, whether or not he had any enemies. I'm ready to answer questions now. I'm not the hysterical type, Inspector. So I gather. Inspector. Yes? There, there's something different about Father. And, and not because... Not because he's dead and been in the water? No. I don't know what it is. Just, just different. I see. Has the inspector asked about the possibility of your father's enemies? He had none that I know of. How much do you know about Mr. Belsey and the other partners in this deal, Miss Hess? Mr. Carter and Mr. Hackett? Well, I don't know Mr. Belsey at all. I, I never spoke to him before he called up Wednesday night because Daddy hadn't hadn't kept his appointment. You've known the others how long? Ever since I was going to high school. Mm. What, uh, what do you know about them? Well, nothing except that they seem nice. Mr. Shane. Inspector. Yes? I... I know what it is that's different. Oh, yes? Daddy's coat, his overcoat, his umbrella, and his glasses are missing. Well, under the circumstances, glasses and the umbrella being missing uh, is not surprising. Of course, he might not have been wearing his overcoat. Daddy always wore his overcoat. It was one of his distinguishing habits. He never went out without an overcoat. Do you know how many coats he had? Well, yes, he had three, unless he bought one while I was away. Do you mind if we go to your house right now? We might find something there in the nature of a clue. No, I have no objection. Okay. Inspector? Yes? You take Miss Hess. Right. Phyllis and I will take Belsey. And I think the sergeant ought to gather Carter and Hackett, too, don't you? The sergeant already called headquarters and asked them to locate them for good, us. Good, good. Then we'll all meet at your place on Pacific Heights. <laughs> Do 
You uh, say, Mr. Pelzi, that uh, everything was harmonious at the meeting between you, the murdered man, Hackard and Carter, on Monday night? Oh, certainly. There was no reason for anything else. The meeting was held at Hackard's house. We were all agreed. I had the invention, they had the money, and they were willing to start right away. I just wanted them to think it over and take their time. What happened after the meeting? Why, nothing. It was cold, and I drove Mr. Hess over the Bay Bridge. He refused to let me drive him home, so I let him out at the key system depot, and he caught a taxi. You say it was cold? Oh, uh, yes, it was. Tell me, was he wearing his overcoat? Why, no. Was he wearing his overcoat Wednesday when you saw him at lunch? Uh, yes, he was. Mike, hmm? I guess this is the house, the one with the white porch. There's the inspector's car in front. Oh, oh yes, sir. Oh, there you are. Miss Hess is checking the closet for her father's overcoats. I said I'd show you into the living room. In this way. Hackett and Carter are on their way out, Mike. Good, good. Car just drove up outside. Two men getting out. Oh, that's them. Inspector, Daddy's dark blue overcoat's missing. And so is his favorite umbrella. The one with the handle carved in the shape of an elephant. Did you say umbrella, Miss? Yes, Sergeant. With the handle shaped like an elephant? That's right. What is it, Sergeant? Well, the headquarters just phoned. They found the umbrella and the overcoat with a pair of eyeglasses in the pocket. Where'd they find them, Sergeant? Washed up at the Yacht Club Jetty in Sausalito. What? What? At Sausalito? Well, that's ten miles from from where we found the body. That's funny. It's more than funny, Inspector. It's the first clue yet. The murderer's first mistake. In just a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and his adventures. Friends, your automobile engine gets dirty inside as well as out. As your engine operates, bits of carbon, particles of dirt, drops of water and gasoline are constantly accumulating in the crankcase. As these accumulations build up, they form a sludge which gums up valves, sticks to piston rings and otherwise interferes with the smooth, easy operation of your engine. That's why Union Oil Company recommends flushing out your engine from time to time with Cleanse Oil, the special solvent action cleansing oil. Cleanse Oil is harmless to your motor, but it penetrates quickly to every working part, cutting sludge away swiftly and cleanly. Then, when the Cleanse Oil is drained out, the sludge flushes out with it, leaving your engine clean. And with a fresh supply of pure paraffin-based Triton motor oil, you're all set for hundreds of miles of clean, economical engine operation. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask the Minuteman for Union Oil Engine Flushing Service. Thank you. The murdered Mr. Hess's overcoat, umbrella, and glasses have been found. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are in the inspector's office at headquarters. The sergeant enters. Oh. Here you are, sir. Coat, umbrella, and glasses. Oh, the glasses aren't broken. Thanks, sergeant. Let me see them, inspector. Oh, wow. wow. Pretty strong lenses. Yeah, if he needed glasses like these, he couldn't go very far without them. Yeah, that's just what I was thinking. This is the umbrella, hmm? Hey, you, uh, you got a magnifying glass, Inspector? Sure. Did you find something, Mike? A uh, question, maybe. Tell me, Sergeant, which pocket did you find the glasses in? It's in the report, right-hand pocket. Mm, I see. Inspector? Yes, Mike? Would you mind calling Miss Hess? Find out if her father was left-handed or not. He was left-handed, Mike. She told me that when we were driving out to her home. I was asking about his habits and so on. Uh-huh, I thought so. Here. You see the finger marks on the umbrella handle? Mm-hmm. They're on the left side of the handle. The thumbprint is on the right. Mm. And the glasses were in the right-hand pocket of the overcoat. Yes? Report from Harbor Master says that prevailing currents would never wash umbrella and coat that distance. Mm. The Harbor Master says there's a strong eddy and they were probably thrown in the water only a few yards away at most. Thanks. Ah, oh, it doesn't tell us much. Hmm. Only that the murderer threw the coat and umbrella into the bay about ten miles from where the crime was committed. It only goes to substantiate murder. We already know that. Maybe we better have in Hackett and Carter. Okay, Inspector. Yes, Inspector. Send in Hackett. Yes, sir. Any ideas, Mike? Yeah. Same as you had. And to go, they don't make much, do they? Sit down, Mr. Hackett. 
Thanks. Tell us, what do you know about this business? I don't know anything about it. You were in on the business discussions? Certainly, but I hardly think they had anything to do with the murder. Well, we have to start somewhere, you know. Well, then why don't you start with some of the men that Tess quarreled with? Mm-hmm. Well, I happen to be one man with whom he never argued. You're suggesting, Mr. Carter? So you're supposed to be the detective. Mm. Ah, but you're doing the hinting. And Carter wasn't the only one who hated Hess. Well, if Carter hated Hess, why did Hess invite Carter into the deal? Hess didn't know that Carter hated him. Well, you're not suggesting that Carter had anything to gain in this venture. That is, by uh, by Hess's death. I'm not suggesting anything. It does seem to me, though, that uh, many people had plenty of reason for killing Hess. Some men hated him. They could have killed him out of anger or revenge. Why look for some financial gain as a motive? We're not. As far as we can see, no one gained anything by Hess's death. Except his daughter, who will inherit a pretty penny. Oh. Again, uh, are you suggesting that Miss Hess didn't get all the money she needed from her father? She got all she needed, but not a cent more. Hess was tight. A nickel had to reproduce itself in 12 months or else. And you can't help us any more than that? No. I see. Well, ask Mr. Carter to step in on your way out. Thanks. Well, there's an unpleasant character. Yes, but unnecessarily so. He pretty well removes any doubts as to what we might think about money being the motive for murder. Oh, I'm not buying that, Inspector. In its entirety, anyway. Oh, well, but nobody has anything to gain by Hess's death. Sit down, Mr. Carter. Thank you. Tell us, what do you know about this business? I'm afraid I don't know anything about it. You were in on the business discussions? Oh, yes, but I doubt if they had anything to do with the murder. Well, we have to start somewhere, you know. Yes, I realize that, and I'd start if I had any ideas. Uh, Mr. Carter, did you ever quarrel with Hess? Quarrel with him? No, I've often disagreed with him, but I wouldn't call it quarreling. Would you say he had many enemies? Good land, no. He was very businesslike, very brusque. Not at all approachable, if you know what I mean. A man of opinions? Oh, definitely. But he respected other men's opinions, too. And the Monday night meeting was held at Mr. Hackett's house, hmm? Yes, the Hackett's was the most centrally located. Besides, neither Hess nor I like to conduct business at home, and Hackett doesn't mind. You get along all right with Hackett? Certainly, I understand him. His bark is worse than his bite. Oh. He's really a very nice fellow. The last you saw of Hess was at Hackett's house, huh? Yes. You made no future appointments with him? No, except the one for Wednesday night. Oh, wait. Yes? Come to think of it, I did say as I was helping him on with his coat that I might see him Tuesday at the club. But you didn't? No, because I didn't go to the club. I was detained on business over in Oakland. I see. And you can't tell us anything more? I'm sorry, no. Thanks a lot, Mr. Carter. We'll call on you if we need you. Well? Not much help. I disagree. What? What? He was a great help. I can't see a suspect in the whole bunch. No, nor can I. All we have is a murdered man. You want me to prove that the murderer is one of the four? Yes, but you can. One of them lied. Which, Mike? That I don't know, honey. If I did, we'd have the murderer. But that doesn't alter the fact that one of them lied. Well, it is true that Hackett's description of Hess's character is very different from Carter's. But I'd hardly call that lying. Oh, I'm not talking about that. Uh, Inspector. Yes, Mike? Ask the sergeant if Carter and Hackett have left the building yet. Yes, Inspector. Have Carter and Hackett left yet? No, sir. They're standing talking to Miss Hess and Belzy. Good. Uh, tell them tell them we've got a lead and that Mr. Shane would like to see Miss Hess at her home alone in about 30 minutes. Did you get that, Sergeant? Yes, sir. And uh, see that they all hear it. Yes, sir. Right away. What's the idea, Mike? The murderer has left plenty clues. Well, I don't know what they are, then. The coat and the umbrella being found so far from the murder. Yeah. The eyeglasses in the right-hand pocket of the coat. Mm -hmm. A deliberate falsehood. One says Hess was wearing his coat. Another says he was not. One says Hess was argumentative. Another says he was not. So what? They're clues, but they don't lead us to anywhere. Right, Inspector, right. So we trapped the killer. Go on, I'm waiting. The killer's clever, Inspector. Very, very clever. He's covered his tracks beautifully, yet... Yeah, Mike? Yet, like every other killer, he made mistakes. We have found some of these mistakes, but we don't know who made them. So we're pretending that we found a lead. The killer will worry. And try to find out what we know, thereby making another mistake. One that will point the finger at him, huh? Right, Angel, right. Now we'll go to the Hess place in my car. I'll drive, and you two keep out of sight. In the back, lie down on the floor. I've got to have the killer believe that I'm meeting Miss Hess alone and that there are no witnesses. Look, Mike, I, 
I don't like that. Why not? Well, you're practically inviting the killer to take a pot shot at you, using yourself as bait. Mike Shane, I didn't catch on at first. Well, you're not going to do any such thing. Yes, I am. I'm going to catch the killer, and you can help or not. Now, come on. Come on. Out the back way. I'll drive my car into the police garage, and that way no one will see you two getting into it. <laughs> Jane, I can hardly wait. What have you found? Are you all alone? Yes, except for the maid. No phone calls? No, not a thing. I just got here a few moments ago. No one followed you? Not that I know of. Now, I'm going to look around the driveway here for a minute. Will you please uh, go to the back door and let the inspector and Phyllis in the back way? Yes, of course. So, eh, Mike? Uh, apparently, it didn't work. Well, I'm just as glad. I can't see any profit in catching a murderer and losing my boss. You expected the killer to follow you. Maybe shoot you because you said that you had found the lead. Uh, that was the idea, Miss Hess. But it didn't work. Hello? Inspector there? Yes. It's for you, Inspector. Yes? Just got a report from the surgeon. Yes, Sergeant. The surgeon said Hess was killed Monday night or Tuesday morning. The body's been in the water at least that long. We'll return to Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Friends, just about everyone who drives a car knows that carbon is one of the prime evils of motoring. But what many people don't know is that the choice of a lubricating oil has a direct influence on the amount of carbon formed in their engine. Yes, that's right. Your selection of a lubricating oil determines the amount of carbon formed in your motor. That's because nearly all carbon comes from the lubricating oil and not from the gasoline, as so many people think. But lubricating oils differ widely in the amount of carbon they will form. For example... In a recent laboratory test made with the seven leading motor oils sold here in the West, Triton motor oil contained 38% fewer carbon-forming elements than the next best oil, 86% less than the average. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, in addition to being a 100% pure paraffin-based lubricant, Triton motor oil gives you definite protection against carbon. That's because Triton motor oil is made by an exclusive propane solvent refining process, a process so valuable that it's been patented by Union Oil Company. You can buy Triton at all Union Oil Minute Band stations, wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Remember, Triton cuts down carbon. Mike's attempt at tricking the murderer into disclosing himself has failed. Now, Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are walking into a well-known cafe on Geary Street. Well, we'll soon find out whether or not that nice inventor, Belsie, was telling the truth. My guess is that we will. Really? Why do you say that, Inspector? If Belsie had killed Hess on Monday night, he wouldn't try to establish an alibi for himself by saying that he saw Hess in this cafe on Wednesday. (laughs) Why not? You can't tell me that he's so dumb that he thinks we wouldn't check on it. Well, we haven't tried to check on it so far, and the only reason we are checking is because the autopsy surgeon says the body's been in the water since Monday. We would have checked before the case was closed. Uh, Perhaps, Inspector, perhaps. But supposing the body hadn't been found for weeks, then the autopsy surgeon couldn't have told the approximate time of death with such closeness. Oh, that's true. And the murderer probably figured on it being some time before the body was discovered. Uh, In fact, he came darn close to a perfect crime. What do you mean, darn close? It is a perfect crime so far. It won't be. What? What? Oh, I know, I know, I know. I laid one trap and it caught no fish, but we'll get him, Inspector. Well, look, kids, here's the door. Now, who goes first, or do we discuss traps, fish, and Mike's failure standing on the sidewalk? I'll lead, Phil. All right. 
There, there's the manager. Yeah, I see him. You wish your table for three, sir? Uh, no, thanks. I'm from headquarters, and I want to ask a question. Headquarters? Yes, yes, sir. Can you recall seeing a gentleman in here last Wednesday? He'd be wearing a dark blue overcoat, carrying an umbrella. It's got a carved handle, carved like an elephant. Yes. So you do know about him? Yeah. I even remember his name. It was uh, Hess. Why do you remember these details? The gentleman was much disturbed. Oh. He don't want nothing we have on the menu. Mm. I used to get a mad with the waiter. But um, how did you learn his name? Well, while the waiter was getting his order. Yes. A young man come up to me and he said, Did I hear Mr. Hess' voice a moment ago? I see. Mm-hmm. I said, I don't know. Mm. Who is this Mr. Hess? Mm. The young man said, he's always carry umbrella and he's wear glasses. He did. And I said, oh, yes, sure. He's in the third booth, but he's in a plenty better mood. <laughs> and the young man laughed and walked out of the booth. That's all I know. Well, thanks a lot. Well, well, that about fixed an alibi for Mr. Belsey. Yes, despite the autopsy surgeon's statement that Hess was killed Monday. No jury's going to convict a man who can produce witnesses who saw them both on Wednesday. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What, Mike? No, no, don't rush him, Inspector. That's Mike's thinking look, and it produces results. Honey, I believe I got it. Quick, quick, back to headquarters and have all the suspects brought in. Any results, Inspector? Yes, Mike. The boys examined the umbrella and found two different sets of fingerprints. So the umbrella had been handled by someone else besides Hess. Oh, that's not conclusive by any means. Why not? A waiter or anybody could hand a man's umbrella to him, honey. They're working on the coat now. Uh, What about the eyeglasses? I was holding that one back, Mike. There are two sets of fingerprints on the glasses. And the two sets on the glasses are the same as the two sets on the umbrella handle? Yes, Mike. Then we've got the murderer. I think so. We have to do this in such a way that the inspector can obtain a conviction. Remember what I said about the jury. Yeah. Yes? Send him in. Now, now remember, at the appropriate moment, I'll spring my story and you two watch like hawks. All right. right. Sit down, all of you, please. I'm going to ask all of you for your fingerprints. It's a messy business, but nothing to it. Uh, why? Have you, uh, found something? Yes, we have, Mr. Hackett. Daddy's murderer. Yes, Miss Hess. Now, folks, I'll bring you up to date. Mr. Hess was murdered Monday night. Oh, wait a minute. I saw him Wednesday. You are going to stick to that? Well, certainly I'm going to stick to it. Mr. Belzy, I'll give you one more chance to get yourself out of the jam you're putting yourself in by continuing to lie about seeing Mr. Hess on Wednesday. Oh, but I tell you, I did I'll explain. It's a matter of ordinary police routine to look for the person who last saw the murdered man alive. Well, yes, I know that. The autopsy surgeon says Mr. Hess was murdered Monday. You're insisting on putting the rope around your own neck if you continue to claim that you saw him Wednesday. But I did see him Wednesday, and the people in the cafe can prove it. <sighs> All right, Belsie. You asked for it. Miss Hess, gentlemen, here's how the murder was committed. Mr. Hess was hit over the head Monday night and his body thrown into the bay not far from the key system depot. The murderer kept Hess's coat, umbrella, and glasses. Go on, go on. You catch on quickly, Mr. Carter. The murderer then waited till Wednesday, and wearing Mr. Hess's coat, eyeglasses, and carrying Mr. Hess's umbrella, he made a point of making himself known at the cafe. He then put the eyeglasses in the coat pocket. The right coat pocket, which was a mistake because Mr. Hess was left-handed. But but he put the glasses in the right-hand pocket, and laying the coat and the umbrella on the chair, he then made himself known to the manager as himself, looking for Mr. Hess, whose voice he claimed to have heard. Mm, Clever. Very clever. Diabolical is the word, Mr. Hacker. The murderer then carried the overcoat on his arm, hiding the umbrella... And later that night, threw them into a different part of the bay. But there are a few things that even soaking in the bay won't remove. Fingerprints. Right-hand fingerprints on the umbrella handle. Fingerprints on the eyeglasses. And, oh, yes, hairs on the inside of a coat collar. Yes, Inspector? Bring in the coat, Sergeant. Yes, Inspector. Actually, gentlemen, all we need is the confession. We have the evidence. The hairs on the collar, other than those of Hess, are the hairs of the murderer. And I know who the murderer is. Here's the coat. The hairs are on the report card. Thanks, Sergeant. Well, is somebody going to confess, or do we have to take all your fingerprints and specimens of your hair? Very well. I think we'll start with Mr. Belsey. That way we won't have to go any further. Uh, Why, you're crazy. You can't hang this on me. Okay, Sergeant. Okay, he's going to be stubborn. But take good care of him, won't you? 
You'll find he's the killer, all right. You know, I've been racking my brains all the way home, Mike. Hoping I wouldn't have to ask this question. Well, what is it, Angel? Well, all the evidence, if you can call it evidence, could have applied to any one of the suspects. Yes, Angel. Was it a good guess? Or were you dead sure that it was Belsey? <laughs> I was dead sure it was Belsey. Oh, I admit I guessed about his method of operation in the cafe, but it was close enough. Well, I still don't know what single thing it was that pinned it on Belsey. But that is from your standpoint. It wasn't a single thing, honey. It was two things. All right, all right, then. Clam Shane, give. <laughs> well, in the first place, Carter said that he had helped Hess on with his coat at Hackett's house on Monday night. Yeah, that's why Carter was so excited in the inspector's office. He remembered that. Correct. And Belsley lied about it. He said it was a cold night and that Hess didn't have his coat. Ah, uh, yes. And the second point? Well, the second is obvious, my dear. Hess had advanced the money to Belsey. Now, if Belsey didn't go on with the invention, then Belsey was several thousand to the good. Oh. I doubt if Belsey's invention ever existed. The whole thing was a clever confidence trick with murder thrown in. Well, I hope it teaches you a lesson, Mike Shane. Why, Angel? Why me? Just the trouble hairs on a coat collar can get you into. They don't have to be blonde, either. This is John Lang reminding you that June 30th is the deadline for the purchase of your federal auto use stamp. To help you safeguard this valuable tax stamp... Your Union Oil Minuteman has on hand a supply of handsome deco protectors. These decals fit right over the stamp on your windshield. They form a neat, clean shield against traffic film and keep the stamp from peeling off. To get your stamp cover, just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask the Minuteman for a free tax stamp protector. He'll be glad to serve you. <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written and produced by David Taylor and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Francisco is a city of color and activity, and in the course of time, Mike Shane's office has had its share of both. At the moment, Mike and his assistant Phyllis Knight have almost more color than they can take. Seated between their two desks is a young man with curly red hair, a red tie, orange shirt, and green coat. Mike squints at him thoughtfully. But I don't understand, Mr. Cullen Ward. Why would anyone want to kill Mr. Uh, uh, what's his name? Demetro Sador. Oh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. But Why? Has he got any enemies? Mr. Shane, a great piano virtuoso like Demetrio Sador has many jealous rivals. Hmm? And then his awful temper, there's no telling. 
Why did he start getting these threatening letters, Mr. Conward? Last week. We went to the police at once. They investigated, or tried to. Mm-hmm. But Demetro wouldn't help in the least. Mm-hmm. He was very annoyed. Then this afternoon, your friend the inspector told me if we still wanted to look into it, I might come to you. You are his um, secretary? <laughs> oh, no, 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 my no. I'm just a friend. I live in the next apartment to Demetro. I'm a poet. Huh? <laughs> Perhaps Miss Knight has seen some of my work, my sonnets to a porcelain cupid. Huh? Oh, yes, well, <laughs> yes, yes. Mr. Cullen Ward, you want me to investigate these threats against your friend, but I doubt I can do anything unless he's willing to help. But we can't let a great pianist, a great genius, gamble with his life. If you'd come out with me and talk to him, well, he'd be furious, of course. But you might convince him. You know, I'd like to meet him, Mike. They say he's a character. Yeah? All right, sir. All right, we'll go talk to your lion of the keyboard. When? Today? Today? This afternoon? Right now. I don't believe he hears us. Oh, yes, it's always this way. I'll just keep pounding. Demetro! Demetro! Oh, uh, don't the neighbors complain of this racket? Oh, no, there are only five of us in this building. We all love Demetro, and we used to know it. Oh, I should think. Living over a garage in a poultry market. Oh, oh he, he stopped playing. Demetro! Demetro, it's Eric! Demetro, I want you to... Go away, go away. What? what? Oh, the... Demetro! Come back! Demetro! I am practicing. Demetro, we've got to talk to you. It's important. Go on in, Mr. Shane, quick. No, no, I have a concert tomorrow. You can practice while we talk. Uh, This is Mr. Shane and Miss Knight, Demetro Sador. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Sador. You are welcome. Mr. Cullen Ward tells us you've had letters threatening your life, sir. We'd like to ask Ah, you to... Police! Uh-huh, police, I will not talk. Huh? No! No! Well, no! No! no. Metro, please, Mr. Shane is a private detective and... We simply a... want to look at those letters, sir. It's possible Oh, that is I... foolishness. Nobody killed Demetro Sador. Oh, we hope not, Mr. Sador. It would be a tragedy if anything happened to a musical genius like Demetro Sador. Genius? Oh, yes, that is so. Why, I've heard you play. It was out of this world. We can't risk losing you, Mr. Sador. San Francisco's greatest pianist. America's greatest. Yes, America's greatest. Mm -hmm. That's why we must find who sent you those threatening letters. They are nothing. Women fall in love with Dimitro Sador. (laughs) I spurn them. Now they hate. I have no time for them. I am married to my music. Yes, yes, sure, sure. Now, if you'll just show us their letters, please. No, all foolishness. But we have to see them. No! Please, Mr. Sador. There is the door. Go! No! Go! Be better, Mr. Shane. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. You're the boss. You are the first people to come to my studio today. And you are the last. Well, how do you feed that guy? Through the bars? I'm frightfully sorry, Mr. Shane. Eric, what in the name of three toed Pete went on in there? I could hear it through the wall. Oh, it was about those letters again. Oh, Mr. Shane, Miss Knight, Rita Amodio. How do you do? How do you do? Oh, those letters. Probably they were mailed by some crank. That's possible. Well, we'd better be moving along, honey. I'm sorry we couldn't do anything for you people. Here, hold on, hold on. We just can't let you walk off with just a thank you. Let me take you both to dinner. Hmm? Well, that's very nice of you. What do you say, Mike? Well, it's okay with me. Oh, fine. We'll go to the little Russian restaurant on the hill, the Cossack Club. Huh? And I'll read you some of my poetry this night. Oh. I know you'll get a kick out of it. Uh-huh. Right on the shins. <laughs> But please, you must have some dessert. No, no, no thanks, no. We really have to be going. Yes, we have tickets to the theater or something. Oh, just one more poem. Just one more. My ode to a lonely seagull. Listen. <laughs> what meanest thou, bird of sad lament? My foot fell. Oh, Inspector, hey. well, what are you doing here? Hey, tell me I'd find you here. I understand you talked to that piano player this afternoon. Yes, about an hour and a half ago. Uh-huh. Mind going back to his studio with me? Well, it's useless, Inspector. He won't talk to you, me, or anybody. I know he won't. He's dead. <laughs>
This is the floor, Inspector. Uh-huh. It's at the end of the hall, Studio A. Oh, I can't believe it. Our own Demetro dead. Murdered, you say? I don't know. Some woman phoned me all in a lather. Said it was murder. She told me about you, Mike, and where you were eating, so I thought I'd better bring you along. Here we are, Inspector. Well, police surgeon beat me here. What do you say, Doc? Oh, Inspector. Haven't had time for real examination yet. There's something weird about this. Oh, there's the body. By his old piano. Who's the man with the beard? Dr. Classen. You found the body. Huh? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, I did. All right. What's the story? Uh, well, you see, I live the other end of the hall, Studio D. I got a phone call. It was Dimitrov. Uh-huh. He said something was wrong with him, gasped, and then I heard him fall. What time was this, Doctor? Uh, about an hour ago, ten past six. Mm-hmm. Well, I found his door locked, so I got Professor Gephardt across the hall and broke the door down. I found him here by the piano. The phone had fallen from his hand. No signs of violence, no wounds on the body. Maybe it was his heart. Heart? No, 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 he was in perfect health. What do you say, Dr. Collins? Oh, just a minute. A little pressure under the rib. You aren't giving him artificial respiration. Uh, no, dead too long. I want to... Ah. Yes, that's it. What is? He died of asphyxiation. Asphyxiation? Are there any gas jets in this studio? It's not that kind of gas, Inspector. I know the smell. It was poison gas. It was deliberate murder. <laughs> We'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Friends, did you ever stop to think that you may be driving a car with a sticky engine? Well, that's just what happens when your engine is full of sludge. You see, this engine sludge formed by some oils is sticky stuff. It can gum up piston rings, plug oil lines, and otherwise interfere with smooth, efficient performance. In addition, sludge is often abrasive, full of harsh metal particles that score the inside of your engine. Now, draining your oil will not remove sludge. That's why Union Oil Company recommends flushing out your engine from time to time with Cleanse Oil, the special solvent action cleansing oil. Cleanse Oil is harmless to your motor, but its dissolving action penetrates to every working part, cutting sludge out swiftly and cleanly. Then, when the cleanse oil is drained out, the sludge flushes out with it, leaving your engine clean. And with a fresh supply of pure, paraffin-based Triton motor oil, you're all set for hundreds of miles of clean, safe engine operation. To clean your engine out this quick, easy way, just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask the Minute Man for Cleanse Oil Service. Thank you. The famous pianist, Dimitro Sedor, has been murdered by poison gas. And Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have just completed a search of the dead man's studio apartment. Mike, I don't see how it could be murder. The door was locked from the inside, the same with the windows. Yeah. Dimitro Sedor was asphyxiated by poison gas. He did it himself. Fine, except for one thing. The poison gas must have been in some kind of a container. Well, where is it? Mm. We've checked the whole apartment. He didn't have anything stronger than aspirin tablets. Okay, it was the work of a ghost who oozed through the keyhole, gave the guy chloroform, then trickled out onto the windowsill. <laughs> Maybe I can help you, Inspector. Hmm? Yes, Dr. Collins. I just examined the man's throat. Oh. There were signs of cauterizing. Death was almost instantaneous. Hmm. I'd say the gas was something like jotite, supposedly a secret German product. Hmm? Either liquid or vapor. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's a terrific help. Mike. Hmm? You smell something? Huh? Smell what? Wait, it's, uh... I'm almost sure it's perfume. A brand I know. Huh? Very strong here by the piano in the bookcase. Uh. Say, you're right. I don't remember smelling anything when we were in here before. Of course, we weren't paying uh, attention. Uh... Well, it might mean that somebody came in after we left. But but how? Demetrio said we were the first people in the studio today. And that we'd be his last. And the door was locked from the inside, according to Dr. Classen. Is that right, Doctor? Hmm? Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. Uh, Professor Gephardt and I had to break in. He lives right across the hall, you know. Mike, maybe you better double-check that with the professor. Yeah, we will, Angel. But first, here's something we overlooked. Letters. Where'd you find them? On top of that pile of sheet music. Hmm. Electric light bill. Advertisement. Uh Uh-oh. Here we are. One of those death notes, Mike? Yeah. Let's see. Postmark San Francisco, day before yesterday. Dimitro, this is your last warning. This week you die. 
Here, look it over, Inspector. Yeah. Yeah. Written in green ink, unsigned. Sheet about the size of a woman's stationery. Yeah, is it? Let me see. Recognize the handwriting, Doctor? Uh, no. no. You, Eric? I don't think so. Phil. Uh, Phyllis, what are you doing? Dusting the apartment? Well, it certainly needs it. Dust and grit all over the top of that bookcase. Yeah, look at this letter. Mm-hmm. Would you say it's a woman's handwriting? Oh, it could be. It's small enough. The writing looks sort of crude, doesn't it? Yeah. Disguised. Maybe written with the left hand. Mm-hmm. Well, this is beginning to stack up. Perfume in the room, a threatening letter written probably by a woman. Eric. Eric, did Dimitro have any special women friends? Well, you heard what he said. Maybe some women were in love with him, and then it turned to hate. He said he was married to his music. It was true. But that's not an answer. Among the women, who was closest to him? Well... Perhaps Rita. Was she in love with him? Well, was she, Eric? Okay. We'll find out for ourselves. Come on, Inspector. I'll be glad to answer your questions, gentlemen. Won't you sit down on my hassock? On your what? Classic. My pillows. Oh. I don't believe in chairs. Uh-huh. Uh, Rita, Miss Emodio, after Eric took us to dinner, which was about 5.45 p.m., did you hear anything unusual in the studio next door? Not a thing. I was sitting here reading. I heard Dimitri playing Greek's piano concerto. That was his favorite piece. Mm-hmm. And then, by and by, it sort of trailed off to nothing. That's probably when he was killed. But he had no callers. I would have heard them. You were uh, uh, quite a friend of Dimitri Sedor's, weren't you? Yes. He was a wonderful man. I I can't imagine anyone killing him unless... Uh, yes? Well, I was just wondering, could it be possible? Oh, no, it's foolish. Could what be possible? Well, it was at a cocktail party last week at the Rainers. I remember something Dr. Classen said. He was talking of some method he knew to kill a man so there would be no clues. Go on, we're interested. Well, that's all I heard. Somebody came over to our group and took me away. Of course, the doctor may have said more. Mm-hmm, of course. But uh, coming back to the murder itself, Dr. Carson says Dimitro's door was locked from the inside, that he and uh, Professor Gebhardt had to break in. Do you know if that's right? Yes, I heard the noise. I went out and watched them. Hmm. Phil, would you mind uh, making some notes over at Miss Amodio's desk? Hmm? Oh, oh, of course. It's a poor sort of desk, really. It's my makeup tape. Uh, about Dr. Classen again, you made a point of talking about him. Have you any reason to suspect him? Well... The doctor fancies himself a composer. Uh-huh. I suppose he did resent it when Dimitro wouldn't play any of his pieces. They were about as musical as the brains of a lovesick donkey. Did you ever hear them follow? Oh, constantly. But we all did. That's the spice of our existence. We live in all four dimensions at once. Mike. Hmm? Mike, that is what you wanted. What did you find? One bottle of green ink, one bottle of perfume. What? Why, how dare you put those back? Phil, is it the same perfume we smelled in his studio? I'm sure of it. Plus a death note written in green ink. Hmm. Miss Amodio, I'll have to ask you. You to... will not. I won't be bullied. Huh? Rita. Rita, what's wrong? Doctor, these, these pickle brain snoopers think I killed Dimitro. What? Why, well, that's claptrap. Perfect claptrap. Maybe. Miss Amodio, just where were you from 5.45 to 7 p.m. tonight? She was with me. We were having supper in my apartment. She was there when Dimitro telephoned you? Yes, she was. Dr. Yes. Claston, didn't you tell us your apartment is at the other end of the hall? I did. Studio D. Mm-hmm. It's rather remarkable that Miss Amodio could have dinner with you at the same time she was sitting here listening to the piano concerto next door. Oh, yes. Uh, may I talk to you outside, please? Yes, certainly. Now, uh, this is very embarrassing. I did lie. For a moment, I, I suspected that Rita might be guilty. Mm-hmm. And you see, she's the woman I love. Then you didn't have dinner with her. No. All right. Now, strain your memory a little more, Doctor. A few days ago, you told some people you knew a way to kill a man so that it could never be traced. We're dying to hear that little secret. How did you know? From your dinner date. Little pal, Rita. Oh? Oh, well, it was just an academic discussion. Mm. Uh, Professor Gebhardt and I were talking of various methods of murder, not just one. Mm. Oh, I, I could name 15 ways of killing a man without a trace. You're not going to accuse me of 15 murders. The neat answer without telling us anything. It is as I said. Okay, that's all for now. But don't leave this building. 
Well, I thought you were just about to land your fish, and then you let him off the hook. Oh, no, he didn't. Let the two of them fry in their own fat a while. Whatever they cook up will be our dish, not theirs. And while they're cooking it up, Mike, let's take a hard look at the much talk about Professor Gebhardt. <laughs> Gentlemen, it was most sad about the meatball, and such a strange death that the class and I were completely mystified. We wanted to talk to you, Professor. You stay very much to yourself, don't you? Yeah, yes, I am working on experiment. Mm. As you see, my apartment is also my laboratory. Yeah, I will clear off the chair so you may sit. Gee, Chris, did you ever see such a jungle? Stuffed animals, glass, tubing, goosenecks, pots, kettles, goofus <laughs> machines. Sit down. Thank, Thank you. you. Professor Gebhardt. We'll come right to the point. First, you know if Dimitro Sador had any visitors tonight between 5.45 and about 6.10? No. No, no, I would have heard them. These walls are like tissue paper. Uh-huh. And now about Dr. Classen. Mm -hmm. We understand, Professor, that last week at a party, he told you of some special way of killing a man without leaving a clue. Yeah, yes, I remember. Do you know what that method was, Professor? In part, it... It was some sort of gas. A gas? Yes, it was It was something he learned as a doctor, I suppose. Do you know what kind of gas? No. He uses my laboratory and experiments with his ideas, but he does not tell me everything. Oh. Do you know, Professor, if Rita Amodio was in love with Demetra? In love? Well, in other words, she was? She is a lovely girl, but she was for the meatball just a fly buzzing around. The meat was very cruel. Then perhaps she might have killed him. Rita? No. No, no, she could not. She... She was with me. With you? But the doctor... Yes, yes, yes. We had dinner here, the, the two of us. Um, <laughs> Dr. Classen tried to claim he had dinner with her. Now, don't tell us, Professor, that you're in love with her, too. Well, I am not ashamed. Mind if we take a little look around your laboratory? I, I would prefer not. I'm afraid we must, Professor. If you, if you will tell me what you want, I... I do not like anyone to handle my apparatus. What are all these broken glass tubes? Please, gentlemen. Oh, good that? heavens, what now? It's Rita. Come on. Rita. 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 What is it? Derek. He's dying. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Ladies and gentlemen, a common error among motorists is to blame excess carbon on the gasoline they use. Actually, nearly all carbon formed in automobile engines comes from the lubricating oil. Now, another interesting fact is that lubricating oils differ widely in the amount of carbon they'll form. In fact, in a recent comparative test made with the seven leading motor oils sold in the West, Triton motor oil contained 38% fewer carbon-forming elements than the next best oil, 86% less than the average, all of which boils down to the laboratory fact that you'll get maximum protection from carbon if you use Triton motor oil. The secret of Triton's superiority lies in Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent refining process, a process so valuable that it's been patented by Union Oil Company. So, friends, with mechanics as scarce as they are today, why not take advantage of the extra protection Triton motor oil will give you against carbon? Triton is a 100% pure paraffin-based lubricant. You can buy Triton motor oil at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are no nearer a solution of the murder of Dimitro. Rita's scream brought them to the hallway where they are trying to revive a very pale and limp young man, Eric Cullenboy. Eric, Eric, what happened to him? He's dying. Don't crowd him, folks. Give him air. Please. I'm all right. All right. Yes, you are. Your white as death can hardly stand up. He staggered into my room and fell down. I, I knew he was dying. Just like Dimitro. Come on, son. Come on. What happened to you? I don't know. Suddenly, I, I couldn't breathe. 
I strangled him. See, it's just like Demetro. Where did this happen? When I was... Just walking down the hall. You'd better lie down. Dr. Classen can take care of you. No, no. I'm, I'm all right. Quite all right. I'll just sit down in here with Rita. But Mike, this was just like Demetro. There must be something deadly in this building. Phyllis, Inspector. What is it, Mike? Follow me. We've got to act fast. We've got to get back into that laboratory. <laughs> Jeepers, if the professor walks in here on us... Now, listen, listen. Just before Rita screamed, I asked the professor about some broken glass tubes and bottles. Yeah, Mike. Here they are on this bench. They look almost like electric light globes. Phil. Phil, back in Demetrio's studio, you said something about a lot of dust and grit. Yeah, yeah, on the bookcase. Was it like the grit on this bench here? Yes, it was. That's not grit, Angel. It's powdered glass. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Does it mean something to you, Mike? I don't know yet. But there might be some connection. Hey, wait a minute. Honey, that cabinet you're leaning on, is it a phonograph? Uh, Yes. Has it got a record on it? Wait a minute. It's... Why, it's Greg's piano concerto. I bet that's it. All right, all right, kids. We're going to make an experiment. Honey, stop that phonograph. All right, quiet, please. Is everybody here now? Rita, Eric, Dr. Yes, Classen, yes, Professor no, Gabbard? Yes, no, you... Okay. Now, you probably wonder why we ask all of you into Dumitro's studio. Yes. During the course of our investigation, you've all come under suspicion for one reason or another. Now that we know who the murderer is... What? You know? We think the innocent parties are entitled to a little explanation. Do you know the murderer? We do. Dr. Classen... You claim to know 15 ways to commit a successful murder. One of them, I believe, is uh, poison gas. Am I right? Well, yes. In fact, a few days ago, Doctor, you concocted such a gas in Professor Gebhardt's laboratory and told about it at a cocktail party. Uh, Yes, And you, Professor Gebhardt, in your laboratory, you experimented with very thin glass globes which uh, shatter by musical vibrations. Is that correct, Professor? It was no secret. I demonstrated it to Dimitro several times. That was very unfortunate, Professor. The combination of experiments by you two gentlemen killed Dimitro Sador and almost killed Eric. No, no, no. I have two of the Professor's glass globes here in my hand. One I have filled with cigarette smoke, which we will pretend is poison gas. The other one contains water, which we will say is... Rita's perfume. Now, look here, I... The perfume was used to cover up the smell of the poison gas. Now, I'll take these globes and tuck them behind this oil painting above the bookcase here. Like so. This is fantastic. Okay. Okay, honey. Sit down at the piano and do your stuff. All right. Just the part we marked. There's water running down the wall. And the cigarette smoke. The globe's broke. Yes. Yes, as Dimitro played his favorite piece, the Greek concerto, he unwittingly released the gas which killed him. This is diabolical. But but who could have done it? The the door was locked from the inside and the window... We know that Dimitro was playing the Greek concerto when we first came to see him this evening. No gas had been released then. But, But when he played the concerto the next time after we left, he died. Now, you all get the significance of that? We leave a live pianist in his room. He locks the door. Half a dozen witnesses see the doctor and the professor break down the door. So no one entered the room after you left. Yes, that is right. But then, then the poison was placed in the room while you, Mr. Shane, and Miss Knight were in the room. Correct, doctor. And I didn't slip those glass globes behind the picture. And I know that Miss Knight didn't. And that leaves Mr. Eric Cullenmore. This is Eric, insane. You, those threatening letters that Mitra got, I hired Shane to protect Demetra's life. The letters you wrote yourself, Eric. And you hired us to give you an alibi. 
you made sure we were with you when you planted the poison gas. And that we were eating with you when Dimitro died. That's the story, isn't it, Eric? Yes, I... I guess it is. It's just one thing we're in the dark about. How did you get a dose of your own poison? I... I had some extra globes of the gas. I was trying to get rid of them. One of them dropped and broke. Everything went wrong. Everything. Yes, Eric. Yes, in murder, everything is wrong. Right from the first chapter. Well, Inspector, I guess the last chapter is yours. <laughs> Kids, look at that clock. You realize for once we've solved the case and we're on our way home before midnight? Mm-hmm. Hey, what's the matter with you kids? You're so quiet. Oh, I was just thinking. You suppose Eric was in love with Rita, too? Of course. When Eric thought he was dying, where did he head for? Rita's apartment. That was his motive. Rita was in love with Dimitro. Eric figured his only chance with her was to get rid of Dimitro. His one dumb trick was to use her perfume. That almost put the handcuffs on his lady love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Three men in love with one woman. I wonder, what, what has she, she got, got that, that I haven't? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, that shouldn't worry you, Angel. What have you got that she hasn't? You know the answer. Oh, uh, uh, Michael. Mm -hmm. again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. As San Francisco's favorite private detective, Mike Shane's life has plenty of excitement and drama, but it also has its routine. It is shortly after 9 a.m. and the business day in room 1515 Russ Building begins just as it does in any other office. While Mike opens the morning mail, his sleek and lovely assistant, Phyllis Knight, glances at the newspaper. Suddenly, Phyllis leans forward in her chair. Good heavens. I can't believe it. Mm, what's the matter? Have you looked at this paper, Mike? About Malcolm Boyd? Mm-mm. Malcolm Boyd. Well, I used to know him at college. He took me to the prom once. He was a smooth number. Too warm a day for me to be jealous, Angel. Oh, no, no, no. Listen. Malcolm Boyd, 31, wealthy young socialite of San Francisco, was mysteriously shot to death in his apartment last night. Well, what? 
Mrs. Mary Boyd, his widow, informed the police that about 10 o'clock she told her husband she was going down to the drugstore for a few minutes. When she returned to their apartment in the Bayview Tower, she discovered the riddled body. Does it say anything about suspects or witnesses? No, not so far. Hold it, honey, hold it. Hello, Mike Shane speaking. Mike, you busy right now? Oh, morning, Inspector. What do you mean, busy? I'm always up to my ears. Fine, I got a client here at headquarters for you. You have? Well, thanks, Inspector, but I've got some odds and ends to clean up. Just and... a minute, Mike. Sorry, partner. Oh, oh, by the way, by the way, we were just reading about this Malcolm Boyd killing. You boys at Homicide got any ideas? Yeah, you're one of them. Huh? This client is the Malcolm Boyd case. Come on down and talk to him. Or are you still too busy with odds and ends? As a matter of fact, Inspector, I'm at the end of my odds right now. I'll see you in five minutes. Where's the inspector now, Mike, coming out of his office? Fast traveling, kids. You made it in about eight minutes flat. Where's your man? In the office. Come on in. Okie doke. Richie, I want you to meet Mike Shane and Phyllis Knight. Friends of mine from way back. Mr. Ward Ritchie. Glad to know you. How do you do, do, Mr. Ritchie? The reason I called you in, Mike, is that this department can't help Ritchie. What he needs is a lawyer and a darn good private detective. It's about the Malcolm Boyd case? That's right. But I didn't see your name in the newspaper account of it. We didn't give it to the papers, Phil. But they'll get a hold of it soon enough. Oh. Pull up some chairs and I'll tell you the story. Yeah, sure. Sure, Inspector. Thank you. Now, as you know... Malcolm Boyd was shot last night in his apartment, the Bayview Towers. Mm -hmm. His wife telephoned homicide. We got there about 15 minutes after the murder. No guns, no clues, no fingerprints, no known enemies, no motives. The perfect murder mystery. Yeah. The girl at the switchboard in the lobby said a man came in and phoned up to Boyd about 9.50 p.m. The elevator boy says he let him off at the sixth floor. Boyd's apartment is 610. And in about 10 minutes, the guy went down the elevator again. The manager happened to be in the elevator this time. Then you must have a pretty good description of the fellow. Okay, Sergeant. Read the description. He was tall. He was short. He was fat. He was thin. What? (laughs) But here's the payoff. About 30 or 40 minutes before homicide was called in, the apartment house directly across the street was robbed. And close to midnight, the thieves were caught. Three men with a grip full of jewels. We figured one of the three might have done the murder across the street. So I got a hold of the apartment manager, the elevator boy, and the telephone operator to see if they could identify any of them. This is where I came in. Hmm? You see, I was at home all the evening. I turned on the radio for the midnight news bulletins. It said Malcolm Boyd murdered. Malcolm and I graduated from college together. And Malcolm married the girl I had hoped to marry. Hmm? So, of course, I was interested. I got dressed and hurried right down here to headquarters. The people from the apartment house were sitting in the show-up, waiting to have a look at these three jewel thieves. Well, Mike, as you know, on a show-up for identification, we always add a few innocent people to the line. Yes, sure, sure, Inspector, so the witnesses won't identify the first man they see. Right. Go on. I asked one of our plainclothesmen and Richie to stand up with the three robbers. And what happened? The manager, the elevator boy, and the telephone operator immediately pick out Ward Richie. Oh, well, of all things. It's impossible, of course. I've never in my life been inside the Bayview Towers. I was at home all evening till I heard that news bulletin. Hmm. I can see it puts you in the spot. You say uh, you knew Malcolm Boyd and his wife was your ex-girlfriend. Yes, we were engaged once. Yet yet, uh, you never went to their apartment? Nor were even in the building? I can explain that. Malcolm took Mary away from me. He had a devilish way with women. I was terribly bitter. I didn't want to see them again, at least not Malcolm. I told him if he ever mistreated Mary, I'd kill him. Oh, fine, fine. That'll sound great to a jury. It's a case of mistaken identity, of course. A terrific coincidence. And you want me to prove it's a coincidence by digging up the real killer? That's our job, too, Mike. But it's less embarrassing if Richie gets his help from outside this department. The inspector tells me that if we don't find the real killer very soon, he'll be forced to arrest me. That would ruin me. Isn't there just a possibility that Mrs. Boyd uh, herself may have killed her husband? Oh, no, Mary isn't that type. She's refined and gentle. Murder is beyond her. Well, Mr. Richie, I'll take the case on one condition. Where it finally leads must be my responsibility. You mean whoever turns out to be the murderer? Yes. Well, all right. Good. Good. And now, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk to the inspector. Of course. I guess there's nothing more I can tell you. When you want me, you'll find me in my home. Hmm? Inspector has my phone number. Okay. It's been a pleasure to meet you, sir. And you, Miss Knight. Thank you. Well, Mike? Well, Inspector, I'd say you're uh, as much on the spot as Mr. Ritchie. A man has been named by three witnesses, yet you don't make an arrest. What's the DA going to say? I'm not completely dumb, Mike. I've checked up on Ward's story. 
His houseboy says he got home at 7 o'clock and didn't go out again until midnight. Can you believe his houseboy? I think so, Phil. He's an old-time Chinese. Oh. They're loyal but truthful. Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. Got something here on the bird case. Oh, yeah, the man's Universal uh, Cleaning Company just turned it in. Some guy took it to them for cleaning this morning. They found some fresh blood stains on the coat and got suspicious. They got the customer's name? Yeah, it's right here on this tag, Inspector. The name is. Uh... Yeah, I know without looking. Ward Ritchie. <laughs> We'll return to the adventures of Mike Shane in just a moment. Friends, e- friends, even with the recent increase in civilian gasoline allowances, gas coupons are still pretty scarce. That's why you should be sure that the cooling system of your automobile engine is in good shape for summer driving. For whether you realize it or not, a hot motor wastes gasoline. And believe it or not, cars driven around town usually get hotter than those driven on the open road. So even if you aren't planning any trips this summer, it's a good idea to drop in at the Union Oil Station and ask the Minute Man to flush out your radiator. Using a special solvent known as Union Radiator Flush, he can clean out the rustiest radiators in just a few minutes. Union Radiator Flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale, rust, and grease right out of choked water lines. Then, when you fill the radiator with clean, fresh water, you can be sure it will really circulate and cool your motor with a fast, steady flow. So, for cooler driving, better mileage, just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Radiator Service. Thank you. At police headquarters, Phyllis watches two worried men pace the floor, Mike Shane and the inspector. Mike, but I've got to arrest Ward Ritchie for the murder of Malcolm Boyd. When three people identify him and a cleaner turns up with his blood-stained suit... It's still circumstantial evidence, inspector. Look, the simplest thing would be to ask Ward Ritchie if the suit belongs to him. Unless you think he might lie. If he's the killer, he will lie. Besides, there's one other thing I'd like to do first. I'd like very much to meet Mrs. Mary Boyd. And she's still at the apartment. I can drive you out there right now. Thank you, Inspector. Then let us meet the widow. Bayview Towers. Miss Evans, thank you. Oh, miss. Yes, sir? Uh, we'd like to see Mrs. Boyd, please. Apartment 610. Sorry, sir. The police won't allow any visitors. I'm not a visitor. I'm a private detective. Those are my orders, sir. Uh, we're with the police. The inspector's outside parking his car. He'll be right in. Sorry. I'll have to wait for his permission. Oh, hi, Shirley. Give us room 807. Sorry, sir. Mrs. Jones doesn't wish to be disturbed. Too bad she's going to be. Give her a buzz. She cannot be called, sir. Listen, sister. This is important. Get me? Important. Well, you'll have to take the responsibility. Okay, kids. Mrs. The elevator's Jones, this way. Oh, wait. Lobby. The switchboard gal says we can't go up without your permission. Uh, you got it. Come on. <laughs> Honey, that man who asked for Mrs. Jones at the desk, do you recognize him? Huh? The one getting into the elevator? No. It's funny. His face looks familiar to me. Going up. Not please. That's us. How are you, Inspector? I'm on the sixth floor? That's right. Oh, Mike, this is Grant, one of the men who identified Richie. I see. Fourth floor, please. Yes, sir. I'd still like to know who that guy is. It bothers me. Out on six. Hartman is the first one here on the left, Mike. Okay. If I were you, Mike, I'd be a little easy on the questions. Mrs. Boyd is the high-tension type. Okay, okay, I'll watch it. Yes? Oh, oh, Inspector. Good morning, Mrs. Boyd. Mind if we come in and talk a while? Please do. Mrs. Boyd, this is Mr. Shane and Miss Knight. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? How do, you do? How do, you do? Mr. Shane is a private investigator who is also working on this case. Oh? It's uh, just routine, Mrs. Boyd. I understand you uh, left your husband here in the apartment about uh, 10 o'clock last night. Mm. He was gone about 10 minutes. May I ask where you went and why? I told them, down to the drugstore to get some aspirin. I I had a headache. I should have told you, Mike. We checked at the drugstore. I see. And just what was your husband's line of work, Mrs. Boyd? Oh, must I go through all this again? My husband was wealthy. He didn't have to work. Oh? And the source of his income? Oh, it, it was a trust fund or something. I didn't pry into his business affairs. 
You mean he just lived at home, a young man of 31, and did nothing? We had a very full social life. Oh. Malcolm had an office he went to occasionally, just... Well, just something to do. You didn't mention that to me, Mrs. Boyd. You didn't ask me. He had some office in the exposition building. Uh, Mrs. Boyd, how long it is, is it uh, since you've seen Mr. Ward Ritchie? He asked you a question, Mrs. Boyd. Uh, Ward? Why, uh, well, it's been years. Not since, well, uh, a long time. Not since you married Mr. Boyd. No. But what has Ward to do with all this? Have uh, either of you two written or telephoned to each other during those years? Well, Ward wrote once or twice. You remember what he wrote? Only that if I ever needed anything, I was in trouble to come to him. And had you? No. Excuse me, please. Good morning, Mrs. Boyd. Is the inspector still here? Yes, come in. It's the apartment house manager, Mike. Morning, Mr. Lockridge. Hello. I stopped in, Mr. Inspector, to ask what you've done with this case. I didn't see anything in the morning papers about Mr. Ritchie. No, we haven't arrested him yet. You haven't? But this is absurd. We all identified him. We'll make an arrest when the time is right, Mr. Lockridge. Well, I hope so. I certainly don't want to see this scandal drag on in the newspapers. It's very bad publicity for the apartment. Well, in these days of housing shortage, Mr. Lockridge, I don't think you'll lose any business. I'm thinking of myself. I've been severely criticized by the owners for permitting such tenants in our house. Mr. Lockridge. Yes? Do you remember the color of the suit Ward which he had on last night? Oh, yes. It was gray. Well, I've got to get along. I have a man waiting to see me. Oh, uh, Mrs. Boyd, in light of what's happened, I hope you'll make arrangements for other quarters as soon as possible. Good day. Oh, this precious apartment house. Mrs. Boyd, getting back to our own problem, it seems to me your attitude is rather uncooperative. I don't all your questions. After a fashion, yes. But uh, if you're genuinely interested in solving your husband's death, you can probably give us a good deal of background information. That's what we've got to have. Oh, but, but of course, if, oh, if I knew anything at all, I'd certainly tell you. I gave the inspector everything I could think of. Mm-hmm. Well, there's one thing you can tell us, uh, Mrs. Boyd. Yes. Uh, on which floor are the manager's offices located? Why, I, I believe on the fourth floor. Oh, I thought so. Hmm? Huh? Now, just What's what... that supposed to mean? Inspector, it's so blamed obvious that for once I'm not going to tell you. Yes, uh, gentlemen, I was glad to help the police. I always say there was something wrong about that, Mr. Boyd. Did uh, he come down to his office much, Gideon? Well, sir, I can't say. My janitor's mostly afternoon and the night time. This year's his door. I'll get out my keys here. Yes, sir, you know, Mr. Boyd had oceans of money. He was a big man. But I always told my wife, I don't like that look in Mr. Boyd's eyes. Someday it's gonna go bad. There he is, gentlemen. Thank you, Gideon. Glad to do it, sir. Glad to do it. Well... This is certainly a Barney place. Just one desk and two chairs. There's not even a picture on the wall. Means we have little to search. Yeah. Nothing on top of the desk. I hope the drawers aren't locked. Huh. Look at this drawer. Theater programs, ticket stubs, list of box holders at the opera. Well, we know he was a social butterfly. There's yeah. a bunch of newspaper clippings. Let me see. Brilliant gathering at Carl's and Party and uh, evening at Irene Eggert's. Wow, look at the names. The cream of the town. Dan Allen Haven, Crystal Finley, Audrey Dyer, Malcolm Boyd. So he was there. Yeah, here's another story. Guests Beverly Pryor, Joseph Spiegel, Francis Ryland, Malcolm Boyd. Why do you suppose he kept these clickings? To see his name in print? Well, ask it this way, Inspector. Why all these clippings kept in his business office? It meant dollars and cents to him somehow. Here's another clipping, Mike, marked with a heavy blue pencil. Reception at Lee Strayhorn's. Lee tonight. Strayhorn. Made... Hold on, Mike. Remember what happened at Lee Strayhorn's party last month? Yeah, sure, sure. There was a big jewel robbery. Uh-oh. Honey, is Boyd's name on that guest list? Well, it says he was to be there. And some of those other, other names you read, Mike. Van Allen Haven, Francis Ryland. The police are still looking for their missing diamonds. This could make a pattern. You mean Malcolm Boyd might have been a jewel thief? Not necessarily, but he could have gone to all those social functions to spot jewels for somebody else. I agree. We've had too many jewel thefts lately for it to be the work of one man. What about those three men who robbed the place across from the Bayview Towers last night? Maybe some connection. 
Though don't forget the apartment house people all identified Ward Richards. Look, we're talking in circles. If Malcolm Boyd was mixed up with a jewel gang, we've got some fast checking to do, and you know where, Inspector. Yeah, headquarters. Rogues Gallery. <laughs> Howard Warden, 42, housebreaking. Ed O'Leary, 23, hold up on assault. Inspector. Yeah? When you look at those photos, we've got a new batch of mixed rooms. We'll get to them, Sergeant. Want to finish burglary files first? Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, Inspector. Yeah? We checked on that suit from the cleaners. Huh? Huh? The guy who took it to them wasn't Richie. You got a description? Yes, a middle-aged man, heavy set. We found out the suit was bought this morning at a fire sale on Mission Street. Hey, then it was a fake. A plant. Yeah, a plant. And so was the identification of Mr. Richie. You, you mean the apartment house people? Honey. What, yes? Honey, take a look at this picture. You too, Inspector. Yeah. Mike, it's that man. The one in the lobby and, and the elevator. Yeah, no wonder his face was familiar. Hmm. Ed Collins, 39, jewel robbery, San Quentin, five years. He didn't just happen to go to Bayview Towers this morning. He was there for a purpose. Ed Collins, jewel thief. Malcolm Boyd, possible jewel spotter. Say, things are beginning to string together. Yeah, but we can't tie a knot in it yet. Inspector... Doesn't it strike you a little odd that Mrs. Boyd doesn't know anything about her husband's career? Very odd. He couldn't completely hide it from her. In fact, she might be with a gang. No, 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 I don't think so. Richie was right about her. She's too high class for that. Yeah, but it might explain why she wouldn't give you boys any details. Mrs. Boyd has social position, a family name. She wouldn't admit that her husband was a crook. There's an angle. Look at it this way. If Mary Boyd knows about the gang, knows who killed her husband... That gang is going to be plenty uneasy about her. They'll try to keep her quiet. Yeah, could be. Yeah, but they wouldn't risk a second murder in that apartment house. Honey, honey, we've got a job for you. Name it. Go over to the Bayview Towers and stay with Mrs. Boy. Don't let anybody trick her into leaving that apartment on any excuse. Don't let her answer the door or the telephone. Tell her what we find out. Uh, try to pump her for the rest of the story, you know, woman to woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And where would you gentlemen be? I don't know yet, honey, but it will be wherever we can pick up Mr. Ed Collins. <laughs> Mr. Shane was right. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, it's true. I didn't want anyone to know. My husband was no good. I, I was going to leave him. He was working with a gang of jewel thieves. Oh, I don't know who they were. I, I began to suspect a few weeks ago. I told him he had to give it up or I'd, I'd divorce him. He said he talked to them, but, but they killed him. Uh -huh. This is the truth now. No more acting. Oh, the truth, the truth. Keep away from that phone. Keep away. I'll get it. Hello? Mrs. Boyd? Uh, yes. Yes. Who is it? You know who. Why didn't you let your husband meet me last night? When? Meet who? You know who. He told you about me. Well, didn't he? Well, I... I don't know which man you mean. He told you about me, didn't he? I, um... Oh, who is this? Who, who is it? Hello? 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 Who was it? What did he say? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh. Let me think. I've heard that voice. Oh, what did he want? What does it mean? Oh, wait a minute. I know. Yeah. I remember. The man in the lobby. It was Ed Collins. Oh. Oh, Miss Knight. Miss Knight, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. No, just relax. Just relax. Operator. Operator, get me the police quickly. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. All my lines are busy. Well, clear one. This is an emergency. I'm sorry. You'll just have to wait. Well, I won't wait. I'll this call is a... you when I'm ready, ma'am. Oh. oh, she cut you off. She wouldn't connect you. No, and she'll never connect us. She's one of the gang. Oh, the door. Quick. Quick, lock it. Just a little too late, ladies. Collins. You know all about me, don't you? Well, introductions won't be necessary, then. Pick up your handbag. Put on your hat. We're leaving. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we know that many motorists nowadays are complaining about excess carbon in their engines. And we also know that most of these drivers blame wartime gasoline for their carbon troubles. Now, that's unfortunate because actually nearly all carbon formed in automobile engines comes from the motor oil. But, and this is the payoff, no two motor oils form the same amount of carbon. For example, it is a proved laboratory fact that Triton motor oil will form less carbon in your engine than any of the seven leading motor oils sold in the West. Not only that, but Triton motor oil is a 100% pure paraffin-based lubricant the finest kind of motor oil that money can buy. The secret of Triton's superiority lies in Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent refining process, a process so valuable that it has been patented by Union Oil Company. So, friends, with parts and mechanics as scarce as they are today, why not take advantage of the unusual protection Triton motor oil will give you against carbon? You can buy Triton at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Several minutes have passed. Mike and the inspector are hammering on the door of Mrs. Boyd's apartment. Bill, open up, Angel. It's Mike. Mrs. Boyd. Say, something's wrong, inspector. Put your shoulder against the door. No. (laughs) Bill. Bill, where are you? we better search. Phil! Not in the kitchen. Phil! Not in the bedroom. Maybe this closet. No. You told her not to leave this apartment. Where's the phone? Operator. Operator. Yes, sir? Uh, did you see Mrs. Boyd and another young lady leave this building? No, sir. All right. Uh, get me the manager. I'm sorry. The manager is busy. I said get me the manager. Send him up here in 30 seconds or else. <laughs> No signs of violence around here, Mike. Surely Phil would leave a note for us. Oh, if anything's happened to that girl, I'll tear this place apart. We shouldn't have fooled around looking for Ed Collins. We should have come straight here. We would have got him. I didn't think I was sending Phil into any danger so long as she stayed in the apartment. Easy now, Mike, easy. You called for me, gentlemen? Lockridge. Yes, yes. We're looking for Miss Knight and Mrs. Boyd. Do you know where they are? Well, not exactly. I saw them walk out of the lobby a few minutes ago. Not according to your telephone operator. She told me she hadn't seen them. Well, I can't help that. Yeah, Mr. Lockridge is right, sir. I took him down on the elevator. You're lying. You're both lying. We sent Miss Knight to this apartment for the express purpose of keeping Mrs. Boyd inside these rooms. All right. Don't believe us. I don't care. We've had all we want of notoriety and ill manners from the Boyds and the police department. Hold on, you. Uh, Grant. Yes? Grant, there's just one elevator in this building, isn't there? Yes. Is somebody running your elevator now? No, I left the door open. Yeah? Inspector, I hear the hum of an elevator. Where's the dumbwaiter? There's one in the kitchen. Come on, you two. I don't have to. Oh, yes, you do. There it is, Mike. Open the door. It's going down fast. Tell us. Phyllis! Where's the button? Now, now we'll bring it back up again. Stay where you are, Lockridge. You too, Grant. No, you guys are all wrong. Here it comes, Inspector. Be ready. All right, Collins, get out of there. Smart guys, aren't you? Inspector. Yeah. Is Phyllis all right? Yeah, she's... Bound and gag, but she's all right. I'll watch these guys. You cut the girls loose. Okay, Mike. Oh, oh Mike. Oh, Angel. Well, it's about time. He, he was going to kill us. You butched this up, Lockridge. We told you not to kill Boyd in the apartment. Shut up, you double cross. Yeah, I'll shut you up. Oh. Drop that gun, Lockridge. How about it, Mike? Yeah, he got him all right. Collins is dead. Okay, Lockridge. Now you got two murders to answer for. Come on, let's go. Well, kids, not a bad day's work. The murder's solved and a jewelry gang smashed. The robbery detail ought to buy us a round of drinks. Miss Phyllis Knight wouldn't be here to enjoy it if you boys hadn't come back to the apartment in the nick of time. Well, you can thank Mike for that, Phil. He figured out the manager was in the deal with Collins. Sure. Remember Mrs. Boyd told us the manager's office was on the fourth floor and it didn't mean anything to you? Yeah. 
You said it was so obvious, you wouldn't explain it to us. Of course. Ed Collins told the telephone operator he wanted to see Mrs. Jones on the eighth floor. But we all saw him get out of the elevator on the fourth floor. He went straight to the manager's office. That's why the manager barged in on us two minutes later. Yeah. And when Collins asked for Mrs. Jones, that was double talk because you two kids were standing by. Ah, uh, the thing which really tied it onto the manager was when I asked him the color of the suit Ward Richie wore last night. He said gray, which was the color of the suit they bought this morning at a fire sale, smeared it with blood and used to try and frame Richie. Oh, I see. Plus their phony identification of Richie down at the show-up. Yeah. The manager, the telephone operator, and the elevator boy agreed among themselves to identify the same fall guy. And by a thousand to one shot, it happened to be Richie, the one outsider who was interested in the case and who, as a favor to me, had stepped into the show-up box. Pure coincidence. Mm-hmm. But you know, Inspector, the only person I really feel sorry for is Mrs. Boyd. Yeah. It's bad enough to be married to a crook, but then a murder. Ah, don't worry. She'll be all right. She'll get plenty of comfort from our client, Mr. Ritchie. Oh, there you go again, cooking up another romance. No, I don't have to. He's still in love with her. I know that gleam in a man's eye. Well, says the expert. Of course. Don't I see that gleam often enough, Mr. Shane? Hmm? Darling? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the domestic heating situation is going to be tougher this winter than ever before. All fuel, including oil, coal, gas, coke, and wood, will be scarce. Here in the West in particular, war industries are going to need more fuel for manufacturing. That means you should act now by weatherproofing and insulating where you can and by checking up on your heating equipment in order to conserve fuel next winter. And don't wait for some special fuel which may not be available. Stock up now on whatever kind and quantity of fuel your dealer can let you have. Remember, fuel will be scarce this winter. Be sure you're prepared. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. One of those drowsy summer afternoons, the sort of day executives spend on their favorite golf course, and office workers spend watching the clock. But not Mike Shane. He's hard at work, hunched over a desk in his private office. Mike's mind is clicking like a Powell Street cable car. In fact, he's right in the middle of a crossword puzzle. Phyllis Knight, his capable assistant, is daydreaming in the outer office, gazing out a window at San Francisco's rooftops. A quiet day? <laughs> Let's be frank. It's a downright dull afternoon. But wait. Is this Michael Shane's office? Uh, uh, yes. Do you wish to see him? Idiotic question. 
Of course I wish to see him. In there, I suppose. Well, well, of all the nerve. Are you Michael Shane? Hmm? Oh, yes. And the young lady who was suffering from spring fever is my usually capable assistant, Miss Phyllis Knight. Won't you have a chair? I'm Winifred Spencer. The society columnist? I believe that is the correct title, although most of my readers and radio listeners prefer to call me a gossip writer. I know something of your work as a detective, Mr. Shane. Well, I'm just an amateur, Miss Spencer, in comparison with you when I think of all the skeletons you've dug out of closets. I'm afraid I've found one too many, Mr. Shane. Hmm? I received this letter this morning. I'm going to kill you. Your poison words have caused grief, wrecked fortunes, divorce, suicides. Now they're going to cause your death. There are scores who would like to kill you. None has a better reason than I, so I'm going to kill you. What would you do if you received such a letter? I'd read it the second time on a train, a fast train. No, Mr. Shane. You'd go after the writer, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. You think you know the person? I hope I uh, to know tonight. Mr. Shane, will you and Miss... Uh, Miss Knight? Will you and Miss Knight be at my home at 8 o'clock? Hmm? I'm having a dinner party, and I believe you will find the guests interesting. You may even find the person so intent on murdering me. We'll be there, Miss Spencer. Oh, may I keep this note and the envelope too, please? Of course. And please dress. You're to be friends from out of town tonight. We'll endeavor to be presentable. And I trust prompt. Goodbye, Mr. Shane and Miss Knight. Goodbye. Mike. Hmm? You didn't ask her any questions. Well, for the present, Angel, I'd rather she did the talking. Hmm. Now, I believe she was actually frightened. Oh, she's scared stiff, honey. Her chickens are coming home to roost. Half the people in San Francisco, the so-called better half, would like nothing better than to send flowers to her funeral. Yeah, I guess that's true enough. Now, you can't grow up on the right side of the tracks, tattle on your friends, and not get your fingers burned. Hey, isn't there a brother somewhere in the background? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. A bit younger than the old Dane. Went through his money fast, and now they say he's going through hers. I believe he lives with her. Oh. Let's have a look at the note, huh? Envelope plain, business type. Dressed to the old girl at her office. Mailed at 6 p.m. last night. You uh, notice anything odd about the paper? Oh, let me look at it against the light. Watermark business stationery, Mike. This has been torn. The letterhead's been torn off. Right you are, Angel. Now, look at the typing. Ah, it looks almost like a professional job to me. Could be... Well, come on, let's do a bit of research on San Francisco society. Oh, that won't be necessary, Mike. I'm one of Winifred's uh, constant readers. Just ask me questions. I'll remember that when the time comes. Uh, Now, please, Mr. Shane, I'd like the rest of the afternoon off. We get a red-hot client and you want to play. No, dear, I want to get my hair done. We're stepping out in society tonight. Say, I wonder if I got a black tie. an old mansion. Look at the Iron Deer on the lawn, Mike. Mm. The bay window in front. Not as big as the Palace Hotel, but older. Anybody with Iron Deer on the lawn is just inviting me. Yeah. Ooh, it gives me the creeps. Ivy all over the walls. Probably some growing inside, too. Yeah. Anyhow, let's find out. Ring the bell. Uh, you mean lift the knocker. Oh. Uh. This way, please. Bring them in here, Henry. This way, please. Oh, I'm glad you came early. Nice to be here, Miss Spencer. What an unusual house. Oh, yes, this old house is filled with memories. The Spencers have lived here since 1850. Say, that's a fine old square rigger model on the mantelpiece there. My grandfather sailed the original round the horn... He brought uh, most of the furniture you see here with him. This desk was one of his prized possessions. Well, it looks like it's being put to use these days, too. Typewriter, lots of books. Is uh, this your study? No, I do my work at the office. My brother, Seward, spends quite a bit of time in here. Seward likes to think of himself as a writer. Is your brother here tonight, Miss Spencer? Yes, with his latest conquest, a Miss Melody. You'll meet them at dinner. Oh. Uh, We'd better be getting back to the dining room. It's time for the guests. Uh... I think there's somebody behind that curtain. Huh? Of course there is. The curtains hide a service entrance. Come in, Henry. 
Pardon me, Miss Spencer. Oh. May I announce dinner? Yes, Henry. We're ready. <laughs> Will you please stop boring one another and listen? I have a surprise for you. This is my broadcast night, and it's almost time for me to go on the air. You're going to do your broadcast right here? No, I recorded it this afternoon. But we're going to listen to it on the radio. I thought it would be interesting to have the people I'm going to talk about as my guests. That's why most of you are here tonight. I'm sure you'll find what I have to say uh, interesting. Uh, Mr. Davis, Hugh, please step into the drawing room and turn on the radio. I don't want anyone to miss a word of this broadcast. You might have spared us this, Winifred. I'm through protecting you, Seward. Well, I'm not going to sit here and be made a fool of by my own sister. You'll remain right where you are. What's the station, Winifred? And for heaven's sakes, how do you turn this antique on? Oh, bother. I'll come and do it. I believe he was afraid to turn it on. What's this all about, Mike? It looks like she's going to tittle-tattle on Seward and her guests. Oh. He might look at Seward. He's ready to explode. He's not by himself, honey. Most of the guests seem to have high blood pressure. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. There's Mr. Davis. He's standing there by the door laughing. Huh? <laughs> oh, it looks like the joke's on Winifred. I don't believe the radio's going to work. Well, what seems to be wrong with the radio? Well, that's what Winifred's trying to find out. She should have bought a new one years ago. Are you sure it's plugged in, Winifred? Well, I guess we're going to have to listen to her. And now, your society reporter, Winifred Spencer. Good evening. This is Winifred. Have I been gathering tidbits about people you know? The first item tonight concerns an immediate member of your reporter's family, my brother Seward. He has played with fire once too often, and I regret to announce that I my brother stay. has Listen. gone too far. Come on, Merle. She's got no right to talk to you. There goes Seward into the drawing room, and Miss Melody right after him. Oh, come on, Phil. Let's get in there. Hey, hey, what goes on here? It's Winifred. She's dead. She's dead. Hmm. A knife in her back? She's dead, all right. We'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Friends, if your automobile engine has a habit of giving a death rattle when you step on the accelerator... The fault may lie with the motor oil you use. You see, most rattling and pinging in an engine is due to excess carbon. And contrary to popular opinion, nearly all carbon formed in automobile engines comes from the lubricating oil and not from the gasoline, as so many people think. Now, no two motor oils form the same amount of carbon. That's why we say your carbon troubles may be due to the brand of lubricating oil you buy. Because, and this is a proved laboratory fact, Triton motor oil forms less carbon than any of the seven leading motor oils sold in the West. Yes, that's right. Triton cuts down carbon. The secret of Triton's superiority lies in Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent refining process. That means all harmful asphalts, waxes, and sulfur have been removed, leaving a pure 100% paraffin-based lubricating oil. An oil that will furnish hundreds of miles of safe, dependable lubrication. So, friends, with parts and mechanics as scarce as they are today, why not take advantage of the unusual protection you can get from Triton Motor Oil? You can buy Triton at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. The inspector is on his way. Mike has announced his identity and taken over. Ten minutes has elapsed since someone murdered Winifred Spencer in her drawing room, not more than 12 steps from where a dozen guests sat finishing their dinner. May I have your attention, please? Now, I'm sure that you want to return to your homes, and there's no reason why those of you who were at the table when Miss Spencer met her death should remain. 
Oh, you may leave now before the police arrive, if you wish. Hey, the inspector isn't going to like this, Mike. Hmm? You said yourself that there were ten people here who had reason to murder Miss Spencer. I said there were at least ten people who would love to murder her. Hmm. Whoever killed the old dame had a lot stronger motive than revenge, Angel. I let them go because they were cluttering up the place. Now, just the same. The inspector isn't going to like it. Watch this. I'm not going to like it. No. Huh? Mike got big-hearted and let some of the guests go home. Uh, we can always bring her back, Phil. Who's left? That's Miss Spencer in the chair with a knife in her back, Inspector. Mm. I believe I told you on the phone that her brother, Sewer, took a powder. Mm. The lady on the sofa is his... Uh... I'm uh, Merle Melody, and I'm sticking around a little. Because Seward will be back. He just lost his temper and couldn't face the guests. Lost his temper, huh? Oh, tut, tut. And uh, the gray-haired gentleman who looks like a banker is a banker. Family friend named Hugh Davis. He's coming over to say hello. Glad you're here, Inspector. I'm Hugh Davis. Mr. Shane has told yeah, you... Yeah, that's the why I'm here. I understand you're an old friend. I suppose I know Winifred as well as anyone in San Francisco. I've been the Spencer's banker for 20 years, Inspector. Hmm? Did uh, you handle Seward's financial affairs too, Mr. Davis? Yes, although I must say they became rather tangled. Miss Spencer mentioned something about his spending a great deal of money on his new girlfriend. The charming Miss Melody. None of us approved of that infatuation. All this might never have happened. Well, you'd better tell us all about it, Mr. Davis. I'd much rather discuss the matter when Seward is present. Mr. Spencer isn't here. He's flown the coop, so let's have it now. What about Seward and his money? It wasn't his money. Oh, Winifred was generous with him, generous to a fault, in my opinion. Seward spent the last of his fortune more than a year ago. So he has uh, been living off his sister, eh? Yes, Mr. Shane. Well, it's not a very pretty picture, but you can't hang a man for sponging. Something I'd like to know, Mike. Yeah, what, Angel? I'd like to know what Winifred Spencer said about Seward in her broadcast tonight. And ended rather suddenly here. You know. I picked up the script on the way over, Phil. Just a lot of society gab and a sprinkling of sneers. Right people in the wrong places. Uh-huh. What'd she say about her brother and his girlfriend? Well, let's see. Oh, yes, yeah, she said Seward had stepped out of bounds with a chorus girl. They were dropping his name from the social register. Then she said she doubted that Miss Melody would be able to support Seward in the style he'd been accustomed to. Oh, so his sister was going to cut him off. That right, Mr. Davis? Yes, they had a bitter quarrel a couple of days ago. Will Seward inherit Miss Spencer's money, Mr. Davis? I think the proper person to advise you on that matter is Miss Spencer's attorney. Oh. Maybe you're right, Davis, but as uh, Miss Spencer's banker, I believe you can answer the question. Well, I'd much prefer that Seward was present, but... Well, I don't suppose this is any time to be guarding family secrets. You're right so far. Now, look, if you know anything, spill it. I doubt that there will be more than several hundred dollars in this old house for Seward to inherit. What? Well, what happened to the old lady's fortune? Well, I'd much rather wait... Well, it'll have to come out sooner or later. Winifred and Seward have had the same safety deposit box at the bank for years. Just three days ago, Winifred came to my office highly agitated. More than $200,000 in negotiable bonds were missing from the box. And just what has your bank done about finding the 200 grand in bonds? Mr. Shane, there are times when a bank has to use discretion. We hope to recover Miss Spencer's property without undue publicity or scandal. That's one reason I sent Winifred to you this afternoon. So, Brother Seward raided the box. That is all too evident, There's Miss another Mike. thing quite evident, sir. If you and Miss Spencer hadn't been so cagey, ducking the very thing that little Winifred dished out, scandal, she might be alive right now. We thought we were doing the right thing. Well, that's water under the bridge. Mike. Hmm? Do you notice anything missing from the room? Well, sure, Ranger, the body. The police doctor just left a few minutes uh -huh. ago. No, not that body. Merle. Merle Melody. Huh? Holy smoke, she has gone. You better search, Mike, with the murderer still on the loose. There's only one way she could have gone, through here. The door's open. Try that room, Inspector. I'll try this one. Right. Here she is, on a bed. Is she alive? Oh, well, I don't know yet. Yeah. Yeah, she's breathing. Hmm. Now it's like a light. Oh, oh, sleeping pills. Yeah, I guess so. Pulse is slow, but regular. Didn't want to answer questions, eh? All right, let us sleep. Let's have a look around while we're back here, Mike. You read my mind, Inspector. Uh, which way is the kitchen, Davis? Next turn to the left and down the hall. Here it is. Hmm, it's as big as a barn. And just as empty. The sergeant came back here when he searched the house. He probably sent the servants to their quarters. What's that? What have you picked up, sergeant? I just nabbed the butler. Let me go in the back door. Bring him into the light. Wow. Look who's with him. The missing brother. Thanks, Sarge. I'll take him. All right, sir. Bring him into the drawing room, Inspector. Here he 
we are. All right, talk. Where have you been all evening, Mr. Spencer? What are police doing all around the house? Where, where's Winifred? What have you done with Miss Melody? I'll have the answer to my question first, Mr. Spencer. Where have you been? I've walked for miles. I don't know where I've been. You were here when I lost my temper and dashed out, Mr. Shane. Winifred had no right to humiliate me before my friends. I hated to come back here. Then why did you come back? I don't know. This is my home. Where is Winifred, Merle? Miss Melody's asleep, Mr. Spencer. Your sister is dead. What? Murdered. No. No, that isn't true. I saw her sitting in that chair when I ran out the front door. Yes, Spencer, she was there. It also looks as if you stopped long enough to stick a knife into her back. No. No, I didn't do it. I might have wanted to, but I didn't. Just a minute, Henry. Where are you going? To my quarters, sir. You'd better stick around. Say, where were you when Miss Spencer's broadcast began? Uh, oh, yes, yes, I recall. I, I was preparing to serve the coffee, sir. I saw you going toward the side entrance to the drawing room when Miss Spencer left the table to turn on the radio. Oh. So you entered the drawing room by the side door, just ahead of Miss Spencer? I did not, sir. The door was closed. I, I stood outside listening. I, I never miss one of Miss Spencer's broadcasts. Why did you lie to me about serving the coffee? I was frightened. You don't look like the type that frightens easily. Were you outside with Mr. Spencer? No, I heard someone at the back. It was Mr. Spencer. I let him in. Didn't the sergeant tell you to stay in your room? I have always answered the door, sir. That's probably the only truthful answer you've given me. Inspector. Yeah? Want to help me with an experiment? What are you going to do, Mike? I'd like to refresh my memory, Inspector. Let's all go into the dining room. Now, there's one thing I want to find out. All right, everybody, please take the places you had when Miss Spencer turned on the radio. I see. Mr. Davis, when I give the word, you are to get up and walk to the radio in the drawing room. Yes. Wait a few seconds and call just as you did at dinner. Very well. Phil, Phil, you be Miss Spencer and answer him. All right, Mike. Henry? Henry, you had better take your eavesdropping post by the side door, if that's where you really were. Yes, sir. Mr. Spencer, when Mr. Davis returns to the dining room, I want you to run into the drawing room. Oh, do I have to go through with this again? Yes, you have to go through with it again. No, I can't. I... I can't... Oh. Henry, what? Seward. Seward has fainted. Was that what you wanted to find out, Mike? No. No, that wasn't on the schedule, Angel. <laughs> We'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, an automobile radiator that's clogged with rust and scale is a menace to your gas coupons. Yes, that's right. You see, choked water lines block the easy flow of the water. That means your motor heats up more than it should. And that spells trouble because motors, when too hot, can waste gasoline. Now, another thing which many people overlook is that cars driven around town with constant starting and stopping get hotter than those driven on the open road. So, even if you aren't planning any trips this summer, it's a good idea to drop in at a Union Oil station and ask the Minuteman to clean out your radiator. This service takes but a few minutes and works like magic. Union radiator flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale, rust, and grease right out of choked radiator cores and water lines. Then, when this foreign matter is cleaned out and the Minute Man fills your radiator with fresh, clean water, you can be sure it will really circulate with a fast, steady flow. So, for cooler driving, economical mileage, just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Radiator Service. Thank you. A couple of minutes has passed. Seward has been placed on a leather couch. Mike, Phil, and the others are gathered around the couch. A rather cruel thing to do, Mr. Shane. Pretending to make Seward go through with all that nonsense. It wasn't nonsense, Mr. Davis. Here, loosen his collar. Mm-hmm. Henry, is there any brandy in here? I'll fetch it, Mr. Davis. It's in the pack. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's coming, too. Oh, no, I can't. I can't. What? Oh, I fainted. Yes, yes, you fainted. All right, now... Now, maybe you'll tell us why you killed your sister. What you did with those bonds. I didn't kill Winifred. I tell you, I didn't. 
And I don't own any bonds. Uh, my glasses. I've lost my glasses. Uh, Mr. Right. Shane, hmm? you've tried your methods. May I try mine? What are your methods, Mr. Davis? I'd like to talk with Seward for a few minutes, alone. I've known him since he was a boy. That's up to the inspector. Why not let him talk, Mike? My man have the place corked up like a bottle. Well, okay, but remember, we'll be just outside the door. Yes, Inspector. But, Mike, all we got on Spencer is circumstantial evidence. The fact he was the last one with his sister. Don't forget the $200,000 in bonds. I'm not, Phil, but with this kind of evidence, I need a confession. We'll get it, Inspector, from one of the three. Three? Yeah, sure. Seward, the butler, and Davis. Davis has a pretty fair alibi, Mike. You told me yourself he was back at the table seated before Winifred Spencer turned on the radio. Yeah, that's right, Mike. He was sitting on my left. Yes, yes. He was in the dining room, but he's still on my list. Now... Mm. Let me see. I know it. What are you muttering about, Mike? Ten steps, twelve, maybe fourteen seconds. That's it. That's it. Why didn't I think of it before? Come on, let's go. It's in the bag, Inspector. Maybe you got it locked up, Mike, but I... Oh, there you are, Inspector. It didn't take long. Well, Davis, the conference over. What's that you've got in your hand, Mr. Spencer? Well, you thought I should sign it. The bonds... Uh... I'll explain. Seward wanted to make a statement after we'd talked a bit. All right, what about? Seward and I talked things over, and I typed a statement which he dictated to me. Yes, I wanted to clear up any... Let me see that paper. Did you read this before you signed it, Mr. Spencer? Well, I can't read without my glasses. Hugh read it to me. I thought so. Mr. Spencer, this is a signed confession to the murder of your sister. So what? you did get it, Davis. He tricked me. He told me to say Winifred took the bond. I didn't kill her. Grab him, Inspector. No, no, not sure. You gave him. What's the matter with no. Dave? Hold him. Let me, let me search him, Inspector. You... Well, here's a pair of glasses. This is outrageous. Those are my glasses. Like to try them on for size? You couldn't get them on with a pair of pliers. They're Seward's glasses. You picked them up when you helped carry them in here. You're crazy. Davis? Davis, you killed Winifred Spencer when you found out you couldn't hoodwink her any longer about the theft of those bonds, the bonds you stole. Are you out of your mind, Shane? I was standing where you could touch me when Winifred was killed. You killed Miss Spencer. You tried to hang the murder and the theft of 200,000 in bonds on young Spencer. You stole his glasses, persuaded him to sign a confession he couldn't even read. You'll find such absurd surmises difficult to prove, Mr. Shane. I couldn't have killed Winifred, and all of you know it. Mike, I, I really don't see how it was possible. I was with you in the dining room when Winifred was killed. I was standing within plain sight of at least a dozen people. Can you answer that one, Mike? I don't have to, Inspector. It has nothing to do with the killing. I think you're all familiar enough with the radio set to know that after you switch it on, it takes a few seconds to warm up. A few seconds, yes. But I was in the dining room considerably more than a few seconds, Mr. Shane. Besides which, I was carrying on a conversation with Winifred, in full view of you all. A one-sided conversation. Winifred didn't answer. Very convenient of you to think of that now, Mr. Shane. But hardly enough to charge me with murder. I'm afraid Mr. Davis has a point there, Mike. Mr. Davis has a point in that I was half asleep when I should have been wide awake. I heard the noise that was the clue as to who killed Winifred Spencer. All of you who were in the dining room heard it, too. But no one thought anything about it. You... you mean the snap of the radio switch? Well, I heard Miss Spencer turn it on, too. But that's just where we were all wrong, Angel. We yeah. didn't hear the radio switch when Miss Spencer turned it on. Mr. Davis? Yes? This is what you did. You saw that the radio was plugged into a light switch. So you switched off the light. That meant that when Miss Spencer switched on the radio, nothing happened. You grabbed her, slapped your hand over her mouth, and stabbed her. Then you walked to the dining room door, stood there talking... And when sufficient time had elapsed, sufficient time that you felt you had an alibi, you slipped your arm behind the wall, pulled on the light switch, and about 10 to 15 seconds later, the radio came on. Anything to say to that, Mr. Davis? From the look on his face, you must have been right, Mike. Oh, I know I'm right. His efforts at blaming young Spencer will hold up in any court. Okay, here's yours, Inspector. <laughs> Kidnapped? <laughs> this isn't the way home. I've got to get that society clam bake off my conscience, honey. We're heading for Fisherman's Wharf. Oh. Maybe a nice cold lobster. Mm. 
Jeepers. We forgot all about Merle Melody. Oh, the sleeping beauty? <laughs> well, she's young Spencer's problem now. Mike, hmm? what made you so sure Davis was the murderer? Oh, he kept chipping his hand. Yeah, but that radio business was a clever alibi. Hmm. Not too clever, Inspector. He counted on the noise covering up the click of the switch. His timing was bad. It didn't. Yeah. We both heard the snap, but we weren't thinking fast. Well, maybe you can tell me one other thing, Mike. I'll make a stab at it, Angel. Oh, don't use that word. Hmm? I only wanted to know if they serve Crab Louie where we're going. When you look like that, Angel, they'll serve you anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Tom Petty and based on a character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is Michael Shane with a message from Director of Fleet Maintenance, Admiral V.V. Chaplin, United States Navy. It reads, quote, To all welders, riggers, electricians, coppersmiths, and other skilled shipyard repairmen. Subject, Fleet Maintenance. There is a serious skilled labor shortage in all West Coast shipyards due to heavy battle damage suffered by our warships in recent weeks. For three straight months, nip planes have hampered, hammered at our fleet off Okinawa. One day alone, late, late in May, 11 of our ships were hit. Not every day is that bad, but every day is bad enough. Until these smashed ships can be patched up or rebuilt, they are as total a loss to the fleet as if they were sunk. This is an urgent appeal to all skilled workers who may be able to qualify as shipyard repairmen to apply at once to the nearest United States Employment Service office, unquote. Well, that pretty well tells it, friends, except to say that if you can qualify as a shipyard repair worker, apply at once. You'll find the number of the nearest United States Employment office in your phone book. <laughs> This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. As a seasoned private detective, Mike Shane is hardly surprised at anything. Puzzled, yes. In fact, this evening, Mike is very puzzled, along with his trim and lovely assistant, Phyllis Knight. Mike's car grinds to a stop near the Presidio, in front of an old brownstone mansion overlooking the Golden Gate. In fact, it is the home of Captain Tyre, shipping magnet. The car door slams. Mike and Phyllis hurry up a flight of stairs. The front door opens before them. Oh, good evening. What do you wish, please? Uh, Mike Shane and Miss Knight to see Captain Tyre, please. Oh, yes, sir. You follow Hop G, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
Oh, Mr. Shane? Hmm? Oh, it is Mr. Shane. Yes, that's right. This is Miss Knight. How do you do? I'm Norma Tyre. I talked to you on the phone. Yes, you were calling for your uncle. We're sorry to be late. I am, too. The captain gets so impatient, you know. Uh, Hop, take Mr. Shane's hat. Oh, yes, Miss. Yeah. Now, they're all waiting in the library. In here, please. Well, Mr. Shane, you did make port at last. At last, sir. I hope Who's I... Who's that? That with you. Your wife? Uh, I'm Mr. Shane's assistant captain, Miss Phyllis Knight. Assistant? <laughs> Fine breed of men nowadays. Always got some woman trailing behind them. Uh-huh. A man's world. Ah, Captain Tyre, I... All don't... right, all right. Let's get the introductions over. My brother Milton, general manager of the Tire Oriental Lines. How do you do, Mr. How do you Shane? Do, sir? Mr. Thomas Packer, our secretary treasurer. Glad to know you. How do you do, sir? Mr. Shane, we're sailing in pretty choppy waters. That's why we're signing you on. Yes, I gathered that much, sir. As you know, sir, from the days of Windjammers, the Tire Oriental Lines has run the finest and fastest packet ships to China and India. We've had plenty of competition, but our line is still fastest and finest. You've always had beautiful ships, Captain. I've watched them sail out the Golden Gate many a time, wished I was aboard. Yes, maybe one of them you watched was the SS Java. It's a picture of her over the bookcase there. But you saw her only once. Say, that's right. She went down on her maiden voyage, didn't she, several years ago? Yes, struck a reef off Hong Kong on the uh, Singapore run. My brother was a captain. Oh? Not Milton here. My other brother, Norman. Uh, My father. He and mother went down with the ship. Oh. Board of Inquiry looked into it, of course. My brother Norman was dead, so he couldn't testify. Mr. Graves was first officer, and Mr. Graves was on the bridge when they hit that reef. He cleared himself with the Board of Inquiry... But I have never been satisfied, and he's never held another berth with our company. And he hasn't done very well with other lines, according to what Graves writes to the paper. I uh, don't understand. Well, I'll show you. We've got newspaper clippings here of letters he's had published each year on the anniversary date of the sinking of the Java. It's been going on for years now. In every letter, he claims that the Java was poorly built, that we made a goat out of him. And now no other line will give him a berth. He says we've ruined his career. Ha. You see, Mr. Shane, next Thursday will be another anniversary of the loss of the Java. And we understand Mr. Graves is going to send another letter to the newspapers. And the following week, we launch our newest ship, the SS India. We're an old and respected line, Mr. Shane. I don't intend that we have any cloud hanging over that launching. I've had enough of Mr. Graves' blather. I won't have any more of it. No more, do you hear? Captain, how do you know he's going to write another letter? He telephoned the captain and said so. We think he's being paid by some other ship line to embarrass us. We want you to find out the facts. Isn't it possible that he just has a persecution complex? Has brooded over the affair too much? I doubt it. I doubt it. And if he's taking money to scuttle our line, I'll attend to that gentleman myself. I've handled his breed before. Uh, no, no, I'll do as I uh, please. Uh, Who's in command here? Do I have to settle that again? Now, Captain, you've got to watch yourself. I never saw such a crew of old women. Captain Tyre, I haven't taken this case yet. And if I do, it must be on one condition. What's that? If we find that Graves is guilty as you suspect, the matter must be turned over to the police. You're not to settle it yourself. We agree to that, Mr. Shane. I want Captain Tyre's statement, please, sir. Well, it's better than he deserves. All right. Good. Good. Now, uh, can any of you tell me where I'll find this Mr. Graves? I may want to talk to him. The last we heard, he was staying at some apartment on uh, Clay Street, a place that caters to old sailors. Oh, that's good enough. You better get on it tonight, sir. I'll check back as soon as I have something, sir. Uh, glad to have met all of you. I'll see you to the door. Thank you. Mr. Shane, I... Uh, may I ask uh, what will be your first step... Well, we'll probably drop by police headquarters to see if they have any record on Graves. Then we'll check his friends and acquaintances to see if he's spending money be yeah. beyond his means. Uh, Miss, uh, your hat, please. Oh, 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 thank you, thank you. Good night, Mr. Shane. Miss Knight, good, good night. night. Angel, what's the matter? You were so particularly quiet in there. Oh, you noticed. Well, I spent most of my time reading a note and wondering what was in the wind. Hmm? When Norma shook hands with me, she pressed a note into my palm. Well, here's what it says. Mr. Shane, I've got to see you. Your apartment, 10 o'clock, 
tonight. That's about the whole story, Inspector. Mm -hmm. Phil and I are checking up on this first mate, uh, Lee Graves. We thought you might have some record on him, Inspector, if he's ever been in trouble with the police. Well, not here in Homicide, Phil. Oh, Oh, of course not, but your general fingerprint file might show something. It might. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Take a look at the fingerprint cards. You got the name? Lee Graves, right away, sir. Well, kids, I'd say you were going in for exotic stuff. Tire Oriental lines, the ship sinking in the China Sea. Mm-hmm. If you want color, Inspector, you ought to see the old captain. He's yes. saltier than the briny itself. Yes, <laughs> sir. He could bite an anchor chain in two. And his niece. Um, why does she want to talk to you in your apartment, Mike? I don't know, but I'm really looking forward to it, Angel. Indeed. Inspector. Well, that's fast uh-huh. work, Sergeant. Find anything? I haven't looked, sir. I'm afraid I've got bad news. Yes? You'll really need Graves' fingerprints now. A few minutes ago, Captain Tyre was murdered. We'll rejoin Mike Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Friends, if your car has a habit of playing the anvil chorus every time you take a hill or step on the gas, perhaps you're using the wrong motor oil. Now, that statement may sound odd to you, so maybe we'd better explain. You see, most drivers recognize carbon knocking and pinging when they hear it. But very few know that nearly all carbon formed in engines comes from the lubricating oil and not from the gasoline. However, and this is the payoff... Motor oils differ widely in the amount of carbon they will form. That's why we say your carbon troubles may be due to the brand of lubricating oil you buy. Because, and this is a proved laboratory fact, Triton motor oil forms less carbon than any of the seven leading premium oils sold in the West. Yes, that's right. Triton cuts down carbon. The secret of Triton's superiority lies in Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent refining process. That means all harmful asphalts, waxes, and sulfur have been removed, leaving a pure 100% paraffin-based motor oil, an oil that will furnish hundreds of miles of safe, dependable lubrication. You can buy Triton motor oil at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. The president of the Tyre Oriental Ship Lines has been murdered. In the private study of Captain Tyre, Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector examine the body slumped over the desk. The inspector turns to the captain's brother. Has anyone touched this body? No one, inspector. And who found him? I did. All right, give the sergeant your name, and now tell us what you know. Thomas Packer, secretary treasurer of the company. About ten minutes after Mr. Shane left the house, somebody rang the doorbell. Hop G let him in and Mm -hmm. took him to the captain's study. I asked Hop who it was. He said a Mr. Graves. The captain and Graves were alone in the study? Yes. Norma, Milton, and I were in the living room. I got uneasy about Graves and came and knocked on the door there. When I got no answer, I walked in. The captain was just as you see him. Yes, at first we thought he'd fainted until we saw the blood. And this man Graves? Boy, he disappeared. Uh, We found that veranda door open over there. It's the only way he could have left. Mm -hmm. Sergeant, I guess we shake out the dragnet for Mr. Graves. Mike, where I'm standing, I can see something white under the body. Just the edge of it. Where? Here, see? Under his chest on the desk. I think it's a paper of some sort. Yeah, I see it too, Phil. I'll raise him up a bit, Mike. Look, look, there's what killed him, his own paper knife. Yeah, right into the heart. What? Inspector. Yeah, Mike? This paper underneath him, it's a note for us. To whom it may concern. My suicide may appear the act of uh, an insane man. It is not. There are reasons. My family knows these reasons very well. Oh, Captain good, Tyre. Good suicide. Hey, let me see that, Mike. There are reasons. My family knows the reasons very well. I'm sure we do not. Why, I haven't the slightest idea what Captain meant. How about you, Packard? Well, I'm not in the family, but it it stumps me. We were talking to the captain less than an hour ago, and he certainly didn't strike me as being in a suicidal frame of mind. No, I can't imagine a proud old sea captain killing himself a week before he launches a new ship. He was afraid of bad publicity from Lee Graves. 
I don't know what could be worse than the president of the line committing suicide. You people are satisfied that this is the captain's handwriting? Yes, it's the captain's. There's no question. The angle of that knife into his chest. Uh, was, uh, was the captain right or left-handed? Right-handed. Uh-huh, that checks. Look, if you people don't mind, we'd like to make some diagrams, routine stuff, you know. We'd like to have the room to ourselves for a while, if you don't mind. Oh, we'll yeah. wait in the living room. All right, Mike. What do you want to tell me? Take another look at that suicide note, Inspector. It was not written at this desk. How do you know? Simple. The desk has a glass top, but the back of the note paper shows it was written on a soft surface. Uh-huh. And see, the pen, the pen flooded once, the ink soaked through, and some green fuzz stuck to the other side. Fuzz from a green blotting pad. Well, Mike, maybe the captain wrote the note somewhere else and then brought it in here. Sure, a lot of suicides write their farewells and carry them around in their pockets for days even. This paper is fresh, Inspector. It hasn't even got a crease in it. Now, you can talk from now till breakfast, and I say Captain Tyre was too rugged a number for suicide. Even his family can't explain it. All right, suppose it is murder. The next thing Yes, is... the same question every inspector and DA asks. What, what is, is the, the motive? motive? Sure, and another thing. If Lee Graves killed the captain, how did he force him to write this note? There's no sign of a struggle. Well, let's stop asking questions and find out. Sergeant, there may be some good fingerprints on that knife. I'll check it right away, sir. Mike, hmm? I stick to phone here. There's a cylinder on it. Well, can you tell if it's been used? Yeah. The wax has a few grooves cut in it. Okay, it's worth a try. Play it back to us. All right. Hacker, where are those blasted maritime foes for the SS China? Packer, how many times have I got to tell you to get hold of Crowder? I want my will changed. Give him those notes I dictated at the office. That's all there is, Mike. Sergeant, never mind that knife. Bring Mr. Packer in here. Yes, sir. So, the captain was worried about his will. Well, that might bear out suicide if he was tidying up affairs before his death. It might mean a number of things. Uh, yeah. You want me, Inspector? Yes, Mr. Packer. Did Captain Ty have an attorney by the name of Crowder? Why, yes. And did Crowder make the changes in the captain's will? How did... No, he, he didn't. Didn't you get hold of Crowder? You were to give him some notes. Uh, no, I didn't give him the notes. Why not? Well, the captain's brother and Norma told me not to. It would mean the control of the company would go to a board of governors. I see. That's all, Mr. Packer. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I'd like to ask a favor, Inspector. Yes? The captain's death is a great shock to all of us, uh, but the business must go on. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do at the office tonight. Must all three of you go? Yes, sir. We have an $8 million ship to launch next week. Very well. The sergeant will tell the men outside to let you pass. Yes, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Well, Inspector, you wanted a motive. You've got two of them. A discharged first mate with a grudge against the captain. Mm-hmm. A brother and a niece who now control the company due to the captain's very timely death. Great <laughs> some law and order. It's the inspector, the sergeant, and my chief. Hello. Who's the lady with you? Hi, Manny. We're looking for one of your customers, uh, Lee Graves. Oh. Skipper Graves? Yeah. yeah, he was here a little while ago. I swept him out. <laughs> he was drunk? Oh, no more than usual. I just got tired of hearing him carve up Captain Tyre. That's so. What did he say? Oh, you know the skipper. Wait till he gets his hands on Captain Tyre. He'll string him up the yard arm, bash his head in with a belaying pin. Keel hole, the old barnacle. <laughs> Bloodthirsty cuss, huh? Don't worry, lady. He's been talking like that for years. He's killed Captain Tyre 917 ways. Yes, sir. What's the matter with you kids? You heard what the bartender said. You treated as casually as yeah, if the sure, man hadn't sure. even... Graves is too loose-tongued. Well... If he planned to kill the captain, he wouldn't advertise it to Joe Dokes and his yellow pup. It works both ways, Mike. If Graves hopped on the idea long enough and then got into a fight with the captain, he might find himself carrying out the urge. Sergeant, call headquarters. I want Lee Graves in custody before midnight. <laughs> What? Please, hop, Jean, or Savvy. The bedrooms, hop. Bedrooms. We want you to show us which room is Miss Norma's and which is Mr. Tyre's. Oh, what? Everybody out now. They'll go offices. All right, we'll go find them ourselves. Oh, hop, Jean, take you. They're upstairs. Please. Hold on. This is Lom, Captain Ziblada. Do you see anything, Mike? No. 
No, I'm not in this room. Okay, we'll try Norma's room. Where is it, Hop? Oh, Missy Norma? Yeah. Uh, see, next to what? This is all. There you are, Mike, over by the window. Aha, uh-huh, a writing desk. And it's got a green blotter on it. Well, it doesn't absolutely prove the suicide note was written here. Mm. Find some writing on the blotter, Mike? Yeah. Can you read it? Wait a minute. It's mostly blur. Um, to whom it may concern, my family knows... The suicide note. It was written on Norma's desk. Yes. And I'm wondering just what Miss Norma plans to tell me at 10 o'clock in my apartment. If she has the courage to go through with it. You mean if she even shows up. Well, Miss Tyre, you must have been waiting outside for the clock to strike ten. Hardly. I told him at the office I was going out for some supper. Let me take your coat, Miss Tyre. Oh. Oh, hello. Uh, no, I can't stay long. I uh, like your apartment, Mr. Shane. What the captain would have called a trim berth. Mm-hmm. I suppose you recognize those docks just off there to your right? The Tyre Oriental Lines. My father lived his whole life on those ships. He died with one. God had made me a man. That's where I should belong, on the bridge. There's no feeling like it. 12,000 tons of steel alive and straining beneath you. Completely at your command in the lives of all aboard. It means power and mastery. Uh, Miss Tyre, in that note of yours, you said uh, you had to see me. Uh, yes, Mr. Shane. The past year or so, I've been watching Tom Packer. He's grown to think that he runs the company. When the captain and Milton took that trip to Australia last March, he darn well did run it. But the captain took over again, didn't he? Yes, but Packer had tasted power. It seemed to me, Mr. Shane, that there might be a connection between him and Lee Graves. Mm? Packer might be paying Graves to embarrass the Tyre family with those letters to the newspapers. Then at the proper moment, Packer would move in. Well, that's what I wanted to tell you. Oh, but that would hardly cause the captain to commit suicide. Or do you think Packer and Graves cooked up a murder deal between them? Well, Tom Packer found the body. See? I've got to go. I shouldn't be away from the office too long. Oh, you won't say anything about this, Mr. Shane. Oh, of course not. Uh, good night. Good night, Miss Tyre. Good night. <sighs> well, honey? Yes, yes, a very big well. Mr. Packer says Norma and Uncle Milton want control of the company. They blocked the captain, captain's attempt to change his will. And now Norma throws it right back into Packer's lap. But the suicide note was written on Norma's desk. No, oh, that's a gruesome killing for a woman. Oh, don't make that mistake, honey. We've got to look at her as a person who, for power and mastery, could murder Captain Tyre. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and Phyllis Knight in their adventures. Friends, your automobile radiator needs more attention than it gets by just filling it with water now and then. For the cores and water pipes of a radiator are smaller in diameter than the thickness of a lead pencil. That means it doesn't take much in the way of rust, grease, and scale accumulations to block the easy flow of the radiator water. And sluggish water circulation is hard on gas coupons because overheated motors waste gasoline. That's why it's a good idea to drop in at a Union Oil station and ask the Minuteman to clean out your radiator with Union Radiator Flush. This service takes but a few minutes and works like magic. Union Radiator Flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale, rust, and grease right out of choked radiator cores and water lines. Then, when the Minuteman fills your radiator with fresh, clean water, you can be sure it can really circulate with a fast, steady flow. So for cooler driving, economical mileage, just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Radiator Service. Thank you. Mike and Phyllis have had their meeting with the murdered man's niece. 
They have rejoined the inspector at Captain Tyre's home. The inspector paces the floor thoughtfully. Assuming, Mike, that everything Norma told you is true, we still haven't turned up a bit of proof. Correct, Inspector. If Mr. Packer is working with Graves, he isn't going to admit it. And we haven't got a hold of Graves. What's more important, Mike? The captain wrote that blamed suicide note. The DA can't indict anybody with that thing dangling in front of his nose. Ah, the inspector's right. We've got murder motives for everybody and no proof that it's even murder. But it's got to be. We haven't found anything that shows the old captain planned a suicide. Admitted. There isn't even a suggestion in his diary that anything was wrong. His diary? Huh? A man keeping a diary? Yeah, Phil. I found it up on that bookshelf while you two were talking with Norma. The captain's log, he called it. Well, where is it now? On the desk. Mm-hmm. The handwriting matches this suicide note, okay? Last entry was yesterday. Yeah. Mostly ship sailings and cargoes. Wait. There's a blank stretch in there. Yeah. I noticed it. February this year. Captain starts writing again on March 3rd. Oh, it's just hand scratches. I can't even read it. But you'll notice on March 5th, the handwriting goes normal again. Uh-huh. Anybody can read it. Four days ago... Four days out of San Francisco. That must have been on his trip to Australia. I checked through the whole diary, Mike. It doesn't mean anything to me. Eh, perhaps it will, Inspector. Honey, how about ringing for Hop Chief, please? Shall do. Don't you see, Inspector? The captain was a careful, methodical man. Every page is full of details about the, the ship line, except for the month of February. A complete blank. What happens in February? I'll have your job for this. Let go of me. Hey, hey, what goes on? We finally got graves, Inspector. A lot of good it'll do you, you confounded landlubbers. We picked him up trying to cross a bay bridge. All right, Graves, I guess you know what you're here for. I do. If you think you can frame me again like Captain Tyre did with that sinking Mr. Light. Graves, you came here to see uh, the captain tonight? I did. To show him the next letter I'm going to mail to the papers unless I get my old berth back. I'm going to ruin my reputation to get away with it. We're talking about murder, Mr. Graves. And you want to blame it on me. Captain was dead when I came in. Yeah? Then why didn't you stick around? Because, because I I lost my head. I've been blowing around what I do to the captain. I walk in tonight, and there he is dead. So I cut out through the window. Mike, there's hmm? Hop G in the doorway. Huh? Oh, yes. Oh, Inspector, will you hold it for a minute? Oh, this is same man Hop G see before. He killed my captain. Yes, yes, now, same man, Hop. But look, uh, you see the captain's log here? Yes, sir. All right. The captain didn't write anything in it from February 6th to March 3rd of this year. Now, do you know why, Hop? Oh, captain sick. Go away. He have stroke. Stroke. Stroke? Do- Paralysis? Doctor say stroke. Captain no move leg, no move your arm. Which leg, which arm? Oh, this one. Of course. That's it, in- that's it, Inspector. Hey, Sergeant. You're going to pick up three more people at the office of the Tire Oriental Lines. Well, we're certainly glad you men caught Graves. Has he confessed? No, Mr. Tire. Graves did not kill your brother. Oh? Then it was suicide after all. Again, no. It was not suicide. It was murder. And you three people knew it was murder. Why didn't you tell us the captain was once paralyzed? The captain was a proud old man. He made us keep it secret. He didn't want it to get out among the stockholders or to our competitors. That was all right while the captain was alive, but not when he's dead. You wanted us to think it was suicide. You forget, Inspector. We called you because we did think it was murder. Then when you found that suicide note, it uh, changed things. It most certainly did not, Mr. Packer. You knew the captain couldn't possibly write that note or plunge the knife into his heart. All right. Let me put it this way. The captain's suicide will hurt the company, but his murder would hurt even more. I knew it was murder. I suspected Norma or Milton. Well, and we suspected you. So all three of you kept still, hoping we'd decided it was suicide and accuse Lee Graves. That one of you three murdered the captain. You can't prove that. Very easily, Miss Tyre. By your answer to just one single question. Where were you during the month of March this year? Why, I... Right here in San Francisco. You were here with her, uh, Mr. Packer? Yes, I was. She represented her family while Milton took the captain on a trip to Australia. The doctor said a sea voyage would help him. Mm -hmm. The captain had a stroke in February. He, uh, 
He couldn't write it in his diary, but uh, once he began his sea voyage, he felt better. On March 3rd, he tried to write in his diary using his left hand. The writing was impossible to read. But on the next day, there's an entry which is perfectly normal. It's a very good imitation of the captain's writing. In fact, it's the same writing on the suicide note. Oh, no. No. Oh, yes, Norma. The truth has to be told. You all knew somebody else wrote the uh, captain's diary for him. The only person who was with him on that voyage is Brother Milton. What? That doesn't say I murdered him. Captain asked me to write the suicide note for him. He killed himself. You're getting desperate, Mr. Tyre. If your brother couldn't write that note because of a paralyzed arm, he couldn't plunge a knife into his heart. Oh, no. Oh, no. You'll need a better story than that, Mr. Tyre. Especially for a jury. Kids, this was a strange case. Huh? Mr. Packer and Norma must have been protecting Milton Tyre from the very start. Sure, sure. They knew he signed all the captain's papers for him. The old fellow was too proud to let people know he was ailing. And they protected Brother Milton because they were glad to have the captain out of the way before he changed his will. And they lost their power in the company. Mm-hmm. A very tight little group. You know, there's one thing that puzzled me about you, Mike. Mm. You're the one who discovered the suicide note was written on Norma's desk. Yet you never accused her. Inspector, you should know Mike by now. A woman with a trim ankle is never a killer to Mr. Shane. Oh, now, now, Angel. Why, I knew from the start she couldn't be guilty. Oh, oh, you did? Sure, sure. You and I both saw her before the killing. We both saw her afterwards. Both times she was wearing the same white blouse with long, frilly cuffs on the sleeves. She couldn't possibly have stabbed the captain without uh, getting blood on those sleeves. You see, Phil, he does notice what a woman wears. Uh-huh, uh-huh. uh-huh. I've noticed that he notices. Trouble is, Inspector, it's always the wrong woman. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on a character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. know that our detective friend Mike Shane is the hardest working member of his profession in San Francisco. We all know that he's a dynamo of energy in his tireless pursuit of the criminal. But at the moment, it seems the criminal is in pursuit of Mike. His assistant, Phyllis Knight, ushers into the office two rather odd characters. Uh, Mr. Shane, my name is Belsey, George Belsey, Jr., my friend here, Richard Stowe. How do you do, Mr. I'm Shane? I'm glad to know both of you. Gentlemen, my associate, Miss Knight. Hello. How do you do? A pleasure. Mr. Shane, this is a very peculiar business call. 
I might say it took considerable persuasion on my part to get Mr. Stowe to come here this afternoon. Oh, well, it's so embarrassing. We I... handle many embarrassing problems, Mr. Stowe. Dick's problem is more than embarrassing. It's almost driving him crazy. You see, Dick is afraid he's going to murder me. Murder? Couldn't we have that last chorus again? Well, I don't blame you, sir. Dick thinks he is going to murder me. Uh, Mr. Stowe is going to murder you. <laughs> At least I'm afraid I might. This is not a practical joke, Mr. Shane. Nor I'll be crazy. I, I'm i not sure just when it started. I, I've been very upset in recent months. I guess I've brooded too much. I'll say he did. Dick got so bad, I finally dragged him down to a psychiatrist friend of mine, Dr. Neiman. Mm-hmm. Neiman, yes, I've heard of him. Well, the doctor seemed to help me for a while. My health improved. But then I, I began having this dream. It's always the same dream. It never varies in any detail. It's, it's the perfect crime. I kill Mr. Belsey in such a way that the police are completely baffled. Which could happen only in a dream, but uh, go on, go on. Well, George Belsey's office is up in the Commerce Building. On the ground floor is a cocktail lounge. Well, I dream that about 8 o'clock at night I go into the bar. I order a drink. I drink half of it. I tell the bartender I'm out of cigarettes. I go out to the lobby, but I don't buy cigarettes. I slip through the door on the left and hurry down a hall. I get into the freight elevator. Room 707 is right in front of the elevator. I open the door. I walk through two offices. George Belsey's room is the third. I see the light shining through his glass door. George is working tonight. I take out my revolver. I open his door gently, quietly, just a crack. George is behind his desk. It takes just one bullet. I close the door, wipe off the doorknob, and run back to the elevator. In a minute, I step up to the bar again. I ask the bartender to light my cigarette. I finish my drink. The dream is over. Well, that's really something for the scrapbook. Well, the dream is so horribly vivid that sometimes I don't know whether I've dreamed it or actually done it. I see. And you want me to set your mind at rest, Mr. Stowe? All right, I think I can show you why you couldn't commit a perfect crime. First, uh, Mr. Belsey, are the bar, the freight elevator, and your office situated as in the dream? Yes, they are. Dick has been up to my office often enough to have the details straight. Mr. Stowe, would you have any motive to kill Mr. Belsey? Oh, no, not the slightest. Are you in any business deals together? No, my line is mining. Dick's is wholesale hardware. Mm -hmm. Mr. Belsey, do you work at your office every night? Oh, no, very seldom. No matter how carefully a murder is planned, there's always the danger of something unforeseen. Mr. Stowe would have to know which night you're working. Then somebody might notice him sneak out of the lobby. An operator might be working after hours on the freight elevator. And then there's the scrub woman upstairs to avoid. And the gun to dispose of afterwards. Yes. No matter what gun you use, the police would trace the bullet. You'd have to prepare yourself against all these slip-ups and a dozen others. Well, now, does that take a load off your mind? Uh, uh, yes, it, it does. And if you dream it again, Dick, just laugh at it. Roll over and go back to sleep. <laughs> well, really, I do feel better already. George, we'd better not take up any more Mr. Shane's time. Oh, that's quite all right. Oh, we want to pay you. No, forget it. I don't charge for just talking. Oh, you've done more than that, Mr. Shane. You've pointed out my mistakes. You've told me how to commit the perfect crime. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure to meet you, sir. And Miss Knight. Thank you. Good afternoon. Goodbye. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Well, this is just fine. Mike Shane, consultant on murder. Hand me that phone book. Who are you going to call? Who do you think? That psychiatrist. Of course I understand, Mr. Shane. Mr. Stowe has been my patient for months, but there is no cause to be alarmed. Well, the way he talked, Dr. Neiman, I, I, I just wondered if he had all his buttons. Oh, there is nothing wrong with Mr. Stowe. He has had a series of especially vivid nightmares, and it has become a habit with him. There is nothing to worry about. I see. Nothing to worry about. Hmm. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed your drink, sir. Yeah, very much, thank you. Here you are. Much obliged. Good night, sir. Good night. All right, honey. Let's head for the lobby. Okay. Now, let's see. Mr. Stowe said the lobby, then the door to the left. Must be this one. And there's the freight elevator. Well, 
we've done everything in the right order. We had a drink in the cocktail lounge. We went through the lobby. We found the freight elevator. All checks with Stowe's dreams so far. Yeah. Room 707 right in front of us. Mike, the lights are on inside. Hmm. Elsie working tonight? Through two rooms and then his office. Mike, it, it's this next office. There's a man's shadow against the door. And it isn't Belsie's. No. Those shoulders look awfully familiar. And the angle of that hat. It's the inspector. Who's out there? Hey, Mike and Phil. What in the name Inspector, of... you're here on a murder? Why, yes. It's a man shot to death? That's right, but how did... Oh, uh, one more question, Inspector. In that next room is a desk, and behind that desk is the body of George Belsey, Jr. How in the name of everything did you know? Ah, I hate to tell you, Inspector. I really hate to tell you. We'll return to Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, nearly everyone knows about carbon and the trouble it causes in automobile engines. But what most people don't know is that the kind of motor oil they buy directly influences the amount of carbon in their engines. That's because many drivers still believe that carbon comes from the gasoline, when actually nearly all carbon formed in gasoline engines comes from the lubricating oil. But, and this is the payoff, some motor oils form a great deal more carbon than others. That's why we say your carbon troubles may be due to the kind of oil you buy. Now, and this is a proved laboratory fact, Triton motor oil forms less carbon than any other of the seven leading premium oils sold in the West. Yes, that's right. Triton cuts down carbon. The secret of Triton's superiority lies in Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent refining process. That means harmful asphalts, waxes, and sulfur have been removed, leaving a pure 100% paraffin-based motor oil, an oil that will furnish hundreds of miles of safe, dependable lubrication. You can buy Triton motor oil at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. A man's dream of murder has turned into a nightmare of reality for Mike Shane. In the office of the dead man, Mike and Phyllis have explained to the inspector how they knew George Belsey had been shot to death. So you and Phil were tracing Mr. Stowe's dream footsteps. That's right, Inspector. Phil and I came up here just to see if Stowe could commit the crime the way he dreamed it. And when we saw you here, the inspector of homicide, we knew what had happened. Uh-huh. It happened all right. Bullet right through Belsey's heart. Well, we'll have Stowe picked up right away. I know where he was 40 minutes ago. Uh, who's this? Frank Mann. I was in business with Belsey. Yeah, Mike. He found the body and phoned us. I saw Stowe down in the cocktail lounge about 40 minutes ago. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Go down to the cocktail lounge and have Mr. Stowe paid for a phone call. If he answers, bring him up here. If he doesn't, send a couple of men to pick him up. Right away, sir. Uh, Mr. Mann, you say you were in business with George Belsey. The mining business? Yes. I'm a mining engineer. Well, maybe you'd call me a prospector. George and I were just about to hit it rich. Now it's hopeless. Oh, well, why's that? Why? Well, you don't find gold mines with every blow of a pickaxe. I've rawhided over every mile of the Sierras looking for a good digging for George and me. George grub staked me. I found him a couple of little mines, but now I need some real cash. That's what you came here tonight to talk over with Belsey? Yes, I just got in from Nevada. Uh-huh. Hadn't seen George for, oh, five or six weeks. He was back east a while. I walk in the door tonight and... Well, you know the rest. And uh, this is uh, the way you found him, slumped over in his chair? That's right. You can see the bullet embedded in the back of the chair. Went clean through him. Mm-hmm. Looks like a forty-five caliber. This is uh, Mr. Stowe, Inspector. Yeah. Found him in the bar, like you said. Where's George? Where's... Oh! Uh-huh. All right, Mr. Stowe, suppose we have your story. You were in the cocktail lounge, you went out for some cigarettes. Yes. It's just like my dream... 
But I didn't kill him. Inspector, I checked with the bartender. Mr. Stowe came in about an hour ago. Mm-hmm. Yes, I went out in the lobby. I even went to the freight elevator. I was just curious about my dream. But I went right back to the bar. I didn't know George was working tonight. I didn't kill him. I know I didn't. Sergeant, was he carrying a gun? No, sir. Well, if Mr. Stowe doesn't believe he did the killing, we've got to go ahead and solve the case ourselves. Now, let's see. The usual stuff on the desk here. Is a bottle of whiskey the usual? Hmm? Hmm. Bonded. Mm Mm-hmm. Must have been open recently. The label's still wet. But this one drinking glass is clean and dry. Mm Mm-hmm. Appointment pad shows Belsie's last caller was at 5 p.m. Mike, there's a, there's a phone number jotted down. Fairfield 62041. Hey, that number. Mean anything to you, Mike? You bet it does, Inspector. I called that number this afternoon. It's Dr. Neiman. Well, maybe we better check up on it. Yes, and speaking of checkups, uh, how about the angle of the bullet? Was it fired from the doorway? Looks like it, though we haven't traced it yet. Well, let's do it now. Must be a good 20 feet from the desk to this door. Mm. Listen, I think I hear somebody coming. Probably the coroner. He's late. Uh Uh-uh, that's a woman's footsteps. Mm, Yes, it is. All right, miss, in this way. What's the meaning of this? Perhaps you'd better tell us. What are you doing here? I came back for something I forgot. She was Belsie's secretary, Marie Farrell. Hello, Marie. Mr. Mann, why are these people here? In case you really don't know, look behind Mr. Belsie's desk. Oh. Then it happened. Mr. Stowe's dream. No, Marie, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. Miss Farrell, do you know anybody else who might want to kill Mr. Belsey? Why, no. Mr. Stowe kept dreaming about it, but nobody would have a reason. Well, we don't think anybody killed him for the pure sport of it. You say, Miss Farrell, you came back to the office because you forgot something? What was it? I... I I can't remember. You've forgotten what you forgot in the first place? Oh, I remember. I... So mixed up the, the theater tickets. I was on my way to the theater with some friends. They must be wondering what happened to me. Well, I guess there's no point now keeping you. We can always find you. Yes, then. I'll get the tickets. They're in my desk. We may want to talk to you tomorrow, Miss Farrell. So if you'll give the sergeant your address and phone number. Oh, of course. Marie Farrell, Calistoga Apartments, Dawson 90351. I, well, I guess that's all. Good night. Now, where were we? Oh, yes, yes. Checking the angle of the bullet. Sergeant, you might take Mr. Stone and Mr. Mann into the next room and let them dictate their stories. Yes, sir. This way, please, gentlemen. Mike, look at this. Mm -hmm. I found Belsie's account books in this desk drawer. Uh, Let's see, Phil. Hmm. Partnership. Belsie and Mann. Gold shipment. Mike, from these figures, I'd say they were doing all right for themselves. Mike. What? How's this little item for the third finger left hand? An engagement ring. Where did you find it? In this middle drawer. Look at this newspaper with it. Photograph of the blue penciling around it. Uh, Miss Carly Schaefer announces her engagement to Mr. George Belsey, Jr. of San Francisco. Hmm? Right good-looking gal. It's a Pittsburgh paper three days ago. Must have been mailed to Belsey. Wait a minute. Huh? Hey, kids, look at this picture again. Where? Miss Carly showing her engagement ring to some girlfriends. But now the ring is here in San Francisco. Uh-uh, it's not the same ring. It's smaller, a different cut. Oh, how can you tell? It's only a newspaper photo. All right, look at it through this magnifying glass. Mm-hmm. Phil's right, Inspector. The Pittsburgh gal is wearing Belsie's engagement ring, yet he's got another piece of Cupid's ice in his desk drawer. For whom? Marie Farrell. Maybe she was after this ring. Could be. I think we'd better have a real heart-to-heart talk with that young lady, and right now. Uh-uh, Mike, you forgot. She's gone to the theater. All the better, my dear. Meanwhile, we can have a look around her apartment. Sergeant. Yes, sir? We're going to see Miss Farrell, the Calistoga Apartments. Looks like our little canary is about to fly her cage. Uh Uh-huh. Suitcase all packed. Hmm. Looks like she's traveling light. Unless she has other bags. Dresses, blouses, stockings, slips. Yeah, perhaps I'd better take the inventory. Here. Hey, hold it, hold it. Here's a letter. Return address, George Belsey, Jr., State Hotel, Pittsburgh. Okay, okay, read the letter. Hmm. 
written last week. Dearest Marie, I'll be back in San Francisco by Saturday, but there's something I want you to know before that. You remember a girl I used to know here in Pittsburgh? Her name is Coralie Schaefer. A good old-fashioned jilt. Yeah. It seems Coralie is the one and only for him. Then Phil was right. The engagement ring in Belsie's desk did belong to Marie. Do you think the jilted young lady might soothe her feelings with a well-placed bullet in her ex-boyfriend? Marie told us there was no reason why anyone should want to kill Belsie, yet she's got the only motive for murder we've found so far. Yeah, but you can pile motives up to the ceiling, and Richard Stowe will still look like the murderer. That's true, Inspector. He had the dream, and the killing was exactly as he told it to us. I'm not saying he didn't do it. In fact, there's one angle which may pin it right on him without motive or intent to kill. Meaning what, Mike? Meaning that we've all forgotten Dr. Neiman. The psychiatrist? Yes, and I think we should swap complexes and phobias with that gentleman. Well, you kids go ahead. I'm waiting right here for Marie. She's got to come home sometime tonight. Well, we're not going to leave you here alone. Oh, 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 listen, Grandma. I'm not helpless. I was with Homicide while you were still playing in the sandbox. Okay, Inspector. Okay. Come on, honey. Do you know where uh, Dr. Neiman lives, Mike? Well, we'll get it from the phone book, but first uh, we're stopping by my apartment. There's something I want to have when we visit Dr. Neiman. <laughs> Of course I remember you, Mr. Shane. You telephoned this afternoon about Mr. Stowe. May I ask, Dr. Neiman, if Mr. Stowe has talked to you this evening? No. What do you ask? Oh, curiosity. I am interested in that nightmare which has been troubling Stowe. The details of the dream to kill Mr. Belsey was so complete. I asked, Doctor, when Stowe was talking to us, he seemed to think it was the perfect crime. So? The perfect crime? In fact, Doctor, it looks like the dream was too much uh, of a temptation for Mr. Stowe. Elsie has been murdered. Tonight? Yes. In the same manner? In the same manner. Uh, will you have a cigarette, Miss Knight? Uh, no. Thank you. I understand, Doctor, that Mr. Belsey brought Stowe to you to help him out of a bad mental state. Yes, he was morbid about his business affairs. I might say he was on the verge of a neurotic collapse. Uh, I helped him considerably. How, may I ask? Oh, by various technical means. I'm afraid Mr. Stowe's mind was not quite balanced. That's not what you told me this afternoon, Doctor. You said he was all right, that there was nothing to worry about. How was I to know he would do such an insane thing? Doctor, in treating Mr. Stowe... Did you use hypnotism? Yes, occasionally. I know what you are thinking, Mr. Shane, but you are wrong. It is impossible to hypnotize a man to commit murder. You can't hypnotize anyone into violating his code of ethics. Mm -hmm. I see. Doctor, I brought along a copy of one of your books, Exercises in Psychiatry. I'd like to read you something you wrote on page 93. 93. Oh, I think I know what it is. Quite yes. possibly. This is it. Modern psychologists maintain that a person hypnotized cannot be made to perform acts which violate his ordinary standards of conduct and morality. However, I suggest that if the patient is first convinced by hypnotism that he has no standard of morality, he can be made to follow out any order, even if it be murder. You can't hold that against me. What I wrote eight years ago, I've uh, tested my theory and I found I was wrong. I... How did you test your theory, Doctor? And uh, can you explain why Mr. Stowe did not have this dream of murder till after you began to treat him? Mr. Shane, I refuse to be dragged into this mess. If you try to smear my reputation in this town, I promise you, you'll regret it very sorely. Very well, Dr. Neiman. Then I think we'll be going. You uh, haven't been what I call helpful. I am not required to be. No. No, but if Mr. Stowe is proved guilty of murder... You may find yourself named accessory to the crime. Think that over, Doctor. Why so quiet, Mike? Thinking. When I look back on it, I think Newman knew what happened from the moment we walked into the door. But, Mike, even if Mr. Stowe was hypnotized to commit a murder, how are we going to prove it? Mike? Mike, what's wrong? We're being followed. Where? No, 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 don't turn around, don't turn around. Look in the rear vision mirror. I saw that same Suzanne behind us when we started over Twin Peaks. Mike, you, you don't think... We'll find out, honey. I'm going to swing into this alley. It passed right by. Yeah, 
Maybe I'm just getting jumpy. To play safe, we'll go over to another street. Oh, I couldn't see who was in the car. Did you? No. No, it's so dark we... Phil. I see it. It turned around. It's right behind us. Duck, honey. Duck! <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures. Friends, with the hottest part of summer yet to come, it's a good idea to make sure that the cooling system of your automobile is working properly. You see, aside from the fact that it makes driving uncomfortable, a motor, when too hot, wastes gasoline. And whether you realize it or not, cars driven around town with frequent starts and stops usually get hotter than those driven on the open road. Now, an easy way to make sure your radiator is on the job and cooling your engine is to have your Union Oil Minuteman treat it with Union Radiator Flush. Union Radiator Flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale, rust, and grease right out of choked radiator cores and water lines. Then, with a radiator that is flushed clean, you can be sure of rapid water circulation and a cool motor. So for cooler driving, economical mileage, ask for Union Oil Radiator Service. Wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. One of the bullets fired into Mike Shane's car came near its mark. Mike was hit in the shoulder. Phyllis has bandaged the wound, and the two are now back at the scene of the murder, the office of George Belsey. How are you feeling now, Mike? Oh, a little rocky, but okay, Inspector. It was just a flesh wound. We'll have a doctor address it properly. You better, Phil. Oh, Mike, the sergeant has just brought in Neiman. We got everybody back here now. Stone, Man, and Marie. Have you got anything out of Marie? Yeah, admit she and Belsey broke their engagement. But there's a funny twist to it. We didn't notice when she was here earlier she was wearing another engagement ring. You mean the one we found in the desk didn't belong to Marie? Looks that way, Phil. She froze up when I asked her about the one she was wearing. Have you checked up on where everybody was at the time I got shot? Yeah, they all got alibis. It's up to us to find out which one is lying. That's what bothers me, Inspector. Somebody tried to kill me because he or she thinks I know the answer to this case, and doggone it, I don't. All right, I'll bring them all in now, and we can sweat them. All right, Sergeant. Say, Sergeant. Yes, sir? <clears throat> Open that door again, please. Yes, sir. Well, I'll be... Inspector. What? There must be something wrong with our ears. We've opened and closed that door 40 times tonight. Well, what about it, Mike? What about it? Well, listen to it. There. Don't you see? The killer couldn't possibly open this door to fire his gun without Belsie hearing him. Mm. Let me show you. I'll step outside the office and close the door and then open it again. What's the matter, Mike? I can't see the desk. Look. Look, the door has to be completely open before I can see the desk. That means the killer practically had to come into the room. I catch. Belsie must have seen him, but he didn't jump up or try to escape. He just sat there, paralyzed with fright. Wait a minute. We've skipped a big point here. Belsie was hit by a forty-five bullet. That would knock an elephant sideways. Yet he stayed there in his chair. Yeah, you're right. The nervous reflex alone would make him jump out of his seat. Unless he was unconscious. Inspector, what? we've assumed all along that the whiskey and drinking glass on the desk were unused. I'll bet my gold bridge worked that the killer cleaned and dried that glass. Belsie took a drink that was drugged. That's possible, but there's still the main question. Of who did it? All right. Mr. Stowe dreamed of the killing. Marie... I believe you indicated that you knew of his dream. Well, yes. Mr. Stowe talked about it so much. And Dr. Neiman knew it, of course. And you, Mr. Mann. Well, Belsie joked about it with me once or twice. So everybody knew of Stowe's dream and could take advantage of it. But here's the point. I practically accused Dr. Neiman of hypnotizing Stowe to commit the murder. I still deny it. And I believe you, sir. I've been thinking it over the past few minutes. Dr. Neiman has never been in this office. We checked on it. He couldn't possibly hypnotize Mr. Stowe... And give him all those detailed directions about the cocktail lounge and the freight elevator. Yeah, that makes sense. The same reason would rule out Mr. Stowe. If he killed Belsie, he would do it exactly as he dreamed it, which is not the way the murder was committed. No, Mike has demonstrated that. Huh? By the opening and closing of the door, and by the probability that Belsie was drugged. Marie, Marie, you are the prize suspect except for two things. 
You didn't know Belsie was working tonight because the last appointment jotted down on his desk pad was for 5 p.m. And you were not in your apartment when Miss Knight and I decided to call on Dr. Neiman. So you couldn't have followed Mike there or tried to kill him afterwards. But that also goes for Frank Mann. Not quite, Inspector. He did hear us say we were going to Marie's apartment. He followed us first to her place and then to Neiman's No, and... no, you're wrong, wrong. Frank wouldn't kill Belsie. He, he's not a murderer. Oh, so now it's Frank. Oh. You've dropped the formality. Miss Farrell, that engagement ring you're wearing, Frank Mann gave it to you, didn't he? Yes. We're going to be married. I suppose you'll make a crime out of that, too. It's a very expensive ring, several thousand dollars. If you're broke, Mr. Mann, and Belsie was grub-staking you, you couldn't possibly afford that ring unless you knew you were taking over the gold mines of your dead partner. You, you can't prove a thing. You can't convict me. You've convicted yourself, sir. You were the only one who knew Belsie was working tonight because you had an appointment with him. You killed him, then called the police. Well, the police are still here, ready and waiting. How about it, Inspector? Mike? Huh? How do you want your eggs? Oh, let's have them sunny side up this time, huh? You know, with this bum arm of mine, Angel, you'll have to feed your poor old boss. And how you'll love it. <laughs> Uh-oh, I bet that's the inspector. Hey, wait, wait. I want to hear this, too. Hello? <laughs> yeah, you guessed right, inspector. She's fixing me some eggs. What bacon? Huh? huh? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, you're right. It's in my pocket. I guess I was just absent-minded. Sure, sure. I'll bring it in tomorrow. Okay. Good night, Inspector. What will you bring in tomorrow? Oh, that engagement ring we found in Belsie's desk. I stuck it in my pocket here and walked off with it. Forgot all about it. Uh, yeah, I know how that is. Huh? When it comes to engagement rings, your mind is a complete blank. Ah, Angel, you walked off with something of mine, too, tonight. This book on psychiatry here. Oh, that. Hey, wait a minute. You've dog-eared a page already. Chapter on... Hypnotism and its power over the emotions. You give me that book. <laughs> You're wasting your time, give honey. It, it doesn't work. I've already tried it. <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. In the course of his detective career, Mike Shane has been called upon to track down escaped murderers, to find missing jewels, to recover stolen bonds and sensational diaries. But never before has he been asked to hunt for something 3,000 years old. 
In his office high in the Rust Building, Mike and his lovely assistant, Phyllis Knight, listen sympathetically to a worried little man, Dr. Frederick Wakeman, museum curator. Mr. Shane, these thefts have been going on at the museum now for two weeks. Some of the losses just wring my heart. You know how today people save the baby shoes of their children, even have them cast in bronze? Well, yes, but Then I... realize what it means to me to lose the baby sandals of the pharaoh Ramesses the first. Why, I used to hold those tiny things in my hand and think back to the days when they patted around the royal court of Egypt. Yes, 3,300 long years ago. 3,300 years? Well, why would anybody steal baby sandals 3,300 years old? Unless they were fresh out of shoe stamps. That's the baffling part of it. The thefts don't make sense. One time it's the court robe of a Chinese emperor. The next it's the original of a love sonnet of Shakespeare or the signet ring of a Russian czar. They're famous. If the thief tried to sell them in New York or London or Bombay, it would be known they came from this museum. In which case, the thief would be caught. Sounds like to me the work of a pretty clever thief. Dr. Wakeman, do you suspect anybody in particular? No, how can I? It's bewildering. It's, well, it's a mystery. The museum is open every day, but we have very capable guards. I believe the thefts occur at night, when only two watchmen are on duty. Any signs of uh, somebody forcing in a door or window? No, none that we can recognize. Hmm. But it's got to stop, Mr. Shane. It's got to. I'm responsible, and there are people who will take advantage of my failure. Even in a museum, one can have enemies, huh? Uh, this is what I want you to do, sir. Hmm? Come out and look over the museum with me. Perhaps spend a few nights there. Well, that's quite an order, Dr. Wakeman, but I guess we're game. How about it, Phil? Certainly we are. All right. Then if you would meet me at the museum tonight in my office, say, about 8.30... Your office at 8.30? Okay, but it's only fair to warn you, Doctor. Every time I go out on a job lately, I seem to wind up with a corpse. Really? Oh, <laughs> then you won't be disappointed. You'll find six corpses. Six corpses? Yes, in the mummy room. <laughs> Mike, there's something really ironic about tonight. Mm. For years I've worked with you, tried and begged and coaxed you to go to the museum with me, and it takes a crime to break you down. Well, I can't think of a better reason. Well, I'm excited about it. This case is so different. Imagine sitting up all night with Egyptian mummies and things. What atmosphere? Uh-huh. Well, right now I'm more concerned about the atmosphere collecting on our windshield. Oh. It's starting to rain and I forgot to get those windshield wipers fixed. Mm, a night in the museum. A rainy night in the museum. That's even better. Yeah. Dr. Wakeman, to the contrary, I doubt anybody will try to swipe anything tonight while King Tut is entertaining us. Do you think we'll have to hide in a sarcophagus or, or whatever they call it? Sarcophagus, mm. yes. <laughs> Well, I guess this is the museum. Ooh, hug your coat, Angel. There's a wind with this rain. All right. Ooh, it's a spooky-looking old building at night. Uh-huh. Only one light showing. Probably in Wakeman's office. I ain't got nobody. Well, right on time, according to the clock in the tower. Not very cheerful sounding, is it? What do you want? Well, uh, we have an appointment with Dr. Wakeman. Oh, yeah, yeah. He told me about you. Come on in. Thank you. All right. Follow me. Yes, sir. Mike, that room right ahead, that strange green light all through it. Egyptian department. Mummy room. Oh, it looks so uncanny. Are, are we going through it? Yeah. Shortcut to the curator's office. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice layout of mummies. Reminds me of the morgue. Ooh. Hey, hey, Phil, slow down. Oh, uh, Mike, that, that mummy standing up, it moved. Oh, don't be silly, that's a god. Oh. And, and you talked about hiding in a sarcophagus. Oh. You're right, Jarvis. <laughs> right on in. Thank you. Sure, sure. Well, it looks like Dr. Wakeman isn't here. Well, he's probably around him. Mike. Yeah? That big chair with its back toward us. Yeah, tobacco smoke coming up from it. Uh, Dr. Wakeman, eh? I... Oh, excuse me, sir. Oh, I didn't hear you. I, I was reading this manuscript. Oh, I didn't see you, young lady. I beg your pardon, being in my shirt sleeves. I was drying my coat on the radiator here. Ought to be dry now. Yeah, just a little wet, but no matter... Good heavens, is that clock on the desk right? Yes, it's 8.30. I'd better phone Wakeman's house and find out what's keeping him. Get me Wakeman. 
Hello? Arthur? Uh, this is Cameron. What's holding up Wakeman? Uh, Mr. Shane is waiting here in the office. But he told me to be here at 7.30, and I'm still waiting. Oh, yes, that's possible. All right, Arthur. Uh, that's the young professor who lives with Wakeman. Said he left for the museum at 7. He lives just across the street. Well, he must have stopped somewhere else first. Yeah, that's what Arthur said. I'm curious, sir. How did you know my name was Shane? Oh, Wakeman told me about you on the phone. I'm Professor Cameron, one of the governors of the museum. Oh, I see. Well, I'm glad to know you. And this is Miss Knight. How do you do? How do you do? I hope you people can help poor Wakeman. He's all upset about this trouble in the museum. I suppose that's what he wanted to talk to me about tonight. I've wanted to see your exhibits for a long time, Professor. Well, I'm not the Egyptologist here, but antiquities have been a hobby of mine most of my life. I'll be glad to show you anything I can. Oh, perhaps this is Wakeman. No, it's Arthur. Hasn't he come in yet? Wakeman? Not yet. Uh, Mr. Shane, Miss Knight, this is Professor Arthur, Arthur Behrens. Uh, he's the man you want to talk to about Egyptology. I'm glad to know you, Professor. How do you do? I don't understand it. The guard just told me he hadn't seen Wakeman all evening. He must have gone out again. Well, a little weight won't hurt us. Uh, pardon me. Do we have to suffocate while we're waiting? It's awfully stuffy in here. Do you gentlemen object to fresh air? Oh, I'm sorry. I've been smoking my pipe. <laughs> well, I'll open the window just to crack. <gasps> What's the matter? Good heavens. Wakeman. <gasps> Hanging behind the curtain. Well, well, get him down, quick. Wait a minute, Professor. We've got to see if he's still alive. Oh, what difference does that make? If he's dead, we've got to leave him there for the coroner. He's dead, all right. Oh, how could he be so foolish, so foolish? You think it's suicide? What else? Of course, look at him. I just did. San Francisco Police Department. Give me the inspector of homicide. <laughs> We'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis and their adventures in just a moment. Here's a tip if you're worried about excess carbon in your engine. Just drive into any Union Oil station and ask the Minuteman for Triton Motor Oil. Why? Well, nearly all carbon formed in engines comes from the motor oil and not from the gasoline. Now, there's a wide variation in the amount of carbon different oils form. So it's logical to buy the oil that farm, forms the least carbon. And that's where Triton comes in. For Triton, and this is a proved laboratory fact, contains less carbon-forming elements than any of the seven leading premium oils sold in the West. Yes, Triton cuts costly carbon. The reason is that Triton is refined by Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent process, a process that removes harmful asphalts, waxes, and sulfur leaving a pure 100% lubricating oil. An oil that will safely lubricate your car for many hundreds of miles and give added protection against excess carbon. Your engine deserves that protection. You can buy Triton at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. <laughs> Mike and Phyllis have located the missing Dr. Wakeman, curator of the museum, hanging from a curtain rod in his own office. The inspector has arrived on the scene and questions Mike and the two museum professors. Now, just a minute. Mr. Shane says it's murder. Professor Barron says it's suicide. I can't be positive it's suicide, Inspector. But I know that Wakeman was a very morbid man and terribly affected by these museum thefts. You mean he may be linked in with them? When he saw the things closing in around him, he chose the one way out? No, no, I didn't say that. Inspector, I'd... just so you don't fall for a phony suicide deal, take a look at that rope. Uh huh. See what you mean, Mike? They has the rope are all flattened in one direction. It couldn't be suicide. How could that possibly tell you? Because we make a study of such things, Professor. When a person is dead before he's hanged, the killer has to haul the body up into place. When the murderer pulled the rope over that curtain rod, the pressure going over the rod flattened all the hairs on the rope. But who would kill Waitman? Unless, perhaps, the thief who's been stealing from us. Obviously. We'd better question the guards and check up on any clues of burglary. Dr. Waitman said he couldn't find any clues after the earlier thefts. But he made a list of stolen articles. Now, if we looked at them, we might get an idea of the type of thief. I'm afraid you'll have to forget that. Wakeman kept the list in the big safe there. But he was the only one who had the combination. Well, let's see. 
It's unlocked. We kept some of our most valuable items in that safe. You and Professor Cameron better take inventory. Hmm. Everything looks in its place. A chapter from the Gutenberg Bible, the Greek medallions. Carelessness, carelessness. Wakeman never put anything twice in the same place. What's wrong? This papyrus, any fool can see it's a prayer scroll of the Fourth Dynasty, but the marker says Egyptian Book of the Dead. Or oh, he just filed in the wrong container. Ah, here's a list of stolen articles. May I see it, please? Mm-hmm. Two blue porcelain vases, Ming Dynasty. Jeweled Arabian sword, gold scabbard, two miniatures, Napoleon and Josephine, set of Egyptian... Napoleon and Josephine? Hey, there's a point. Cameron, you remember how Mr. Bradley fought with Wakeman when Wakeman wouldn't sell those miniatures to him? Yeah. Uh, you're talking about Richard Bradley, the lumberman and art collector? Yes, a creature wholly without culture who buys rare and beautiful works merely to flaunt the power of his money. Oh. But... But a man with millions wouldn't descend to stealing. Well, I'm not so sure. Bradley offered Wakeman $20,000 for the miniatures of Napoleon and Josephine. Then he upped it to 25000 Yes, I remember. He was bidding against that art dealer, that, that Francois Lys. Yes, and when Wakeman wouldn't sell at any price, Bradley got so furious he threatened him. He said he'd come down here some night and slit Wakeman's throat and take the miniatures anyway. Oh, I'd discount that. Bradley is notorious for his bad temper. Still, we can't overlook it, Mike. we got to follow all leads. Sergeant. Yes, Inspector? We're going to call on Mr. Bradley. Nobody is to leave this building till we get back. Hmm. So Wakeman is dead, huh? Well, well, perhaps now I can do business with the museum. What time did you say he was killed? We didn't say, Mr. Bradley, but we think between 6.45 and 7.30. Well, that's lucky for me. With my feeling toward Wakeman, you might be coming here to accuse me of his murder. But at that hour, I happened to be eating dinner at the Mark Hopkins. May I ask why you're so bitter toward Wakeman? number of reasons. Do you realize I offered Wakeman a quarter of a million dollars to build a new wing on the museum, and he and his board of governors turned it down? Yeah, turned it down, yes. Merely because I wanted my name chiseled over the doorway. Would another of those reasons be, Mr. Bradley, that Wakeman wouldn't sell you two miniatures of Napoleon and the Empress Josephine? Yes. $25,000 offered him. And I believe when Wakeman refused to sell, you threatened him. And said something about coming down and slitting his throat to get those miniatures? <laughs> yes, I said that. Anything else you want to know? We ask these questions, sir, because those two miniatures were among the articles stolen from the museum. Well, I hope you find them. And when you do, let me know. I'd still like to buy them. When we find them, sir, we'll have the murderer of Dr. Wakeman. I may be able to put you in the right direction. Mm. Yeah. Let me take a look out of the window. Yeah, I can see the light in his store. It's still open. He's down just a block from this apartment. Who? An art dealer, Francois Lys. Yes, I think he would be a very interesting man for you to question. Thank you, sir. If we need any more answers, we'll be back. Mr. Bradley may be a big shot in this town, a millionaire and an art collector. But his heart doesn't pump blood. It's vinegar and arsenic. Yeah, awfully anxious to pack us off to Francois Lys. Mm -hmm. And that alibi of eating dinner at the Mark Hopkins. I think the sergeant better double check on that. You kiddies are a suspicious crew. Now, why would a millionaire commit a murder for two useless miniatures? Well, we can continue this discussion some other time. Here's Mr. Lys' gallery. You are looking for something, yes? Oh, yes, we didn't see you. It's uh, it's like this. My friends here and I are redecorating an apartment. It's to be in the French style, and I... Uh... <laughs> so? Uh, what kind of an apartment are you decorating? Perhaps a cell at the police station? Hmm? Uh, what? <laughs> you are Monsieur Shane, the detective. This is Monsieur Inspector of the police and the young lady. She is Mademoiselle Knight. You have come here to ask me about my poor friend, uh, Dr. Wakeman. Alors, it is a great pity. But... But how did you know? It is simple. One of the guards at the museum, Monsieur Olson, he telephoned me about the murder. So now you come to my studio to look for stolen property. Très bien. 
In my studio, she is at your command. Well, this isn't exactly what we expected. It you see, there is no need for apology. You will pardon if I go. I am promised to see Madame Van Allenhaven tonight, and uh, perhaps to buy her library. Yeah, but hold on, uh, just a minute. Uh, when you have searched my studio, if you will lock this front door, please. Au revoir. Well. Hmm. Well, of all... You've the... come to my studio for look for stolen property. I am happy to have you. Yeah, that's what's wrong, mm. Inspector. Mr. Lease is too free. He knows there's nothing here. If he dealt in stolen goods, he was brain careful not to store them in this studio. Mike, let's go after him. He's going to tell us a few things. Wait a minute, Inspector. He's already told us something. A guard at the museum named Olson telephones him that Wakeman has been murdered and tells Lease about us. What for? Yeah. Lease and the guard must be working this together. Maybe, but that's what we've got to find out. And I know how we will find out, Inspector. We are going to search his studio. For what? I want a cardboard box, some wrapping paper, and a shipping label. Then back to the museum as fast as we can go. Sergeant's got Olsen in the next room, Mike. You ready for him? Yes, Inspector. Yeah, now look. This is the way we'll work it. On the desk here, we've got the box all wrapped and uh, addressed to Richard Bradley. Mm -hmm. Now, inside, we've planted a Chinese vase that we borrowed temporarily from the museum. We'll call in Olsen. We'll tell him we found this box at Lee's studio. And then when he recognizes it as museum property, we hope he'll get rattled and confess. Right. Huh? Okay, kids, let's begin the act. Olsen, in here, please. Olson, we just got back from a little trip downtown. In uh, looking through the studio of an art dealer, Francois Lise, we ran across a package, this box here on the desk. Well, what about it? We'd like you to read the label on it. I don't get what you're driving at. All right, Olson, I'll read the shipping label for you. To Mr. Richard Bradley. Well, suppose we see what's inside the package, huh? Here we are. Well, very pretty. It's like... It's a vase. A rare Chinese vase, Olsen, from this museum. Why, how, how do you... It was one of the things stolen from here, Olsen. And we know who stole it. We know. Now are you going to talk? No, no. No, I didn't take that. He never told me anything about it. You admit you stole for Francois Lee. Look out, Phil! He came through the window. I... I... Didn't take... No, 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 no. Oh! Right through the heart, Inspector. Sergeant! McCarthy! Cuban! The side door, Inspector. Come on, this way. jumping. It looks like it is. That's what least. No, no, no. No, let me go. You are wrong. Inspector, we caught him running for his car. We got his gun. It's still warm and one of the chambers is empty. No. No, you do not understand. But we do, Miss Elise. You were afraid the guard would talk and you killed him. But you were just a little too late. He confessed that he was working for you. All right. Yes, yes. I, I admit. I killed Olsen. But not Dr. Wakeman. No, no, never. We let a jury decide that. Inspector, shall I call off all the boys now? I wouldn't do that, Inspector. This case is not closed yet. What are you talking about, Mike? We've caught the man who killed Olson, but the man who murdered Dr. Wakeman is still at large. We've still got one murderer to catch. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures. Friends, the radiator on your automobile plays a definite part in the economical operation of your engine. Like other parts, it needs some attention now and then. You see, the small honeycomb cores and water pipes of a radiator are easily plugged with rust, dirt, and scale. When that happens, the water circulation is impaired, the temperature gauge shouts danger, and the engine loses efficiency. That's why, with the hottest part of summer yet to come, it's a good idea to make sure that the cooling system of your automobile is working properly. And the quickest way to do that is to have your Union Oil Minuteman clean your radiator with Union Radiator Flush. Union Radiator Flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale and rust right out of choked water lines. Then, with this foreign matter flushed out, the clean water can circulate rapidly and the engine stays cooler. 
Remember, your Minute Man can flush the radiator while you wait. The cost is nominal, and you'll benefit with cooler summer driving. You can get Union Radiator Service wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Mike is certain that the capture of Francois Lys does not solve the murder of Dr. Waitman. In the office of Dr. Wakeman, the inspector argues the point with Mike and Phyllis. I'm sorry, Mike. I just don't get your reasoning. Lise admits he and Olson were robbing the museum. He admits he killed Olson to cover up. Then why do you accept his denial that he killed Wakeman? You just gave me my reason, Inspector. Lise will be convicted for one murder. It will make no difference to him to confess the second killing. That's why I think he's telling the truth. In other words, Mike, you think the second killing occurred tonight merely because of our investigation of the first killing. Correct, Angel. Okay, oh. suppose you're right. Maybe Olson killed Wakeman. They're both dead. One murder cancels out the other. No, Inspector, no. The murder of Dr. Wakeman was very clever, too clever for Olson to have thought of. Mike, you must have something in mind. I have. I was just thinking. When we first started out tonight, we found that safe over there unlocked. Dr. Wakeman wouldn't leave it unlocked with constant thefts going on around here. Do you think the the murderer made him open it? Well, let's have another look inside that safe. There's a lot of valuable stuff in there. If we could find it... Wait a minute. That papyrus. The Book of the Dead, remember? Yeah, sure. The professor said it was kept in the safe. Yeah, the young one. Baron said it was misplaced. That's what he said. Now, I'm no expert on Egyptology, but I do know that the Book of the Dead is an extremely rare old papyrus in delicate condition. Now, if you were going to steal it, what would you put it in? How would you carry it? Well, I see a half dozen long metal cylinders in the safe. I suppose you'd carry it in one of them. Okay, let's check them. Uh, All of them are labeled. Prayer scroll of Imshet Sup. Yeah. And record of Noble's War. Hey, here's one with no label. It's bigger. All dusty and dirty. What? Let me see that. Well, it's even got cobwebs on it. But the safe itself is almost antiseptically clean. Inspector. Yeah. Look at these spots. They're all over the cylinder. You know what made them? Hmm. Water spot. <laughs> ah, yeah, water. And I'll bet you the papyrus inside this tube is the Book of the Dead. Okay, Inspector, get everybody in here. Why, yes, Mr. Sheen, that's the Book of the Dead. We always keep it in the safe. Yes, as I said, Wakeman must have misfiled it. Uh, Professor Barron, you told us you were studying this papyrus just the other day. Yet now we find it in an old, dusty container. Well, I don't know why that would... All the other papyrus cylinders are perfectly clean and bare labels. Where did this dirty, unlabeled container come from? It must be from the storehouse, a building away out back of the museum. Are there a lot of uh, spiders out there? Spiders? Naturally, it's an old building. All right. I'll tell you exactly how Dr. Wakeman was murdered. This evening he opened the safe for somebody who wanted to look at the Book of the Dead. The only thank you he got was to be strangled to death. Then the killer hung the body behind the curtain so it wouldn't be discovered immediately. The murderer needed a special carrying container for the papyrus. So he went out to the storehouse and got one and came back. Time was running short. So temporarily he tucked the papyrus back in the safe, hidden in the new container. It was almost 8.30. He knew Miss Knight and I were due in the office. So he calmly sat down and pretended to be reading that's when we walked in on you, Professor Cameron. Why, why preposterous. I, I never heard of Professor, such a thing. Professor, you told us that you came into the museum at 7.30 and spent the whole hour here in the office reading and smoking. It didn't start to rain tonight till almost 8.30. Yet when we came in, you were drying your coat on the radiator. Well, I, that doesn't mean that It means I... everything, sir. This papyrus cylinder has more than dust and cobwebs on it. It's got spots. Water spots, rain spots. Spots that were collected at the same time you collected them on your coat when you came back from the storehouse after you killed Wakeman. And as final proof, Professor, all four of us here can see wet cobwebs stuck to the back of your trouser legs. Does that convince you, Professor? Yes. Yes, I... I thought I was so careful that no one could prove... That's what every murderer thinks, sir. But the murderer is always wrong. He always makes some little slip some little mistake. Tonight you made yours. Well, 
Well, kids, there's my car parked across the street. I'll say good night and thanks again. Oh, come on, Inspector. Follow us over to Phil's apartment, huh? She'll fix us some coffee and sandwiches. Well? No, I'll do better than that. I'll try out a new spaghetti recipe on you. Spaghetti? Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. There goes my waistline again. <laughs> okay, it's a deal. I'll meet you at the apartment. Okay, okay, Inspector. We'll see you later, then. <laughs> Mike. Yes? You know, I still don't get it. Why would Professor Cameron kill a man just to own an Egyptian papyrus that he could borrow any time he wanted to? No, it seems no motive for murder. Well, it seems silly to us, maybe. But you remember... Remember how sentimental Dr. Wakeman got about those baby sandals of the pharaoh Ramesses? Mm-hmm. Well, Cameron felt the same way about the Book of the Dead. But Cameron was uh, inherently dishonest. Yes, I suppose so. Cameron buried himself in his work. He isn't married, didn't play golf or dance or go to movies, didn't have any fun at all. Ah, that's dangerous for any man. <laughs> now... Well, what are you giggling about? It sounds like a perfect description of Mike Shane. Oh, 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 oh no. No, there's a difference. I uh, may not be married. No. May not play golf or dance. But I've got you, Angel, and I do have fun. <laughs> again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. Here is a message from our government. It's been a long time since there were any new cars, and naturally we're all excited about them. But let's not forget that it'll be many months before new automobiles are on the market. That means that we still have a pretty serious job taking care of our old cars. More and more cars are junked every day. That places a mounting burden on public transportation facilities that are already overtaxed. Now, a few simple conservation measures will help you keep your car rolling. Join a carpool, check your tire pressures every week, and have tires recapped in time to save the casings. Have your battery checked regularly, and make sure your car is regularly and properly lubricated. Take care of minor troubles before they become big repair jobs. Drive slowly. Speed increases wear. Remember... Your car has to last till victory, and then some. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It's just before noon on a bright but blustery day in San Francisco, 
And Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite detective, instead of chasing criminals, is sitting peacefully in his office, academically discussing crime and its detection with his able and attractive associate, Phyllis Knight. And, oh yes, the inspector of homicide who has come to take them to lunch. You see, Inspector, I'm not criticizing the police department when I say that uh, I'm not bound by the rules that... Well, you, for instance, are bound. I realize that, Mike. I have to be pretty sure of my ground before I make an arrest. I have to have evidence enough to convince the district attorney, and he has to have reasonable prospects of obtaining a conviction before he goes to the grand jury. Plus the fact that you, Inspector, can be sued for wrongful arrest, whereas we, Mike and I, never arrest anybody. (laughs) We pass the buck to you. (laughs) I know. I know all that. But what I'm getting at is this. Mike has something in the way of, well, being able to nose out a suspect that we, well, that is, most of us in the department either don't have or else don't apply. The answer is simple. Proving it is difficult. Let's hear it in all its simplicity. Well, you and every other member of the department are so busy taking notes, which you have to do, that you get into the habit of reading what witnesses and suspects have to say. Whereas I, uh, I listen to their tones, uh, to their delivery... I strain my ears for the meaning behind what they say instead of the mere words. I'll admit all that. I think there's something else, Inspector. Although I hesitate to say this. (laughs) Don't spare my feelings, Phyllis. (laughs) No, I'm not thinking of your feelings. It's Mike's. Oh, don't spare mine, Angel. You never do. Hmm. Well, in spite of the fact that Mike hates criminals and hates crime, I think he has a criminal mind. Angel, what you just said. I mean it. Mike seems to be saying to himself... If I had committed this crime, how would I go about it? Or if I were the important clue, where would I be found? Well, that's not a criminal mind, Angel. That's just that I... Michael Shane, private detective. Hello, Phil. Is the inspector there? Oh, sure thing, Sergeant. For you, Inspector. Uh Uh-oh. Hope this doesn't break our lunch date. Hello, Sergeant. Report homicide, Inspector. man named Porter called up and said he found a body at 323 Foothill. Any idea who the murdered man is? Porter said the man's name was Beatty. Didn't give much more information. He seemed pretty upset, not too coherent. Okay, Sergeant. I'll meet you there as soon as I can get there. Homicide, huh? Yeah. Well, what do you want? Murder or lunch? Oh, don't be silly, Inspector. We'll pass up a whole week's meals for a murder any time. street. Yeah. And that looks like the apartment. Right there, with a man standing on the steps. Yeah, that's it. No signs of your boys yet, Inspector. No, but then we were closer than headquarters. That must be Porter. Looks all upset. Well, wouldn't you, if you just found a body? Are you, uh, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes. I've been pacing up and down these steps waiting. I thought you'd never come. Where's the body? Upstairs, on the couch in his living room. This isn't your house, then? Uh, no. No. No, this is Mr. Beatty's house. Oh. You were visiting Mr. Beatty? I called to take him to lunch. When? Just before I called the police. Not more than uh, 20 minutes ago. In this way, please. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, I, I, I went in, and there he was lying on the couch. There was a knife sticking out of his chest. I ran over to him, felt for his heart, and got my fingers all sticky with blood. You shouldn't have touched the body. Well, I didn't know it was a body. He might still have been alive. Had he been, I would have called a doctor before I called the police. That makes sense. Where is he, in this room? Uh, on the couch there. He, uh... Oh, but... But he must be. Body? There's no body on this couch. But no. he was there. Maybe you were mistaken. Maybe he wasn't dead. Oh, but he was dead. He was cold. He was bleeding. His, his heart wasn't beating. Ugh. What's the matter, Angel? Oh, there's blood on the couch. I just got my hand in it. So you're right. Here. Here's my handkerchief. Thank well, you. if he was dead, someone must have removed him. But they couldn't, Inspector. There's only one entrance to the apartment through the front door. There's no back door to the apartment? No, and I've been here all the time. I I haven't been out of the sight of that front door since I discovered his body. I, I, I feel sick. I've got to sit down. Okay, okay, now calm yourself, calm yourself. I don't blame you for being upset. But we'd better get this straightened out. Mr. Porter, tell us what you did from the very start. Well, I, I told you. I, I came to take him to lunch. If he was dead, how did you get in? Well, the door was open... And that's funny, too, because he was always careful about locking and bolting it. Go on, go on. The door was open, so you went in. I found him, and when I saw he was dead, I I, I phoned the police. You'll probably find my bloody fingerprints on the phone. Yes. Then what did you do? Well, I I walked up and down, and I went to the front door. I 
came back and... Oh, I, I remember. I saw the mail lying in the hallway. I absently, almost unthinkingly, picked it up. Where did you put it? On the table there. Mm-hmm. Huh? Oh, the wind must have blown it on the floor. There. That's it. That's it. Uh, then you did what? Well, that's all. I, I walked back and forth, and I walked downstairs to the front door to look for the police, and then I'd come back. And you were never out of sight of that hallway and front door? No, not for one second. Well, it's a cinch that even Houdini couldn't take a body out this back window. That window was open? Yes. <sighs> no signs of anything on the sill. No, and even if there were, Mike, look there. Workmen working on that building would be bound to see anything like that. Yeah, you're right, Angel. You up there, Inspector? Yeah, come upstairs. Well, what do you think, Inspector? I don't know what to think. What's more, I don't know what to do. Well, what do you mean you don't know what to do? Well, to put it bluntly, how do I go about finding a murderer when I haven't even got a body? But there was a body, and there has been a murder committed. You can't talk like that about not doing anything. The man's right, Inspector. I know perfectly well he's right. But why don't you suggest something? All right, I will. What? Let's go hunt a body. <laughs> Return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. You know, you hear a lot about magical post-war products and how easy they're going to make your life. Well, friends, one such product is here already. Yes, that's right. It's Union Oil Company's Luster Wash, a product that makes washing your car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Using an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously over the car. Then, just rinse off with a hose and you're all through. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. No fuss, no bother, no mess. Union Luster Wash is harmless to the car finish and to your hands, yet cleans as fast as you can apply it and without the usual elbow grease. Luster Wash is not a soap, but a special detergent compound which dissolves road film and traffic dirt on contact, leaving the surface clean and smooth. You'll be amazed at how fast it works and how clean it makes your car. A package of Luster Wash sells for only 10 cents and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can get Luster Wash at any Union Oil Minuteman station. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have been confronted with a murder, a man who saw the victim, but so far, no corpse. They've finished searching the apartment and stand looking at one another. Well, if there's a body in this house, it must be in small pieces and hidden in cracks in the walls. Uh, there's certainly no body in this apartment. But, Inspector, Mr. Shane, I, I, I saw it. We know. We know, Mr. Porter, but it isn't here now. Look, we've all had our say on the body. Let's change to something else. We've pretty well covered the apartment. Not only us, but the sergeant and his boys. We couldn't find a thing amiss. Ah, uh, Granted. So, let's take a look at the murdered man's mail. Oh, h here it is. I put it on this end table. Oh, thanks. Ad from Flower Shop. Oh, open this one, Inspector. Okay. Here's another ad. And uh, you open this one, Angel. All right. I'll tackle this one. Hey, Mike. What? Hmm? Listen, I warned you for the last time. Settle up or else. Sign. I can't read the initials, but the signature looks like Reynolds. Oh, that must be. Yeah? Tell us more. Well, I, I, I don't know very much, but Reynolds and another man by the name of Weaver went into some sort of a deal with BT. They felt that BT had swindled them. Uh, not in the way that they could go to law, you understand, but in such a way that Beatty didn't lose his money, but they lost theirs. And Beatty told me that he'd been threatened by them. He told me he was worried, but that was all. Why the dickens didn't you tell me this before? Oh, because I, I, I didn't think it was important. You surely don't think that either Reynolds or Weaver would kill Beatty over, over a thing like that? We don't know, but it's our only lead so far. Wouldn't you say so, Mike? Oh, not exactly, but it's one we've got to follow up, of course. You'll return home, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes, of course. I'll be there if you need me. Okay. Let's go, Phil, Mike. We'll go in my car. Let's see. The address on this stationery of Reynolds is Stats Building. I'll stay behind, Inspector, just in case of any phone calls or anything like that. Watch out, Sergeant. Um, doesn't anybody want to know what was in the letter I opened? Huh? Why, you little... 
I wondered why you were so quiet all of a sudden. What is it, Phil? Well, I didn't want to read it while we were in the room. You think we'd better wait till we reach the car? Oh, no, no, huh? We're out of earshot. Okay, shoot. It says, I don't suppose I should care what happens to you, but just the same, you are a fool. I've told you before that I don't trust Porter, and I'm more sure of it now than ever before. What's the signature? There isn't any. But although it's written on a typewriter, I'll make you a bet. What? What? I'll bet you this warning was sent by a woman. Eighth floor, please. Yes, sir, eighth floor. Number eight, sir. There's Reynolds' office right down the hall. Yeah, there's a man just going in. Yeah, we might be in luck. That might be Weaver. Something tells me that this isn't going to be very profitable. Well, we'll soon see. Yes? May I help you? We'd like to see Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Reynolds is busy just now. If you'd care to wait, he has someone with him. The someone with him isn't by any chance Mr. Weaver. Well, well, yes, it is, but how... Oh, you saw him come in just before you did. Then if it is Mr. Weaver, that's most fortunate, because we want to see both gentlemen. Well, I I don't know. I'll ring Mr. Reynolds. Please don't. We're on police business, and we'd rather go in unannounced. Oh, but I... I... Well, and to what do I owe this intrusion? Isn't my receptionist out there? Your receptionist isn't at fault, Mr. Reynolds. I'm from police headquarters. We'd like to ask a few questions. Police? What on earth for? You sent this threatening letter, Mr. Reynolds? Let me see. Uh, Yes, yes, I did. And I'll send more if I don't get satisfaction. Uh, Satisfaction for what, sir? I don't think it is anyone's business. It's police business, Mr. Reynolds. Now, we can all be very comfortable and save a lot of time by getting our answers here. But, of course, if you prefer headquarters, then that's your privilege. Oh, well, if Beatty has been fool enough to report this letter to the police, I'll tell you all you want to know. We'd like to know why you wrote the letter. Well, briefly, uh, Beatty, Mr. Weaver here, and I uh, put up equal amounts of money into an enterprise. It was at Beatty's inducement. Uh, Beatty had the inside track on the thing. He knew before we did that the venture wasn't going well. He withdrew his money without giving us a chance to withdraw ours. And the venture folded. It did, and... uh... Go on, sir. Reynolds and I feel that Beatty should share the loss with us. In other words, you feel that Beatty should split what he got out of the deal three ways with you two. Yes. Uh, Legally, of course, we can't compel him. Morally, we feel entitled to it. Uh, Where does Mr. Porter fit into this scheme? Porter? (laughs) He doesn't fit in at all. He's just a real estate man who helped Reynolds find a warehouse. A personal friend of Reynolds? Well, yes. You said warehouse. Is uh, the warehouse being used, Weaver? No, no. We still have a lease on it, but the business folded three weeks ago. And the warehouse is empty? Yes, uh, quite empty. You have the keys. Uh, I do. Uh, You want to borrow them? Yes. Thanks. Now, one more question. Where is the warehouse? It's at 2200 Key Street. Beatty, Weaver, and Reynolds is on the signboard. Oh, boy, what a rat trap. Yeah? Well, here's hoping it's more than just a rat trap. A man trap. Yeah, this looks like the key. Well, yeah, here we go. All right, now careful where you walk. Remember, they said the business folded three weeks ago. There should be enough dust on the floor to show footprints. The place is empty enough. There are footprints leading to that cubbyhole of an office. Well, leave us have a look, see. There's not a blessed thing in here, except this old table. Take a look, Phil, Inspector. Hmm? Yeah. You notice how the dust is disturbed on the edge of the table next to the wall? That means that table was moved. Yeah. No, it may not mean a thing, but keep it in mind. Outside of that rickety chair out in the warehouse, that seems to be everything. No loose boards or hidden closets or anything? No, nah, pretty much of a blank. Mike? Yeah? Inspector. Yeah? Take a look at this chair. I, I may be wrong. But... What is it, Angel? Oh, oh, look, that spot. Dry, shiny. It, it looks like brown paint, but it... it... Could be blood, huh? Mm-hmm. It does look like blood. One single drop. If it is a blood spot, it dropped from quite a height. 
You see how it's spread out like a, like a seal? Inspector. Yeah? That table. Let's get it out here, right in the center of the floor. Okay. Now, the chair on top of the table. Yeah. Mike, that ventilator in the room. Right, Angel, right. I didn't notice it till now. Oh, it's a common failing. People never lift their eyes high enough. Now, give me a hand, Inspector. Okay. I hate to twist an ankle, even on a murder case. There. There. Any luck? Yes. Yes, blood on the edge of the vent. You need a flashlight, Mike? Uh-uh. Uh, the body's here, all right. Close to the eaves and lying along the rafters. That'll do till the police surgeon gets here. Yeah, okay. Phil... Will you make an inventory of all the stuff as we search it? Uh-huh, shoot. Okay. Leather wallet, identity card, J.J. Beatty. Driver's license, age 52. Uh-huh. I think... Yeah? I think he was stabbed twice, Mike. Once in the back, and that was the stab that killed him. Stabbed again in the chest, eh? Looks that way. Autopsy will tell us definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, pocket handkerchief. Okay, one or two. One in trouser pocket. One folded in breast pocket of coat. Mm-hmm. Got it. Checkbook, balance, $800.30. Any stubs to Porter, Reynolds, or Weaver? No, Mike. Seems to be all for light bills, gas bills, department store purchases, things like that. Pipe, tobacco pouch, and book of matches. Yeah. Bill clip with $25 in loose cash. Three silver dollars, 90 cents, and two streetcar tokens. Old-fashioned gold watch and chain. Watch and gray, J.J. Beatty from... Fellow workers, Wadsworth Plant, Kansas, 1913. Uh-huh. Fountain pen and pencil. And that seems to be it. Okay, then. That's all. Got it. Got it all down in my own inimitable shorthand. So, that's all, is it? What do you mean, Mike? Yeah. Why that cat that ate the canary look on your face? <laughs> Once before, I told you that something was so blamed obvious that I wasn't going to tell you what it was. Oh, we remember, Daddy. Okay. The same thing applies here. Now, come on, let's get going. I don't know where you'd like to go, but I'd like to put in a phone call. Who to, Phil? First, to Mr. Beatty's wife, if he has one, ex or otherwise, to see if she wrote that warning note to Beatty. One run? Go ahead. If no Mrs. Beatty exists, then to the little receptionist at Reynolds' office for additional... Two runs, no errors. I'm with you. Good. And I'd like to use a police teletype. I'm with you on that one, Mike. Teletype Kansas to see what associates Mr. Beatty had in the days of his past. But I'm still puzzled about what you seem to know that we don't. I don't know a thing that you don't know, Inspector. I'll give you one hint, just one. But you mustn't ask any more questions. I'll bite. Go ahead. Just put your hands in your pockets, Inspector. That's all. Just put your hands in your pockets. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. Ladies and gentlemen, a few minutes ago, we told you about a sensational new way to wash your car. Now, if you think that there can't be anything new about washing a car, well, just try Union Luster Wash. You see, Luster Wash is a special detergent compound that makes washing a car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Then, with an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously. To finish, you simply rinse the car with a hose. That's all. No rubbing or elbow grease is necessary. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. Luster Wash cleans glass and chromium, too, which means you don't have to use a chamois afterwards. It's harmless to the finish and to your hands and leaves no film to dull the surface. No matter how dirty your car may be, Union Luster Wash will wash it as swiftly as you can apply it. A package sells for just 10 cents, one dime, and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Union Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can buy Luster Wash at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mm-hmm. 
Mike, Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector are at headquarters. Phyllis is on the phone. Mike is looking at his notes, and every few minutes, the inspector guiltily puts his hands in his pockets, pulling them out again when he catches Mike's eye. Doggone you, Mike. You got me as self-conscious as a giggling (laughs) schoolgirl. It's your own fault, Inspector, your own fault. If the solution of the murder depended on it, I'd tell you right now, but... Well, it's only hush, one hush, link. Hush, hush, kids. Huh? She's on the phone. Oh, who? The ex-Mrs. Beatty. Oh. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Beatty. Yes? Mrs. Beatty, don't hang up when you hear my question, because if you do, you'll be called right back, and that will be by the police. Yes. Go on. Uh, did you by any chance send a note of warning to Mr. Beatty? Well, Mrs. Beatty? Yes, I did. Why? Well, it's, it's hard to explain, but... There was something about this Mr. Porter I didn't trust. Oh, I haven't seen much of Mr. Beatty these last few years, but I've met him socially several times when he's been with this man, Porter. Mm-hmm. Go on, Mrs. Beatty. Well, that's all. I have only a woman's intuition for not trusting Mr. Porter. He, he reminds me of someone. I can't remember who, but someone not to be trusted. And that's all? Honestly, that's all. Thanks very much. Well, there's not much there. She sent the note, but just womanly intuition made her distrust Porter. You think she was telling the truth? Yes, don't you? Uh, not entirely. Not the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes? A force from Kansas, sir. Bring it in, Sergeant. Yes, Inspector, I'll get it typed up. Doggone, if there isn't something in the Kansas report, we're going to have a regular unsolved mystery on our hands. Wouldn't like to call in Sherlock Holmes or Father Brown, would you? Oh, Mike, this is serious. This is murder. I know it is, Inspector. Now, look, both of you. Yeah. Yeah? When we burst in on Reynolds and Weaver, they didn't show any signs of knowing that Beatty was dead. I mean, they were wholly taken up with the idea that Beatty had brought the police into it because of the threatening letter. That's right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Reynolds said that if that letter didn't bring results, he'd send more letters. Right, Angel, right. And although that could be cleverness, I'd be inclined to mark it down as truthfulness. You may be inclined to mark it down that way, Mike. But until we have the murderer in our hands, everybody who ever knew Beatty is a suspect in my little list. Granted, Inspector. But Weaver didn't hesitate to give us the uh, keys to the warehouse. Mm, You can't lay too much stress on that, though, Mike. Both Weaver and Reynolds knew that we could get into that warehouse without keys. True, true. But to be able to carry off their interview with us uh, with such savoir faire would indicate that they were very clever and very experienced crooks, which I, for one, don't believe they are. Yeah, yeah. But, Mike, murderers don't have to be crooks. Many a killing is a criminal's first and last crime. I know that, Inspector. I'm thinking out loud to convince myself. You see, what I... Yes, yeah, sir. Not much, I'm afraid. Mm-hmm. Let's see what this says. Only connection Beatty ever had with police was his witness in robbery trial. His testimony was essential in proving guilt of defendant. And the defendant's name was Porter. Yes, Phil, the defendant's name was Porter. Well, what are we waiting for? That's it. No, no, not quite, Phil. You see, Porter died in a penitentiary in 1936. Oh. Oh, well, then, of course, it isn't the same Porter. That Hmm. report doesn't say whether or not Porter had a brother. No, Mike, it doesn't. But I'd be almost willing to bet that he had... What so many women like to call woman's intuition is uh, nothing more or less than a half-forgotten incident or something half-heard and half-forgotten. You think that Mrs. Beatty's instinctive dislike for Porter is because of the name or a likeness between the Porter who found the body and the Porter who went to jail? Yes, Inspector, that's exactly what I do mean. Well, that shouldn't be hard to find out. But it still isn't the stuff that convinces district attorneys or grand juries. No, Inspector, but on the face of it, I think another interview is justified. Interview? Who with? All of our suspects, Weaver, Reynolds, Porter, and Mrs. Beatty. All right, Mike, we've got nothing to lose. We have everything to gain. You see, our chief suspect holds the key to this little mystery, and we'll find that key at 323 Foothill. Will I get understand why it's quiet, please? Quiet. Now, to some of you, this is going to be somewhat of a shock. But Mr. B.D. has been murdered. What? We found the body in the warehouse you used, Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Weaver. But Mr. Porter had the distinction of finding it first. Although he lost it again. Uh, will you take over from there, Mr. Porter? Well, uh, I, I came here this morning to take Mr. Beatty to lunch. The door was open, which was funny because he was very careful about locking and bolting the door. Mm-hmm. I came upstairs, found him lying on the couch, stabbed through the chest. I, I ran over and felt him to see if he was alive. Found he was dead and called the police. And got your fingers all sticky with blood? Yes. Uh, then I, I, I wandered about the apartment. Went downstairs to the front door to watch for the police and came back upstairs... 
and picked up the mail. The mail which contained the threatening letter from Mr. Reynolds and the warning from Mrs. Beatty. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, anyway, when you arrived, we all came upstairs and the body was gone. It uh, couldn't have been taken out the front door because I was never out of the sight of the head of the stairs. And we know it wasn't taken out the back because there's no back door. Would uh, you have any explanation for that, Mr. Reynolds? Uh, no, no, I, I can't see how. Or you, Mr. Weaver? No, no explanation. And I'm sure that Mrs. Beatty hasn't. Oh, no, it's completely baffling to me. It was to us for quite a while. The reason it was baffling was because we were stupid enough to believe Mr. Porter. What? If you picked up the letters after you examined the body and after you phoned the police, how come there are no blood-stained fingerprints on any of them? But I... And with the wind blowing so hard that it blew the mail off the table, how come the front door was open? It would have blown shut. And if the body couldn't be taken out the back window and you never lost sight of the front door, how could the body be spirited away? I, I don't know. I don't know. That's the mystery. No, no mystery, Porter. Just a tissue of lies well rehearsed. The body never was here. But the blood on the couch. Put there by you after you had hidden the body in the warehouse rafters. Oh, this is absurd. You can't throw accusations around like that. We can and we will. Give me your keys. My keys? Yes, yes, the keys in your pocket. There, you see. When we searched Mr. Beatty's dead body, we found everything a man usually carries. A wallet, pen and pencil, watch, checkbook, handkerchief. But, uh, but, Inspector... Yes? No keys. No keys to get into his house or anything. Now, what Porter did with the rest of Beatty's keys, I don't know. But here's the key to the warehouse. Uh, F-24 is its number. It checks with the number of your keys, key, Mr. Weaver. Yes, that's right. And one of these two keys is the key to Beatty's apartment. This apartment. Shall I try them, Porter, or do you admit it? I... I admit it. Okay, Inspector. I guess that takes care of that. <laughs> early in the evening, and we're on our way home. Aha! But we're not on our way home, Angel. No? Where are we going? We're going to meet the inspector and have a late snack at Fisherman's Walk. Oh, good. Mike, I, I wonder if Porter is a brother of the man who died in the penitentiary. Oh, I'm sure of it. He'd better be. Why? Because if he isn't, we'll spend the evening talking to the inspector about motives. Oh. And what would you rather do, Mike Shane? Are you asking me or taunting me? Well, I just, uh, Mike. Huh? No, not here in the car. I mean... Why not, Angel? Uh, I can drive with one hand as well as the next. again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story, based on the character created by Brett Halliday, was written and directed by David Taylor. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis.
On those rare evenings when Mike Shane and his lovely associate, Phyllis Knight, are not eagerly in pursuit of a criminal, they are just as eagerly in pursuit of pleasure. But tonight, they are not even together, and the reason seems a little mysterious. While Mike glumly putters around his apartment all alone, Phyllis, in her apartment, has a visitor, a handsome-looking woman who talks with nervous gestures. Now that I'm here, Miss Knight, I, I don't know how to begin... I asked to come here to your apartment tonight because I've got to talk to you. You don't have to apologize, Dr. Grant. You asked if we could be alone. We are. You just tell me in your own way. Well, Miss Knight, you've come to me as a patient to her doctor. Now I come to you not as a doctor, but as a woman. A woman in trouble. I I worried so about this thing. It's affected my work at the hospital. I I can't sleep nights. I've never seen you like this before. Dr. Grant, is it about your business? About one of your patients? Oh, no, no. Why? Is it about your husband? Well, no, not directly. It's... Oh, I was so stupid, so foolish. Oh, I think I understand. It's blackmail, isn't it? How did you know? From what you didn't tell me. I don't need to know what the situation is. You don't need to explain it. But whatever you do, you must not pay any blackmail. That's the awful part of it. I already have. Oh. When? Years ago. It was back in St. Louis. Now the man turns up here in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And now he wants more money. $5,000 before midnight tonight. Oh, it, it wasn't anything criminal I did, Miss Knight. I was just foolish. And they made an example of me. They expelled me from medical school. I had my name changed legally and went to a different city and entered another medical college. As the years passed, I forgot all about it. I came to San Francisco and built up a fine professional reputation. J- just a second. I, I want to make some notes. What is this man's name? John F. Hunt. I'm not afraid for my medical standing, Miss Knight. No one can hurt that. But it's my husband. Irvin isn't politics. His reputation is spotless. But this man forced me to introduce him to Irvin, and Irvin has taken a liking to him. Oh, I can see where that might lead. A man who would stoop to blackmail won't stop there. What am I going to do, Miss Knight? He's coming to the house tonight with some other guests. Dr. Grant, you know that Mr. Shane and I work on all our cases together. He, he's had considerably more experience with this type of case than Would I he help had. me? Could he do something? Well, I haven't seen Mike fail yet on a blackmail case. Now, if you could invite us to your house tonight, you know, you could tell your husband that we're old friends. Well, of course. As I said, Irvin has already asked several political friends in for the evening. That's perfect. I'll telephone Mike right now, and then I want to get some more information from you. you know? <laughs> I knew you'd get lonesome for me. Oh, I'm just naturally weak, darling. Look, Mike, get shaved and put on a clean shirt. How huh? we're going calling tonight? A party? Mm-hmm. Oh, swell with you for some fun. Mm, not tonight, dear. It's going to be work. Dirty work. <laughs> Oh, good evening, sir. Miss Knight and Mr. Shane. Oh, of course. Come in, come in. Thank you. My wife told me you were coming. I'm Irvin Grant. How I'm do you do? I know you. I'll take your coat, Miss Knight. The butler's mixing drinks. Oh, thank you. Say. Gee, that's a beautiful ship model on the table, sir. Oh, isn't it? Clipper ship, Flying Cloud, made by an old sea captain. If you'll excuse me, I'll go find my wife for you. Thank you. Well... Seems like a right guy. Oh, yes. Dr. Grant's always talking about him. Very much in love with him. Oh, boy, oh, boy. That ship model intrigues me. I'd pawn my soul for one like that. (laughs) Phil. Phil, that sounded like a... It was. It came from the hall. Huh? The next room, Mike. The door closed. Mr. Shane, I heard a shot. Yes. This door is blocked. There's something against it. (sighs) Mike, I think it's a body... Behind the door. It's John Hunt. I've never heard it. Oh. Where? What happened? What happened? It's Hunt. He's dead. Very dead. A bullet right through the heart. No, no, no. I don't see a gun anywhere. It means murder. Murder? Why, no, no, Bill, no, call the inspector. No, no. Right away. Uh, Mr. Grant, Miss Knight and I came here tonight as your guests, but it so happens that we're private investigators. 
Now, may I ask if everybody in the house is present in this room? Why, yes, Mr. McGuire there and Mr. Davis. That's Collins, the butler, in the doorway, and, and the cook. Good, good. Now, uh, the police will be here in a few minutes. For your own protection, while all of us are in sight of each other, I suggest you allow yourselves to be searched for a possible gun. Uh, I guess that's all. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not a police officer. I have no authority to search you. But this may save you a lot of unnecessary questioning later on. Very well, Mr. Shane. You may start with me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Mm-hmm. All right. And you, sir, I don't know your name. J. Hugh Davis. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. Fine. Uh, next. No, I will not. Grant, this is an insult to your guests. I, I refuse to be searched. That's your privilege, sir. And now the butler, uh, uh, Collins? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, swell. And the cook? Oh, no, monsieur. I have no gun. <laughs> well, perhaps we'd better wait until... Uh, I'll search him, Mike. The inspector said he'd be right over. But Good. I have no gun. I am afraid of guns. I don't blame you. All right. All right, that's all. And now, Phyllis, if Dr. Grant will permit you... Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> honey, wait. Uh, Mr. Grant, if you'll stay right here, we'll talk to her. Come on, honey. Please, Dr. Grant. You've got to get hold of yourself. I'd have paid him the blackmail. I'd have done anything to avoid this. Dr. Grant, <laughs> the police are bound to find out about the blackmail. You can't cover it up. Oh, no, 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 they mustn't. They, they will, mustn't. Doctor, they will. In fairness to yourself, you'd better tell your husband about Hunt first. No, I can't. Oh, of course you can, Doctor. He loves you. He'll understand. People have been blackmailed before. No, no, don't you realize? John Hunt was my brother. We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. It used to be that washing a car meant the better part of a morning's work, with a lot of fancy equipment and getting wet besides. Well, times have changed. You can now do the same job in ten minutes without even changing your clothes if you use Union Luster Wash. All you do is empty a small package of Luster Wash into a pail of water, apply the mixture generously with an ordinary rag, and then rinse off with a hose. That's all. In ten to fifteen minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to tail light. Yes, it's as easy as that. Luster Wash is harmless to the finish and your hands, yet cleans almost magically without scrubbing. That's because Union Luster Wash is not a soap, but a special detergent compound which dissolves road film, grease spots, and dirt on contact, leaving the surface clean and smooth. Luster Wash will clean glass and chromium, too, and you don't have to use a chamois afterwards. You can buy a package of Luster Wash for only 10 cents at any Union Oil Minuteman station. One package is enough to wash any average car. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Luster Wash. Thank you. Mike and Phyllis find themselves guarding two very compromising and uncomfortable secrets. Secret number one, the man found murdered in Dr. Grant's house was blackmailing their client. Secret number two, he was their client's own brother. The inspector has just arrived on the scene, and Mike grows more and more uncomfortable under the inspector's question. Are you trying to tell me, Mike, that you were not called in to investigate this murder or to represent anyone? Well, <clears throat> Dr. Grant is Phyllis' physician inspector, and <clears throat> Phil suggested we stop in this evening for a little visit, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And we'd hardly got inside the door when we heard the gunshot. We ran down the hall and found the body here in the library. Mm-hmm. And who was the last person to see him alive? Don't any of you people know? Mike, don't you know? Well, I saw Dr. Grant and Mr. Hunt go into the library a few minutes before the shot. You're Arnold McGuire, aren't you? Why, yes, the Arnold McGuire of politics. And which of you is Dr. Grant? I am. Doctor, were you talking with Mr. Hunt at the time of the gunshot? No, I had just left him. I was on my way to the bedroom to fix my hair. I, uh... I've already searched everybody, Inspector, to see if they had guns, except Mr. McGuire, who objected. Oh, that's so? Mr. McGuire, I'll have to ask you to cooperate. I do not have a gun. I'm sorry, sir. What's that bulge inside your coat pocket? 
Business papers. They're confidential. They have no connection with this murder. Perhaps not. Oh, by the way, Mike, is the body here just as you found it? No, not quite, Inspector. Mr. Hunt fell against the door, and I had to push it open. And that moved the body? Yeah. You can see where the bullet went through the front of his coat. Made a nice clean hole. No powder burns. Mm -hmm. Means the bullet came from a distance. I'd say not less than 15 feet. Oh, but this is a very small room, Inspector. You'd have to fire the gun away over in the far corner to be 15 feet from the body. Mm -hmm. The uh, shot could have come through the doorway... There are four doors opening into the library. Yeah. From the position of the body here, it's in line with all four doors. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Make a list of everything in the victim's pockets and take a set of his fingerprints. Right away, sir. Can any of you uh, tell us who Mr. Hunt was and what he did? He was a friend of my wife, sir, from back in St. Louis. Uh -huh. He wasn't employed at the moment. I was thinking of adding him to my staff. Mr. Davis here is so overworked. I see. And Mr. Davis is... I'm Mr. Grant's political manager. I see. Well, now, let's find out where all you people were at the time the shot was fired. Dr. Grant said she was on her way to the bedroom. Now, where is that located, Doctor? It was the downstairs bedroom. That door there leads to it. The door on the left, Mike. And you, Mr. Grant? Why, I think I was in the hall. I was looking for my wife. But then I saw Mr. Shane trying to push the library door open. Mm hmm And Mr. McGuire? Why, guy who was in the living room. That's through the second doorway on the right there. And I was in the dining room eating a sandwich. That would be the first door on the right, Mr. Uh, Davis? Yes. <laughs> Then you were all separated. No two p people in the same room. And all had access to the library. What about the servants? I am Collins, sir. I was in the butler's pantry mixing some cocktails. Hmm? The cook was in the kitchen right next to me. We, oui, monsieur, that is the truth. We heard the bang and I was almost scared to death. Where is the kitchen and the butler's pantry? In the other wing of the house, sir. Do you suppose the shot could have come through this window here? How could it? The windows were closed and no bullet hole... There's no bullet hole through the glass. No, no, and it must be 10 or 12 feet down to the ground. Oh, Inspector. What is it, Sergeant? So I found this check uh, crumpled up in Hunt's hand. Let's see. Paid to the order of John F. Hunt. $500, signed John Hugh Davis. What is this, Mr. Davis? I... Why, that's just a check I gave him on a business deal. It was a personal matter. Mm -hmm. Business deal? Why, Davis, I thought you were so bitterly against my hiring hunt. I was, so far as your business was concerned, but for my purposes, he was quite all right. I think we'd better take a look at Mr. Hunt's living quarters. Maybe we'll find out about some of these personal business deals and why someone wanted to kill him. Here's his address from the wallet, Inspector. Want to go along, Mike? Well, I doubt we'll find much, Inspector. I got a hunch the solution is right here in this house. Uh, just the same we'll check up. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Nobody is to leave this house till we get back. Yes, sir. Uh, Collins, w will you find my coat for me, please? Of course, ma'am. Mike, uh, you and Phil and I have been friends for a long time, haven't we? Oh, I guess for more years than Phil would like to admit. Oh. Yeah, you two have helped me out on many a case. You've always played fair with me in the police department. What are you driving at, Inspector? I know that you kids didn't come here just for an innocent social evening. And I noticed, Mike, that when I started to question Dr. Grant, you switched me off on another track. What are you holding out on me? Okay, Inspector, okay, but you've got to keep this under your skull cap. I can't promise that. Well, I think you will when you know. John Hunt was blackmailing Dr. Grant. Blackmailing? Why didn't you tell me? There's our motive. Oh, no, don't be silly, Inspector. Dr. Grant came to my apartment and told me the whole story an hour before the murder. Well, she wouldn't tell me and, and, and invite us to a party and kill a man with all those people around. All right, but she did give you a lead that would help us. Well, I can't remember everything she said, but I took notes in shorthand as she talked. All right, Phil, let's have them. Uh, your coat, to map. Oh, yes, thank you. I, I left the notes in my apartment. Mike, you give me the keys and I'll run over and pick them up, huh? Okay. And while you're doing that, Phil, Mike and I'll explore the apartment of John F. Hunt. <laughs> Telephone bills, gas bills, hands, old laundry list. Mike, the desk is crammed with junk, but nothing that matters. Well, that's what I expected. Hunt was too smart a guy to leave anything important lying around for some... Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I take that back. What? Here's a manila folder in this bureau drawer. Hmm. Some clippings with a photograph pinned to them. Snapshot of a boy and girl in a canoe. Yeah, and some writing on the back. Malcolm and Mary, June 12, 1914. Hey... Look at this first clipping underneath the photo. Legal notice. Change of name from Mary Boyd to Mary Allen. And, and the next one. Prominent attorney marries woman doctor. 
Last night, Irving Grant was wed to Dr. Mary Allen in a simple ceremony at... Mike, this is a file on Dr. Grant. Alias Mary Allen, alias Mary Boyd. Uh, yes, yes, I know. John F. Hunt is another alias. He was her brother. I see. Of course, you didn't let me in on that little fact. Now, how much more do you know? That's all, Inspector. That's all. The whole works. You sure of it? Positive. And before you start jumping to conclusions, Inspector, do you know if the sergeant took those fingerprints on, of Hunt? Yeah. I got them in an envelope here. Well, then I suggest we go down to headquarters and see if we can collect some local color on Brother John. Good idea. But what about Phil? Well, I'm calling her now. Uh, it's Mike, Angel. Oh, I'm typing these notes, Mike. Well, listen, the inspector and I are going down to headquarters fingerprint checkup. You want to meet us there? Oh, sure thing. Be there in a few minutes. Okay, Angel, I'll see you at headquarters. Well, Mike, looks like we struck the jackpot. Here's the card file on our man. Hmm. Under the name Malcolm Boyd. John F. Hunt must be a new alias. Yeah. 1931 St. Louis. Forgery conviction. Three years Missouri State Prison. 1935 New York. Forgery and blackmail. Nine years Sing Sing. Wow. 1945 San Francisco. Drunk charge. Uh-uh, Mike. Seems to me more and more little details you didn't bother to tell me. This is the first I've heard about it, Inspector. Believe me. And I'm just as, sh as sore as you are. Dr. Grant should have told Phyllis and me. We're entitled to know these things. Yeah. Dr. Grant may be a reputable physician. She may be married to a prominent man. But when her brother is blackmailing her, a brother who is an ex-convict, well, I couldn't give her a better motive for murder. Agreed, Inspector. But I saw the way she reacted when she first saw the body. No matter what Hunt had done to her, she was still his sister. And Irving Grant was still his brother-in-law. Grant? Yeah. Maybe this wasn't such a well-kept secret after all. Maybe Grant discovered his wife was being blackmailed. That his brother-in-law was an ex-convict. How do we know that Mr. Grant didn't kill the man to save his wife and to pre protect his own reputation? Mm. No answer for that, huh, Mike? I was just thinking. Pretty much the same could be said about Grant's manager, Mr. Davis. You noticed how uncomfortable he got when we found his check for 500 bucks crumpled in Hunt's hand? Just a personal business deal, says Davis. But I'll bet it was more blackmail. Yeah, very probably. And Mr. McGuire, why wouldn't he let us search him? What were those private confidential papers in his pocket which he wouldn't show us? Yeah, both men are suspects. But, Mike, don't try to kid me by laying down a smokescreen. I'm still going to follow the trail of your client and her husband. Well, I can't argue with you, Inspector. Phil talked to Dr. Grant, and Phil knows more about the case than I do. Let's call it her, her partner and see if she's found anything in those notes, huh? She may be on her way over here right now. On that phone, sister. You ain't talking to anybody. Uh, how, how did you? Who are you? Hang up that phone. <laughs> what does this mean? Don't. <laughs> don't you dare. Oh, don't try to bust past me, sister. You ain't going no place. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Ladies and gentlemen, would you like to be able to wash your car in ten minutes without having to change clothes and at a cost of only ten cents? Well, that's just how easy it is with Union Oil Company's Luster Wash. All you do is empty a package of Luster Wash into a pail of water. Apply the mixture generously over the surface with an ordinary rag and then rinse off with a hose. That's all there is to it. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight without mess or scrubbing. That's because Luster Wash is not a soap, but a special detergent compound which dissolves grease spots, road film, and dirt on contact. Luster Wash is harmless to your hands, yet eliminates the hard work of old-fashioned methods. It makes glass and chromium sparkle, too, and you don't have to use a chamois afterwards. You can buy a package of Luster Wash for only 10 cents at any Union Oil Minuteman station. One package is enough to wash any average car. 
Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Luster Wash, the new easy way to wash your car. Phyllis is still in her apartment, but very unwillingly. A strange man is pointing a gun at her heart. You... You're insane if you think you can get away with this. I'm doing it, ain't I? Now, for the last time, hand over those notes on Dr. Grant. Well, you've got them. I just finished typing them. No, no, no. I want the rest of them. This stuff don't mean anything. But that's all there is. What did you think Dr. Grant told me? Trying to be smart, huh? Sorry, I ain't telling you. Hand over those notes, or do I have to slap you around? Phil! Phil! My... Shut up! (laughs) One sound out of you, and I'll kill you. You're you're caught. It's Mike. And the inspector, you can't get away. Phil, honey, open the door. Answer me. Tell him to wait a minute. Uh, Just a minute, Mike. Now, I'm going to stand behind the door. You open it and tell him to come in. If you make one squawk, one little tip, I'll let you have it right in the back. Now, go on. Well, they... well, they're gone. The hall's empty. Yeah. Maybe it's a trick. You bet it is. Hands it to you. Hand over your gun. Mike. Mike, he wanted my notes on Dr. Grant. I gave them to him, but he kept saying there were more, and there aren't. Then Dr. Grant knew something about this guy, and he killed John Hunt. Huh. Know any more gags? Plenty. All right, Inspector. Let's take him back to the house. We're going to find out who he's working for. <laughs> Shane, I've never seen this man before in my life. It's an insult to even think I'd have anything to do with a criminal. I say the same. This thing has gone far enough. Then if we're to believe all of you people, nobody here knew this man. No. no, no. Well, it means just one thing. Somebody is lying. That man is the murderer, and you've caught him, and yet you accuse us. No. No, he's not the murderer, Mr. McGuire. If he had killed Hunt, he wouldn't be afraid to murder Miss Knight. Instead, he argued around with her, and you haven't told us why he went to Miss Knight. What was he threatening her about? I uh, prefer not to explain that, Mr. Grant. But uh, he was working for somebody here. Who... Tommy Rott. He killed Hunt. He sneaked up to the window and shot him. That's impossible. The window was 10 or 12 feet from the ground and the windows were closed. Wait a minute, Inspector. Wait a minute. Maybe that's it. Phil, after we heard the shot, how long did it take us to get into the library here? Oh, I'd say less than 60 seconds. And did you smell any gun smoke in the room? No. No, I didn't smell anything. You wouldn't. If the windows were open and the shot came from outside... Well, then somebody must have closed the windows during all the excitement, Mike. But, Mike, we decided the shot came through one of these doors. The body is completely out of range of the window. Yes, but where was Hunt standing when he was hit? Uh, how do we know he wasn't standing right here by this desk in full view of the window? Before he died, he could have staggered clear over to the hall door. Mike, a man would have to be 12 feet tall to fire through that window. No, Inspector, no, he wouldn't have to be 12 feet tall, and he did shoot through this window. I understand it now. All right, show me. I'll open the window. Now. Now, will all of you people go back to where you were when you heard the shot? We're going to fire a gun again, and you're to tell us if it sounds the same way. You too, Collins. You and the cook go into the kitchen. Uh, Yes, sir. Uh, Sergeant. Sergeant, will you please stand in any one of these four doorways, it doesn't matter which, and fire a blank cartridge. Now, give uh, Phil and me about 15 seconds to get the outside entrance. Mm, Yes, sir. I'll come along with you, kid. Hey, uh, I remember Mike was admiring that ship model when we heard the shot. Yeah, I see it. There it goes. All right, honey, how did that sound to you? Oh, no, it wasn't the same shot at all. This one was much louder. That's right, because the bullet which killed Hunt was fired from outside the house by somebody inside the house. Mike, that sounds impossible. How? Who? Come on, come on, follow me. The butler's pantry. Yes, yeah, here in the other wing of the house. Excuse me, Jane. I heard the shot, but I told Monsieur Collins it did not sound right. Thank you, Ivy. Thank you. Now, Inspector, you will notice if you will look out this pantry window here on an angle, you can see the library in the other wing. Yeah. I'll raise the window. Now, now all I have to do is take my gun, lean out the window. I see. The shot would sound as if fired outdoors. Yes. And if I fired now, as I'm aiming my gun. The bullet would go right through that open library window and hit the library desk. But, Monsieur Stane, there was nobody in here. Monsieur Collins was mixing cocktails right there. I was making sandwiches in the next room. Of course. I was talking to Ivy all the time. 
I had the cocktail shaker in my hand. And uh, a gun in the other hand, Collins. When the cook wasn't looking, you leaned out of the window. You're crazy. No. No, Collins, it has to be you. You see, besides the inspector and myself, you were the one who knew Miss Knight was going to her apartment to get those notes. When you brought her her coat, you overheard us. You were afraid of what was in those notes, so you phoned your pal to get them away from Miss Knight. This whole thing is cockeyed. You know, Collins, you sound less and less like a butler and more like an ex con Oh, you... Grab him, Inspector. Wait, wait a minute. Wait. Uh-oh. He reached for this cupboard. Let's see. Aha. The missing gun. And one bullet fired. That's all, Collins. I think you'd better wear these. For safety's sake. Inspector, would you mind... Leave it to me, Mike. Murder's solved, and I think the motive is something of interest only to the district attorney. Come in. Come in, Inspector. Mike's been reheating the coffee for you. I was longer at headquarters than I figured. Oh, hi, Inspector. Well, did he confess? Yeah, pretty much as we expected. Collins served time in the penitentiary with the guy who broke into Phil's apartment. Two of them met Hunt in prison and found out Hunt was planning to blackmail his wealthy sister when he got out. So they decided to cut themselves in, eh? That was it. Hunt was working with them for a while. He got Collins into Dr. Grant's home as a butler, so Collins could keep an eye on things for him. Then Hunt got bigger and grander ideas of blackmail and started to cheat the other two. That was his fatal mistake. Oh, and I suppose Collins figured he knew as much of the dope as Hunt, so why split the money three ways? Exactly. And Mr. McGuire and Davis, they were like the others on the wrong end of Hunt's blackmail. The paying end. Huh? I, I wonder, wonder who, who that, that could be. be. Excuse me. Yes? No, I'm not sure. Oh, then it's for me. Well, thanks. A package. Look, a big one. Who's it from, Mike? Oh, well, wait a minute. Let's see. It's from Irving Grant. Well, open it for Pete's sake. Oh, 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 oh. boy. Phil. <gasps> Phil, it's Grant's ship model, the flying cloud. Oh, the one you admired in his house. I wonder. Do you suppose he knew he did know the truth about Hunt? That this is his, well, his way of thanking us? It could be. Oh, Mike, it's beautiful. I know just where it should go, on the table in the bay window. Uh-uh, uh-uh. No, no, I want it. I want it over the fireplace. Oh no, no, Mike! It'll look perfect in the window with the harbor as a background. Angel, huh? wait a minute. Whose apartment is this? Oh, well, it's yours right now, but I have hopes. <laughs> <laughs> again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Charles Dan. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis.
It was Gilbert and Sullivan who said, quote, a policeman's lot is not a happy one, end quote. But tonight, just on the stroke of eight, Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite ferreter of felonies, is seated in his apartment. He looks down on the bay at the masthead lights rising and falling with the swell as Phyllis, his easy-on-the-eyes associate, does things with eggs in the tiny kitchen, a kitchen which hangs like an eyebrow on the forehead of Telegraph Hill. Mike? Uh, yes, Angel? How's the shoulder? It's fine. Uh, that is... Uh, oh, it's pretty good. Why? Because uh, I think you're using it as an excuse to get me over here every night to fix your dinner. Well, Angel, some fellows have etchings. I use scrambled eggs. Uh-huh. Well, from tonight on, if I come over to your apartment to be as a guest, you're going to do the cooking. Oh, Angel. I mean it. I'm through being a detective by day and a cook at night. All right, come get it. Oh, boy. Uh, hello. Hi, Mike. Oh, hello, Inspector. What are you doing? Well, I was just going to sit down to a plate of scrambled eggs. Why? I got a buddy. <laughs> you sound like something out of a horror film instead of Inspector of Homicide. What kind of a body? It's been in the water a week or so. It looks like an accident. Autopsy surgeon seems to think it was an accident. Sergeant here says it was an accident, but... Uh... You think it's murder? Could be, Mike. Where are you? You know where Olium is? Right on San Pablo Bay? Yes. I'll have the police boat pick you up at the jetty. Oh, swell. The sergeant will pick you up as fast as he can get there. Well, uh, give me two more seconds. Two more seconds? Yes, Inspector. One second for each egg. There she is. Pull alongside. Are we going aboard that yacht? Yeah, the inspection board. Mm, it's a trim-looking craft. Yeah, about 200000 bucks worth. Hi there. Can you make it up the ladder or do you want a bosun's chair? Oh, half an hour aboard ship and he talks like an admiral. <laughs> we'll use the ladder, Inspector. Hmm. Oh, what's the matter, Angel? Can't cook his own dinner because of a bullet wound in the shoulder, but he can climb a ship's ladder. Well, I... Okay, okay, you go first, Mike. Okay. Well, kids, you made good time. Mm-hmm. Sergeant brought us up the bay as if he knew every wave. He does. Born and raised at San Rafael. Well, <laughs> where's the body? On the engine room hatch. Mm-hmm. Any uh, wounds? One blow on the head, which could have been made if he had fallen off the rocks. Water in the lungs? Yeah, Phil. Oh, so he was alive when he hit the water. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Dressed in sailor pants, a reefer jacket, scarf. Shoes don't look like a sailor's. Uh, what besides the shoes make you suspect murder, Inspector? A dead man's hands, Mike. No calluses. And the nails have been manicured. Mm. Sailors don't have soft hands and manicured nails. Oh, good work, Inspector. Good work. But, uh, how come uh, you're aboard this ship? Is the owner aboard? No, Mike, but we've sent for him. We came aboard because the Bay Patrol found the body near the ship. And because of this. We found this note in the dead man's pocket. The North Star, owner Nelson Carter. And this is the North Star? Yeah, Phil. Autopsy surgeon said the body has been in the water about ten days. Oh, it's pretty hard to identify him now. Any missing persons reported? I don't know. The sergeant checked with the missing persons bureau when he went back to pick you up. Yes, sir. Nobody reported missing, Inspector. Say, uh, who's aboard? I noticed the anchor light is trim and clear. No smudge on the glass. Must have been lighted tonight. That's right, Mike. Captain is aboard, also the quartermaster. Oh, I don't see any cabin light. No, Phil, the portholes are covered with heavy green curtains. Uh, did you uh, question the captain and the quartermaster? Yeah, Mike. Very noncommittal gents. Said they didn't know the dead man. Never seen him before. Didn't know anything about him, and then they both retired to their cabins. Well, that's a little suspicious, don't you think? Uh, not particularly. Well, most people are inquisitive, Inspector, especially about anything that smells of murder. Inspector, did you search the ship? Yeah, they're doing quite a bit of repair work. Huh? Placing all the paneling in the stateroom and so on. Oh, uh, Inspector, did you take a look at the uh, ship's log? No. After all, Mike, we really haven't anything definite to go on, not even a legitimate reason to suspect murder. I think we have. Well, so do I. Otherwise, I wouldn't have sent for you. But to try and tie the murder up with the captain or... With the ship, even. But I do tie it up with the ship, in a way. What do you mean, Mike? Point number one. 
We're agreed that this dead man isn't a sailor because of his hands. Uh -huh. Agreed. Point number two, we think that these sailors' clothes aren't his clothes, all except the shoes. Oh, yes, Mike, but I still don't see how Dead you... men can change clothes, Angel. Oh. So that suggests uh, violence. Now, take a look at the inside of that right trouser leg. Mm -hmm. You see that uh, smear of orangey red? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike. So what? Well, that was made by red lead. The stuff they use to keep iron and steel from rusting. Go on, Mike. Now, take a look at these stanchions on the port side. Freshly painted with red lead. I didn't notice that before. Well, neither did I until right now. But you'll notice, Inspector, that there's no trace of red lead on the inside of either of the dead man's shoes. I see what you mean. To get that smear on the pants legs, whoever was wearing those pants would be sure to get some on their shoes. Right, Inspector, if he were wearing them voluntarily. No, that smear suggests that he was carried. So I give you a suggestion. The murdered man was stripped of his own clothes, then these sailors' clothes were slipped on him and he was dumped into the bay. And these sailors' clothes came from this ship? Yes, Inspector, yes, these clothes are from this ship. And for that reason, I think we should question our four suspects. Four suspects? I... I don't get you, Mike. Four suspects? Yes, yes. The captain, the quartermaster, the owner... Yeah. And the fourth? The fourth is the ship's carpenter. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the news you've all been waiting for. Post-war gasoline is here. Right now, as we speak these words, Union Oil Company's huge new 100-octane refineries are shifting to civilian production after long months of exclusive military service. That means that within a very few days, you'll be able to buy a new 76 gasoline that will knock your hat off. As fast as this new super gasoline can be blended, our trucks are hurrying it to your Minuteman stations. Some have it already. If your Union Oil Minuteman hasn't received his first shipment of this powerful new gasoline yet, he will within the next two weeks. And just as soon as he does, he'll post signs announcing its arrival in his station. Watch for these signs to go up. And then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of the new 76 gasoline. Soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are still aboard the yacht North Star. The dead man's body still lies on the engine room hatch as Mike knocks on the captain's cabin door. What do you want? This is the inspector of homicide. We'd like to talk to you again. Well, I won't say glad to see you because I'm not. I won't say sit down because I'm hoping you won't stay long. We've uh, sent for the owner, and I thought we could save time by asking you a few questions. Who are you? I'm Mike Shane, private detective. I don't know that I got to answer any of your questions. Oh, you don't, of course, but I'd like to ask one question anyway. Well? Where's your master's certificate? Why, you went And to... don't tell us it's in the chart house, because uh, we looked there. Now, Captain, you may not like to answer Mike's questions, but I think you'd better answer mine. Where is that certificate? Here in the drawer. I haven't had time to put it up yet. I only took over this ship yesterday. Oh, only yesterday, huh? Yes. I answered an ad in the paper. man wanted a navigator to be captain of his private yacht. I got the job. What about the crew? Only well, need three. I'll pick them up in San Francisco tomorrow. What about your quartermaster? Is he a new man, too? Yes, I hired him yesterday. Ahoy there, North Star! Throw us a line! Here you are, Sergeant! Who have you got there, Sergeant? The ship's carpenter named Wilkinson. What about the owner, Carter? Couldn't you find him? No, he's down in South America. Been there for three months. What's that? I said the owner of the North Star has been in South America for the past three months. But that's impossible. I spoke to him a couple of days ago when he hired me. Ah, well, that's what Carter's secretary says, and he ought to know. I brought him along in case you wanted to ask any questions. Mm -hmm. Who else is that in the police launch? Well, the woman is Mrs. Carter. Um, has she heard from her husband lately? No, not for three weeks. Mike. Yes, Angel. You and I have the same idea. I'm beginning to have the same feeling, kid. Well, let's have the secretary up first and have him look at the body. What's his name? Jackson. Mr. Jackson, will you come up the ladder, please? 
I wonder... Yeah, Mike? I wonder if the ship's carpenter is one of the old crew or a new man. Did you know he's be one of the old crew? I didn't hire him. You want me, Sergeant? Ah, uh, yes. This is Inspector of Homicide. How do you do? Mike Shane. Hello. Miss Knight. How do you do? I wonder if you'd come over this way, Mr. Jackson, to the engine room hatch. Okay, Sergeant. Oh, boy. Well, that's... That's... Mr. Carter? Yes, that's Mr. Carter. Hmm. Inspector. Yes, Mike. I'd like to make a suggestion. Sure. I think we should take the body back to San Francisco. Yes? Then we should take everybody, and I mean everybody, to police headquarters. <laughs> Sit down, Mr. Ryan. You're carpenter on the North Star. Yes, sir. Tell me, how long since you were aboard? Well, nigh three months, sir. Not since Mr. Carter left. Is that right? That's right, miss. Mm-hmm. Now, take a look at this reefer jacket. Hey. Hey, that's mine, sir. I left it in my bunk. And these pants? Mine, too. But there wasn't no red lead on them when I laid them on the bunk. Mm-hmm. Did Mr. Carter say anything to you about redecorating or repairing the paneling in the staterooms? No, miss, not to me, he didn't. And uh, you think he would have, if that's what he wanted done? Oh, I think so. But uh, Mr. Carter was always one to be full of surprises. He could have done it without saying anything to me. You don't know of any reason why anyone should want to kill him? Not me, sir. I didn't know anything about his private life. Only as the owner of the North Star. Did he and his wife use the North Star much? Oh, yes, quite a bit. Sailed a couple of times to a wire with her. Lots of trips to Vancouver, B.C. He was in the shipping business, you know. Yeah. Well, Mike, unless you have any more questions... Oh, yes, just one. Where was the North Star anchored the last time you were aboard? She was tied up at her own jetty, three miles northeast of Olium. Oh, so she's been moved in the past three months. Yes, miss, out into the middle of the bay and about uh, three miles south. Uh-huh, I see. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Wright. The sergeant will show you out. And bring in Mrs. Carter, sergeant. Yes, sir. Sit down, Mrs. Carter. I know this has been quite an ordeal. You identified your husband? Yes. We suspect murder, Mrs. Carter. Have you any reason to suspect anyone? No, my husband hasn't... hadn't an enemy in the world that I know of. You thought he was still in South America? Well, yes, although I haven't had a letter for a month. I, I used to hear from him regularly every week. I suppose you inherit your husband's property, Mrs. Carter? I suppose I do... Half of it is mine anyway. I inherited it from my mother. Did, um, did your husband say anything about repairing or redecorating the paneling in the salons? No. But that reminds me of something. Yes, Mrs. Carter? Well, I heard Mr. Jackson talking to someone on the phone the other day about paneling. I didn't know what he was talking about, but then I paid very little attention to my husband's business. I see. And you can't help us anymore? I'm sorry, but I'm afraid not. If I think of anything, I'll call you, Inspector. Thank you. The sergeant will show you out. Bring in the captain, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, we may be out to call on you, Mrs. Carter. It might be necessary to search your husband's papers. Certainly, Mr. Shane. Sit down, Captain. Thanks. I take it that if you only took over command of the ship yesterday... You haven't given any orders? No, I spent yesterday and today checking supplies, looking over the ship's gear. You knew nothing about uh, the replacing of the salon paneling? Oh, yes, yes. The man I thought was the owner told me he was having it replaced and the workman already knew what to do. And this man that you thought was the owner, what did he look like? I don't know. I never saw him. But you said you spoke to him when he hired you. I spoke to him on the phone. Aha. Now we get somewhere. What was his phone number? I don't know. He called me. I wrote him an answer to his advertisement and put my phone number in the letter. He called me on the phone and told me to report aboard yesterday. Mm-hmm. And that's all you know? That's all I know. I saw the ad, answered it, and he told me the berth was mine. I came aboard, and that's that. Well, thanks a lot, Captain. I guess you'd better get back aboard ship. I'll wait for the quartermaster. 
I'm sure he doesn't know any more than I do. As you wish, Captain. You're quite certain that the quartermaster doesn't know anything. Oh, can he? I picked him up on the waterfront this afternoon. He's only been aboard a few hours. I see. All right, Sergeant. We'll see Mr. Jackson next. Uh, just a second, Inspector. Yes, Mike. I think maybe we ought to take a trip out to Mr. Carter's home before we talk to Jackson. All right, Mike. Keep Jackson and the quartermaster till we get back, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Yes, Inspector. Get out into the corridor and see if the captain and Jackson or the quartermaster get to talking. Right, Inspector. Attaboy, Inspector. Uh, are you serious about going out to Carter's place? Well, yes, honey, why? Well, I've been following your advice, Mike. Yes, Angel? I've been listening to the tone of these voices. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think the captain is lying. Or at least not telling the whole truth. Why, Phil? Well, he said he hadn't given any orders since he went aboard. That's right. Yeah. He said he'd been checking stores and looking over the ship's gear, but... Well, then who painted the stanchions with red lead? The captain? Those stanchions were still damp. Well, it takes red lead quite a time to dry, but Angel... Angel, I think you have something there. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know quite what it is, but you have something. Thanks, Mrs. Carter, for waiting up for us. Oh, not at all. Naturally, I'm anxious to do anything I can to help find my husband's murderer. Hmm? I'm afraid I, I hardly realize he's dead. Yes, there isn't much we can say, Mrs. Carter, except that we'll get his murderer if anybody can. This is... this was my husband's office, his home office. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jackson always worked here when my husband was out of town. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd better check the desk first. Bill, you take the straw, Inspector. I, I don't know about shipping schedules. Say, Mike. Phil, yeah? hmm? what is it? Here's the North Star's clearance to leave her jetty on the... an anchor in the bay. Dated the 26th of last month. Well, it might mean something. We'll, uh, we'll remember that. Hey, what have you got there, Mike? Well... Something not quite on the up and up, I think. In the fireplace there? Uh-huh. Yeah. Burned envelopes and letters. Here, Inspector. Yeah. Here, if that isn't part of a Panama stamp... Panama? I don't... That's where my husband was when I last heard from him. Well, this was mailed the 21st. Airmail. The last I received was the 18th. Mailed the 21st, and the North Star changed her moorings on the 26th. Yes, Angel, yes. Just time to receive this letter and change the ship's moorings. Does that mean something? It uh, depends, Mrs. Carter. It depends. Inspector. Yeah, Mike? I think we should pay a visit to the North Star's jetty, three miles northeast of Oleum, as I remember it. <laughs> Rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of those who may have tuned in late, we are repeating the announcement made earlier in the program. Post-war gasoline is here. Union Oil Company's huge new 100-octane refineries have been shifted to civilian production after long months of exclusive military service. That means that within a very few days, depending on your locality, you'll be able to buy a powerful new 76 gasoline that beats all pre-war performance. As fast as this new super gasoline can be blended, our trucks are delivering it to your Minuteman stations. Some have it already. If your Union Oil man hasn't received his first shipment of this sensational new 76 gasoline, he will within the next two weeks. Just as soon as he does, he'll post signs announcing its arrival in his station. Watch for these signs to go up, and then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of the new post-war 76 gasoline. Soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Watch for it. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are facing one of their most baffling mysteries... A murder with apparently no motive and no clues. We picked them up at the jetty, where the North Star is usually tied up. Well, there's not a thing that I can see. Bare jetty. Odds and ends of rope, freshly painted stanchion. Yes, everything connected with the North Star seems to lead to stanchion. What is what? it, Mike? Look, look, a piece of red glass. 
Looks like part of a ship's lantern. Port lantern. A natural deduction, Inspector, since we're on a jetty. But look again. Then look at the railing here. Hmm? A long scratch with paint rubbed into it. Yeah. A scratch made by an automobile bumper and rear fender. Yes. When the car was backed up to turn around, whoever was driving scuffed along the rail and broke this tail lamp glass. Sergeant. Uh, yeah, Mike. Check with Mrs. Carter's car, Jackson's car, and, uh, the captain's if he has one. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike. But, uh, first get hold of Chips. Chips? Uh, the ship's carpenter, Mr. Wright. Oh. Get hold of him and tell him to meet us aboard the North Star as quickly as possible. Yeah. And then? And then... Then bring everybody back out to the ship, but not before you've checked all the automobiles. Yeah, Mike. And what's our move, Mike? Back aboard the North Star and lay a trap for a murderer. Oh, that constant creaking of the ship gets me. I think we're in luck. I don't believe the captain or the quartermaster are back on a boat. No, Mike. Captain said he was going to wait for the quartermaster, so they're both back at headquarters. Yeah, you're right. I forgot. What are you looking for, Mike? I don't know. But I'm giving these port stanchions the once over. Say. What? You see that dark stain on the deck? Yeah. Sure. What about it? You know what made that? No. Do you? No, but I'll make a good guess. Fresh water. Fresh water? Yes. Deck should always be washed down with salt water. It leaves them white and sparkling. Fresh water makes them dark. Yeah, but even so much. Shh, shh, shh. I hope this is Chips, our ship's carpenter. Oh, there! Oh, Scar! Yeah. Here's the line. Tie up and come aboard. All right. All right. All right, mate. Well, what can I do for you? Uh, tell me, what will dissolve red lead? Red lead? Why, oil will if it ain't too old. And you've got to scrape it. Uh, take a look at the stanchion. Oh, wipe that off in no time. You've got oil aboard? Sure thing. Okay, let's get going. All right, sir. Now, now for a quick look at the salon. You know, this was a pretty cleverly conceived murder. If that body hadn't been found for a week or two, there would have been no trace of this murder at all. There isn't much trace even now, Mike. Uh, not enough for your district attorney or grand jury, but enough for me. And I think we can trap the murderer without too much difficulty. Well, this is the salon in here. Oh, oh what a beautiful place. Yes. Doesn't seem to me that the paneling needs redecorating. Uh-uh. But I tell you what it does look like, Mike. Yeah? Looks as if the paneling had been torn out in the search for something. The ship's safe, perhaps? Mm. Could be, or something hidden behind the paddling. There goes Chips. Uh, Why do you call him Chips? His name is Wright. All ship's carpenters are called Chips. At least in the books I read. Well, here we are. I found these rags in the captain's cabin. Good. Look like they've been used for the same job before. Let me see those. Hmm. Blood? I think so. Here, use this one. All right, sir. This is going to make a mess of the deck, though. Uh, that's all right. All right. Do, do I hear a boat coming? Yeah, I hear it too, Phil. Hurry, yeah. Chips, hurry. Get some more of that red lead off. All right, sir. I'm going like the roaring 40s, I am. Ah, that's the stuff. You got it down to the old paint there in spots. He was right off when it's still soft this way. Ahoy, North Star! Tie up and come aboard, Sergeant. Bring everybody aboard with you. I think this ought to do it. Hey, 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 what's going on there? You'll ruin that deck. I think this deck's already been ruined, Captain. But let that go for a moment. The uh, inspector had you all brought out here to see what we were doing. Yeah, what are you doing? We're taking off the last few layers of red lead that somebody put on this stanchion. Now, would you know who did it? You did it, Captain? You've been aboard two days and this red lead was still soft and wet. Could it have been put on without your knowing about it? Red lead often takes a week to dry. That stanchion hasn't been painted since I came aboard. That stanchion is the clue to this killing. What do you mean? Mr. Carter was killed aboard his own ship. Oh, Mr. He was probably hit on the head with a marlin spike, but that's beside the point. The main point is that while his killers were changing his clothes, putting the ship's carpenter's clothes on him, he bled quite a bit. Some blood was spattered on the deck. The killers tried to clean that with fresh water. Yeah. Then they were afraid that some of his blood was on the freshly painted stanchion. So after they'd thrown his body overboard, they repainted the stanchion. But not before they got a smear of red lead on the pants leg as they heaved him overboard. Oh, but who would do such a thing? My husband... The captain, for one, Mrs. Carter, and I think the sergeant has the answer to the other. Right, sergeant? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Mike, we found the car. The car? What car? Yes, Captain, the car which was used to take Mr. Carter out to the jetty while the North Star was still tied up there. 
That car has a broken taillight and a badly scraped fender. And it is where, Sergeant? In Mr. Jackson's garage. Jackson, you fool, I told you... Shut up, you idiot. Cut out the arguing. You'll need all the arguments you can scrape together when you face the jury. Okay, Sergeant, you can handle them. going to taste good. Nearly six in the morning and I'm hungry. You know, I was afraid that the inspector wasn't going to get a confession from those two, the captain and Jackson. They were tough monkeys. Oh, not so tough, really. They had just spent so much time plotting and carrying out this murder that they, they couldn't realize they were trapped. Oh, such a senseless murder, too, Mike. All murders are senseless, honey. But I don't think they started out with the idea of murder in mind. As I see it, the secretary of Jackson had uh, made several trips on the North Star. He knew that wherever they went, Mr. Carter always had plenty of ready cash. Mm -hmm. He just got the idea in the back of his head that the money was hidden somewhere on board. He didn't know where, but uh, when Carter went to Central and South America, he determined to make a haul. Mm. So when the crew was on vacation, he got together with this man who called himself the captain. They started taking the salon apart, huh? Right, Angel, right. Jackson needed someone who knew something about ships. And then when he saw from the mail that Carter was coming home, he he got panicky and destroyed the letters to Mrs. Carter? Mm Mm-hmm. He met the unsuspecting Carter when he arrived, took him out to the jetty where the North Star was birthed, set out into the middle of the bay and killed him. Ah, dressing him in the carpenter's clothes so if he were found, nobody could identify him. Mm Mm-hmm. I see. Have some more coffee, Mike? Sure thing, Angel. How's the shoulder after the night's excitement? Oh, pretty good, but... I still think you'll have to come over for a few nights and fix dinner for me. I will not. You can eat out if you're too lazy to fix your own dinner. You know, I've been thinking, Mike. Yes, Angel? Wouldn't it be nice to have a yacht like the North Star and go any place, any time you wanted to? Oh, I don't know. Look what happened to Mrs. Carter. She lost her husband on account of the North Star. (laughs) Of course, darling. I don't have a husband. Well, don't give up hope, Angel. Now, if you were to fix my dinners for the next few weeks... Mike, Shane, I believe that's all you think about in a wife, a good cook. Oh, no, Angel, not quite. But uh, being a good cook is a good recommendation. Before we sign off, I'd like to repeat the special announcement made earlier in the program. Post-war gasoline is here. As fast as Union Oil Company's trucks can haul it, a powerful new 76 gasoline is being delivered to your Minuteman stations. Watch for the signs to go up at all Union Oil stations announcing the first shipment of the new 76 gasoline. Then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of powerful post-war gasoline soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Watch for it. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Written and produced by David Taylor, tonight's story was based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Charles Dan. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis.
detective as well known as Mike Shane is in the limelight pretty much of the time. This evening, Mike is not in the limelight, but behind the footlights. Or rather, he is just about to be. A new review is opening at the Empire Theater, and for reasons still unknown, Mike has been asked to attend the rehearsal. Right now, Mike and his pretty associate, Phyllis Knight, are waiting at the stage door. Yes, what do you want, son? We'd like to see Miss Beverly Pryor, please. I'm sorry, son. Rehearsal going on but now. But she asked should... us to come. It's business. Oh, business. Well, then, I guess it's okay. Come on in. Miss Pryor's dressing room is number four. Well, thanks. Mike, how long is it since you've seen Miss Beverly Pryor? Oh, years. <laughs> Ten years. We got to be good friends when I spent a couple of vacations down in New Orleans. Seems to me she could have told you what she wanted over the phone. Well, we'll know in three seconds. This is dressing room four. Come in. Oh, well, Martin. Hello. You old darling. Let me give you a... <laughs> Bev. My good gracious. Beverly. You pieces, Mike. It's so wonderful to see you again. <laughs> Oh, I'd almost forgotten you were so handsome. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Oh, I almost forgot, too. Phyllis, uh, I mean, uh, Beverly, I want you to meet my... I mean, uh, I want you to meet well, Miss Phyllis... Oh, Mike, you haven't gone and got yourself married. No, Miss Pryor. Not yet. I'm Phyllis Knight, Mike's associate. Oh, uh, just in a business way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How do you do? Beverly, I didn't know you'd gone on the stage. Oh, I was always good at dancing. You remember, Mike. I've got a specialty number in the review. Oh. South American dances, rumbas and sambas. Do you like my costume? Oh, sure. It's uh, <clears throat> very colorful. <laughs> Shows off my legs very well, don't you think? Uh-huh. <laughs> you remember what skinny legs I used to uh, have. Miss Pryor, Mike and I don't want to hold up your rehearsal. Oh, oh no, no, that's right. Beverly, you said on the phone that you were afraid of something serious happening. Somebody connected with your show. Oh, oh yes, I, I was pretty scared yesterday. Some changes are being made tonight, and, well, I think things will all straighten out now. Well, what was wrong? Well, maybe it was my imagination. We've all been so nervous and hot-tempered. Yes? Well, I thought somebody was planning a murder. Somebody was... Mm-hmm. What made you think so? Hiya, beautiful. Ready for your spot? Larry says you're going to follow up. Oh, come team, in, boys. I want you to meet an old friend of mine. Mike, this is our comedy team. Sweeney and March. Mike Shane and Miss Knight. Hello. Is the salt sent to the pepper? Shake. <laughs> How do you do? They're just dandy. Snug as a rug and a bug. <laughs> you get the switch. Snug as a rug. <laughs> All friends of Bev's, huh? Uh, well, you, believe me, this little gal's going places. You know, this show's just third base for her. Next strike will be home plate or Hollywood. <laughs> yes, indeed. Sweeney thinks he can sell me to Hollywood. If he'd stick to comedy and forget the agent. Now, you business. wait, you wait. You'll see I'll have Sammy Goldman and Louis B. strangling each other for you. Hey, come on, Sweeney. We're late for us. Okay, yeah, we'll be seeing you. Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> a slap-happy pair. Mike, why don't you and Miss Knight go out in the wings and watch their routine? Well, I want to get your story first. Now, who was planning a murder? Oh, it's all straightened out now, Mike. After rehearsal, we can have a little supper, and I'll, and I'll tell you all about it. Now, go on, Scoot. I've got to finish dressing. Well, all right. Well, what's the matter, Angel? Haven't you anything to say? Angel. Your vacations in New Orleans must have been very pleasant. Oh, (laughs) yes, very pleasant. (laughs) (laughs) Did I miss a joke? You missed something. (laughs) Uh, The hotter a woman gets, the more she freezes. Okay, Sweeney, let's take that railroad spot again. All right, fine. You all set? Let's go. Right. It doesn't really matter, Mr. March. Any train will do, but I must have a ticket for Hollywood. Well, I understand that, Mr. Sweeney, but I can't let you have a ticket unless your trip is essential. What sort of business are you in? Oh, well, I'm president of the 12 Flavors to a Foot Sausage Company. 12 Flavors to a Foot Sausage Company, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, you see, we manufacture a sausage that's 12 inches long and contains 12 different kinds of meat. Well, what's the advantage? What's the advantage, Mr. March? Just this. If you're slicing a piece of our sausage and someone comes up to you and says, no matter how thin you slice it, it's still bologna, they're probably wrong. It may be liverwurst. Oh, oh, come now, Mr. Sweeney. After all, how can I give you a train reservation for something like that? Well, if you must know, I've got to get to Hollywood to see my doctor. Oh, oh, you have a serious illness, do you? Yes, I suffer from very bad attacks of bakery face. <laughs> bakery face, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, you see, under uh, my doctor's orders, I wash my face in baking powder and lemon juice. Well, then what happens? 
Why, break out in cupcakes. <laughs> Mr. Sweeney, it seems to me that the thing... Wait a minute. Oh, what's, what's going what's on? Mike? Mike, it's the old man, the doorman. Yes, and he's pointing into that dressing room. Come on. Estelle! Estelle! She's murdered! Wait a minute, I see her. Hell, I see her, Mike, in the dressing room. All right, stand back, everybody. Stand back. You're not coming in here. Who says we're not going in there? I do. I'm a detective. Dad, you keep him out. I sure will. Oh, it's not a pretty picture, Mike. Stabbed in the back right at her dressing table. Hmm. Done with a huge knife. A special kind of knife with a gold hilt. Mike. Yes? Look the mirror right above her head. Oh, some letters and lipstick. Yeah, she tried to tell us something. It spells B E V E. The rest of the letters are just a red scrawl. Oh, I'm afraid we know where they were meant to be. B E V E. R L Y. Beverly. Beverly Pryor. <laughs> return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, since we told you last week that post-war gasoline was here, many of you have already tried a tank full of the powerful new 76. But just in case the Minuteman in your locality hasn't been able to supply you with the new 76 gasoline, be patient. As fast as the modern 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company can make and blend it, our tankers and trucks are hurrying post-war 76 gasoline to you. Watch for the signs to go up in your neighborhood announcing its arrival. Then, for a real thrill, drive in for your first tank full of the new 76. Performance of the new 76 gasoline far exceeds pre-war standards. You'll like its lighter, faster, more powerful action. And you'll like the price, too. It sells at regular prices. No increase. So, to make your old car act like new, put in a tank full of the gasoline of the future, the new 76. Now going on sale wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76, your Union Oil Minuteman Station. Mike's backstage visit to the Empire Theater has taken a grim turn. Mike and Phyllis have found a girl stabbed to death. Behind a closed door in the Dead Star's dressing room, Mike and Phyllis tell their story to the inspector. And that's about it, Inspector. The old Mm -hmm. fellow who watches the stage door discovered the body. We were out in the wings watching a comedy routine when we heard him yell. The murdered girl is Estelle Carroll, Inspector. She was the dance partner of Vic Hunter. Carroll and Hunter, they're listed on the billboard. Yeah, sure, kids. But this gal, Beverly Pryor, you say she called you here tonight because you thought a murder was cooking? How does Beverly know so much? Well, you see, Inspector... I see plenty. I see in that mirror right above Estelle's head the letters B-E-V-E written in lipstick. Estelle tried to write the name of her murderer. I was coming to that. Just give me time. Now, Phyllis checked through Estelle's purse. And according to Estelle's driver's license, she was five feet four inches tall. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm six feet tall, Inspector. Yet these lipstick letters are three or four inches above my head. Now, I've heard you, Inspector, lecture your boys on the squad. That a person will usually ride on the level with his eyes. Sure, it's a safe generality. Well, then, Mike, you think somebody else wrote the letters B-E-V-E, huh? Some tall person to give us a false clue? That's possible, Phil, but we can't prove it. No, no, but I would like to see a woman who has been stabbed in the back rise clear out of her chair, take a lipstick, and scrawl some letters 12 inches above her eyes. All right, while we're on the subject of clues, what else have we got? Well, I searched her dressing table. It's just the usual stuff. Except for one thing, this old-fashioned locket necklace. Hmm. Smear of blood on the locket. Mm. Yeah. From the murderer's fingers, probably. We found it thrown in the bottom drawer. Yeah, uh-huh. but more important, Inspector, look at the inside of the locket. There, you, you can see a patch of glue and a trace of paper sticking to it. Yeah. Well, there was a photograph pasted inside this. And if we can find out whose photograph it was, I think we may know why Estelle was murdered. Okay, let's start asking questions, beginning with Beverly Pryor. No, oh, if you want, Inspector, I'll go get her for you. Thanks, Phil. Hmm. Mike, has Beverly seen the body and this writing on the mirror? No, no, we kept everybody out of the dressing room. Good, and I think I'll drape this towel over the mirror. Just as well if Miss Pryor doesn't see her own name on the glass. Or any of the others, for that matter. Hmm, this peculiar-looking knife. Gold-painted hilt. Must be a theatrical prop. Mm, probably. Whoever the killer was, he or she must have stood behind Estelle as she sat at the dressing table. And while they were talking, plunged the knife in. Assuming the killer was supposed to be her friend. Well, sure, sure. There's no signs of a struggle. 
And no closet for a murderer to spring out of. This may be this window here. Seems to open into an alley. Well, we checked it, Inspector. It was locked. Uh, Miss Pryor, this is the Inspector of Homicide. How do you do, Miss Pryor? If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a few questions. I, uh, no, no, of course not. You want to ask me how I knew there was going to be a murder? Yes. Well, I, I didn't know. But I saw something during rehearsal last night. Well, that's why I telephoned for you, Mike. And what did you see, Beverly? Well, I, I was standing in the wings, waiting to do my number. Estelle was out front rehearsing her solo. She was supposed to do pirouettes clear across the stage into the opposite wing. And, well, just as she reached the curtain, I saw a long, thin sword slide out through the curtain. I, I screamed and, well, Estelle stopped. That's all that saved her life. You didn't see who held the sword? I, I couldn't. Did anyone else in the cast see who it was? Oh, I, I didn't tell them. I, I said I screamed because I saw a rat. May I ask why the deception, Miss Pryor? I didn't know who it might be. I, I mean, I wasn't sure. Maybe I just imagined I saw a sword. The stage lighting is so uncertain. Yet that it... you took it seriously enough to ask Mike to come here tonight. Beverly, we want you to examine the knife here in Estelle's back. Oh, it's... Ghastly. Yes, but do you recognize the knife? Is it a theatrical prop? Yes. It's it's from Harry's act. Harry? Harry Frizee, the magician. The famous Frizee. Would he have any reason to kill Estelle? I don't know. Okay, let's find out. Let's talk to everybody. Oh, I... Uh, hey, me. hold on. Come back here. Yes, yes, sir. Who are you? I'm uh, I'm the doorman, sir. I was just passing... Oh, yes, and you're the man who found the body. Yes, sir. I had a telegram to deliver to Miss Carroll and her partner... I thought they were both in the dressing room. When I opened the door, man alive, there she was. You didn't tell me anything about a telegram. Well, uh, I, I forgot. Here, I got it in my pocket. Let me see that. Oh, it's addressed to Vic Hunter and Estelle Carroll. Yeah, two or three telegrams in the last uh, couple of days. Think so? Oh, Sergeant. That's Inspector. Check with the telegraph office. I want the text of all wires received here in the past week. Right away, sir. Inspector, listen to this. Yeah. Carroll and Hunter have booked you three weeks, Club Belvedere, starting next Sunday. Stop. Top deal. Regards, Sam McGlynn. Yeah, I have that telegram, please. Huh? I'm Vic Hunter. Oh, Estelle's partner. Mr. Hunter, do you know if Estelle had any enemies? No, not real enemies. She, well, she had several bad quarrels the last couple of days with March and with Beverly. I huh? heard that, Vic. You know it wasn't Beverly's fault. Estelle was jealous. She knew Beverly was going to steal the show. Don't be silly. Nobody can steal a show from Estelle. Then why did she tell me she'd fix it so I'd never dance again? Okay, okay, okay. Estelle was jealous. Let it go at that. Now... What about this fight with March? All right, I'll tell you. I suppose everybody knows about it anyway. I was trying to get Estelle to marry me, but she kept turning me down. We began a fight. I and... told you, March, you were wasting your time on her, but oh. no, no, you wouldn't listen to me. You even had to take our paycheck, my paycheck, to buy her an engagement. Well, she right. gave it back to yeah, me. Yeah, she gave it back. Look at your money. Don't no, 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 worry about your money. Quiet, quiet. Did any of you notice anything strange in Estelle's action the past few days? Did she seem afraid or worried? No, no, no just a fight with Beverly and March. Mr. Hunter, we found a necklace and locket in Estelle's dresser, an old-fashioned gold chain and locket. Yes, she always wore it. She called it her good luck charm. Whose picture did she keep inside the locket? Why, I think it was a man's photograph. I assumed it was some fellow she was or had been in love with. She never told you his name, Mr. Hunter? No, Estelle was very closed-mouthed. Mm -hmm. I want to establish the time element in this case. Estelle and Mr. Hunter finished rehearsal. And then went back to their dressing rooms. Now, sometime during the next 15 minutes, the murder occurred. Now, during those 15 minutes, where was everybody? Well, I was in my dressing room. Part of the time, Mike and Miss Knight were visiting with me. And Sweeney and I were just buzzing around. We stopped in and gabbed a minute with Beverly and her pals. Yeah, well, we're in the clear. A comedy guy couldn't carve a hole in a gal's back and then go out front and panic them with gags. Sure. We'd be laying turkey eggs all over the place. I'm not the one to say that you didn't, Mr. Sweeney. Huh? Didn't which? Say, listen, if you mean that Inspector... Our... We were going to talk to the magician, the famous Frizee. Yeah, it's about time. Anybody know where we can find him? Well, he was in his dressing room a few minutes ago. I'll show you where it Never is. Never mind if you'll just tell us. Oh, all right. You go right down here. The famous Frizee's dressing room is the last on the left. Okay. Thank you, Beverly. You kids got any ideas yet? I have. Huh? Mm -hmm. I'd like to know why none of these people voluntarily mentioned the famous Frizee. They know everybody in this theater is under suspicion. Yet nobody refers to the magician, mm. the owner of the knife which stabbed Estelle to death. Right. Well, probably because none of them noticed the knife. Aside from Beverly, I'm not sure the others even know how Estelle was killed. Mm, one of them does, Mike. Huh? He said a comedian couldn't carve a hole in a girl's back and then go out and do a gag routine. Sweeney. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. 
This must be the dressing room here. No answer. Well, there's his costume on the chair, but no Mr. Frizee. That's blame funny. We haven't seen him anywhere around the theater. He just disappeared. Mm, it's not surprising for a magician. <clears throat> hey. Hey, that window curtain. It's blowing. Yeah, and the window's wide open. And an alley right outside. I'll bet he ducked out the window and up the alley. Oh, great. Now I'll have to drag out the old net. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Low gear for a moment, Inspector. Look at that sword rack on the wall there. Sabres, swords, daggers... Yeah, in several blank places in the collection. The rack is minus two daggers, the same type that killed Estelle. And also minus two swords. Swords. Oh. Huh. Oh, what, Angel? I just remembered. When I went out to get Beverly for you boys, I found her in Sweeney and March's dressing yeah, room. Yeah, and... and... I saw one of those swords on top of their trunk. Uh-uh. And last night, Beverly saw a sword come out of the curtains intended for Estelle. Mike! Mike and Fetch! What's that about it, Beverly? What's wrong? I just got a phone call. A man told me he knew who killed Estelle. Huh? He asked me to meet him in my hotel room. I didn't know what to do. Well, I said yes. Could you recognize his voice? Oh, well, I think so. He was trying to disguise his voice, but it sounded like... like Harry Frizee. Frizee, swell. Then we know where to find him. Oh, I'm scared, Mike. Everybody in the troop knows I called you in tonight because I knew something. Maybe he's trying to lure me outside. That's exactly what he's trying to do, Beverly. Now, you're going to stay right here. We'll keep that appointment for you. Give me the key to your room. Uh, here it is. It's 9.05. Frizzy is right across the hall, number 906. What time did he say to meet him? At 9.30. And it's 9.10 right now. Okay, Inspector, we've got ourselves a date. <laughs> That would be this way. Yeah. Yeah, here we are. That's for Z's room across the hall. And a light shining over the transom. Okay, let's talk to him in his own room. We may get a chance to see something. It's funny. His lights are on. This is another vanishing act. Let's try the door. Unlocked. More than that. Look at the doorknob. And my hand. Blood. Mike, is... is that the famous Frizee? I'm afraid the word is was, Inspector. It was the famous Frizee. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane in his adventures. How about it, friends? Have you gotten your first tank full of the new 76 gasoline? It's available right now at no increase in price at many Minuteman stations. The new post-war 76 is freshly blended from the huge 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company. That means you're getting the benefit of the latest in war-proven refining methods when you get the new 76. It's lighter, faster action beats all pre-war performance. You'll notice the difference as soon as you come down on the accelerator. So for a real motoring thrill, get a tank full of the powerful new 76 gasoline. If your minute man doesn't have the new 76 today, please be patient. Our tankers and trucks are making deliveries with all possible speed, but some outlying districts of necessity take longer to supply. But whether you're able to buy the new 76 right now, or whether you have to wait a few more days you'll find it the gasoline you've been waiting for. It's the new 76 gasoline, now going on sale at your Union Oil Minute Man stations. For the second time tonight, a murderer's knife has struck. The prize suspect, the famous Frazee, has been killed. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have just completed a search of the dead magician's hotel room. Ransack, turned upside down, pulled apart. I wonder what under the sun the killer was looking for. Well, we haven't the foggiest idea what to look for or what's missing. Mm. But at least this time we know the motive. For Z was killed because he knew the identity of Estelle's murderer, huh? You can't even say that, Phil. Huh? Don't forget for Z's knife was found in Estelle's back. He may have committed the first murder tonight, then somebody else killed him. Oh, 
I want to take a really good look at that body. Hmm. Still wearing his overcoat, so he had just come in. Wound on the back of the head showed the murderer first tried to put him out quietly. Hey, Inspector. What? His wristwatch, it smashed. Yeah, it stopped at, let's see, 8.57. 8.57? Inspector, when Beverly rushed in and told us about Frizee's phone call, remember I looked at my watch? That's right, you said it was ten minutes past nine. Hey, hey, then Frizee was already dead. He wasn't disguising his voice on that phone call. Somebody was trying to imitate for Z. And I'll bet you that somebody made the phone call from right inside the theater to get us out of the scene for a while. Well, if you're right, Mike, it's a darn good thing I phoned the sergeant to bring these people here to the hotel. Hey, kids. Yes, what? Angel? Y- you notice that for Z's right hand is closed tight, uh, in fact, awfully tight. Yeah. You suppose maybe he's got something in his fist? Well, we shouldn't disturb the body till the coroner gets here. Go ahead. Perhaps if I just pried his fingers open. You're right, honey. Mm, let's see it. A photograph, a tiny round picture of a baby. Yeah. And look at the back of the photo. Dried glue. This is the picture that was torn out of Estelle's locker. Inspector, I've got everybody outside for you. Sweeney, March, Hunter, and Sprayer. Okay, Sergeant. We'll talk to them one at a time. Bring in Sweeney. Yes, sir. Mr. Sweeney. This thing gives me the creeps. When are you guys going to stop finding bodies? Mr. Sweeney, you have one of Frizee's swords in your dressing room. Mind telling us what for? Oh, that old March and I borrowed a couple of them from Frizee. We were cooking up a burlesque on his magic act. Mm. We figured we could get some laughs. Yeah, I see. And now, uh, will you look at this photograph here? Sure. Do you recognize this baby? No. That's all, sir. Okay, Sergeant, bring in March. March. Mr. March, would you explain why you had one of Frizee's swords in your dressing room tonight? Sure, we've had him a couple of days. Sweeney, now we're going to do a takeoff on Frizee's act. Oh, yeah. That checks up. Do you recognize the baby in this photograph? Mm, no, sir. Okay, thank you. That's all. all right. Sergeant, Mr. Hunter. Yes, gentlemen? Oh, Mr. Hunter, we found that photograph which was missing from your partner's locket. You have? Good. Yes, yes. Here, this is it. A baby's picture, and as uh, we recall, Mr. Hunter, you said that there was a man's picture inside. Well, there was the last time I saw it. She must have changed photographs recently. Do you know who this baby might be? Not the slightest idea. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Will you send in Miss Pryor next? Oh, yes, Inspector. Yes, I will. Excuse me, Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. One of the boys just came to the telegraph office. Here are the copies of all the telegrams sent to the theater. Swell. Then hold Miss Pryor outside till we've read them. Yes, sir. Let's see. The first wire is four days ago from Chicago. Regret to inform you your father passed away last night. Stop. Will you attend funeral? Sign Norman L. Tyre, gang cop and tire attorneys. Well, the second wire is a duplicate. Two days later. And the last is dated yesterday. No word from you, so funeral tomorrow. Stop. Have been named administrator of your father's estate. Stop. You are again beneficiary because of John Jr., Signed, Norman L. Tyre. John, Jr. Again beneficiary because of John. Well, maybe I'm crazy, but I say the baby in this picture is John. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Back at the theater, I asked everybody if Estelle acted in any way peculiar the past few days, if she'd been frightened or worried. Yeah, and they all said that she was not upset. Well, then that's our answer. Inspector. Yeah, Mike? Somebody had better go back to the theater and pick up Dad, the old doorman. Now, Dad, now I want you to be very careful. How many telegrams did you receive addressed to Estelle? Why, three to Estelle and one to the team of Carol and Hunter. Uh Uh-huh. Now, um, you all remember that I asked uh, whether or not Estelle had shown any signs of being worried or upset? And you all said no. Yes, Yes, right. Three of these telegrams told of her father's death. Well, she certainly didn't say anything or show any signs of grief. The answer to that is easy, Mr. Hunter. She never saw those telegrams. They were deliberately withheld from her. But but, uh, I delivered them. At least I gave them to Mr. Hunter. You're right. I did withhold them. I didn't want Estelle to go to pieces and ruin our act. How long did you and Estelle work in that act, Mr. Hunter? Over three years. And during that time, your impression was that the locket she wore as a good luck charm contained a photograph of a man? Some fellow she was or had been in love with, I think you said? That's right. You're lying, Mr. Hunter. What do you mean? Does this look like the photo of a man? It's a baby. Estelle's baby. I don't know. I told you. You told us a lot that you didn't mean to, Mr. Hunter, but you didn't tell us that Estelle's baby was your baby, too. That you and Estelle were married, that you that you had the killer. I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. And you killed Frizee because he knew. Frizee found the baby's photograph. How, I don't know, but that doesn't matter. 
For Z put two and two together. You had to kill him. I can only guess at your original motive, but uh, that's something I'm quite sure the inspector will wring from you when he gets you down to police headquarters. <laughs> There it is, Angel. I know, Mike, but I still don't see how Hunter could expect to get away with it. But didn't he know somebody would check up on those telegrams? Well, certainly, honey, but he miscalculated on one thing. Hmm? He didn't know a private detective was going to be backstage right after the killing. He didn't have time to plant the telegrams in Estelle's purse or dresser. Well, I don't understand how that would help. I'm sure it would. Then he would have played it differently. Hunter would have admitted the marriage. He would have told us Estelle and he were planning to leave the show because Estelle had come into her father's money. Uh, as I see it, the reason he had to kill her was because she was going to divorce him. Oh, and that would cut him off from Estelle's inheritance. Yes. Mike. Yes. Thought you'd like to know we just got a confession. Seems Estelle was planning to divorce Vic and... Ah, uh... just what I finished telling Phil, Inspector. Oh, oh, but there's one thing, one thing. How did Hunter make that phone call imitating Frazee? From the theater, Mike. He called Beverly to give himself an alibi. He wanted us to think Frizzy was still alive while Hunter was in the theater. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the one question that worried me. <laughs> okay, Inspector. Thanks a lot. Mm, Michael. Uh, yes? Uh, there's one more question, and it worries me. Hmm? When you were down in New Orleans, just how friendly were you with Beverly? Oh, why, Miss Knight. Well? <laughs> Uh, I may have an eye for figures, but, Angel, you certainly haven't got a head for them. <laughs> How old would you say Beverly is right now? Mm, 22, 23. She's 22. I told you I knew her in New Orleans ten years ago. Yes, ma'am, we were the scandal of her grammar school. Mike Shane, you deliberately led me on. You allowed me... Oh, <laughs> come here, you big lug. Oh, oh, Bev... What? I mean, the angel. Remember, friends, the new 76 gasoline will give you a driving performance that will make you think of jet propulsion. Watch for the signs to go up in your neighborhood announcing the first shipments at your Union Oil Minuteman stations. Then, for a real thrill, drive in for your first tankful of the powerful new 76 gasoline, freshly blended from the huge 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company, now going on sale at your Minuteman stations. again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. The characters of Sweeney and March were played by the comedy team of Sweeney and March. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It 
Mike Shane were a painter, right now he might be gazing raptly from his office window at the sun setting directly into San Francisco's Golden Gate. If Mike Shane were a poet, he might be gazing dreamily at Phyllis Knight, his office associate. Being simply a very practical private detective, Mike's eyes are focused upon a typewritten letter on his desk while he and Phyllis share the telephone talking to the inspector of homicide. And it goes this way, Inspector. Dear Mr. Shane, my life is in great danger. I dare not come to your office for fear I shall be followed. This note is to acquaint you with the fact so that when I telephone to you, you may come instantly without question and well armed. And it's signed with the initials R.E.M. Hmm. When'd you get it, Mike? Oh, we could go Tuesday, Inspector. No return address given, and it's typed on the very cheapest paper. Sounds a little different from the usual crackpot thing, Mike. But I think that's all it is. Mm. Our department gets a dozen of those letters every day. Mm, I know, Inspector, but this afternoon I got a phone call from the guy. Still wouldn't give his name. Said he was in really desperate peril now. He was going to risk coming to see Mike anyway at 4 o'clock. And so... Well, it's 6 o'clock and we're still waiting. And forget it, Mike. Guy's just a screwball. If it had really been serious, he'd have gotten in touch with the police. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Oh, uh, by the way, Mike, what are you doing this evening? Oh, Mike and I are going to go to dinner and maybe a movie. You want to make it a force? Well, my wife is spending the night down on the peninsula with her folks. Okay, Inspector. Look, I'm going back to my apartment and change shirts. Say, uh, what do you say you meet us there in a few minutes, huh? I'm on my way there right now. Hope you kids don't mind my inviting myself along like this. Oh, nonsense. We love to have you. But I make one condition. No shop talk from you kids tonight. Deal. Oh, well, it'll be a painfully quiet evening, then. <laughs> uh, let me see. Let me see. Any mail in my box? Uh, uh-uh. No, not today. All right, make yourselves to home, children. It won't yeah. take me a minute to shave and put on a clean shirt. under the star... Mike! Huh? There on the floor. Holy... Mike, what do you want? Where did you get it? It's a head. A mummified human head. Yeah, it's been shrunk. The head's no larger than a baseball. And the skin, it's almost black. That long hair. Oh, it gives me the shudders. Mike, how in the devil did it get in here? Somebody pulling a gag on you? Blamed if I know, Inspector. From what I've read, I'd say it's a trophy of some headhunting tribe. Probably Sarawak or uh, Borneo. The cheekbones look more like an Indian's to me. Mm. You know, they say they have headhunters in Martinique and up the Amazon. You're right, Phil. It's a South American Indian. But how did it get in here? The front door was locked. The same goes for the windows. Unless maybe the one in the bedroom. Inspector? Yeah? Mm. Yes. Look. Look on my bed. A body. These slight markings on the throat are conclusive, Mike. He was strangled. Yeah. And with a good deal of finesse. It was done with something, some soft noose, uh, a garot, garot or something. First we find a mummified Indian head and then a man strangled. Well, kids, there must be a connection between the two. Yeah, Phil, but what? Did the killer leave the head for Mike, or did this man drop it? Hey. Hey, there's something on the floor. Yeah. Huh? The man's wallet. The driver's license gives his name as R.E. McIntyre, 1198 California Street. Born April 5th, 1896. Listed as married. R.E. McIntyre. R.E. Inspector. Yeah, Mike. The initials on that letter. R.E.M., R.E. McIntyre. This is our man. Yeah, but what in the blazes was he doing in your bedroom? I thought he was to meet you at your office. Well, maybe he was being followed, Inspector. Decided he'd be safer if he could hide in Mike's apartment till Mike came home. No, yeah. it's dizzy any way you look at it. There's almost a hundred dollars here in his wallet. He's dressed like a Knob Hill millionaire. Yet he wrote to me on the cheap paper a schoolboy would use. Yeah, let's go through his pockets and see what else we can find. Okay. First, the wallet. Here. A gold pen and pencil, initialed R.E.M. Yeah. Here's a checkbook. Key ring. Gold knife. A couple of dollars in small change. One pack of cigarettes. Match folder. 
That's all. Yeah, it doesn't tell us anything. Hand me the phone, Mike. I'm going to call headquarters for the squad, and after they get here... We're leaving for 1198 California Street and the lady who is Mrs. McIntyre. <laughs> When did I last see my husband? Well, we ate luncheon at the Palace Hotel, and then Mr. McIntyre said he had some business to attend to. What time was that, Mrs. McIntyre? Mm, I would say two o'clock. Well, that's just about when he telephoned the office. He told me he was coming to see Mike at four o'clock. Did uh, your husband tell you, Mrs. McIntyre, that his life was in danger? That apparently he was being followed everywhere he went? Mr. McIntyre never talked over his affairs with me. However, I, I did notice that the past several weeks he seemed very nervous. I thought he was brooding over some business matter. And just what was his business? Mining. He and his partner, Anthony Locke, own a big tin mine in South America. South America? That's where the dried Indian head came from. It did mean something. Mrs. McIntyre, do you know if your husband had any enemies? I've answered that. Mr. McIntyre did not talk over his affairs with me. Mm -hmm. Well, he certainly provided a beautiful and expensive home. Mrs. McIntyre, can you explain why he should write us that letter on the cheapest sort of paper and then sign only his initials? <laughs> Max done that trick before. Mm -hmm. He wanted you to think he was a poor man, so you might work for him at less money. Oh. He would even introduce himself by some false name that would fit his initials. <laughs> yes, he thought that much of a nickel. Except when he could spend it on himself, huh? I presume, Mrs. McIntyre, your husband left the will. Mr. Shane, I'm getting very weary of repeating this. Mm? My husband did not talk over his business with me. Of course he had a will. And of course I'm the beneficiary. You must realize, Mrs. McIntyre, that I we're... realize that for one half hour I've been subjected to highly impertinent questions. I know nothing which can help the police department. And there the matter ends. <laughs> Mike, for two cents, I'd go back to the house and haul that royal lady down to headquarters. I think she'd decide to answer our question. Look, let's forget her for the time being, Inspector. We've got to talk to McIntyre's business partner, Anthony Locke. Hey, kids, I just saw a man duck behind that front gate. You did? Okay, let's have a look. Hey, he got in that car. Quick, we'll follow him. Here, jump in. Thanks. Right. Mike started. He's getting away. He's gotten away, Angel. The wires have been pulled loose from my ignition switch. We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. Many motorists have been amazed at the way the new 76 gasoline performs in traffic and on hills. Well, the reason is simple. It's because the new 76 contains components of the same 100-octane gasoline Union Oil Company's refineries produce for the Air Forces. That means the new 76 gasoline for your car is packed with extra power, greater than pre-war. You'll notice its instant response as soon as you come down on the accelerator. You'll like its quieter, faster action. And you'll like its price, too. For 76 is a non-premium gasoline and still sells at regular prices everywhere. So for a real thrill in driving, put in a tank full of the powerful new 76 gasoline. Nearly all Union Oil Minuteman stations have the new 76 on hand now. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. <laughs> Tonight, a triple mystery dogs Mike and Phyllis. Why was a mummified Indian head left in Mike's apartment? Why was a man strangled to death in Mike's bed? Who pulled the ignition wires loose in Mike's automobile? Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have gone to the home of the murdered man's partner, Anthony Locke. The dining room door opens. Mr. Locke asks if you would please join him in the dining room. Why, certainly. Thank you. Ah, uh, good evening. I was just beginning my dinner. Hope you haven't eaten. I'll have water set extra plates. I'm afraid you don't understand, sir. I'm the inspector of homicide. This is Mr. Shane and Miss Knight, private detectives. Oh, really? 
Well, I uh, misunderstood, Waters. Bit hard of hearing, you know. Too much quinine, touch of malaria. Sit down, sit down. I despise eating alone. Happy to have your company. Mr. Locke, this is not a social call. No, can't recall inviting you. Don't know what you're doing here. But uh, how about some terrapin soup? It's excellent tonight. Sir, I'm from the police department. Your partner, Mr. McIntyre, has been killed. Murdered. Strangled to death. When? Tonight, in my apartment. What? And in the next room, we found a dried, mummified human head. Uh, Mr. Locke? Mr. Locke, are you all right? The sign of death. You know what it means? Yes. Yes, McIntyre came to me with an anonymous letter. It said he was going to die. When was this? Uh, About ten days ago. I tried to get him to go to the police. He wouldn't. Finally, he said he'd hire a private detective. We both knew who sent the letter... But I didn't think he'd actually kill. Hmm? That's what that head means. He? Who? Please, Mr. Locke. His name is Ferd Stockel. He lives in Bolivia. McIntyre and I bought our plantation from him about five years ago. Mm -hmm. It was just jungle and bare mountains. Then we dug the tin mine. Stockel said we cheated him out of it. He swore he'd get even. (laughs) The scar on my cheek. He did that with a machete. Then you think he's in San Francisco? He must be. The letter was postmarked from here... But, gentlemen, this isn't the end. I have received the same letter. The hmm? same death threat? Yes. Okay, let's have a look at that letter. Well, that's a strange thing. I had it on my desk, then suddenly it disappeared. Then we'd better move fast. I want a description of this third stock. Well, I can give you that. He's about five feet seven. He has black hair, black eyes, very dark skin. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'd be about uh, 40 now. He speaks English with a peculiar hissing accent. Good. Now, Mike, we better get moving. But, but, but how can you catch him? What can you do? Plenty. We're going back to headquarters and broadcast a general alarm. All right, boys. That's the man's description. Get that on the radio right away. See that all squad cars are contacted. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Smith. Your men will cover all airports, train depots, bridge control stations, and highways. He may try to skip town. Yes, sir. Russell and you boys go over the registrations at all hotels. See if you can get me the immigration authorities. Yes, Yes, sir. That's all. Get busy. Inspector, we made an inventory of everything in McIntyre's pocket. So did we, Sergeant. Oh, then you know about the folder of matches. Matches? What about them? Address on the cover there. That's the third rate place down in the Embarcadero. Hardly a place for a rich man like McIntyre. Mm, you're right, Sergeant. Not only right, Inspector. I suggest we visit that third rate hotel on the Embarcadero right now. <laughs> That's what I said. Ain't nobody name of Ferd Starkle registered here. Well, he may be under another name. You got any man registered from South America? Hey, let me think now. South America? Well, yeah. Yeah, room 307. That great big guy with the beard. Signed in from Lima, Peru. When? Oh, maybe two weeks ago. Name's Ed Badger, he says. Two weeks ago. Hmm. Time fits if the description doesn't. Okay, I guess this time we walk up. <laughs> Yes, I come up from Lima. What about it? Before that, Mr. Badger, by any chance were you in Bolivia? Oh, now I'm on. You've been talking to McIntyre. What's Mac doing? Running to the police just because I, uh... uh, Well, I, uh... I thought he had some sense. You were going to say just because you what? Well, now, gents, it was a good deal. I figured Mr. McIntyre and Mr. Locke wouldn't mind owning the second tin mine down in old Bolivia. I could fix it so they'd get hold of a really big one. Mm-hmm. A few thousands played in the right place, you know. <laughs> but if Mac is going to turn Sunday school boy on me... Mr. Badger, you, uh, you work for McIntyre and Locke? I was boss of the mine, madam, until uh, they were looking for an excuse to get rid of me. Mm-hmm. But Edge Badger is not one to hold hard feelings. When did you last see McIntyre? Well, he come to the hotel here yesterday. Now, I'm not one to do Mac dirt. You ought to know that. So if you gentlemen will give me an idea what this is all about. Mr. McIntyre has been murdered. Oh, that's not so good. No, no. Uh, Mr. Padgett, 
Do you mind telling us where you've been for the past three hours? Oh, I see what you mean. Well, I've been right here in my room. And, uh, oh, maybe a couple of trips to the bar. Did Mr. McIntyre tell you that he'd received a letter threatening his life? No. A letter, eh? So that's what was worrying old Mac. I figured he was having trouble with his wife. While you were down in Bolivia, Mr. Badger, did you know a man named Starkle? Ferd Starkle? Oh, did I know Ferd. There's a cutthroat for you. Oh? Now, if you were to ask me if Ferd Starkle would kill Mac, I'd say yes. I, Mac and Locke, really crossed him up once. Uh, have you seen him in San Francisco? Here? Yeah? No. He's down in Bolivia. When did you last see him there? Why, a couple of months ago, I say. Yeah. You mean you think he's in town? I wouldn't like that, gents. He's a bad one. You said a moment ago you thought McIntyre was having trouble with his wife. Uh, where did you get that idea? Well, I, uh, I, I only thought. I don't know. Go on, go on, please. Well, I, I don't know anything. Mac just said something about his wife nagging him. I, I hope you gentlemen won't tattle that to her. I may have to do business with her and lock. Hey, you won't say anything, will you? That's for us to decide. Uh, Mr. Badger... Is there anything further you can tell us? Anything else that comes to your mind? No, I can't think of anything. Mm-hmm. Inspector, no, I Mike. think I've got a slightly different angle on this case. I'd like to go back to McIntyre's house and have a look at his private papers, whether Mrs. McIntyre likes it or not. What you're thinking, Mike. You figure Ed Badger is in this deeper than he'll admit. Now you want to get some proof in black and white. Well, that's part of it. Yeah, he told us just what he wanted us to hear and no more. Mm -hmm. So he's a shady character. But probably he's never risen above petty larceny and confidence games. No, he doesn't look like the... The type, yes, uh uh-huh. You know, someday, Angel, the inspector and I are going to take you down to Rogue's Gallery and show you the pictures of every convicted murderer for the past ten years. You'll say most of them look uh, as innocent as the inspector uh, or myself. That's no recommendation. Oh, get her. <laughs> Here we are, kids. I'll pull up in the driveway. Stop and... the car. Quick. What? There's uh, that man, the man who tore the wires out of Mike's car. Yeah, he's running down the walk. Hey, you, stop. Stop or I'll shoot. That stopped him. Come on. Inspector, if you've hit Don't him. Don't worry, I aimed at the pavement. He's pretty shaky in the legs. What's the big idea? Try to kill a man. Listen, if I wanted to hit you, I couldn't miss it that short range. You can't get away with this. Sticking up a guy right... I'll have the law on you. You're talking to him, buddy. I'm inspector of homicide. And we want to know why you were sneaking around outside this house. And why you pulled the wires loose in our car. I'm a private detective. I was paid to watch this house. Who paid you? McIntyre. I'm watching his wife. Oh, is that so? Then, Inspector, suppose we give him a chance to do uh, more than watch her. Suppose we make him talk to her. The man's lying. Why would my husband hire a detective to watch me? Well, we don't know that he is a detective. I got a license. Here, see if he is so. Mm-hmm. Your name Andy Blackmore? Yeah. License was issued last month. I never heard of him before. So what? I never heard of you before. I'm new in San Francisco. Mr. Blackmore, when did Mr. McIntyre hire you to shadow his wife? Last week. It's preposterous, I tell you. He's lying. My orders were to watch her and a fellow named Locke. Well, get McIntyre. He'll tell you if I'm lying or not. McIntyre was dead. But murdered. He's what? Mr. Blackmore, just what were you supposed to find out about Mrs. McIntyre and Locke? Well, I don't know. I was supposed to keep track of her and everybody she was in contact with. Especially Locke. And what happens? I get myself half strangled to death and then you shoot at me. Wait a minute, hold on. Who strangled you when? Oh, some big guy with a beard. He was leaving here a couple of nights ago and when I... Hello? Is the inspector there? Yes, he's here. It's for you, Inspector. Thank you. Hello? Inspector? Yes? Mr. Locke just phoned headquarters. Says he's discovered a very important clue. All right, Sergeant. Tell him we'll be right over. You meet us there. Mike, I, I don't like this at all. Mr. Locke's front door open, the electric lights off. Not only off, there's no electricity at all. Listen, you guys aren't going to mix me up in this. I'm going out and waiting in the car. You're staying right here, mister. Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke. 
Not a sound. Where are the servants? I want to find the telephone. Mike, throw your flashlight around. Oh, Mike. Huh? Throw it this way. I just kicked something. It, it, it rolled. There it is. A head. Another head. Yeah. And right behind it. On the couch. Mr. Lock. Mr. Lock. Mr. Lock. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. We don't say that driving with the new 76 gasoline will eliminate all your traffic problems, but we do say it will make your driving a lot more pleasant. Even the oldest cars perk up and come alive when you put in the new 76. That's because this new post-war fuel contains components of the same 100-octane gasoline that Union Oil Company's refineries are producing for the air forces. That means it's packed with extra power, greater than pre-war. You'll notice this as soon as you come down on the accelerator. You'll like the quieter, faster action of the powerful new 76 gasoline. And you'll like its price, too. For 76 is a non-premium gasoline and still sells at regular prices everywhere. So for a real thrill in driving... Put in a tank full of the new Super 76. The new 76 gasoline is now going on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. In the darkened house of Anthony Locke, Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have discovered a second mummified human head. But this time, the murderer has failed. Our trio have arrived just in time. Anthony Locke himself has been revived. In the yellow light of Mike's flashlight, the victim gasps out his story. Thank heavens you got here. You thought he had killed me. We did, too. The garage was still wrapped around your neck. Did you see who it was? No. It it was Starkle. Ferd Starkle. It must have been. But you couldn't see him. No. No, I came home and, and found the servants gone. I got scared. I phoned the police. Then I heard a window smash. Where? The breakfast room, in there. Suddenly, the lights went out. Somebody grabbed me. I felt something tighten around my throat. That's the last I remember. Well, he left you for dead, then ran out the front door and left it open. Well, it must have happened in the past 15 minutes. You were all right when you phoned us. Yes. Oh, please, that that flashlight hurts my eyes. You can light the candles on the mantel. Uh, I'll light them. Who's that man there beside you? Andy Blackmore. I'm a private detective. He claims McIntyre hired him to shadow Mrs. McIntyre and you. McIntyre hired him to... No, no, he's lying. I tell you it's the truth. Now, listen, you guys aren't going to rope me into this. Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke, you said on the phone that you had discovered some important clue. Yes, I I found the letter. Good. The letter threatening my life. I've got it in my pocket. Good. It may be the key to the whole case. No, I'm sure I... No, it's gone. I, I had it right here in my pocket. He took it. Doggone, just when we thought uh, we... You've got to catch Starkle. You've got to. He's mad. He'll try again. We'll do our best, Mr. Locke. But I'm worried about these missing servants. Uh, how many are in your employ? The butler and the French cook. Why would they disappear? Is that the front door? Inspector! It's the sergeant. Oh. And Ed Badger. And why not? Gentlemen, I was suspicious. I couldn't see any lights except a couple of candles. Because somebody pulled the light switch. And tried to murder Mr. Locke. To mi- No, Mr. Locke, too. Are you all right now, sir? He is. But uh, what were you doing outside? Why, I was coming to see him. After you gentlemen left me at the hotel, I figured I'd better talk over my business with him personally. He's the man I was trailing the other night. He's the one that tried to strangle me. You again. Now, look here, friend. Remember what I told you about messing the things that don't concern you? Inspector. Yeah, Mike. Before the trail gets hot, sir. Uh, we'd better look for clues. The killer may have dropped something. Right. Let's start with a broken window. Mr. Locke said it was in the next room. Mm-hmm. There's the glass scattered all around the window. Yeah. Double sliding window. Now, let's raise it and check for footprints outside. A ah, little luck. Cement paving. Oh. He smashed the glass, crawled through the window... But he didn't cut himself or snag his clothes. Well, let's look around the room. Mike, let me have that flashlight a minute. Oh, what is it, Angel? 
Look. Look, this window has an upper and lower half. Yeah, and the bottom half is smashed. Yeah, but there are little pieces of glass scattered along the wooden frame here on the top of the lower half. Mm. How, how could glass from below the frame get on top of the frame? Angel, Angel, you hit it. Hmm? The top half of the window was lowered first. And when it was raised again, the glass was transferred from one frame to the other. Then that window was smashed from the inside. Wait a minute, kids, wait a minute. Remember Mr. Locke said he got a threatening letter just like McIntyre's? Yeah, the one he just said was stolen for the second time. But only McIntyre did anything about it. I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Locke. Yes? Mr. Locke, where is the uh, power switch that turns on the electric lights? Right down in the basement. And immediately after the window was smashed, the lights went out and somebody grabbed you? Yes. Mr. Locke, it would take several minutes to get from that window down into the basement, then tumble back upstairs in the dark. What? Why, why uh... You why... faked the whole thing. You broke that window yourself. You got rid of the servant. No, no, it was Ferd Stockle. He you was... built up a dramatic story for us to swallow. Oh. But your own partner didn't believe it. That's why McIntyre hired a detective to watch his wife and you. You were the one who insisted on going to the police about McIntyre's threatening letter. But you also got a letter. You never went to the police. You didn't hire a detective. Because you knew there was no danger, Mr. Locke. Because you are the murderer. No, no, no. Somebody followed McIntyre to Shane's apartment. Somebody climbed through the window and strangled him. Thank you, Mr. Locke. Thank you. As sweet a confession as I ever heard. None of us told you that the killer got into my apartment through the window, but you're perfectly correct. Well, Inspector, I guess that's all the proof the D.A. will ask of you. Mike. Hmm? Do you realize we haven't had a single bite of dinner tonight? Oh, my stomach won't let me forget it. Oh, the inspector told me he'd meet us at Fisherman's Wharf as soon as he finishes at headquarters. I hope he can find out where Locke got those gruesome Indian heads. Oh, he probably brought them with him from South America. Well, maybe so. Anyway, Mike, I think I can guess Locke's motive for the killing. He was in love with Mrs. McIntyre. He wanted the husband out of the way. Uh-huh. Locke's elaborate build-up was just to disguise a very simple, sordid murder. No. I don't believe Mrs. McIntyre had the slightest interest in Locke. Or even suspected his intentions. Well, it just goes to show you, Angel. When some men are in love, they'll stop at nothing. Uh huh. Uh -huh. That's not my problem. Hmm? Mm. It's when some men are in love and will do nothing. Why, Angel? again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who 
will make the new 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. There may be many drawbacks to the life of a private detective, but boredom is not among them. At least not for Mike Shane. This evening is no exception. At this moment, Mike and his fetching associate, Phyllis Knight, are hurrying through the entrance hall of one of the luxurious homes of San Francisco's Marina District. And the reason for their haste? A hurry-up call from the inspector of homicide himself. Mike? Well, you sure got here on the double. Oh, you asked us to, Inspector. And just why you ask us is still a mystery. Because, Mike, I wanted to learn what you know about John N. Crowder. John N. Crowder? I never heard of him. You didn't? How about you, Phil? Mm-mm, mm-mm. The only Crowder I know is the kid who sat behind me in seventh grade, and his name was Wilbur. Okay, I want to show you kids something. The body is in that room there. But we'll get to that later. Whose body? What body? John N. Crowder's body. This is his home. He's been murdered. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Well, people all dressed up as if it were a party. It huh? was a party, Phil. Mike, you see this telephone stand here and that scratch pad beside the phone? Oh, oh I see what's bothering you. Yeah, and that scratch pad is your phone number. I can't explain it, Inspector. Crowder didn't phone me. All my calls the past couple of days have been from people I know. That doesn't look like a man's handwriting to me. Did Mr. Crowder have a wife? He was a bachelor, Phil. Just a minute. Miss Whitcomb? Yes? Miss Whitcomb, this is Mr. Shane and Miss Knight. Janet Whitcomb is Mr. Crowder's ward. How do you do? Oh, I'm glad to know you, Miss Whitcomb. Uh, do you happen to know how this phone number, my phone number, got on this scratch pad? Why, yes. Uncle John, that's what I called Mr. Crowder, was looking through the classified directory this afternoon. He asked me to jot down that number. Did he tell you why he wanted it? Why he wanted to call a private detective? A private detective? Uh-huh. No, no, he didn't. Well, what about the murder itself? Anybody know what happened? As I've gotten the story, Mike, they were having a party tonight. At 8 o'clock, before most of the guests arrived, Mr. Crowder excused himself and went into the library to listen to the radio. Uncle John always lis- insisted on listening to this one broadcast, the days of 49. So when we heard several gunshots, we just thought they were part of the radio show. Several gunshots? Yeah, Mike, but one of them was the real thing. Who found the body? Miss Whitcomb here. Oh. I... Well, when the program was over, he didn't come out of the library. I went to call him. I... I opened the door. Oh, why? Why, how could anybody... Please, you mustn't. You've been so brave through all of this. This is Lee Strayhorn, her fiancé. Uh-huh. And the other gentleman? Richard Russell, madam. Where are the other guests? There aren't any. I told the sergeant to turn the others away at the front door. Was this radio program Mr. Crowder listened to a 15-minute or half-hour show? 15 minutes. And after Mr. Crowder went into the library to listen to it, where were you three people? Well, I hadn't gotten here yet, Mr. Shane. When I walked in, I found Janet in hysterics, and Charlie Lung, the houseboy, was trying to quiet her. Mm-hmm. Janet is a high-strung girl, and well, at first I thought she was upset about something she'd spilled on her dress. Then I saw Mr. Crowder, and I took one look and telephoned the police. As for me, gentlemen, I was here in the living room talking to Oliver. Oliver left, and then in a few minutes, I heard Janet shriek. Who is Oliver? Another servant? No. Mr. Oliver is one of Mr. Crowder's clients. Mr. Crowder was an investment counselor, and he handled Mr. Oliver's stocks and bonds for him. Nobody told me about Oliver before. I didn't know anybody had left the house. I guess you'd better round him up, Inspector. And now, how about you, Miss Whitcomb? Where were you while Mr. Crowder was listening to the radio? I was upstairs. I'd spilled something on my dress and was cleaning it. When I came downstairs, the program was over. What about the servants? I checked, Phil. They were all in the kitchen or the butler's pantry or the dining room. Oh. Did Mr. Crowder have any known enemies? Oh, Oh, no. 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 Inspector, I'm sure I never talked to a John N. Crowder. So how about letting me have a look at the body? I was just going to suggest it, Mike. Okay. A couple of chairs overturned, the drapery pulled down. There must have been quite a fight. Which makes me doubt these people when they say that they heard nothing unusual. Oh, the body's on the other side of the desk, Mike. Oh, man about 50. No, Inspector, no, I've never seen this man before. Shot through the heart. Well, the gun was fired at close range, Mike, if those powder burns on his shirt mean anything. I've found one interesting clue. Huh? I've kept my mouth shut about it so far. Take a look at this blood on the rug. Mm-hmm. 
Right in the middle of the blood, a spot of clean rug. Mm -hmm. In the shape of a dollar mark. Hmm. I know what that is. Yeah? was made by one of those uh, money clips. You know, Mike, you carry one in your pocket for dollar bills. Yeah, the killer dropped it and then picked it up in order not to leave a clue. Or so he thought. Well, I'm still wondering, why did Crowder have my phone number? Why did he want to call me? And when he had the number, why didn't he call you? They said Crowder had no enemies, yet somebody must have had a motive to kill him. Just a minute, Inspector. Maybe, maybe I can give you a hint. Yeah, Mike? What? Look around the room very carefully. Well, what about it? Oh, you mean those two overturned chairs? The walls, Inspector. The paintings on the walls. A painting of Carmel by the Sea in particular. You're right, Mike. The painting is crooked. Not only crooked, but it stands out from the wall. Yes, and I'll bet behind the painting there's a wall safe. Well, I'll push the painting to one side. So, and there we are. Mm. It's unlocked. Now, let's see what's inside the safe, if anything. Kids. Huh. This desk lamp is the only light in the room, isn't it? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, why? Because I'm going to turn it out. Somebody is about to come in through that French window. We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. If you like to feel your car surge ahead with quick power when you press down on the accelerator, try using the new 76 gasoline. You'll find that with a tank full of the new 76, your car will respond instantly to the throttle. Take hills with the easy lift of a soaring bird. That's because the new 76 is power-packed with components of 100-octane gasoline, the fighting fuel Union Oil Company refineries produce for the Air Forces. Furthermore, the new post-war 76 has been blended under scientific control to produce a fuel which will give you the full horsepower of your engine regardless of make. It's no wonder motorists are saying that old cars perform like new with 76. So try a tank full of this powerful post-war gasoline and then watch the way your car surges ahead with new life and power. You can get the powerful new 76 gasoline at any Union Oil Minuteman station. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. And while you're in, ask the Minuteman for your Union Oil credit card application. On the library floor lies the murdered body of John Crowder. And on the sun porch outside, Phyllis has seen a prowler. Mike and the inspector step to the French window. And then suddenly... All right, mister. Hands in the air. What in place? Come here. Come inside. That's what I've been trying to do. The police at the front door wouldn't let me in. Okay, turn on the light, Phil. All right, now. Who are you and why the peeping Tom act? I was not peeping. I came around the side of the house to see if someone would let me in. That flat foot at the front door said Crowder had been murdered. There's the evidence on the floor. Yeah. Shot through the heart. Blood on the carpet. Who did it? That's what we're trying to find out. And also your name. Oliver, see? But Oliver. Oh, you're the man who was here earlier. Why'd you leave the house? Why not? No murder had been committed then. I walked across the street to my house. Well, Mr. Oliver, why did you go home? Because I forgot my present for Janet. And uh, when did you last see Mr. Crowder alive? He came into the library to listen to a radio program. I was talking to that, well, that social butterfly, Richard Russell. I stepped into the library here for a moment, finished some business with Crowder... And then left. What kind of business? Investment business, stocks, bonds. Do I have to draw a diagram for you? When you were talking with Mr. Crowder, was the radio on? Full blast. And when you came back, the sergeant wouldn't let you in the house, so you came around onto the porch. Yes, 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 I already said that. Why were you so anxious to get inside, Mr. Oliver? People generally give a murder a wide berth. Oh, for Pete's sake, I'm a good friend of Crowder and Janet. I wanted to help her. Why should Janet need your help? Because she won't get any from that fiancé of hers. That's reason enough. Crowder should have stuck by his guns. We should have forbidden the marriage. Inspector, I think we should ask Mr. Oliver to relax in the other room for a while and let us talk to Janet. Right. If you please, Mr. Oliver. Miss Whitcomb, would you step in here a moment, please? Oh, Mr. Oliver. Don't let them frighten you, Janet. You wanted something? Uh, Just a small point, Miss Whitcomb. Now, Mr. Crowder was to be your guardian, I believe, until you are 21? Yes. I suppose that means you have some money? From my parents. Was it very much? Several hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. And you were having some trouble with Mr. Crowder? About your money? Oh, no, not that. He was a fine man. 
He was perfectly honest. He had money of his own. Then you didn't get Mr. Shane's telephone number from the direct mother. There's no need to be frightened, Miss Whitcomb. I... Uncle John didn't understand. He... He wouldn't understand. <laughs> now, please, Miss Whitcomb... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, fellas. You told Oliver to go in the other room and relax. I suppose you sit down and relax a while. I'll talk to Janet. He's dead. What does it matter now? We're just trying to help you, Janet. The more we know about Mr. Crowder, the easier it may be for us to find his murderer. Now, you can see that, can't you? Yes. Of course you can. Now, you were having some difficulty with your guardian. You can tell me what it was. He... Uncle Johnny didn't want me to marry Lee. He said Lee was no good. I told him he was wrong, wrong. I told him I wouldn't let him run my life any longer. I'd leave home. I love Lee, and he loves me. I'm going to marry him. Nobody can stop me now. Nobody. How long have you been engaged to Lee? Two weeks. Uncle Johnny was mad about it, but he never said another word about Lee. Mm -hmm. And that's all the trouble you ever had with Mr. Crowder? Yes. Can I go now? I guess so, Miss Whitcomb. Thank you. Well, what do you think, kids? I don't know, Phil. The girl is so dramatic about everything. If Crowder didn't make an objection to the marriage for the past two weeks, I don't see why she's so excited. Uh huh. Well, before we have another interruption, I want to examine that wall safe. Hmm. Safe is hardly as big as the inside of a hat box. Hmm. One small tin box, empty. One packet of currency marked $2,500. Mm. Oh, that's odd. If it was burglary, why did the killer leave the money? Well, they might have been scared off before we saw it or even overlooked it in this hurry. Yeah, but we don't know what was in the safe originally, Mike. We can't tell what was stolen. If Crowder was a good businessman, he must have kept an inventory of its contents. And if he was a cautious businessman, he would not keep the inventory right inside the safe. No. How about this desk here? Mm. Uh, Inspector. Eh? Oh. What is it, Mr. Russell? I noticed that Janet is very upset. I thought maybe I ought to tell you that she used to quarrel with Crowder all the time. Uh, he didn't want her to get married. Yes, Janet told us all about it, Mr. Russell. Oh, well, I just thought you'd like to know. Uh, find anything in the desk? Mr. Russell, we're very busy, so if you don't mind... Oh, all right. I just thought you'd like to know. Oh, a nosy character. Oh, well, here we are, Inspector. The inventory to the safe. Swell, Mike. Let's see now. Cash, $2,500. Well, that checks. Then one package, Charlie Lung. It's a houseboy. Yeah, but no findy package. Next, $21,000 bonds. PM and ORR. Abbreviation for railroad bonds, probably. Yeah, and said bonds are also missing. Now, the last person known to have been in this library with Crowder was Mr. Oliver. Mm. Yes, Oliver said he had some business with Crowder about stocks and bonds. After which Oliver walked across the street to his house. If, uh, if he paid Crowder for those bonds, I didn't find a check in the safe. And I searched Crowder's body. He had just a small amount of money in his wallet. Mike, you know what we're going to do? Yes, Inspector, we're going across the street and search Mr. Oliver's house for those bonds. <laughs> Mike. Yes, Inspector. I've looked all through Oliver's desk. You find anything? No. No, no luck. I searched the whole living room. I thought there might be another wall safe. And I checked upstairs. If Mr. Oliver's servants were home tonight, we might get them to tell us where he keeps his valuables. Mike, you think Oliver would still be carrying those bonds on him? Oh, that'd be pretty risky. Uh Uh-oh. Hey, do we dare answer it? I'll take a gamble. Hello? Hello. Oliver speaking. Is this the inspector, Mr. Shane? <clears throat> well, it's Shane, Mr. Oliver. How did you know we were uh, here? Russell saw you. You're looking for those bonds. Well, we were just checking. If uh... You haven't found the bonds yet. I tucked them in Webster's Unabridged Dictionary. It's on the table, right behind the phone. The dictionary on the table. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Oliver, those bonds belong to Mr. Crowder. How did you I have... bought them tonight? I told you I had business with Crowder. You didn't give him a check in payment? Of course I didn't give him a check. Crowder always sends me a monthly statement. My credit is A1. When you leave the house, please turn off the lights. Well, how do you like that? Russell saw us come in here. 
Oliver hid the bonds inside the dictionary? Yeah, Phil, here they are. Oliver was so straightforward about it all. Yet he might be trying to beat us to the punch. Yeah. Now what? I'll talk to him this time, Mike. The inspector speaking. Inspector, this is the sergeant. They told me I could reach you at this number. Yeah? What is it, sergeant? Uh, that Chinese houseboy, sir. Uh-huh. I saw him sneak out of the house. I trailed him clear down to a shop in Chinatown. He's up to something. Oh? Where are you now? In the chop suey place on Grand Avenue. I can watch the shop from here. Okay, Sergeant. Keep your eye on it. We'll meet you there in ten minutes. I, uh... I followed him into this building, Inspector. And up those stairs to the second floor. And then where? He went in the first door at the top of the stairs. Please, Angel, watch those heels. You sound like a dray horse going up a ladder. Don't be personal, Mr. Shane. Oh, there, no. there. That's the door right ahead, sir. The transom's open. Mm-hmm. Listen. Talking Chinese. Think, think we better knock Mike. Oh, uh, uh, will you come in, gentlemen, and uh, miss? <laughs> Listening through closed door is like cotton in one's ear. Well, you see, we were just... Uh, yeah. I am Yin Hao, dealer in Oriental Imports. I believe you already know my friend, Mr. Charlie Lung. Yes, yes, we wanted to talk to him. Obviously. That is why you followed him from Mr. Crowder's. As Inspector of Homicide, I gave orders that no one was to leave that house. Yet Charlie Lung sneaks off. Why did you run away, Charlie? Please, Charlie. My friend, Charlie Lung, came to me with a problem of ethics, a delicate matter of conflicting loyalties. So? Mr. Lung is in possession of an object. You of the police would call it a clue. I see. His problem is whether to produce the clue or to hide it. He'd better produce it or I'll have to arrest him. Even the honest man casts a crooked shadow. Unhappily, Mr. Lung tells me the object belongs to Miss Whitcomb. You can, of course, appreciate his distress. If Miss Whitcomb is innocent, I promise no harm will come to her. Why, yes, this clue may solve the whole murder. Oh. Uh, oh. My friend, Mr. Lung, say that upon the basis of your promise that no harm will come to Miss Whitcomb, I may give you the object. It is this. A silver money clip. The dollar mark. Charlie, where did you find it? Oh, after Missy Clyde, I find it on the floor in the blood. I, I take it. Now, now, what you do? We're going back to the house and talk to Miss Whitcomb. And you, Mr. Lung, are coming with us. I'm sorry, Inspector, but I just had to lie down for a while. Uh-huh. I... I don't feel at all well. She really is sick. I've been sitting here in the bedroom talking to her. Lee, would you mind stepping outside? We have something we'd like to show Janet in private. Well, yes, of course. Janet, do you own a silver money clip? The sort you carry in your purse to hold dollar bills, Janet. Yes. Is this it? Why, I must have dropped it. Janet, Charlie Lung, the houseboy, found it beside Mr. Crowder's body... In a pool of blood. Oh, no. No, it now, can't now, be. Now, 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 Janet. I didn't have my purse with me. What are you trying to do to me? Inspector. Yeah? Mr. Shane. Yes? Could you come here a moment? Why, certainly. Phil, you stay here with Janet. All right. No, 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 no. You're, you're making a mistake. It's, it's your mind. It's your mind. It's Charlie Lowe. What's wrong, Sergeant? I caught this houseboy hiding a bundle under his mattress, sir. This bundle of money. Seventeen thousand dollars. Holy Harry! It belonged to me. It's your mind. Where would you get seventeen thousand dollars? Oh, Charlie Long, very rich man. I make you say we fifteen year. I say we go back by and by China to die. Mister Clowder, he keep money in his safe for me. Then it was you who went into his safe tonight. No, sir. Huh? Me, I ask you, Mister Clowder, for my money tonight. Mister Clowder, go to the safe, take out the money, and he give it to me. Oh, 
In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. If you have to drive in traffic very much nowadays, you've probably noticed the extra congestion on the road. Now, we don't say that driving with the new 76 gasoline will eliminate traffic problems. But we do say it'll make your driving a lot more pleasant by putting new power under your foot. Even the oldest cars step up with renewed energy when you put in the new 76. That's because the new 76 is power-packed with components of wartime aviation gasoline. The fighting fuel Union Oil Company refineries produce for their air forces. Furthermore, the new post-war 76 has been blended under scientific control to produce a fuel which will give you the full horsepower of your engine, regardless of make. It's no wonder motorists are talking about the way their cars perform with the new 76. Try a tank full of this powerful new gasoline and then watch the way your car surges ahead with new life. You can get the new Super 76 gasoline at any Union Oil Minuteman station. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. In answer to Janet's piercing scream and Phillips, Phyllis's call for help, Mike Shane and the inspector dash into Janet's bedroom. <laughs> Phil, Phil, Janet, what's the matter? What happened? The window. I saw two arms reach through the window. He wanted to kill me. Who, who wanted to kill you? I don't know. I couldn't see. Phil, did you see it? No. I was in Janet's dressing room. Let's check what's outside the window. Uh-huh. Balcony. Runs the full length of the house. Janet. Janet, was that you screaming? Oh, Lee, Lee. Who made it? You, you, you all right? What blaze is going on in this house? Somebody was being murdered. Quiet, quiet, please. Quickly now. We want to know where all of you people were during the past three minutes. Lee? I was in the dining room. Mr. Oliver? In the hall below. I was starting up the stairs when I heard the commotion. Mr. Russell? In the living room. Seems I'm always in the living room when something happened. And Charlie Lung was outside the door with the inspector and me. Don't... Janet, you're certain that you saw somebody? Oh, yes, yes. I almost died of fear. Phil, were you out of the room? Naturally. Janet told me she was certain that the clip found in the library was not hers. That her clip was in her purse, so I was looking for her purse. And did you find it? Yes, it's in the dressing Let's room. Let's go take a look at it. Here, this is the clip. Uh-huh. And comparing it with the one Charles Lung found? Oh, it looks just the same, only a trifle smaller. Phil. Yeah? Do you think Janet really saw somebody, or was she faking it? I've been wondering myself. I don't know, Mike. If I'd been in the room with her, Back it wouldn't here. have been... Mr. Shane. Yes, Mr. Russell? Oliver says he was below in the hall when the screams came. Well, I was in the living room looking out into the hall, and I didn't see him. Perhaps not, but I did. I saw him starting up the staircase. Oh, you may be more helpful, Mr. Russell, if you'll return to the bedroom with us. Gentlemen, do any of you own a silver money clip in the design of a dollar mark? No, I've no, never owned one. one. I'm sorry to contradict you, but one of you did own such a clip. A brand new one. How can you make a statement like that, sir? Because the clip which I'm holding in my hand is of highly polished silver. It has not been in contact with the loose chains in a man's pocket because it bears no scratches. It is brand new. Janet. Uh, Miss Whitcomb. What? Would you mind turning around, please? Oh, a little more into the light. You mean like this? That's it. Have you worn that same dress all evening? Why, yes. I cleaned the spot just before... before I discovered Uncle John. Mm-hmm. Inspector. Yeah? Angel, will you step out into the hall with me, please? All right, all right, Smarty. What's all the mystery? You heard Janet earlier this evening. She said she had cleaned that dress just before finding Crowder's body. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure, Mike, but what about it? What about it? Come with me. Where? Downstairs and outdoors. I think we'd better search one of those cars in the driveway. Not just any car, but a car. <laughs> Right, Mike, here it is. It was hidden under the seat. Colt, 38 revolver. One chamber fired. Huh? That does it. All right, Inspector, I think we're ready for our murderer. That's what I said. 
This gun I hold in my hand killed Mr. Crowder. Inspector, I've never owned a gun in my life. The same goes for me. The last time I used a gun was skeet shooting. Very well. No one has come forward to claim his gun, so we'll give him another chance. Janet, when we were first talking to you tonight, do you remember somebody else mentioned that you had a spot on your dress? I don't remember. Perhaps not, but I do very distinctly. Maybe I can refresh your memory by telling you what happened. The murderer parked his car down the street a couple of blocks. He walked here to the house, then sneaked around in back and watched the living room window. He saw Janet spill something on her dress, and then Mr. Crowder excuse himself and go into the library to listen to his favorite radio program. The killer knew the program would last 15 minutes. While Crowder was at the radio, the man opened the French window and sneaked up on Crowder. At the last second, Crowder discovered him. They struggled. And in the struggle, the man's silver money clip dropped to the floor. The man fired and Crowder fell. The killer stepped outside the French window and closed it. He ran back to his car, got in, and drove up to the house. Then, very casually, walked in the front door just after Janet had discovered the body. But, but that's when Lee came in. Yes, Janet, your fiancé. And he tried to kill you a few moments ago when he thought you were beginning to suspect him. Don't believe him, Janet. It's, it's crazy. You told us that when you walked into the house, you didn't know Mr. Crowder was dead. You said you thought Janet was upset because of the spot on her dress. But Janet had already been upstairs and cleaned her dress. The spot was gone. You saw the spot on her dress when you looked through the library window. Why, that isn't what I said. Oh, yes, it is, Strayhorn. We found this gun in your car with one chamber fired. All right, arrest me. You won't get anywhere. No jury will convict me on evidence like that. The murderer planted the gun in my car. Lee, have you ever heard of the paraffin test? No. Well, the police coat a man's fingers with paraffin. If he has recently fired a gun, the paraffin will show the powder marks. Are you willing to take that test? All right, Inspector. I think the look on Lee's face is proof enough. <laughs> Kids, I'm sorry my wife is down country again. She'd love to fix these eggs herself. Well, we're sorry too, Inspector. You know, your house seems empty without it. Yes, it <laughs> certainly does. Not to change the subject, Inspector, but hmm? I've been wondering. Lee Strayhorn seemed awfully cocksure that a jury wouldn't convict him. Do you think he has a chance? Not a chance, Phil. Tomorrow we'll check every jewelry store in town and find which one sold Lee that silver money clip. That'll cinch it. And we can prove his motive. Mr. Crowder knew 